Good evening. This is Sergeant X, filling in for Peter Laurie. When uh, danger threatens any one of her brood, even the placid and uninspired mother hen can become an avenging demon, purposeful and unmindful of her own safety. And in man, too, this instinct to preserve one's own is strong indeed. As you will hear tonight in the Mystery Playhouse. Tonight, the Mystery Playhouse is proud to play host to an ardent stamp collector, a proud and loving father, and master detective, the incomparable Charlie Chan. The record of Mr. Chan's achievements in crime detection, you know, is equaled only by his reputation as a family man, a role he much prefers, by the way. However hard Charlie has tried, he's never been able completely to retire and live the life of a simple, home-loving man. Take, for instance, one night when he was seated in the living room poring over his beloved stamp collection. His daughter Rose was writing a letter to her boyfriend overseas with the Navy, and Tommy, his number one son, was expected home from a war bond rally. Dad? Hmm? Can you send an imprint of a kiss by V-mail? Rouge, very disconcerting to machine, designed to transfer letter to film. Oh. Humbly suggest you substitute words, I salute my brave warrior with a kiss. That sounds silly, Dad. I'll just say, um, uh, consider yourself kissed, you mutt. Is not mutt American slang for dog? Well, sure, he's in the Navy, isn't he? So he's an old sea dog. Would appear seagull more appropriate for a Navy flying man? <laughs> well, I can't say. Consider yourself kissed, you old gull. <laughs> if boyfriend to receive letter from number one daughter before his return home, suggest choice of suitable epithet and letter sealed and mailed. Okay, Dad. Hiya, Dad. Hiya, sis. Neighbors surely must appreciate effort of number one son in keeping them from quiet evening. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Dad, he's the noisiest kid I know. Kid? Okay, Grandma. Oh, son, you brought newspaper as requested? Yeah, the... Paper? The newspaper. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. I meant to, but I... Well, I, I can run down now. I'll be right back. Wait, son. Uh, take sister's letter. Oh, Dad. Oh, now, don't do me any favors. Besides, I want to make sure this letter reaches Jimmy and it doesn't stay in your pocket. So I'll mail it myself. And what's more, Dad, if you want to read your paper tonight, I'll see that you get it. Huh. I suppose you'll never forget anything. Well, not when it's important. Oh, is that so? Oh, no, I don't remember. Please. Suggest that family storm be deferred. Thunder outside of more immediate concern. Possible rain coming. Since you stand some distance away, suggest number one daughter, Harry. Okay, Dad, I won't be long. And don't worry. If it rains, I'll take a cab. Be right back. Someday I'm going to lose my temper with that dame, son. And then I... Uh, yes, Dan. Suggest you retain temper and go to kitchen for usual snack before retiring. Oh, all right, Dan. Uh, fully appreciate now burden of honorable wife with 11 sources of trouble. Aye, son. What happened? Sounded like shot. Oh, Dad, did I scare you? Did not soothe me. Number one son carries gun, perhaps? Oh, no, Dad. Just some firecrackers I was taking out of my pocket. A torpedo dropped to the floor. Firecrackers? Hmm. Hardly a plaything for one your age. Huh? Oh, gosh, Dad, you got me wrong. I was just holding them for the neighborhood kids so they wouldn't hurt themselves. They were using them to whip up the bond sales in Chinatown. With number one son holding same, fear greatly honorable mother will have no home to return to. Give the rest of same to me, please. Well, okay, Dad. But if they don't sell a lot of bonds, those kids will have your scalp. Get your paper, miss. Kind of wet. Sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, is there a taxi cab around? Yeah, a cab in front of the bank there. Hey, cab! Oh, thanks. I'll get it. Sorry, kid. My cab's taken. Yeah, you can't stay in here. I've hired this cab. <laughs> Help me! Help me! Hey, look, Molly. Here comes the bank guard. Let me out of here. Molly, get your 
the cab. Let go, my feet. You've broken them. That's tough. Okay, Muggsy. Here comes Chuck. Get going, Muggsy. Hey, who's this dame? I don't know, but she's coming along. She's seen too much. <laughs> Investigation going on here. Move on. A thousand pardons, Captain Flannery. Hmm? But I, too, am investigating. Well, Charlie Chan. <laughs> How are you? Disturbed, Captain. Disturbed. Tell me, why are you here? I was a holdup at the bank. Pretty routine stuff, Chan. Guard shot. Nothing that would interest you. What are you looking at? Notice small coral beads in hand. Hmm? Oh, these. Pick them up in the gutter. Why the interest? Believe small beads came from necklace worn by number one daughter. Rose? Yes. She failed to return from posting letter. Beads suggest possible harm befell her. Hey, wait a minute. The newsboy said a Chinese girl got in the cab. Age seldom gives credit to eyes of youth. Tell me, was car followed? Yes, Jan. One of our squad cars gave it a chase. They got away by beating a freight train to a crossing. We're sure one of our bullets hit the back of the car. Fervently trust same bullet did not go further. Danger to daughter almost too much to bear. Easy now, Chan. You go home. I'll get Rose back for you or turn in my beds. Thank you. First time in humble career, find emotions stronger than detecting instincts. Dad, you've got a car that's pacing up and down. Well, you haven't been off your feet in 22 hours. Dad, did you hear me? Forgive me, son. Ears open, but mine closed. Well, will you eat something? A bowl of soup, a little rice, anything. No, thank you, son. Thoughts are not a food. They dwell on number one daughter. Gosh, Dad. I shouldn't have let her go. I should have gone myself. Them grateful, honorable mother knows nothing of misfortune. Oh, I'll get it, Dad. It's good news, I'm sure of it. Hello? Oh, yes, he's here, Captain Flannery. Yes? You have? Oh. Oh, that's all right. I'll tell him. Dad, they found the cab in a ditch. In a ditch? You mean... Take it easy, Dad. It was empty. Looked as though it had been driven there deliberately to hide it. It had a bullet hole in the back. I must go. Dad, Dad, wait till I tell you the rest. Captain Flannery has surely located owner. Captain Flannery? How do you know? No, Captain Flannery. Well, I'll go with you, Dad. No, son. Remain here, close to phone, in case there is further news of sister. This is Charlie Chan. He wants to ask you a couple of questions. Look, I ain't denying it was my cab, but I don't know nothing about the whole up. I loaned the hack to my brother. I had to. The kid was wild. The only way I could keep him straight was to let him drive the cab once in a while so he could make some money. Where does wild brother make headquarters? Huh? How do you reach the punk when you want him? Why, I don't, you see. What? Oh, well, that is, there's a cigar store on the outskirts of town. Sometimes I can get him there, but... Not now. I try. Well, you better keep trying. You don't want a murder rap tossed at you. Well, I tell you, I am mixed up in old Robbins. It was your cab. But but I tell you, I had... Excuse, please, Captain Flannery. Mr. Russick, should you contact Wild Brother, inform him, please. I'm holding him responsible for safety of number one daughter, Rose. Huh? Your daughter? You heard him. Rose Chan was in your cab when your kid brother pulled that bank job. She hasn't returned since. Boy, no wonder you're so interested in this case. Hey, don't look at me like that, Mr. Chan. Honest, I ain't never been mixed up in no robins and killings. Get going, Russick, and find your brother. Huh? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll do my best. You can bet on that. Yes, sir, I sure will. What do you think, Chan? Is he in on it or not? Think not. Too surprised at mention of daughter. Hmm. Was it wise to mention her... Wouldn't she be safer if I didn't know who she is? Believe unknown Chinese girl might become liability to men in hiding. Therefore, kill her. Mm. But daughter, asset for bargaining. Mm. Then you feel pretty sure their next move will be to contact you. Hope such is case. Return home now to await developments. Oh, there you are, Dan. Gosh, where have you been? Taking first steps on path that leads to honorable sister. Oh, gosh, I'm sure glad you got back. This was stuck under the door, but when I looked out, no one was there. Hmm. 
handwritten note on wrapping paper. It's a demand for money for sister's release. Gosh, Dad, what's happened to her? Honorable sister got in cab used for holdup by mistake. Then this is a ransom note. Yes, son. Gee, ten thousand dollars. Where'll you get it? Yes, legitimate question. Long-standing friends may help, but first we'll attempt to contact Mr. Vaughn, president of the bank, which was robbed. Oh, we'll answer door. Please phone Mr. Vaughn. Yes, Dad. Captain Flannery. Glad you're here, Chen. Russick just came back to the station house. Said he was sure he could locate his brother. Good. Also have news for you. Ransom note delivered here, demanding $10,000 for release of daughter. $10,000? Dad, I got Mr. Vaughn on the phone. They're coming, son. Hey, now look, Chen. You're not going to pay any ransom while I'm on the force. Give me time. I only suggest good friend retain shirt. We'll only use banker to divide and conquer enemies with the use of cab driver Russick. What do you mean? Listen to phone conversation. Hello? Hello, Mr. Vaughn. Regret delay. No, have not yet apprehended criminals. Hope to do so before night is out. Greatly need your worthy assistance. Also cooperation of some suburban bank. Owner of cab involved will also help. Listen closely, please, to most dangerous plan for releasing daughter who at moment is in hands of desperate criminals. Trap must be set. Take these handcuffs off. It's uncomfortable being locked to this chair. Don't move, Miss Chen. They won't hurt. Besides, this hideout wasn't built for your comfort. Oh. Now, are you sure you left that note where the old man will find it? Yeah, that? Chelsea. Yeah, I slipped it under the door just like you said. I wish they could be sure. I'm telling you. Yeah, like you told me you could handle a getaway. So of all the dames in the world, we got to pick up Chen's daughter. That's bad, huh? We are getting ten grand for her, ain't we? Did you pull off the bank stick up? No, you bumped off a guard and got no dough. Shut it. The kid must be. It could be my dad, Charlie Chen. Huh? Open that door, Chuck, will you? Stop being so jumpy. Okay. Hey, Chuck. Hi, Muggy. Hello, Molly. Hello, kid. Where have I got news? What's up? It was my brother wanting to see me, all right. He's got a proposition. I don't trust Pipe you. down, Chuck. I want to hear the kid. What's the proposition? Now, look, Molly, I'm not... Quiet! Go on, kid. Well, my brother picked up two old gents in his cab, see? They're on their way to a hick bank about five miles from here. My brother's got all the dope. So what? We're going to meet a guy there who's going to open up this here bank. I'm still listening. Okay, get this payoff. They're going there to get that ten grand we're asking for this chance to have. Oh, yeah. nuts. On a level. They couldn't open a Vaughn's bank on a kind of time lapse or something. Sounds to me like a frame-up. Now, wait a minute. My brother ain't no stool for the cops. I tell you, he picked up these two gents' cruises. It could happen, Chuck. But it didn't. Why is your brother playing ball with us all of a sudden? Well, he's getting smart for a change. Beginning to realize he ain't going to make a million driving a hack. Yeah, it took him a long time. Wait a minute, Chuck. If I heard Rustic tell this himself, I'd know. Where is he, kid? At the cigar store, waiting for you. I think I'll talk. Hey, just a minute, Molly. Suppose this is a trap. We still got Chan's kid, ain't we? Muggsy, keep your eye on her till we get back. Molly, I say we play this safe. I want ten grand for that thing. And I want ten times that from the Hicks Bank. <laughs> I think that's the car now. Yeah, that's it. Splendid, Mr. Russick. Wait. The man has left the car. The woman's parking it. Hey, the boat's supposed to meet me in my cab outside. Ah, suspect only one will accompany you to bank. Other will return to hiding place to await outcome. Yes. If anything wrong, fear for safety of number one daughter and your brother. I think you're right, Chan. Look, no. man already in cab. Woman on way to enter scene. We telephone number one son to follow gang car back to hiding place. Okay. Well, I'd better go out before he gets suspicious. Much depends on you, Mr. Russick. Remember carefully all instructions. Speak with caution. Don't worry, Chad. I will. I'll be careful. Chuck, like I've been telling you and Molly, it looks like a lead pipe cinch to me. A lot better than holding Chan's daughter for a measly ten grand. Chan's daughter? 
What's she got to do with this setup, Russick? Well, quit stalling, folks. One guy in my cab called the other one Vaughn. He's the president of the bank you stuck up while you were using my cab. That's what you say. Yeah, and so did the cops who shot at you when they put that bullet hole in the body of my hand. That still don't put Chan's daughter in the picture, Russick. The guy did that. He's the big shot at his sick bank. He told Vaughn he was helping him because he was... Afraid of chance. Okay. So how come you didn't drive them out to this hick bank if that's where they were heading? They wouldn't do that till 11.30, so I drove them to Chance House. By the way, it's getting late, and that bank's a good four miles from here. Uh, Rustic, um, you really like this deal, huh? Sure. I think it's a setup for real, too. And, uh, you'll do the driving? Who else? I want to earn my 50% cut. 50%? <laughs> Let him dream. Russick, if it don't come off, you and your kid brother both lose. <laughs> we ought to. Not like you, Russick. You see, Chuck here handles the sort off real nice. If the cops are at the Hick Bank... Your head gets blowed off. Yeah. Of course, I won't be there to have the pleasure, because I'm not going with you. Just you and Chuck. I'll be back at the hideout. If Chuck don't come back by midnight, little brother gets it too. Right between his baby blue eyes. <laughs> you still want to play bank robber, Russie? Well, sure. Why shouldn't I? Okay. You, uh, haven't any way of contacting Mr. Chan, have you? I wouldn't know him if I fell over him. Yeah. Too bad somebody can't tell Chan. Tell him what? That if this is a frame-up, his daughter gets it, too. Do you see? Yeah, but... Well, that's his worry. Well, let's get started. It's almost 11.30. Huh? Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, Molly. This little guy ain't on the level. He's got more guts than his kid brother. Be yourself. What choices he got now? Okay, you two better get going. Be, uh, seeing you, Russick. <laughs> That it, Russick? That stone building ahead? Must be. Yeah. See there? They are. That looks like Vaughn, and there's the other guy. Yeah, they're just going in. Hey, this begins to look good. Should I pull up? Are you nuts? We case the block first. What? Go around the block slow, chump. But ain't it easier if we walk in while they're busy getting the money? We'll be there. Do like I say. Okay. Pull up right in front of the door. Right in front? That's right. So as I can cover you in the entrance while you go in. Me? You heard me, Russick. Get going. Right. Now walk right up to the door and stand beside it. I'll keep you covered with the sword off. Okay. Wait. Wait. Hold it, Russick. Drop the gun. Cops, huh? Well, you asked for it, Russick. You all right, Russick? Huh? Yeah, his shot missed me. Well, you won't be bothered by him anymore. He's dead. Uh, where's Charlie Chan? Uh, he's trailing a day. Evil woman has gone inside house. Pray that trailing her proves fruitful in quest for honorable sister. A parked car here, son. All right, Dad. Be quiet. Come. Let us investigate. Okay, Dad. See, Dad? Look. That window on the side. There's a light. Approach him cautiously. Can see honorable sister inside. Mm. He's handcuffed to chair. Gee, Dad, what are we going to do? Should I take the car and get help? No. Wait, son. Have planned. Mm. Go to car. Drive up to front of door with much clatter. Okay, Dad. Humble father will remain here to make sure no harm befalls honorable sister. <laughs> So, Miss Chan, if Russick is on the square, we'll leave you here tied up. Be a smart old man to find. And 
What happens if he... If he... <laughs> you mean if Russick double-crosses it? Uh, Look, if Chuck don't show up by midnight, and that ain't far off, I'm sending you to what you call your honorable ancestors. Oh. Hey, Marla, you, you won't kill her, will you? Don't you worry, your little head, Muggsy. You won't know a thing about it. What does that mean? Are you kidding? If Chuck don't get back, you get bumped off, too. Now, stop worrying. Oh, honest, Molly, I'm telling you, my butt is no stooly. We'll see, kid. Gee, Molly, maybe the cab broke down on the way back, or maybe... Hey, that's Chuck. I told you they'd pull it off and get back. None too soon, neither. Right. What's that? The cop! They must have tailed him. I'm getting out of here. I ain't got no rod. Keep away from that door. Don't open it. I'll cover the window. Yeah, maybe that'll hold it. Yeah, look, we ain't got a chance. I'm gone. I said keep that door shut. I'll tell you out for it. Open that door, would you? You shot him. He's outside. He'll be killed. No, what is yellow? I'm fighting it out, see? It's no use. Your gun's empty. You better surrender. I want to get another rod. Heaven, unlock the door. If I unlock it, they'll blast me. You open it. They'll recognize you and won't shoot. I can't. I'm handcuffed, remember? Okay, okay. I'll take them off. Want to get out there and stop them. There. Now they're off. Now get out there. Hey, what are you doing? Seeing how you look with the handcuffs on. Now stand there where you'll be safe. Oh, Dad. Dear. Uh, oh. I'm happy to find Pearl of great price unharmed. Boy, am I glad to see you. Are you all right, sis? Oh, yeah, Tommy, I'm okay, but... Hey, where are the others? What others, daughter? What? Why, well, the police who surrounded the house. No police, only humble father and brother. What? Say, I ought to... No, you don't. Hey, how did the handcuffs get on you? Ask your smart sister. Huh? Oh, <laughs> I get it. Oh, but, Dad, where did all the shots come from? You, you hardly ever carry a gun. He's correct. Did not do so on this occasion. Say, what are you giving us? I suppose you made all that racket out there with firecrackers. <laughs> Again, correct. <laughs> firecrackers taken from number one son which were to be used in worthy cause. What do you mean, Dad? No questions now, please. First, must attend wounded brother of Mr. Russick. Then, deliver evil lady to police. Explanations will come at home. Some more tea, Dad? Uh, palate says yes, stomach says no. Gee, Captain Flannery sure was pleased when we turned over that Molly dame, huh, Dad? He thought you were great on this case. I'm deeply grateful to number one son for assistance. Oh, it was nothing. Also deeply grateful for brave assistance of Mr. Russick and Mr. Vaughn. And don't forget sis here. Oh, cut it out, Tommy. No, I mean it. She was wonderful, wasn't she, Dad? Yes, son. How wonderful I did not realize until I thought I might lose her. Fate turns on small wheels. Consider good fortune at beginning when beads were torn from worthy sister's throat by evil ones. Oh, but, Dad, those beads weren't torn. Explain, please. Oh, gosh, your daughter's inherited a little of her father's ability. I dropped those beads deliberately. Uh, number one daughter causes humble father deep pride. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Uh, but tell me, what about those firecrackers? In case of firecrackers, must admit fortune smiled kindly on humble father took them from honorable brother who held same and safekeeping for neighborhood children. <laughs> yes, sis. The kids were going to use them to sell war bonds. Well, I guess they won't be too disappointed. Chinatown will sell its quota without fireworks. Yes, son. And humble father will do his bit. With share of reward from bank, we'll purchase bond for each firecracker exploded. Gosh, Dad. Then this war bond drive will really go over with a bang. <laughs> Charlie, you did it again. But I guess it doesn't hurt to have a smart daughter around, huh? It's certainly been fine to have you with us tonight, and I hope we can tear you away again from the family hearth to say nothing of your stamp collection real soon. Right about now, Mr. Laurie, if he were here, would invite you all to the green room to eavesdrop on the rehearsal for our next Mystery Playhouse production. And who am I to be different? Follow me, please. Come. Yes, Charlie, 
don't be so self-conscious. I never said any such thing about the corn that comes out of your typewriter. Tailor-made for you, my precious. Oh, no. You're thinking of the precious Mr. Warren, our leading man. The ambulatory werewolf of the megacycle. Don't be bitter, Bernhardt. Jeff will write you fatter parts when you can handle them. Say, I was playing leads when you were a standing. Now, lay off, Alma, will you? Look, you've all worked together so long, you've got your private lives mixed up with the characters you're supposed to be playing. Three minutes, there, time, Jeff. Okay, okay, Ed. Check master control to see if we're getting the air on time. I'll check, but it looks like we've got the channel on the nose. Okay, Ed. Now, as you were saying, I was Jeff... saying that if you can't keep your petty jealousies outside the studio, I'll have a new cast. So what about our public, oh, Jeff? Oh, they won't like that. Listen, they'll explode your irreplaceable illusions like a toy balloon. And what about our contract clause? Read the cancellation clause and don't start anything you can't finish. What about our subordinate characters, Jeff? Are we also on the griddle? Yes, yes. Kent, you can quit wandering around the studio making passes at every ingenue I cast on this show. <laughs> and how you pick them. Or lay off the wisecracks, Kent, or your reputation as the hand that dies a thousand deaths will catch up with you. What about uh-huh. Mary Smith, Jeff? Haven't you any unkind words for our honey-haired heroine of tonight's masterpiece of mayhem? No, I have not. Mary, at least tries to play her part in spite of Warren's wolfing and your burn. I resent that. What she and Warren does is no concern of mine. Now lay off, Alma. In this studio, I'm the boss. I'll make the wisecracks and I'll do the telling. Outside, you can beat each other's brains out for all I care. Jeff, I can take care of myself. Not when it comes to Warren the Wonder Man, Mary. Don't worry about me, Jeff. Now pipe down, Kent. Look, Mary, just play your part. You're new to radio, but you're good. Don't let these technically perfect Mike monkeys tell you different. Oh, yes, dear, and don't fall for Jeff's private lessons in emotional acting. Yeah, Mary, beware. Take care. We're an odious aggregation. And directors never, never collect etchings or go to Atlantic City. Oh. <laughs> it's abstracts this season, darling. One minute to go, Jeff. Okay, now, Cass, there's nothing the matter with this show that you can't remedy if you just forget your personal differences for the next 30 minutes. Now, snap out of it and let's go. Hey, no say, Mr. Tyler. Uh, how about the sound that shooting spot in the phone booth? That's okay, but keep that gun away from the sound, Mike, or you'll blow us off the air. Okay, and, uh, uh, Mr. Tyler, thanks for standing up for Mary. Well, she's a good kid, Pop. Why doesn't she let on that she's your daughter? Oh, she wants to make her own way in radio. Not that I could do much to help her. Well, she will, Pop. 20 seconds air time, Jeff. Okay, gang, I'm going in the control room. Stand by and make it good. <laughs> Okay, here comes the last scene, Ed. So far, so good, yeah? Hello, Blake Detective Agency. Hi, yes, Wayne. Now, listen. Oh, yes, darling. Where are you phoning from? From a phone booth at a corner drugstore. Now, listen. Yes, Pretty good show so I'm far, Jeff. Yeah, cut the volume on that control room life. speaker, Ed. Do them well. Okay, Jeff, I thought you wanted to really hear this last thing. I do, but not that badly. <laughs> That's better. That lacing you gave the cash sure snapped them out of it, Jeff. Yeah, but there's too much bad blood out there. I'm going to have to make some changes. That shooting spot is coming up. Watch it. I've just found out who killed our client. Who was it? None other than our old friend. Oh, I... I'm shot. I, I am shot. Help. Somebody. What? Somebody help me. Oh. What's the matter? Say, they played that like they meant it. I'd rip their heads off. Yes, the script only called for one shot. Yeah, Pop's oh. nervous tonight. Probably pulled the trigger twice. What happened to you? Say, what's going out there in the studio? Pop didn't fire that shot. He's over by the curtain in front of the phone booth. Tony Warren, Mr. Scott. He's lying on the floor of the ice house. Ed, cut the show. I'm going out there to see what goes. Tell Master Control to pipe in the standby officer. <laughs> Looks like actors are expendable, too, doesn't it? This one certainly died in the line of duty. Right on the radio studio, script in hand. Probably the best scene he ever played. (laughs) So much for snide remarks. Why don't you plan to be in your seats for our next performance when big town Steve Wilson, fighting newspaper editor that he is, becomes involved in murder in the radio studio. Peter Laurie is our regular mystery master of ceremonies, and he'll be back on the job soon. But for now, this is Sergeant X closing the doors of the mystery playhouse and saying for him, 
Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Personal notice, dangers my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Well, greetings as usual, friend. Now, before we get down to cases, I want to ask you a question. What, in your opinion, is the dirtiest trick man can play on his fellow man? Now, don't say stealing candy from a baby, because that'll send you right back to the bush leagues. No, I'll tell you what I'll do. I promise you that if you'll listen to our Let George Do It adventure, you'll get some of the nastiest ideas on how to loss up your neighbor that you've ever heard of. Is that a deal? Okay, suppose I let George Valentine take it from here. Dear Mr. Valentine, first letter I ever read in 17 years, since the last time I filed a gold claim in Nogales. Name's Tioga Tom, only honest man left in the West. If you ever heard of the castle I live in out by the desert, then you know what these railroad tickets are for. To come see me, but you don't know anything else, understand? Trouble you fellas, you jump on conclusions. Think nobody else is smart but you. If you think I need help, then you're crazier than the people in Cactus Junction. And I ain't spit in their direction since WPA. But I do need a mite of assistance regarding the arrest of a culprit. I'm a man everybody tries to pester, on account of how rich they think I struck it. But me, I like my privacy and I aim to maintain it. P.S. The culprit I make reference to is the one who stole or made disappear or killed my dog. Only botheration is, it was my C&I dog. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Like a chicken leg, dearie, I brought a whole fryer along with some hard-boiled eggs. You know how trains are. Oops! Excuse me while I just get my valise on the rack here. It's all right. I'll move my coat, only this Yes, you came all the way through from the city, huh, dearie? Claire Brooks, it says on the baggage thing. Oh, my, that's a nice name. I had a boarder named Brooks once, but he died with his kidneys, poor darling. How you like our town, Cactus Junction? It ain't much, uh, look, is it? Please, excuse me, but really, this seat is... Dead. There we are. I guess there's no room for my hat, though. Have to jab it in across the aisle. Mind me to keep my eye on it. You never know. So now, let's eat. Well, I'm awfully sorry, madam, but I'm trying Go to tell on, you Go on, dearie. There's plenty of chicken for both of us. Oh, but I had the most awful time wringing its neck. Oh, you should have seen me. I chased him all around the oh, yard. Oh, no. I-, I said, will you please not sit down here? The seat is taken. Oh, George. George. Yeah, here I am, Angel. Well, 
If I'd known you was that tight. Oh, that's all right, lady. Sit still, sit still. Look, George. Going out for a smoke. Have a nice time, Brooksy. Oh, George. Isn't he sweet after all? Now, my name's Carmichael, dearie, and let me tell you about this chicken. What? Let it go, Jake. Well, here we go, Mr. Valentine. Last stop before Henry Switch. Henry Switch. That's where we get off, huh, conductor, for Tom's? Yep. Two, three-mile walk, I guess, up the hill. But there's a moon tonight. Rode around the back way, but of course it's his father. Uh-huh. Kind of a lonely spot for a blind man, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, desert rat with money. <laughs> Probably never let a doctor touch him in his life. Seen him out there once just a couple of weeks ago. He was fumbling along, hanging on to his dog. He doesn't like people, huh? No, there's an old Oriental been with him for years, if that's what you mean. Ho Singh, cook and bottle washer. Richer and Croesus, Tom is. A whole fortune might have paid in his castle, they say. <laughs> eh, I can't feel too sorry for him. Tioga Tom, last honest man in the West. <laughs> says him. Well, you'll be the first fist up there for a long time, I guess. Maybe you can get your hands on some of that gold. Underway now. Hey, save me another. Hey, wait, wait for me. Hey, stop the Oh, conductor, there seems to be a guy out here. Never yeah, make it, really. Always somebody too late for a train. Huh? Ridiculous. Shows a man's got no efficiency. I'm never late. Wait, will you? Wait. Come on, let's give him a hand. Hey, drinking, Jim. Can't even run straight, you see. Help me, fellas, will you please? Here, let me reach him. Now, now, here, I can reach him. Oh, gee, thanks. Oh, Easy there. Couldn't even hang onto my hand. Don't know why we bother. He's liable to fall. Get out of the way, friend. I'll get him. Here we go, boys. Here we are. Oh, gee. Oh, thanks. Sorry to be in trouble. I was in the bar. Everybody is so nice. They couldn't get away. Okay, okay, Frank. You made it all right. Oh, yeah. Wait a uh, minute. Here's your uh, hat over here. My name's uh, Loosefoot. Want a drink? What? Uh, Loosefoot. Uh, it's a name. Somebody just give it to me, I guess. I don't remember. Uh, come on, come on. Have Wait a, a minute. Scepter, it's a ticket, huh? too. Hey, it? Look, it fell off your hat. Here, give me that. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it's sure nice of you, hey, pal. Emery uh, Switch, it's uh, Yeah, didn't it? Oh, oh, sure, sure. I, I'm a necktie salesman. Got a few samples for the Switchman who works there. That's all. Well, thanks again, and, and, and you too. I, uh, where'd the other guy go? Back in the car, I guess. Oh, well, uh, thank him for giving me a hand, will you? I mean, thanks. I sure appreciate Yeah, it. sure. Only didn't you notice, Liz Brain? What that other guy tried to give you was a shove. I didn't shove him, Mr. Valentine. I just didn't help him much. I didn't want him on the train. What of it? Well, Mr. Flannery, I don't know. I'm just curious. Perfect right. Perfect. His name's Loosefoot. You know him? Who doesn't? I've done business in Cactus Junction. Lawyer. Coming this time from the city, though. As far as Emery Switch, huh? You too, maybe, huh? And why not? Now, Loosefoot's the kind of a person who's always in the way. Son of an old partner of Tioga Tom's, or claims to be. Always claiming to have a claim on him. Oh. And why are you going? What's your claim, Mr. Flannery? Never ask a lawyer a direct question, young man. <laughs> Spoken like an ambulance, Jason. Or presume on a man's guilt before it happens. Now, I haven't really seen Tom since before he lost his eyesight. Many's the time I've handled his legal affairs. Oh, wait and... a minute, what do you mean, guilt before it happens? What happens? What's going on tonight? You and Loosefoot, that makes three of us headed for the same place to visit a guy nobody ever visits. And all on the same night. Why? Oh, you too, eh? <laughs> well, well. What's your angle? You need counsel say so. You don't leave me alone. Why should I say why? <laughs> I tell you this, though. There's four, not three. Huh? His common-law wife for six months back in 1917. Or she says she was, but that's her claim. Not a bad one. You mean Tioga Tom? That big, overdeveloped appetite out there in the coach. Notice her eating fried chicken. A woman, Mr. Valentine, who'd wring your neck for a favor, but charged to tell you the time. The widow Carmichael. My 
my land, yes. That's where I live in Cactus Junction. Just to be near the poor dear. 33 years I've waited. The one true love of my life. All right, so you're going to see him too, but would you... Four of us? Four of us? My, I think it's just friendly. That's what I think. Only even with my shoes on, it counts to five to me. Ain't that so, Cousin Henry? Ah, uh, who's cousin? Well, I guess it does, widow. Oh, George, he's some sort of a cousin of Tioga Tom's. Uh, mother's side it was. Never very close, but blood's always thicker than water. The way I was raised. If you can't miss Brooks, here it's six of us, ain't it? Tioga, uh, he never liked crowds. Family trade. I told them we were going up to do a magazine story on him. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. But the rest of you, Mrs. Carmichael, will you please... I don't hold no secrets. I'm sure you don't. I ain't afraid to speak up. Remember, blood sticker and strangers, too, widow. And to whom is bereavement a secret? What? what? Oh, but he'll be well again. I know he will. I brought along my nursing things. It's my opportunity as well as my duty. It's the telegrams, Mr. Valentine. We all got them. Even that loose foot up in the bar car... Where Tom's nearest. Bless his adorable old soul. Now, 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 widow. The telegrams, but I don't know Got why... Got this should... evening, miss. From uh, Po Singh, that heathen up the castle. Here, yeah, read for yourself. Oh, thanks. Boss, very bad. Fall down, very bad. Come quick, please. Signed, Po Singh. Boss, very bad. A blind man, and he's already had some kind of a fall. Emmer switch. Ten minutes stop, Emmer switch. Come on, Brooksy, i got to get to a phone. Trap? What trap? What is it? Quiet, Agent. Oh, some kind of trap. I know, Savvy. All it's same, he mix oh, up. Oh, for the love of... Look, Po Singh, I told you this is Mr. Valentine. I'm on my way out, but I want to find out what happened since Tom wrote me. Now, if you need a doctor or no, something... No, 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 no. Boss, he say doctor just for horses and descending he bills. Boss dying, that's all. What? Come quick, that's all. Boss dying. <laughs> dying? Come on, Brooksy, let's get our stuff off the train and get up there. I don't know what's going on. But George, day before yesterday, a blind man's dog was stolen or killed, and then he has an accident. I know, I know. A rugged character who probably kept moving around, dog or no dog. Sure, somebody's up to something. This bunch of people. Haven't you realized what they are? Yeah, they all got telegrams. You know what I mean. They're the only people in the world, apparently, who have any sort of claim against Tioga Tom. They're nothing but vultures. Well, I'll go you one better, Angel. Say ghouls. Because you want to bet a guy like Tom has never made out a will? So if he did die, they'd all want to be handy to stake out those claims, start grabbing for his gold. Yeah, they go, George. All walking out together. Yeah. About three miles up the hill, somebody said. Only suppose you and I just walk fast and beat him, huh? Let's get to Tom first. It's all right. Loose foot in the widow. Look, there's certainly a pair. Cousin Henry, he's as slow as they are. Characters, I tell you. But there's one who's not so slow. Hey, he's not with him. Who, Mr. Flannery? Yeah. Still in the compartment. Let's drag him along with us. I want to ask him about what he did with that seeing-eyed dog. Ask him? George, what makes you oh, think I'm just he's... guessing. I'll tell you later, Angel. Hey, Flannery, let's go. We're... George. Mr. Flannery's dead. Yeah. Heard it. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. And now back to George Valentine. Tioga Tom the legendary man in the castle overlooking the desert. He thought he didn't need help, but that was yesterday when all that worried him was the disappearance of his seeing-eye dog. Once his protection was gone, something happened to Tom, an accident, and his only friend, Po Sing, says that he is dying, says, come quick. The vultures, the only relatives or ones with claims against Tom, they're gathering too. But if your name is George Valentine, you can't hurry to the castle quite as quickly as you'd like. Because one of the vultures is dead. Yes, Mr. Flannery has been murdered. 
Holy brother of Macintosh, what are we going to All do? All right, take it easy, Conductor. Take Some it easy. Some sort of a sharp weapon, George. Yeah, a little tiny wound in his throat. Yeah, but I got a train to worry about, and them people all scattered now. I better get on the telegraph. George, you said you had a hunch Mr. Flannery was the one who did something to the dog. Why? Oh, any of these people could have got at that dog. You know, Angel, it happened yesterday. It's only 15, 20 miles from Cactus Junction out to the castle. So they could have gone back and forth. Well, what's on your mind? But Mr. Flannery told you he'd come all the way from the city, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Neat, sharp little guy, man with efficiency. How about that, did he? Well, I, I don't know. I don't remember. I, I'm so rattled that I, I can't tell. There's I, mud, well, clay on the bottom of his shoes and the instep, see it? I noticed when he crossed his leg and carefully creased his trousers. Mr. Valentine, wait till the sheriff... He'd been in the city the day before. How'd mud get there? I'm the kind of guy who'd have a shine before breakfast. Say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I got the stubs here. I... Yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. Flannery, compartment... But you're right. He just got on at Cactus Junction, just like the others. Uh-huh. So then maybe I'm wrong about the dog. Oh, George, now you're confusing me even worse. Well, why was he murdered? Who murdered him? Maybe somebody else did something, and he was up here snooping around and saw it. Quite an operator, you know that. That'd be his style. See something and just keep quiet. Hey, Al, you see him? No. Oh. See a little woman, a little wobbly guy, and a stiff-jointed slowpoke? I know, sure, I know. No, I didn't see him. I couldn't catch up. Already left the road, I guess. Took the trail up the hill. Oh, brother. This road run around the backside of the castle. Sure, about five miles up there. There's a place you Okay, can... stay and help the conductor, will you? Let me have your truck. Yeah. Well, he's got to get us off on the side. And then all right, all right. You guys seen. worry about the train and the body. Come on, Brooksy. The ghouls are on foot. We can beat them. Yeah, sure, Only George. get that sheriff here fast. One murder's enough for tonight. Particularly if the second one should be me. Fits the description. Yeah. This door, I guess. Yeah. Don't see anybody inside there. At least we're ahead of the others. Yeah. Uphill, it'll take him another half hour. Only George, the murderer, if he's one of them, wouldn't stay with the others. Wouldn't he run away? Oh, maybe whatever this is all about isn't finished yet. Here we are, Angel. I guess we walk right in. Oh, it's a kitchen. Living room in here, apparently. Yeah. Hello? Anybody here? Hey, Tom, where are you? The place is so empty, but it's clean. That must be his room. It's the only one that... Yeah, could... Maybe he's asleep. But... George. Hey, a man dying, but his bed's empty. He's gone. Yeah, yeah, he's gone. Huh? What? Oh, 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 Mr. Valentine. Hello. Hello, miss. You're posing, but where's your... Tom, gone. <laughs> he is gone. Now, look, friend, what is this? A man who takes a bad fall and is dying doesn't just disappear like that? Oh, Mr. Tom, say, Mr. Tom, gone. Now... Now, excuse me, hey, please. wait a minute. Where are you going? I get a cleaver knife. A what? Me a cleaver. You sorry? Mr. Tom say you must stay. Oh, he does, huh? The boss. Old Honest Tom says we should stay, huh? Suppose we don't. You going to use that thing? More better, I think you stay. Oh, sure. Okay. No. We'll stay outside. I can work it. Brother Valentine the sucker, Valentine George, the sucker. George, there's a fence down here the front way, too. It's supposed to be a gate half a mile from the house. Yeah, and this was a path when we started out on it. Where the deuce did we lose it? Valentine the pathfinder, the boy oh, scout. Oh, George, you don't know yet. Hey, look out now. Easy there. Ooh. We seem to be down in a gully. What? Yeah. The trail must be up there, George. A little bridge right up over us. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Wasn't what I was looking at. Sawdust. Hmm? Yeah, sort of scattered. All around here, too. Farther under the bridge. Seems to be just a little footbridge. Pretty far up there, though, isn't it? Yeah, sort of has been here for a day or two. Wet. Fell here, and there's some on top of the cross piece, too. Yeah, I see it. Somebody said trap. Something up there has been freshly sawed, Angel. And anybody coming up the trail from the front gate would have to go across that bridge, wouldn't they? And it's so dark, they couldn't yeah, see. Yeah, come on. Get up there before somebody tries to walk across it. And... Look out! Where are you going? What? Bump into a man just sitting peaceful like that. Hey, there. 
woman's voice, wasn't it? Well, yes, couldn't you see it? Tom, Tayo, get Tom, wouldn't you know? You wouldn't know anything. Who is it, Valentine? Yeah, I'm standing right here in front of you. You're sitting on a rock waiting for something to happen. Detectives all are stinking. Trouble with you, fella. But sitting nice and healthy, huh? The poor guy who had the bad tumble. Only honest man left in the West. And he gets his hired boy to send out telegrams saying he's dying. Huh. Had a tumble. Broke ten ribs back in 1922. Never told a lie in my life. So that's the way you stretch it. Poor dying Tom. Been dying since the day I was born. So have you. So now you're sitting here waiting to hear wood break, huh? Bo Sing brings you out where you can, waiting to hear people tumble through that little trap you set up there. Pester me, every one of them. I told you that... I'm afraid we don't believe anything you told us. Told you I like my privacy. I aim to maintain it. Bunch of vultures, all pester me, looking for my gold. So you hire me... See an eye dog disappeared. Don't you think somebody's up to something? You jump on conclusions. Say, I had that bridge sword. But one of them did it. Like one of them did a murder, I suppose. Ain't interested in murder. Gonna die myself sometime, that's enough to worry about. Just trying to slow up the process, that's all. I steal my dog and then saw my bridge. Who do you think uses that bridge? I do. Even without my dog, I can find my way around this place, but I found him out, yes, sir. Tom isn't gonna go down with it. Huh? Go on, one chosen. Hold your tongue. Ain't you got ears? Well, yes, somebody's coming. I'm going to get up on that bridge before... No, this way. Hey! Hey, where am I? Who is that over there? Where's the trail? I can't see. Ah, my loving vultures. Tell everybody they're friends of mine can't even find their way around. Hello, Henry. Your voice, ain't it? Tom. <laughs> Fitter than a fiddle. What in the name of... Never mind. Where's the rest of them? Loosefoot and the lady. Oh, coming, I guess. We move kind of separate. Only that telegram, Tom. What kind of a stunt? Yeah, let me take your arm. Help me out. Quiet, Henry Loosefoot. Mrs. Carmichael. Another county you heard from. Could hear that one across three counties. Yeah, there she is, over on the other side. She's headed for the bridge. Come on. But, Tom, Hurry up and can't... get her. I'll oh, be all right. George, we can't get up there in time. We're on the wrong side. She's coming this way. Mrs. Carmichael, stop. Who is that? Where are you? Stay where you are. Don't come across that bridge. What did you say? Oh, the bridge, yes, I see it, all right. Uh, stop, don't walk on it. Oh, it's you, dearie, I'm coming. Stop, I said, stop, will you? Well, I can't stop till I get there, can Oh, I? Lord, she'll fall, oh. stop. My heavens, what's all the fuss? Oh, we... Out of the we way, got... Angel, let me see something. What's the matter with him? Oh, dearie, what a climb. And the wind blowing my hat off all the time. What are you trying to see, George? The good is sawed half through, all right. But a board's been freshly nailed across to support it. George, but I who don't... could have nailed the board across? Tom and Poe Singer are the only ones up here. So Tom was telling the truth. Someone else saw it, then Tom had it fixed. Wait a minute. Mrs. Carmichael, where's your hat been? What? Yeah. When Flannery was murdered, little tiny wound. He was stabbed with something sharp. Well, how in blazes should I know where the pin is? George, she pinned her hat to the seat opposite us. The seat across the aisle. I remember it. Did I? Couldn't find it when I left the train. And the only person who would have noticed it or thought of using it was the one who sat down there. Cousin Henry. Yes, Cousin Henry. And George, he's down there with Tom. Wait a minute. What about Loosefoot? Where's he? Ran on ahead, I guess. He was the fastest. And the trail's easy mount. So we haven't seen him because he's probably already crossed this bridge. Probably clear up at the house by now. But George, Tom is down there with sure, Henry. Sure, sure, with Henry. Don't you see, Angel? Tom wanted to know who killed his dog and sawed the bridge. That was the reason for the phony telegrams, this whole shindig. It was to get all the vultures up here and see which one of them wouldn't walk across the bridge. Henry. And five minutes ago, Tom discovered who was guilty. Well, uh, hurry up. Yeah, 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 but quietly. Because now it's all backwards. Now the question is what Tom intends to do to Henry. There. Here they are. And they're not moving toward the house, not moving at all. Tom's got a gun, George. He's hanging onto Henry's arm. Even a blind man could shoot somebody as long as he yeah, had a... Yeah, come on, around this way. Look out. Uh... Well, come back, did you? Get down here, Mr. Valentine. This crazy... Shut thing... up, dog killer. You'll get your chance to grovel. He's a murderer, too, you say, huh? Don't answer, Angel. Around the rock here. Yeah, that's right. Now, oh, come on. He's crazy. You're both crazy. Everybody comes pestering me. Well, it's going to stop once for all. 
Sure, he killed Flannery. Flannery's another pet, snooping around the same day he was. Let go of me. Let go of me. Get your hand oh, off my... Oh, no, you don't. You move. The gun goes off. Okay, Tom, I'm here now, right beside you. You can hand me that gun. Uh-huh. Hey, George, you let go. He just let go. Oh, you, you... Look out. I'll get him. Give me that gun, I said. Where are you? Where is no, he? No, no, you don't. Detectives knocking my gun out. The sheriff will get him. Don't worry. I just got an idea. It might be good to save you from dying for a while, Tom. <laughs> Man's dying from the day he's born. Oh, sure. Honest Tom. Rugged independent. I know I hate that guy, but shooting him while escaping might not go down so well with a jury. Uh, just shooting wild? Uh, I couldn't actually... Well, would have been just blind luck if I hit him, I mean. Oh, sure, sure, Tom. Be careful what you say. Don't want to tell a lie. Only honest man left in the West. Yep, that's me. Don't want to admit you might be a dead shot. Don't want to say right out to your blind. Even though that's how you suckered these people into coming after you. <laughs> but, George, he said... <laughs> Ain't a lie if a man always talks like he had to hear people to recognize him, is it? Ain't a lie to stumble around a few times you've seen, is it? Buster, you take the cake. <laughs> Honest as the day is short. Sure, we all jumped at conclusions, all right. Because I guess there's no law against a man with good eyesight owning a seeing-eye dog. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Don't like it. People, don't like it. Well, you can leave for the castle pretty soon, Tom. Taking down your cousin Henry's confession now. Worthless bunch of vultures. Won't be pestered anymore. Sure, sure, Tom. You've got your privacy. You know, we did stop you from doing the one thing that really would have been wrong. Do I appreciate it? Obligations ain't for me, young lady. Well, the reason people pester you is because of your gold. And I thought maybe you'd tell us what... <laughs> Tell you a secret. Sure, I got barbed wire and faces, but I never actually said I have gold, did I? What? Oh, for the luck. Lo- oh, George, come on, let's get out of here. Jump on conclusions, like everybody else. Oh, that awful man. George, I want to go out someplace and go dancing and forget about him. Okay, spend my gold. Well, at least I know you haven't got any. <laughs> I'll tell you something that'll worry you for years, you notice? Tom didn't say he didn't have any either. You have just heard Nothing But the Truth, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now, this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, let's drop in on the famous colleague of Sherlock Holmes, our good friend, Dr. Watson. 
Good evening, Dr. Watson. And a very good evening to you, Mr. Bell. I've almost given up hope of your coming tonight. I know it's pretty late, Dr. Watson, but I saw that your light was still on, so I thought I'd drop in. I'm glad that you did, Mr. Bell. Applying the methods of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I would venture a guess that you're on your way home from the theater. Amazing deduction, Dr. Watson. <laughs> I lament to Mr. Bell. Isn't that a theater program I see sticking out of your pocket? Oh, of course. Oh, uh, what was the play? <laughs> Hamlet. Very fine production, too. Have you seen it? No, not lately. But I think I can claim to be one of the very few men in this world to have seen a far older Hamlet than any that you saw performed tonight. An older Hamlet? I don't quite understand. Some 400 years older. You've heard me speak of Professor Moriarty? The arch-villain whom Sherlock Holmes considered his most worthy opponent? Precisely. I think that Professor Moriarty would cheerfully have given his right arm to possess the Hamlet to which I'm referring. At least he was quite willing to commit murder for it. I remember... Oh, but uh, here I am monopolizing the conversation when I knew uh, know that you've got something quite important to, uh, to tell our listeners. Yes, Dr. Watson, I'd like to tell our listeners about a modern trend in hair grooming that's in such great demand today by men who value their appearance. It's called cremel hair tonic. Frankly, man, cremel is the only hairdressing I've ever found that really makes my hair stay in place. An outstanding feature of Kreml is that it always keeps hair so neatly groomed, yet never gives it that cheap, greasy look. Kreml never leaves hair full of sticky goo. Your hair feels so soft and looks so natural. And men, don't tell me that you won't be mightily pleased when your wife or sweetheart remarks how attractive your hair always looks. How it feels so nice to touch, never greasy or sticky. It's spelled K-R-E-M-L. Kreml. Hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about Professor Moriarty and the original Hamlet? I'm all ears. It all began in the most commonplace manner imaginable. I was walking down the street with Holmes in answer to a completely routine call from Scotland Yard. Hurry up, Watson. Don't lag. I must say, Holmes, that as a medical man, I heartily endorse this recent passion of yours for long, brisk walks. My dear Watson, the constant succession of dull cases with which we've recently been favored leaves me with so much surplus energy that I can only sleep by exercising myself into a state of utter stuporous exhaustion. Look out! Oh, look out! Good heavens, that carriage! Oh! Catch it, Doctor! Catch it, Doctor! Oh, did you see that? That carriage ran right over that old man. Poor devil. I better see what I'm going to do for him, Holmes. Well, that's your mate, Watson. Look after the poor chap. I must be getting on to the yard. The poor man. Uh, move to one side, please. Move to one yeah, side, yeah, please. Away. I'm a doctor. Oh, oh, let the doctor through. Let the doctor through. I'm all right, sir. I'm all right, thank you. Well, there are no bones broken, I'm going to say. Here, let me help you to stand up. Thank you, sir. Yes, I, I'm all right. Quite all right. Very kind of you to come to my assistance. Oh, not at all. I'm a doctor. At least I picked a good spot for my accident. I see there's a pub right across the way. I hope you'll at least let me have the pleasure of standing you a drink. That's the quickest fee I ever received. I'll lead the way, sir. Two whiskies and sodas, miss. Right, sir. Allow me to introduce myself, sir. My name's Franklin Burley. Oh, and here's, uh, here's my card, Mr. Burley. Not the Dr. Watson. Oh, you mean the little paper I wrote on the, the common cold in the last issue of the Lancet? I don't know I, about uh, that, but aren't you Sherlock Holmes' colleague? Yes, I am. God sent you to me, Dr. Watson. Oh, really? I've been wanting to put my problem into competent hands. What do you mean? I didn't stumble in front of that carriage, Dr. Watson. I was pushed. Someone's been trying to murder me. No, 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 Mr. Burley, I... I... tell you, it's the truth. Two weeks ago, a wheel came off the carriage that I was driving. A most convenient accident. Last Wednesday, as I was passing St. George's in Hanover Square, an enormous balk of timber fell, missing me by less than a yard. Well, why on earth should anybody want to kill you? Here you are, gents. Oh, thank you, thank you. Because I saw it, Dr. Watson. Saw what? I saw the ghost of the Burleys. Which no man may see and live. Oh, no, 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 my dear fellow. After all, this is the 19th century. We are a very old family, the Burleys. Not nobility, but just as old, just as proud, and just as poor. My father left me two inheritances. The magnificent Burley Library, which has been in our family for over 300 years. And the Burley Ghost. Oh, you needn't look at me like that. I'd always scoffed too, when I heard tales of the ghost. But a week ago... 
I saw it in the library. Uh, very well, Mr. Belly. Uh, may I ask whose ghost it's supposed to be? The original collection of books in the library was stolen from an abbey expropriated by Henry VIII. When the abbot resisted, he was killed, and it's his ghost that, according to legend, haunts the library. I don't suppose you could describe the ghost. That's where you're wrong, Dr. Watson. I saw it, or him, if you prefer, quite clearly. He was extremely tall, very thin, his forehead a high, pale curve, with his eyes two sunken pits of blackness. Gracious, will But most of all, I was struck by the slow almost hypnotic, constant oscillation of his head from side to side in a manner which I can only describe as curiously and horribly reptilian. You and Mr. Holmes must help me, Dr. Watson. You must... Uh, I can see from your expression that you think I'm merely suffering from delusions, imagining persecutions that do not exist, but I tell you, my life is at stake. Mr. Berlin, as a medical man, I'll admit that at least you believe you're telling the truth. Tell me... Do you live alone? No, my son lives with me. A uh, good enough sort, though I could wish he had a bit more purpose in life. But his wife... <sighs> what about his wife? When my son was in Salon running a tea plantation, he married a half-caste woman. She's utterly strange, a terrible creature. I more than half suspect she's behind everything that's happened. Rather a weird alliance, isn't it, between your ghost and your son's wife? All right, Mr. Burley, I'll speak to Holmes, if that's the only thing that'll set your mind at rest. It won't be the first time that he's driven a ghost back to its lair. No, do stop scraping on that violin of yours, Holmes. I'm trying to tell you about this poor chap's delusions. I assure you, Watson, you've been receiving my closest attention. So your friend Mr. Burley suspects his son's half-caste wife. Go on. Well, that's all there is to it. I promised him that I'd tell you his story, although obviously the poor man is the victim of a persecution phobia. I wonder, Watson. I wonder. Oh, now, now, really, Holmes. There are certain I... definite points of interest. That description of the ghost, for instance. Tall, very thin, high forehead, with a constant oscillation of his head in a reptilian manner. Who does that remind you of, Watson? Remind me of? I don't know. Could it be anyone but our friend Moriarty? Good heavens, you're right. And a library of the nature that you describe might well contain treasures worthy of the professor's highly selected interests. I tell you, Watson, it sounds precisely like Moriarty. The inspection of the library in his ghostly guise, followed by the realization that if he's to secure without suspicion the treasures he covets, their owner's death is necessary. Come, come, Watson. Stop lounging in your chair. Oh, but where are we off to? Mr. Burley said he was returning to an ancestral home at the seaside in Cornwall. Yes? We shall join him there. It's been too long since I've crossed swords with such a masterly adversary as Professor Moriarty. <laughs> Home, the sea breezes, the salt air, and the sun shining on the water make a man realize that life is worth living. Ah. If you don't stop admiring the surf instead of watching where you're putting your feet along the singularly aimless meanderings of this path, you won't have any life left to live. It's a good 200 foot drop to those extremely unpleasant looking rocks below. Yes, I see what you mean. I say, Holmes, look down there. I never realized that those Cornish cliffs are simply riddled with caves. Which no doubt accounts for their popularity with smugglers in bygone days. That and their inaccessibility, except from the sea. The path seems to buy just up there ahead of us. Of course, that fool of an innkeeper didn't tell us which fork to take. A problem, Watson, but not one incapable of solution. And may I ask how you propose to solve it? Deductive reasoning, I suppose? <laughs> not at all. I shall merely inquire the proper direction from that boy who seems to be birds nesting behind those bushes. Oh, here, young fellow. Hi, my lad. Good morning, my boy. Oh, I'm not doing nothing. Oh, I shouldn't. Of course not. There's nothing to be frightened of. We simply want to know the way to Burley Manor. Eh? Hey? Uh, Burley Manor, my boy. To the right or to the left? Oh, 
know you want Burley Manor, eh? That is the impression we are trying to convey. <laughs> Everybody knows where Burley Manor is. Well, we don't. Where is it? Straight along the path. That way. <laughs> Pathetic sight. When will our civilization advance sufficiently to produce a race free of such pitiable creatures as that? Oh, I don't know. The boy looks well fed and happy. Why, shouldn't he? Nothing to do but walk round barefoot and climb about the cliffs all day. Seems all a present life. I wouldn't mind being an idiot myself. Jackie! Jackie, where are you? If you're looking for that barefooted boy, madam, he went off towards the cliffs. Oh, does anyone speak back for hours? He hunts birds' nests and eggs. Sells them for a few pennies. Very sound hobby. I used to do a little birds' nesting myself when I was a boy. I wanted him to run an errand for me, but it's no match. The boy told us that we should take this path to Burley Manor, but he seemed a trifle oh, wanting. Uh, if you're going to Burley Manor, I will be glad to show you the way. I'm Mrs. Stephen Burley. Good Lord, not the... Uh... <laughs> uh, your father-in-law invited us down to see his library, Mrs. Burley. May I introduce Dr. Watson? Uh, how do you do? My name is Sherlock Holmes. I'm very glad to know you both. Now, if you'll just follow me along the path... It's rather narrow, so I'm afraid we'll have to go in single file. Well, that's just attractive girl, eh, Holmes? Quite. Which makes me wonder all the more why she has evidently been weeping. <laughs> So that's Burley Manor. Impressive looking old place, I must say. They built them to last in those days. I suppose it is impressive. But is it a house which conveys to you an aura of happiness, Dr. Watson? Well, I can't say that I've ever Oh, read. there's Stephen now on the terrace. Lila! Lila, where the devil have you been? Oh, uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Glad to know you. Your father asked them down to see the library. The library? Oh. Stacks of weird old books in there. Stuff's never been catalogued. Can't make any sense out of it myself. No, it's not my dish of tea either. <laughs> Felt like reading Hamlet one night. Found some old black letter thing I could barely spell my way through. And from the little I made out, it wasn't even the right form of the play. Really, Mr. Burley? How was that? Oh, it started out with some sort of a prologue. All about ghosts and revenge. Never saw that in Hamlet. Stephen, where is your father? I haven't seen him since I packed his lunch. Has he gone off to the cliffs already? You must have just missed him, Mr. Holmes. He often spends the day browsing about out there. Takes lunch along with him. And he's gone off alone? Which path did he take? The one toward the cliffs. But I don't... Come, Watson. There's not a moment to lose. <laughs> I might as well try to hurry through a bramble edge. I only pray we catch up to him in time. What was all that about, uh, about Hamlet, Holmes? Only that there is indeed a treasure here, Watson, and one fully worthy of Professor Moriarty's distinguished attention. Treasure? What sort? From Stephen's unseeing description, I deduce that the Burley Library must contain the Ur Hamlet. The Ur Hamlet? Uh, what's that? The original play ascribed to Thomas Kidd, upon which Shakespeare based his version. Not a single copy is known to exist in the entire world, Watson. It would be absolutely priceless. Oh, gracious me. I say, Holmes, look. Up there ahead. I just caught a glimpse of a man's back beyond those trees. It must be Burley. Good. Mr. Burley. Mr. Burley. The wind's blowing towards us. He, he can't hear you. Hurry up, Watson. We catch him beyond that bend in the path. Great heavens. How appalling. Why, the man's literally blown to bits. As I feared, Watson, we were just too late. It'll be interesting to see if Sherlock Holmes really was too late. But men, it's never too late to help improve the appearance of your hair. If you're having trouble keeping your hair in place, if it's dry, lifeless looking, why not try Cremel hair tonic? 
Honestly, I think Kreml is by far one of the greatest hairdressings ever discovered. Kreml keeps hair in perfect order from morning until night, with a nice, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that cheap, greasy look. It never smothers hair down with sticky goo, which makes the hair and scalp feel so dirty. In addition, Kreml makes hair a cinch to comb. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. It relieves itching of dry scalp and makes your scalp feel so clean and refreshed. Next time you get a haircut, ask your barber for an application of Kreml. In the meantime, buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. And now, Dr. Watson, what happened when you and Sherlock Holmes found that Mr. Burley had been the victim of an explosion on those Cornish cliffs? Holmes sent me back to the house. As soon as I had reported what had happened, I headed back to the cliffs where I found Holmes standing lost in meditation, his tall, gaunt form silhouetted against the sea. Holmes, I've sent a servant from the house to fetch the police. Good man. Uh, what's that you've got there? A few barely identifiable fragments of the lunchbox Burley was carrying. From the marks of the explosion, it is obvious that the bomb was in it. I see. Great Scott, Holmes. Young Mrs. Burley said that she packed that lunchbox. Precisely. And you will observe these footprints leading away here in the softer ground at the edge of the path. Naked footprints. That barefoot boy, the, the idiot. He saw it happen was frightened by the explosion and ran away in a panic. You'll notice how smooth the footprints are? Smooth? Uh, never mind. There's little we can do now but await the police. And I doubt if it will be long before they arrest a murderer. I should like to suggest, Superintendent Maddox, that you broaden the course of your inquiry... If you don't mind, Mr. Holmes, I'll conduct my questioning in my own way. Not at all, Superintendent. A little rude for... Now, Mrs. Burley, it'll be a lot better for you if you help me instead of hindering me. I've been trying to answer your question, Superintendent. Although only a fool could fail to see where they're leading. Now, Lila, the Superintendent's only trying to find out the truth. Very well. I'm innocent. And if all you want is the truth, you shall have it. I hated my father-in-law, and he hated me. Lila, don't say any more. And that isn't all. All the gossip you picked up from the servants this afternoon is true, Superintendent. My husband and I quarreled this morning. Quarreled bitterly. Stephen talked of divorce. His father's constant pressure has made him so confused that he no longer knows his own mind. That's not true, Lila. I still love you. So if that's what you wanted to know, Superintendent... Yes. I'm glad he's dead. I hated him. I hate him. I think that'll be quite enough, Mrs. Burley. I shall have to take you with me to the chief constable. The charge is murder. <laughs> oh, you're crazy, Maddox. My wife didn't kill my father. The fact that she's told you all these things should be proof enough. I'm sorry, Mr. Burley. I've got to do my duty as I see it. Come along, Mrs. Burley. Very well. I'm ready. I'll come along with you, my dear. No, darling. Stay here and help Mr. Holmes in any way you can. That's the best way for you to help me. She's quite right, my boy. Now, come along, Mrs. Burley. Mr. Holmes, I'll offer you any sum you wish to clear my wife. Your father was my client. I already have a duty to find his murderer. And you think that Lila... I think the superintendent would have arrested her twice as quickly if he had known of the other possible motive. That in revenge she had conspired with Professor Moriarty against your father. Then you're leaving... You won't help me. There are loose ends to clear up, Mr. Burley. I must send Dr. Watson on an errand. As for myself, my first objective is to inspect the famous Burley Library. I brought you some sandwiches, Mr. Holmes. You've been in here for hours. I'm afraid I've rather lost track of time. Have you found what you wanted? I did not find it. And nothing could be more significant than its absence. There is no sign here, Mr. Burley, of the black letter Hamlet which you described. Well, that's funny. I distinctly remember that... Ah, oh, there you are, Holmes. Any luck, Watson? No, not a bit. I missed my supper and had a wild goose chase for my pain. You mean you couldn't find the half-witted boy? Checked every house in the village. He's nowhere about. I'm afraid he will never return. Dead? 
You mean you think that he saw too much? I mean, Watson, that the person who planted that bomb also murdered that poor boy. If you could have some lanterns at once, please, Mr. Burley. Of course. I think we'd better follow the tracks of those bare feet to their final destination. Here, Watson. Hold that lantern over my shoulder, close to the ground. This moonlight isn't quite strong enough to... Ah, that settles it. What is it? This overturned pedal. See? The underside is still moist and discolored. Someone has been here very recently. I must say, Mr. Holmes, I don't believe there's another man on Earth who could have brought us to this spot in the dark by these minute indications you've discovered. Quite elementary, my dear Mr. Burley. At all events, our tracking's at an end. This path seems to lead right down the face of the cliff. If you call it a path, where the devil does it lead to? If you look over the edge of the cliff... Look over here. Careful. It's a 200-foot drop to those rocks below. You see a dark opening some 40 or 50 feet down? One of the caves. Precisely. And except for this extremely precipitous and presumably unknown path, a cave completely hidden and inaccessible save from below by way of the water. Come on. In here, it's slippery. Careful, Holmes. Look out for those rocks. Oh, blasted! I nearly wrecked my ankle. Look out! That boat is loose. Good heavens! I just missed me. What price the brisk sea breezes now, Watson? Oh, I wish we were back in Baker Street. There. The worst bit's over. Here's the cave. It's larger than it seemed from above. Hold that lantern high above your head, Mr. Burley. This cave extends back quite a distance, apparently. Ah, there's something white beside those rocks. Good gracious me, it's some sandwiches. Precisely. The remains of your father's lunch, Mr. Burley. But I don't understand. And How here, you... unless I'm greatly mistaken, in this pile of books we shall find the missing handlet. Ah, yes, just as I thought. Follow me, Mr. Burley. Keep that lantern high enough so that I may see what's ahead of us. What the dickens are you doing with a revolver in your hand, Holmes? I expect to find it of use at any moment, Watson. Ah, the end of our road. It's my father. It's Burley. He, he's asleep. But but he's wearing Jackie's clothes. Precisely. Wake up, Mr. Burley. No, none of that. I've got you covered. What's the meaning of this? A very clever plot, Mr. Burley. You so hated your half-caste daughter-in-law that you determined to get rid of her before she could bear you a grandchild. Even to the lengths of framing her for your own murder. We said that only she could have tampered with a lunchbox. Obviously, we should have thought, Mr. Burley, only she and you could have done so. Good heavens, Holmes. Do you mean to say that my father... Under the pretext of some childish game, Burley, you exchanged clothes with that poor boy. We saw him walking along dressed in your clothes. No wonder he didn't answer when I called your name. You watched him as he was blown to bits by the bomb, and then you disappeared. You knew, Holmes, what we'd find here? The bare footprints were smooth, Watson, which would have told me at once that they were the prints of Franklin Burley's feet. The boy Jackie, who spent his days climbing the cliffs, would have had horny, calloused feet. When I realized that, everything fell into place. The ghost in the library. Pure invention. The accident, which doubtless was simply an accident, introduced Burley to you and suggested that I might prove an unimpeachable witness to his ostensible murder by his daughter-in-law. The story of the ghost was simply an ingenious device to pique my interest. All right, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. As long as you're so smart, answer this question. What can you prove? I'll admit I changed clothes with the idiot. I'll say it was just a game. Then he was killed by the trap that had been meant for me. I was panicked and ran away. Yes, panicked to the extent of bringing your most valuable books with you, Mr. Burley. The sale of which would be a great help in starting your new life. But there's more to it than that. How does the heir of an old but impoverished family do himself as well as you do? How does a country gentleman secure a well-made time bomb? And above all, how is it that you were able to describe Moriarty so precisely in order to tempt me? I know You're one of Moriarty's henchmen, aren't you? It's always been a trick of his to use the old smuggler's passages in these caves. Perhaps you're even counting on him to complete your plan. Look, Holmes, look, look. There's a motorboat coming in towards us. They're standing on the prow. That unmistakable thin figure. That oscillating head. It's Moriarty. Get down, Watson. Out of sight. Stand up early in the mouth of the cave. Let Moriarty see you in the light, but don't try to warn him. I assure you I won't hesitate to shoot you. You don't dare kill me. You want me as a witness. Moriarty! It's a trap! Sherlock Holmes is here! Moriarty's raising his rifle. He's... Oh! oh. He shot him, Holmes. Moriarty's shot Burley. 
Moriarty has made certain that no one shall turn King's evidence against him. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't try to stand up, man. You're, you're badly hurt. I'm dying. But there'll be no dying words for me for you to use in court. <laughs> I see where you're looking. You want that Hamlet, don't you, Mr. Holmes? Every scholar, every museum in the world would... Oh, and it's mine. I'll never let it be seen. No one shall have it now. You least of all. I'm dying. And it's dying for me. Look out, Holmes. Bernie, stop. <laughs> Good heavens, he, he's thrown himself into the sea. He hasn't a chance on those jagged rocks. Yes, and his body will be washed out to sea before we can get down there. Watson, an irreparable loss. Loss? A confounded murder like that? I was referring to the copy of Hamlet. I'm afraid it's the most shocking loss to English literature since half of Milton's papers were burned by his cook. So Professor Moriarty once again got the better of Sherlock Holmes. Oh, no, honey, in that he escaped capture, Mr. Bell. After all, Holmes solved the mystery and managed to save the reputation of the young and beautiful Mrs. Burley. That's true, Dr. Watson. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will tell us about next week's story. But first, ladies, Sherlock Holmes is tops at solving mysterious problems. But here's one hair problem which those beautiful powers models solve. And here it is. We discovered there's nothing better than cremel shampoo to bring out all the hair's natural glossy luster. Cremel shampoo actually keeps our hair shining bright for days. And cremel shampoo does such a marvelous cleaning job. Even in the hardest water, its rich, active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff flakes as well as the dirt. Cremel shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to reveal all its glorious natural brilliance. Even after the first shampoo, your hair looks a vision of loveliness. And don't forget to mention how its beneficial oil base helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle. Yes, I know. That's why my wife always uses cremel shampoo for our youngster's hair. In fact, everyone at our house uses cremel shampoo because it's so mild and gentle on the hair. You can buy a bottle at any drug counter. Just ask for cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson... How about next week? Well, now let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes unmasked the sinister Dr. Punsonby, head of a boys' school, and thus saved the life of one of the pupils. I've always referred to this particularly bizarre adventure as a singular affair of the dying schoolboys. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the dying schoolboys. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This is Mr. Moto. Mr. I.A. Moto. Once again, NBC brings you Pulitzer Prize winner John P. Marquand's fabulous and mysterious Mr. Moto, international agent extraordinary, the inscrutable, crafty, and courageous little Oriental whose exploits have endeared him to millions of Americans in another adventure in the world of mystery and international intrigue. Tonight's story concerns the crooked log and stars Mr. Moto. Mr. I.A. Moto. It is said that a crooked log makes a better fire than a straight one. The log in this case was no exception to the rule. It began in New York 
with the woman in the case, who had been referred to me by the Maritime Commission. She was attractive and quite young, but had the manner of one whom grief had aged beyond her years. At first I thought I must be seeing things, Mr. Moto. But then I went back and took another look. And it was definitely a picture of my husband. You say this painting was in the window of a shop on 57th Street? Yes, between Park and Madison. It's called the Offencloth Gallery. Please, uh, describe the painting, Mrs. Clausen. All right. Well, uh, in, in the background is this South Pacific-type beach. Yes. There's some war souvenirs in the background, a couple of rusty landing barges, a stack of oil drums. But what first caught my eye was this pin-up calendar tacked to a palm tree. The month showing is January 1948, and the date is circled in red, the third. Now, what is the significance of that date? It's the day my husband's ship exploded in the Pacific and sank with all hands. Oh, that is the SS Amley Landis of which your husband was captain. Yeah, that's right. But, Mr. Moto, that picture is dated 1950, and I've been a widow for three years. The artist might have finished the painting at a later date. No, I don't think so, Mr. Moto. I think my husband's still alive. And I think that picture may be his way of telling me so. How do you explain his failure to get in touch with you directly? Oh, maybe he couldn't. Maybe he was afraid. Afraid? Look, the Emily Landis was carrying valuable chemicals. Ah. Clifford Landis, the owner of the line, collected one million dollars insurance. Have you any reason to believe the explosion was not an accident? There's only one man's word for it. You say the ship sank with all hands? All but one. A man named Garner. He was first officer of the ship. He's now vice president of the whole line. A very rapid promotion. And his testimony? He testified that my husband was drunk in his cabin. And that the explosion was due to his negligence. The commission was satisfied with Mr. Garner's testimony? They didn't have any choice. The ship's log brought up to date by Garner was the only official record. Have you talked to the artist who painted this picture of your husband? No. The man in the shop wouldn't give me any information. Just act as if he didn't know what I was talking about. I think I had better have a talk with him, Mrs. Clausen. In the meantime, I suggest you stay by your telephone. I may want to ask you some more questions. Well, just one thing, Mr. Moto. If my husband is alive... Yes? Please don't tell anybody till I've had a chance to talk with him. May I ask why? I told you. They collected a million dollars insurance on that ship. Landis and Garner might like it better if he stayed dead. I was quite favorably impressed with Mrs. Clausen and her story. When I saw the painting in the window of the gallery on 57th Street, I was less favorably impressed. She had neglected to tell me that the face of the man in the painting was not visible. He was lying prone with his head on a gnarled piece of driftwood as if he had fallen asleep while reading, using the open book to shade his face. The cover of the book bore the name of Clausen's ship, the S.S. Emily Landis. On his forum was a heart-shaped tattoo mark enclosing the letter L, which may or may not have stood for Mrs. Clausen's first name, Leela. The title of the picture was on a card in the corner of the frame, The Crooked Log by Mervyn Felice. Ah, you are Mr. Moto. I am Auchincloss. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Auchincloss? I, I am receiving your phone call on the very brink of insanity. Thirty years at the same address, Mr. Moto, the Auchincloss galleries had never any trouble until this moment, which I got burglars. Burglars, Mr. Auchincloss? Which they have in the night, my shop in Broken. You uh, mistake my intentions, Mr. Auchincloss. You want the police. Oh, no, no, no. I already called them. You see, uh, which they insult me and question my balance. So? Yeah, yeah, because the burglars didn't steal anything, which instead they brought me a gift, which is the truth and the basis for the insults from the police. The burglars brought you a gift? Yeah, a picture in my window where was a little Madonna which they are exchanging without my knowledge, which I want you to find out why I want to find the artists. I, too, want to find that artist, Mr. Auchincloss. Oh, excuse me, a customer. Do not run away, sir. The customer was a plump, affluent-looking individual 
with a gold-headed cane and a grey Hamburg hat, which he had removed, revealing a dome-shaped head totally devoid of hair. While Mr. Ockingloss talked with him, I walked to the rear of the shop and examined the rear entrance, through which the gift-bearing burglars had entered. My investigations were interrupted by a cry of distress. Help! Police! Stop team! Oh, oh, that man, he has stolen the picture from the window. Stop him. Do not worry, Mr. Ockenglass. Yeah. He couldn't have gone very far. No, but hurry before you lose him. Stop. Stop for a moment, sir. Please. Please. Unhand me, sir. Or I shall call an officer. That will not be necessary, sir. I will take that picture. And I paid for this picture in coin of the realm, sir. That ridiculous foreigner is only trying to make trouble for me. Then I am sure you will not object to coming back. While we check on your story. You are adamant, sir? I am. Well. But mind you, I mean to have this picture by fair means or foul. Are you by any chance the artist? I have had about enough of your insults. Ah, ah, you have trapped him. Burglars bring, burglars take away. You see, Mr. Moto, which is all too strange to be harmless. I am inclined to agree, Mr. Auchincloss. Thief, indeed. You are the thief, sir. After bidding me up to $50,000 for this wretched canvas, and then refuse my very generous offer. Uh, explain to him, Mr. Moto, which the artist has not quoted me the price or even authorized me to sell it. But then, by all means, let us find him and talk to him. That should be simple. It is not simple. Uh, here is Mr. Moto, a secret agent, looking for him. Ah. Uh, my name is Carmichael, sir. How do you do? If you succeed, Mr. Moto, finding that artist, I will pay you $5,000, irrespective of the price of the merchandise. Why does he always want to pay so much for everything? It is all too strange to be harmless. I am a connoisseur, sir. When I want a thing, price is no object. And where can I reach you, Mr. Carmichael? That will not be necessary. I, or my agent, sir, will contact you. Of that you may be sure. Good day. When he had gone, I returned my investigation of the window at the rear of his shop. A neat hole had been cut through the glass, and the burglar alarm had been dismantled as delicately as if by the hand of a watchmaker. There were, to my knowledge, only three men with enough skill to have done it. Two were in Sing Sing, and the third had retired from burglary to operate a small bar on the Hoboken waterfront. Well, 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 what brings you across the river, Mr. Morto? A work of art, Mr. McCavity. Uh, would you take a wee drink, Mr. Morto, on the house? Uh, no, uh, not at the moment. It's a funny thing when I was thinking of you last night, Mr. Moto. Remember when I helped you break into that warehouse over on Gansevoort Street? <laughs> Only time I ever did a job for the law. Yes, I was thinking about you today, too, Mr. McCavity. Well, 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 great minds the same channel, eh, Mr. Moto? I was thinking about a six-volt Mitchell burglar alarm with a three-way circuit breaker, the Upper Plus Galleries. On 57th Street. Uh, what were you thinking about? You know, I was thinking about you when I was doing it, Mr. Moto. Eerie, yeah, is it not? Very, very strange indeed. Aye, but it did me good. It took ten years off my life to get out the old kit, take my shoes off and do a job again. You saw it, did you? Oh, yes, I was there. Well, then, was it all right? I don't think I lost my touch, do you? It was quite, quite skillful. Uh, by the way... Uh, may I ask why you did <laughs> Oh, just impulse. A man paid me 50 bucks to take a picture in. Uh, do you know why he wanted it in that window? No, I don't ask questions. You know me. Now then, what's up? They're not after me, are they? I am trying to locate the artist who painted that picture. I wouldn't have an artist when I see one. Now, how about the man who hired you? Do you know where he is? Oh, I, then why didn't you ask me that before? He's away over at yon table. Huh? Do you see him? The one with the scarred face. The name he gave me was Bert Clausen. I looked back at the table Mr. McCavity had pointed out. I saw a big man with dark hair and approximately two days' growth of beard on the left side of his face. The other side of his face was solid scar tissue. 
from his hairline to his collar, it could have been caused by a burn. Across the table from him sat a small man in a rumpled white suit. When I approached the table, I saw that there was paint under his fingernails. Mr. Clausen did the talking. What do you want? I want to talk to you, Mr. Clausen. About the crooked lodge? That is correct. What's the offer? Fifty thousand dollars. I can't hear you. Tell him to add a zero. Maybe that'll make my hearing better. May I ask what is in that picture to make it worth half a million dollars? No, I can't figure you. If you don't know about the crooked log, what are you in this for? Someone wants to find the artist who painted that picture. You don't want the painting. He seemed to want it very, very much. Oh? What did he say? I mean, exactly what did he say? That he would pay $5,000 to the one who succeeds in finding the person authorized to sell the crooked log. Well, you found me. If you think you can collect on that, try it. Is there another bidder? Look, Slant Eyes, guessing smart will get you no place. You don't even know what you're looking for. They'll never tell you, neither will I. If painting is your hobby, stick around. If it's your living, you're wasting your time here. I am inclined to agree with you, Mr. Clausen. Good night, and thank you for your very, very good advice. Outside the bar, I walked to the corner and waited. I did not have to wait long. It was the little silent man in the crumpled white suit and an artist beret who had been sitting at Clausen's table. He was wringing his hands and all but weeping. Please, please, I've got to talk to you. He's crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Unless you are quite sure what you are talking about, sir, I had rather... No, 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 no. I painted that picture. The Crooked Log. Ah? Huh? I'm Mervyn Trelease. I did authorize Clausen to sell it for me, but he's crazy. Fifty thousand dollars, for heaven's sakes, I accept. Don't pay any attention to him. I think Mr. Clausen is right about one thing. The gentleman might pay fifty thousand dollars for the picture, but he wants some information as well. I'll gladly tell you anything I know. I have no secrets. Oh, what do you know about Mr. Clausen, for instance? Please... Let's walk on a ways. Do you mind? Not at all. Well, I... I met him in Tahiti. Yes? I don't know how he arrived there. He'd never say. One day I found him on the beach in front of my house. That's when I painted the picture. He said if I'd come back to the States with him, he could get me a lot of money for my paintings. I see. Especially one I called... The Crooked Log. Why did you call it The Crooked Log? That chunk of driftwood in the painting... He wanted to keep it as a souvenir. Worked on it for days, polishing it, scraping out the termite nest, drying it out. And when we sailed for the States, he brought it with him in a little chest he'd made for it. Do you know where that is now? Why, oh, yes, he, he left it in my studio along with some other things. I would like to examine that log, Mr. Trelease. Oh, Clausen would be very angry if he knew I... I wouldn't dare take you there myself. I'll give you the address. Come there in an hour. Second floor. First door at the top of the stairs. Mr. Trelease's studio was in a loft building on Front Street. I arrived there shortly after 8 o'clock and climbed the stairs to the second floor. Mr. Trelease? Mr. Trelease, are you... are you in there? Are you all right, Mr. Trelease? Mr. Trelease, what is it? Have you been drinking? Here now, wake up. Wake up. The log. Yes. Yes. They said they wanted the log. Who? I gave it to them. The log. And they... They... He had half raised his head. And when it dropped back to the floor, it turned slightly to one side. And then I saw what had happened. The back of his skull had been crushed with a heavy bludgeon. Beside him on the floor lay a gnarled, bleached out, lovingly polished piece of driftwood. It was identical with the one in the painting. The poor little artist had been murdered with his own crooked lock. While I was waiting for the police to arrive, 
I made a hasty search of the murder room. There was nothing of interest except for a half-finished canvas on the easel. On the back of the bathroom door was hanging a woman's skirt, blouse and jacket. The clothes Leela Clausen had been wearing when she called on me earlier in the day. I cautiously opened the closet door and handed them in. Who's out there? I'm only one of the models. If you touch me, I'll scream. Please, take your things and remain calm, Mrs. Crossan. Is that you, Mr. Moto? Yes, it is. Oh, I'll be out in just a moment. What were you doing here, Mrs. Crossan? He advertised for a model. And I, uh, wait till I get into this blouse. You had better hurry. The police will be here soon. Yeah. Just well, let me get these shoes on. There. Oh, thanks for helping me out. You make it difficult for me to help you in more important ways, Mrs. Crossan. Oh, the poor little guy. He's dead, isn't he? Who did it? Two men. I didn't see them. You were just taking a nap in the clothes closet when they arrived, is that it? Please, Mr. Motor, this is nothing to joke about. I ask you again, who killed well, him? Well, for all I know, it may have been you. Why do you say that? Well, he said somebody offered you $5,000 to find him. That is correct. I did not accept Mr. Carmichael's proposition, however. The name is not Carmichael. You know who he is. How much have you found out so far? I only know for certain that this man has been murdered. You don't know why? I think they thought he knew something he did not know. Yeah, about the crooked log. He thought it was that hunk of wood, the poor dope. So they brained him with it. It could have been your husband who did it. Bert? Bert's alive? Did you come to me to find out if he was alive or to make sure he was dead? Well, that's a crazy thing to say. Or did you want that logbook for yourself? What's it good for except to clear my husband? You pointed out that the ship was insured for a million dollars. So? If your husband has the straight log of that voyage... The owner of the line, Mr. Landis, and the first officer of the ship, Mr. Garner, would pay a good deal to suppress it. I hate to think of Bert being a blackmailer. Ah. Although I don't know why I care. He was always a skunk as far as I was concerned. Oh, but gee, when I read in the papers how they were hanging it all on him after he's dead and can't speak for himself, it made me sore. And he always had a lot of respect for ships, so I knew it was something cooked up. Listen, when you said he was alive, you weren't just saying that, were you? I was not just saying that, Mrs. Crossan. Well, how did he look? Was he hurt bad? That depends on how you feel about scars. I don't want to see him. It's been so long, he could have been in touch. I used to dread every time he'd come into port. Every time he left, I swore I'd never see him again. So he comes back from the dead all scarred up and I'm supposed to feel different? What precisely does this log book, the log of the SS Emily Landis, look like? Well, it's like the others I've seen. Nothing special about the size of a ledger. And what does Mr. Landis look like? Fat, 55, with a beautiful head of hair. Mr. Carmichael fits that description, but he is quite, quite bald. <laughs> that amuses you. Landis is more worried about that log than I thought. You mean he left his toupee at home? Well, he'd have to do something to disguise himself. He's too well known. I mean, he's going around in person haggling over a painting. No, but listen, Mr. Moto, I'm scared. You don't know Landis like I do. And Bert's a fool to bargain with him. Landis is an old pirate. He comes from a long line of pirates. See, shipping isn't like other businesses. They're all tough and mean and crazy from the top on down. How much insurance did you collect on your husband, Mrs. Clausen? All right, Nosey, I'll tell you. Fifty thousand bucks. Leela Clausen was an enigma. I was sure she was telling the truth, but I never knew just how much of it she was telling. I made a rough estimate, and on the strength of it, let her go. Then, I examined that piece of driftwood. I had a hunch that Clausen had not spent all that time fixing and polishing it for his private amusement. And I was quite correct. The underside of it 
had been rotted away originally, and the hollowed out part was sealed with a layer of pitch. Underneath, I found what I was looking for, the logbook of the SS Emily Landis. I found Mr. Clausen at the table in the bar where I had left him. I laid the book down on the table in front of him. So you found it? As you see, Mr. Clausen. Where did I get hold of that little paint slinger? I'll murder him. Unfortunately, someone beat you to it. Oh. Well, it was his own fault he talked too much. You suffer from even a more dangerous ailment, Mr. Clausen. You do not talk enough. Yeah, maybe you're right, Slant Eyes. What shall we talk about? A nine-letter word beginning with B and spelled blackmail. You're wrong. What do you choose to call it, Mr. Clausen? Any master or officer of an American ship unemployed in a foreign country as a result of shipwreck shall receive full pay maritime law. I am quite aware of that. Well, Landis owes me three years of it at 25000 per. Total, 75000 bucks. You see, I had another score to settle with Landis and Garner besides money. I had to pay them off for a lot of nice guys that went down in that ship for a lousy insurance fraud. I knew Landis would buy that picture, and I knew he'd look at it till he'd go crazy. Well, I wanted to let him squirm for a while before I let him have it. How did you manage to come out of that wreck alive? Garner made the mistake of planting a charge of explosive right outside my cabin. So? So instead of trapping me, it blew me out a porthole, clear over the starboard rail, and I hit the water a good 50 feet clear of the ship. And where did you obtain the rubber raft? A mermaid swiped it for me from Davy Jones' locker. Now do you believe my story? Every word of it, Mr. Clausen. I'll do my best to prove it. I telephoned Mr. Landis to meet us at the Ockenclos Galleries at 1 a.m. It took Mr. McCavity a few minutes to figure out the new burglar alarm that had been installed, but he did not fail me. I gave Mr. Clausen his instructions, left him in the back room, and reached the front door just as Mr. Ockenclos was unlocking. Mr. Moto! May I ask what you are doing here at this time of night, Mr. Ockenclos? Oh, I couldn't sleep, which I am dreaming burglars are my shop coming in again. Ach, but you are here, so all is well. Yes, yes, indeed, Mr. Ockenclos. Uh, you found Mr. Trellis? That is quite correct. He gives permission to sell the painting? Quite so, and I found you a new buyer, Mr. Ockenclos. For such a bad painting? A gentleman named Landis. He will be here in a moment. Well, couldn't he come during business hours? In the middle of the night, he buys bad paintings. Oh, it is all too strange to be harmless. Ah, I see him outside now. Yeah. You wait in the back room, Mr. Auchinglass. I will handle this. It is all in your lap, Mr. Moto. Ah, Mr. Moto. You brought it with you? I thought I asked you to come alone, Mr. Landis. Ah, allow me to introduce my associate, Mr. Garner. Mr. Garner was first officer of the Emily Landis... So naturally, he is interested in the recovery of the log. Come on, stop, Stone. Where is it? The picture is still in the window. Picture? What's he talking about? Come now, Mr. Moto. Don't play the innocent with me. You know as well as I do what was bargained for. If you bargain with me for a picture, Mr. Garner, a picture is what you will get. If you want anything else, you have only to ask for it in a straightforward and specific manner. You fat bungler, Landis. It's a good thing I came along. He doesn't know a thing that can help us or hurt us. In another minute, he would trap you in a confession. You had better tell him, Mr. Landis. Tell him what? That you offered me his share of the insurance money if I could get that logbook from Trelease. Well, that's a lie. Trelease was dead before Moto got there. I personally beat his brains out. But I have the log. And you may as well be frank about it, Mr. Landis. Mr. Garner's share is what you offered me, and that is still my price. Now, look here, Moto. We, 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 we can't cut poor Garner out altogether. You shouldn't have made that deal, Landis. You cut me out, I'll cut you down. Oh, Garner, put, put that gun away. Don't be so hasty. After all, Mr. Moto may know something. That's what I'm afraid of. No, no, Garner. Uh, this is most unwise. <coughs> Garner. G Garner. Speak to me. Oh, by heaven, sir. He, he's dead. I, I never even saw you draw your pistol. I did not do so, Mr. Landis. Uh, but, but I... Oh, I, Mr. Landis. What... What's the matter? You look kind of sick. Clausen. Yeah. M Moto, I, I consider this most unethical. What are you beefing about? I saved your life. Garner would have dropped you if I hadn't gotten him first. What do you want, Clausen? 
my money. Well, that's very simply arranged. You have the log. How much money? I have 50000 in this briefcase. That's all the cash I could raise on such short notice. All right, I'll take your personal note for the rest of it. Sit down there and write. Motor, you're not going to let him do this? Take your share, too? I said right. Yes. Well, that's it. I trust you're a man of your word. Moto, you sign it as witness. With pleasure, Mr. Clausen. Moto, you're a madman. Give it to him now, Moto. You are quite, quite sure this is what you want, Mr. Clausen. I know what I'm doing. Very well. Here you are, Mr. Landis. The log of the SS Emily Landis. Thank you, sir. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Bonsoir, adieu, and goodbye. Oh, Mr. Landis. Uh, your long-lost Ulysses has sailed home at last, madam. My felicitations. Mr. Moto, I came just as soon, but you gave him the log. Right? I, uh, remember me, Leela? Yes, I seem to remember I once had a husband. Well, come here. No, don't. I don't want to look at you. I don't want to feel sorry. Oh, Bert. Oh, Bert, your poor face. Oh, shut up. Come on home. Good night, Mr. Moto. And thanks for everything. Uh, Mr. Moto, uh, this painting, I give it to you for a gift. Oh, thank you so very, very much, Mr. Arkansas. Uh, the painting only. I keep the frame. Oh, I quite understand. Here, right now. Uh, yeah. Oh, look, there, there's something stuck in the back there. Some paper. Yeah. What is this, Mr. Moto? It is part of the log of the SS Emily Landis. The only part that matters. The part that mattered was a detailed record of what had gone on aboard the Emily Landis during the three days before she exploded and sank. It was not very honest of Mr. Clausen to sell Mr. Landis the worthless part of the log. But the police are holding Mr. Landis for murder. And where Mr. Landis is going, he will not need any money. But as I noted before, a crooked log makes a better fire than a straight one. just heard the world's greatest secret agent, Mr. I.A. Moto, in The Crooked Log. And here with a preview of next week's story is Mr. I.A. Moto. Next week, a story of intrigue involving a seductive Latin American lady bent on vengeance and a platinum locket that held the key to one of the largest and most ingenious smuggling operations ever devised in the case of the stolen convertible. And now, may the serenity of an October evening bring sleep to your waiting eyes and bear you away upon a fragrance of night-grooming jasmine in the tranquility of a summer garden reflected in the still pool of untroubled dreams. Good night. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf Transcribed. Later this evening, the unique Mr. Monty Woolley stars once again in the new comedy series, The Magnificent Montague, the delightful saga of an embittered Shakespearean ham. After many triumphant years on the stage, the magnificent Montague now portrays Uncle Goodhart, the hero of a radio serial. And his trials and tribulations are 30 minutes of delightful listening over most of these NBC stations. And today being Friday means another visit to Duffy's Tavern, where Archie the manager presides over another sparkling session of mischief and madness. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello. The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. Yes, this is Nero Wolf's office. The mountain of a man in the oversized armchair staring at Archie with a beady eye is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf is in. Mr. Wolf is always in. Would he stay in until... He would. Archie, what on earth? Boss, she sounds blonde. Phooey. Don't believe I can tell over the phone? Okay. Excuse me, miss, but are you blonde? Oh. Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mr. Wolf will see you. Goodbye. I did not say. No, but you will. Besides, she wasn't blonde. And I want you to see red. Oh, Archie, you better think of some new ones. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, bulkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight, it's the case of the girl who cried wolf. In the old brownstone house in 35th Street, my boss, Nero Wolf, with all his 300 pounds, sits at his desk from which he runs his world. We have been patiently waiting for the lady client. And there's a knock at the door, and I admit her. A beautiful, frightened, and red-headed girl. Mr. Wolf? Mr. Nero Wolf? Not by 160 pounds. I'm Archie Goodwin. Oh, yes. I spoke to you on the phone. I'm... I'm Mary Dunning, Mr. Goodwin. I was wondering if... He's in. He's always in. Come on. We'll try getting him to admit it. This is Mr. Wolf. Miss Mary Dunning. How do you do, Miss Dunning? Here, take this red leather chair. It's a nice match for your hair. You know, it was old Dr. Tidmouse who said to me, beware of a red-headed woman. But I never could believe Thank them. you, Mr. Goodwin. Your business, Miss Dunning? Do you mean what I do, or or why I've come to you? Both, if you please. Well, I'm Mr. Stevens' secretary at the Tolliver Ecological Foundation. Our offices are down on East 12th Street. Uh, ecological? Fear research as to factors operating on plant and animal development and survival, Archie. Animal development, huh? Miss Dunning, the foundation has several agricultural research projects throughout the country, hasn't it? That's right, Mr. Wolf. And Donald Stevens is executive director. Or was until... Was? He's disappeared. It's been three days now. He's not been near the office, nor his apartment. No message or... Apartment? Stevens been living alone? He's a bachelor. He's engaged to Laura Tolliver. She's a cousin of the original Tollivers. But she doesn't know where he is either. Have you come to me on Laura Tolliver's account or on behalf of the foundation? Well... Well, neither, Mr. Wolf. I'm just worried, and and I'd heard of you as one of the finest private detectives in New York. You heard of me, Miss Dunning. We see that you're here. I still fail to understand why. But I've told you. Mr. Stevens has dropped out of sight. And there's another thing. The last time I saw him, he had a caller with him in his office. Caller? Male? Female? I don't know. We're in a converted old brownstone house, and... Well, the way the offices are laid out... I don't see all the people who come in unless they make a point of coming to my desk. Mm Mm-hmm, I see. All I know is that Mr. Stevens stepped out for a moment, looking either scared or angry, I couldn't be sure which, and asked me to see if there was a policeman at the corner. Which corner? (laughs) Archie, continue, Miss Dunny. Well, I started to go, and there were low voices arguing from the inner office. And then Mr. Stevens called me not to bother. Then what? He said I could go ahead and take my lunch hour then. So I did. And when I came back, he was gone. Leaving no message? Leaving no message. And you've neither seen or heard of him since? I've tried all over. By phone, going out myself. Miss Dunning, has Mr. Stevens been in the habit of making extended business trips? Well, once in a while to our research stations in Pennsylvania or New Jersey or up in Vermont, but not without letting me know. I have to make out his travel vouchers. Has there been any recent trouble at the foundation? Trouble? Financial trouble? Personal trouble? No, there's been no trouble. Miss Dunning, you're wasting my time and yours. This is a problem for the police, if there is a problem. Oh, oh no, Mr. Wolf. I, I'd have gone to the police, except... 
Well, if there should be an innocent explanation, it didn't seem fair to the Foundation to risk the unpleasant publicity of... I said for the police. Oh, uh, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. It's your say-so, but when a girl walks in here and asks... A young lady can depart by the use of the same rather trim legs that carried her here, Archie. Oh, now look, boss, just because I yes, look at... Yes, Dunny. I can think of a dozen reasons that might take your bachelor director out of town for a few days without the formality of explaining his actions. Then... You won't look into this? Despite Mr. Goodwin's frowns, no. Should Mr. Stevens not turn up tomorrow or so, I suggest you advise the police or whatever attorney acts for the foundation. There is such a person, of course. Yes. Jonas Dowd is counsel. He's also a cult trustee. Consult him then, by all means. But you don't seem to understand. If you'll excuse me, I'm overdue for an important conference with my cook. We have just received a shipment of truffles from France. Well, of course, if Mr. I... Wolf, if you ask me... Precisely I... what I have refrained from doing, Archie. Would you be good enough to escort Miss Dunning to the door? To the door, Archie. Good night, Miss Dunning. Good night. Good night. And thanks, just the same. Look, Mr. Wolf, it's your shop and you can get as surly as you please. But can you give me one excuse for that high-handed brush? One thin shred of an excuse? Miss Dunning was sitting in the this chair... The girl was lying, Archie. Lying? How can you say At that? At least we... twice. And possibly from the moment she opened that undeniably pretty mouth. Now, if you'll excuse me, Archie, I have an appointment with a truffle. <laughs> You say you have a surprise for me, Archie. Enough to yank you three inches out of that chair. Remember the girl who was here last night, Mary Dunning? You seem unwilling to let me forget her. Well, I took off on my own this morning to check up on that foundation setup. Good, Archie. I ventured a small bet with Fritz that you would. All right. See if your bet included this. I found Stevens down there right in his office. Missing executive director? Yes, and the missing Mr. Stevens claimed he had just been on a business trip. Delayed getting back because his car had been smacked by a hit-and-run driver in New Jersey. Now, here's the payoff. He even tried to make out that he'd been thinking of calling you in on a problem. A hit-and-run accident? No, no, something about the foundation. But I didn't waste time letting him cloud it up for us. The point is... Archie, that... you brought him here, of course. Stevens? No, he's still down there. We'll want to grab him before the day is out, but I had something more important to run down first. It took me three calls on the way up here, but you can take it as confirmed. We've still got a disappearance case, and this one you're not sitting out. Indeed. And who has disappeared now? Mary Dunning. Stevens is back, but Mary's gone. Not at the office, not at her rooming house, and none of her clothes are taken. How'd you get going? Put a police call out on Mary. Back to 12th Street and get Stevens out of that office and up here as fast as you can. I'll phone him. You are on the way. <laughs> Hello? This Donald Stevens? Yes, this is Donald Stevens. This is Nero Wolf. I understand you've been thinking of consulting me. Well, as a matter of fact, I have, Mr. Wolf. I started to explain to Mr. Goodwin, but... Uh... Are you alone there at the office? Why, well, yes. As it happens... Be careful. I don't think your car smash up was an accident. I've just sent Mr. Goodwin to ask you to come here. Meanwhile, I'd suggest... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Wolf. There seems to be someone coming in now. Wait, Mr. Stevens. There hasn't been time for Archie to get there yet. Excuse me, Mr. Wolf. Don't. Just hold the wire a moment. Wait, Mr. Stevens. Uh, come on in. I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, what? No! No! Oh. <laughs> And that's all Inspector Kramer has been able to make of it, Archie? Not to hear him tell it, but that's all he's got. Stephen dead and the girl still missing. Did you find anything helpful at the office? I think the murderer started to tear up some account books and project ledgers, but I must have scared him away when I rang the bell. Couldn't have been more than three or four minutes after the shooting when I got there. But you saw no one? Hmm. The murderer can cover a lot of ground in three or four minutes. You, uh, naturally, by accident, since it is merely illegal, you had a good look at the dead man? A very good look. Not to mention his pockets. Anything particular? Well, there was a half-eaten package of lifesavers in the left-hand trouser pocket. What's particular about that? The flavor was lime. I hate lime. Foy. <laughs> Archie, I uh, called Jonas Dowd last night. The foundation lawyer? 
Yes, he set up the original charter under which Donald Stevens operated with an annual fund of $90,000. Ecology has its attractions. 90,000 attractions, to be precise. It indicates a possible reason for Stevens' murder. He was in sole charge of that money. Somebody donated three thirty-eight caliber bullets to him. Hardly a token of appreciation. Perhaps not. However, the shooting followed the attempt to stage an automobile accident. Archie, I sent Saul Panza on an errand for me. Saul, huh? He's expensive. True, he's the best man in the shadow job there is, but... You've got something, huh? Possibility. An angle I can't handle? Apart from your natural preference for curves, you more than work enough here in New York. Finding Mary Dunning for a starter. Or, uh, her body? Or her body, as it may be. Is that what Saul's on, picking up a line on Mary? Among other chores, Saul's is buying me some special groceries at the city market. You frown, Archie. I glower. But okay, play it cozy. You can send Saul off to Stockholm for smorgasbord for all I care. I'm still asking, what about Stevens and what about Mary? Where do we start? I'm expecting Laura Tolliver, the heiress, and the son of Jonas Dowd here within a few minutes. Jonas Dowd himself proved as difficult to pry from the office as... As you generally are from this one. Oh, good for old Jonas. Wait a minute, though. He said a son was coming. Would that be Peter Dowd? It would be. Could I trouble you to pass that second bottle of beer? It's your third. Stop auditing me, Archie. You reacted to the name of Peter Dowd. May I ask why? Kramer is ahead of you on that pitch. He's had Peter Dowd downtown already. And learn? Playboy, used to be in love with Laura Tolliver, now in line to take over Stephen's tidy 20000 a year salary as executive director. To take over? Fui. Peter Dowd's no ecologist. He's got more important qualifications. His old man and Laura Tolliver are co-trustees under the Tolliver will, and the director can be anybody they name. Archie, you sound prejudiced against young Mr. Dowd. Yeah, that's what Kramer said. I'm just naturally suspicious of anybody who stood to pick up 20 grand a year, plus a whack at the 90,000 a year in house money, just by throwing 338 caliber slugs into Stevens. Particularly after getting rid of Mary Dunning to clear the way. The police still have no leads on Miss Dunning? A for effort, Z for results. Now, the way I see it, boss. Leg work now, Archie. Guess it's later. You might try Miss Dunning's landlady again for one, and try Peter Dowd's apartment. Now? Yes. I'd say go along and keep after the missing girl. Instead of sifting through the names in Stephen's appointment book you were asking about? It's two legs of the same animal. The names may help on the girl. Now, Archie, on your way. Come in. Mr. Wall? Yes, come in, Mr. Oliver, Mr. Dowd. Sit down. It's good of you both to come. Miss Tolliver, I'm profoundly sorry of your loss. You were to marry Mr. Stevens, as I understand it. Yes, three weeks from today. I was trying to warn poor Stevens just as the murderer came in. But he evidently knew his caller well enough to feel no alarm. The uh, police told us that, Mr. Wolf. We've just come from Inspector Kramer's office. I know, Mr. Dowd. Did you gather the inspector meant to see you again? Why should he? How could anyone think that, well, that, that Peter could have anything to do with this, this horrible business? I see that you have no doubts about Mr. Dowd here, Mr. Oliver. Easy, Laura. Yes, Mr. Wolf, I, I gathered that Kramer was interested in me. He's got a man outside here watching us now. You're alert, Mr. Dowd, or... Or what? Or aware that Inspector Kramer may have grounds for keeping you under surveillance. Look, Mr. Wolf, I didn't come here to be put through the jumps again. First Kramer, and now you. I'm acting for the Tolliver Foundation, Mr. Dowd. I have been since your father retained me last night. Well, why jump on me, then? Young man, at my age and weight, the chances of my jumping on anyone are about as likely as, uh, well, as unlikely as to expect that you are not still in love with Miss Laura Tolliver here. Mr. Wolf, we haven't admitted that, that we... Miss Tolliver, Miss Tolliver, your concern a moment ago at the possibility that this young man might be charged with Stephen's murder... Now, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. Climb back on me if you want, but let Laura alone. If you're trying to... to make... I'm no longer trying, Mr. Dowd. You both confirmed the point for me. All right. I am still in love with Laura. And I think Laura's known ever since she accepted Stephen's ring that, her... well, that their engagement was a mistake. What are you going to make of that? Did Stevens know you hadn't given up on Laura? I told him twice. I even went down to the foundation just... 
Just when, Mr. Dowd? This morning while I was telephoned Stevens, for example? I... I... I haven't been near the foundation office for days. I, I've... Well, I, I've been out of town. Mr. Wolf, you've no right to twist and turn everything Peter says. I do love him, but I... Laura. Oh, that's, that's the first time you've come right out with it since... I'm sorry, Peter. I've wanted to tell you a thousand times. But, well, you kept going away on all those trips, and I never knew whether it was for some other girl or... <clears throat> Mr. Dowd, Miss Tolliver, could this tender exchange be postponed till you two find yourselves alone? Go ahead, Mr. Wolf. Ask anything you want, as long as I know it's all right with Laura here. Well, he's spoken, Mr. Dowd. May I ask about Mary? Ma- What's Mary Dunning got to do with this? I'm glad you're aware of the Mary I meant. Well... Well, I've, I've met her at the foundation, of course. We've all heard she's missing. You couldn't suggest where she might be. How would Peter know? Let's return to Mr. Stevens. Can either of you explain his three days' absence from the city? Well, I've been out of town myself. Mr. Oliver? He could have been inspecting any one of the research plants. He didn't tell me, if that's what you mean. Stevens said this morning he had been wanting to consult me. You can't suggest why? Well, no, I can't. About foundation business or personal business? Three thirty-eight caliber bullets kept Mr. Stevens from making that clear, Miss Tolliver. Mr. Dowd's father is sending me over some material, but as yet it's not in my hands. Are you familiar with the personnel at the research stations? There aren't any more than four or five project managers. Halsey in Vermont, Schwartzdown, Pennsylvania. Excuse me. Here to work? Archie. Yes, Archie. You can take it back about Mary Dunning. If she's a liar, she's just gone to a lot of trouble to make it look good. Dead? No, but knocked out with chloroform and stuffed in a closet in a man's apartment. And uh, guess whose apartment? Spare me your charades, Archie. Peter Dowds. That's where I'm calling from. Is he still with you? As it happens, yes. You better hang on to him. There's been another development. Inspector Kramer's got hold of a man named Schwartz. The Pennsylvania project manager. Right. Schwartz was at the foundation office this morning, and he says Peter Dowd was going in as he came out. When? Within minutes of your call to Stevens. Kramer's on his way to your place now to pick up young Dowd. Any uh, instructions? I'd like more company. Well, the ball game is all wrapped up, isn't it? I'd still like more company. Right, Mary and Schwartz? If you can get them here, and Archie. Yes? Get them here. <laughs> have that fifth bottle of beer, Archie. Seventh and quarter for the night. And when do you get around to calling in Mary and our friend Schwartz? In a moment, Archie, in a moment. After all that scramble to get him here. I've been studying these project reports that Jonas Dowd sent over. Fascinating field ecology. I know. The factors playing on the development and survival of living organisms. Too bad poor Stevens didn't figure on a factor named Peter Dowd. Archie, I'm ready for Mr. Schwartz now. No Mary? I'll risk you in the next room with Miss Dunning for the time being. Okay. One Schwartz coming up. Oh, come in, Mr. Schwartz. Mr. Wolf? How do you do, Mr. Schwartz? My apologies for this long wait you've had. And I'll try to make our business brief. Yes, sir. Mr. Schwartz, you managed the Tolliver Agricultural Research Station in Pennsylvania for some time. Two years. I am not sure. I didn't once enjoy a shipment of mushrooms that came from your place. You've experimented with Maya Arenaria. Maya Arenaria? Yes, of course. Yes, we've done some work with mushrooms. They were excellent. Uh, By the way, I understand you saw Mr. Stevens just before he was shot down. If I'd stayed ten minutes longer, he might still be alive. May I ask the purpose of your call? I was delivering the monthly reports. No espresso trouble you came to discuss? No, sir. You met Peter Dowd coming in at the foundation as you were going out. How did he look? In a hurry. How so? He just pushed past with his face turned away. You sure it was he? Yes, I had seen him at the foundation maybe two or three times before. Were you aware that Mr. Stevens and Mr. Dowd were both apparently in love with the same young lady? I'm a research worker, Mr. Wolf. I wouldn't know about Mr. Stevens' personal affairs. Just an hour ago, before Inspector Kramer took him from here, young Dowd admitted that he'd been there today. I didn't think I could be mistaken. But he said only because Stevens had phoned him to come. Were you there when that call was made? No, there was no call to Dowd while I was there. Excuse me, Mr. Swartz. Yes, Nero Wolf speaking. This is Saul Panzer. 
Yes, Earl, you're still... Yeah, it's still down here at the city market. Looks as if you were right. Indeed? One of their trucks just pulled in with a load of full crates. Top quality produce. I'll try not to wince when you send in the expense sheets. Any other confirmation? Internal revenue records show no taxes paid on income by the Tolliver Foundation. Thank you, Saul. Phone any information as you get it. You'll forgive me again, Mr. Swartz. Archie. Yes, boss? Could you ask Miss Dunning to step in now? Coming up. Come in now, Miss Dunning. Good evening, Miss Dunning. You've quite recovered from the chloroform? Mr. Goodwin's been helping me. He's been rubbing my forehead, and I'm beginning Spare me to... any further details. Miss Dunnings, would you mind telling me again how it was you came to find yourself in Mr. Dowd's apartment? Well, it was the phone call that got me to go over. It was a man whispering. He didn't give his name, but he said if I came to that address, apartment 4C, I could learn something about Mr. Stevens. You went to apartment 4C, and then? That's really all I know. Just after the door opened, before I could see him, this coat was thrown over my head, and then he must have given me the chloroform. It was Peter Dowd, of course. Dowd? Who else could it have been? It could have been Mr. Swartz here. Mr. Wolf, you're joking. Am I, Swartz? Joking or drunk? Why should I... Uh... For the ancient reason, Swartz. Money. For the racket you had and wanted to keep. Racket? Mr. Schwartz was in... Swartz is no more of an ecologist than Mr. Goodwin here. A moment ago, he accepted Myra Arenaria as a mushroom. It happens to be a common clam, common on nearly any beach, rare in inland Pennsylvania. Well, Stevens knew I didn't go in for all that Latin stuff. I could understand that you might be useful without it, Swartz. But to get away from your station operations, you faked the scientific knowledge you never had. All right. Suppose I am more of a farmer than a fancy scientist. Our job at the research station is to raise vegetable crops, isn't it? As you worked at Swartz, of course. You turned an agricultural research project into a commercial farm. All expenses met from tax-free funds. And not a cent of return shown for the produce sold. So that's why Saul Panzer drew the rutabagus run. Stephen had the innocence of a specialist interested in his own field only. But even Stevens finally began to get on to those doctored reports of your sports. And when was it the Internal Revenue men began asking questions? Look, Goodwin, is this fat guy out of his mind? You had to get rid of Stevens after the last inspection trip. Were you even counting on taking over his job after Peter Dowd was put away for Stevens' murder? Merely, if you'll just explain to this lunatic... Watch it, Archie, watch it. I've got his gun. Droidly done, Archie. Now, wait a minute. This is a thirty-two, and it was a thirty-eight that did the murder. Mr. Wolf, that's my bag. You can't... Take this pistol from it. I have, my dear. In this extraordinary effort you put me to, of actually leaving my chair to secure this weapon, we'll add that to the score against you. Mr. Wolf, if you aren't too tuckered to answer, that gun from Mary's bag... It's a thirty-eight. It may be the one used on Stevens. But Mary couldn't. She didn't. If ballistics tells us that this is the weapon, then Swartz must have passed it to her for safekeeping. Till it could be planted in young Dowd's apartment or car or whatever. I didn't have anything to do with it. Miss Dunning, you had to do it more than you know. Do you realize that if Mr. Goodwin hadn't found you at the Dowd apartment when he did, that you might not be alive at this moment? You were the one person who knew Swartz's crime. Mary, don't listen to him. She's listening, Swartz. Miss Dunning, you thought the chloroform scheme was directed solely against Peter Dowd. And so you let Swartz talk you into it. Mr. Goodwin tells me the door of that closet was sealed with scotch tape. I didn't know that. Schwartz actually tried... Your chloroform sleep was meant to turn into a permanent one, Miss Dunning. And I was trying to cover for him. All right, here it is. Schwartz planned it all. He did try the hit and run, and he did shoot Stevens. He's a liar. Mary, you've been juggling those books since... Say the details for Inspector Kramer, Schwartz. There's guilt enough to be divided between you and guilt enough to burn you both. You're being noble and not rubbing it in. Don't I merit a full explanation? Archie, I am concentrating on truffles. Do we dig out a bird or shall we have them in an omelet again? Mr. Wolf, look, I've got a white flag up and I'm asking. All right, Mary and Schwartz wanted Stevens out of the way. And all right, they tried to hang it on Peter Dowd. But why'd Mary come here and try to get you into it in the first place? 
As far as he knew that night, Archie, Stevens wasn't to get back to New York alive. Swartz hit and run ambush in New Jersey was supposed to take care of Stevens on his way back from Pennsylvania. By luck, Stevens survived the accident, and Swartz had to follow him here to finish him off. Yes, but I still don't see why... Mary came here to establish her innocence by pretending to seek our help. Oh. And she thought to keep suspicion from Swartz by creating the imaginary figure of a threatening caller at the office several days before. She knew Stevens meant to consult me about Swartz, and she could guess Jonas Dowd would call me in eventually. Well, Stephen said he wanted to consult you that morning when I... That morning when you couldn't hear Stevens out because you were seeing him as Mary Dunning wanted us to see him. Oh, a trick operated with two vanishing acts to explain. Stevens's and Mary's. There you have it, Archie. And both fake. A straight business trip branded a run out or a snatch only by Mary's account, and then the chloroform act at Dowd's apartment. You have it in full. Mm-hmm. Except how you knew she was lying to start with. Point one, the girl offered no fee, no prospect of a fee. Mm-hmm, stay at that. Could anyone claim knowledge of my reputation, Archie, and still seriously expect that I would take an arduous labor for the love of it? <laughs> oh, hmm. I'm ashamed of myself. Point two, she told us of a caller coming to see Stevens. Of Stevens asking her to fetch a policeman, then changing his mind. When asked to call a policeman, what woman's curiosity would be satisfied by being told not to bother? <laughs> How utterly brilliant you are. Hmm, yes. Archie, a bottle of beer. All right. And now back to a serious problem, you know. I think I see a compromise on these troubles. Between bird and omelet? Archie, why not both? Ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Charles O'Neill was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Charlotte Lawrence, Howard McNear, Mona Keneally, Lamont Johnson, and Herb Butterfield. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Slaughtered Santa Clauses. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial tuned to NBC later as Archie the manager and his delightful friends cook up another mad and merry session at that remarkable restaurant, Duffy's Tavern. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. No other cigarette has Camel's rich, full flavor. No other cigarette gives you this convincing proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast test, hundreds of people with normal throats smoked only Camel's for 30 days. Noted throat specialists examined the throats of those smokers every week and reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking Camel's. Make your own 30-day Camel test. Smoke only Camel's for 30 days. See how well camels agree with your throat, pack after pack, week after week. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, your plight is our delight. 
Helen Asher speaking. A gal alone with just a phone. Oh, clever, Helen. Clever. Thank you, sir. After all, you're not the only one who can make up corny slogans. Easy, girl. You're crowding me. Of course, I just might give up my slogans if you were on time for dinner tonight. Well, that's the deal. I can't stand competition. Seriously, Rick, I have a surprise for you tonight. Oh? Inviting a preacher for dinner, maybe? No, nothing like that. But I'm fixing the whole dinner myself, from soup to salad. Oh, great, Scott. Four million dollars and she can cook, too. Well, you just remember to go easy on lunch. I want you to have an appetite by the time you get here. Helen, I couldn't think of eating anything that would spoil my appetite. Besides, the automat won't take slugs anymore. Well, I do believe little old me has a little client. Must be male. I don't hear your fangs clicking. Oh, dear, you're so astute. Bye. Bye. You, the diamond? That's right. Well, what do you know? Odds were ten to one uh, I'd find you in. You don't say. Yeah, now get your hat, pal. It's 45 puts the odds in my favor. Now, now, get up. What are the odds on finding out what this is all about? 101 right now. You'll find out soon enough, though. Now, now, come on. And, and uh, Diamond, don't try no tricks. You do when it's even money, you'll be a dead, dead man. Well, some people collect stamps. Me, I collect strange visitors. And the character who led me downstairs to his car was one of the strangest I'd seen all week. He wore a loud check vest, purple sports coat, and bright yellow slacks. And every time he opened his mouth, he gave odds on something or other. We drove through town, finally pulled up in front of a ritzy apartment house. He led me back to an apartment on the first floor. Hold it. This is it. Inside, Diamond. That's far enough. Hey, Janet! Janet! Uh, I'm right here, Freddy. You don't have to... I told you it was four to one. I could... Bring him here. Oh, you in the bed, Freddy. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Oh, hello. Fred, if you'd told me she was going to be here, you wouldn't have needed odds. Oh, that's very sweet. I'm a very sweet guy, especially with a gun in my back. Oh, you can put it away now, Freddy, and take a walk. I want to speak to Mr. Diamond alone. Oh. Freddy. Okay, okay. Only the odds are three to one I should st- stick around. Mr. Diamond, I need your help. I suggested this to Freddie, and he said he'd bring you. I, I had no idea he'd force you to come. Oh, skip the apologies, honey. Just why do you need my help? My name is Janet Collins. My brother is Bert Collins. Does that name mean anything to you? Well, it all depends. There was a Bert Collins sentenced to the electric chair a few months ago. Same one? Yes, but he isn't guilty, Mr. Diamond. Bert was convicted of murdering a bookie, but he didn't. He tried to tell his story in court, but they wouldn't believe him. And I take it you want to tell me his story now? Exactly. Well, I'm listening. Bert went into the pool room to see this bookie about a loan. While he was talking to him, a stranger came in and shot the bookie. Said something about getting even. And the stranger dropped the gun and ran. And, uh, what did Bert do all this time? Well, he was stunned. He bent over the body and picked up the gun just as the police rushed in. It looked like he did it. Only he's innocent, Mr. Diamond. Honey, as I remember it, your brother had a fair trial. Twelve men disagree with you about his guilt. I I know that. But there's one man who can prove he told the truth. Oh? Well, keep talking. There was a witness to the murder. A little racketeer named Tony Garibaldi was in the pool room when it happened. He saw this stranger come in and kill the bookie. Why didn't this come out at the trial? Because we couldn't find Tony. We? Freddie, Bert's lawyer, and myself... We have witnesses who swear they saw Tony enter the pool room and rush out after the shooting. But you haven't got Tony. No. And he's the only one who can prove Bert is innocent. Unless we find Tony by tomorrow, it'll be too late. Please take the case, Mr. Diamond. Find Tony Garibaldi. Well, I, uh, I can give it a try. This is a big city, though. Tony could be hiding anywhere. I know it's a hard job, but I'll pay the usual fee and... I'll be very grateful, Mr. Diamond. Very grateful. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll save the gratitude for later, dear. After we find Tony Garibaldi. Oh, Diamond. A pretty face, a sob story, and you get into the scroyest cases. Find a cheap racketeer out of seven million people. Hm. I wonder what kind of odds Freddy would have given me on that. I caught a cab back to my office, picked up my car, then drove down to the 5th Precinct. 
I was hoping Lieutenant Walt Levinson could give me some lead on Tony Garibaldi. Oh, good morning, Mr. Diamond. Mr. Diamond? Well, so formal. New policy. Commissioner decided we were getting too lax here at the 5th Precinct. Henceforth, we are to treat visitors with dignity and respect. You don't say. Yeah, and stop mm. grinning. <laughs> what do you want down here, anyway? Oh, I'm working on a case. You, uh, you remember Bert Collins? And how? Grilled him after he was arrested. Tough boy. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm working to spring him. Yeah, he was one of the... What? Are you crazy? Collins gets the chair tomorrow night. I know, I know, but his sister says he's innocent. And you believed her? I don't know. She wants me to find a punk named Tony Garibaldi. Says Tony witnessed the murder and can prove Bert didn't do it. Oh, yeah, I remember. That's what Bert told us. We tried to locate Tony, but he's dropped out of circulation. You think Tony really saw the murder? Who knows? Guy next door to the pool room said he saw Tony enter and come out later after the shots. Look, Rick, there's no doubt that Bird did it. <laughs> the patrolman on the beat rushed in, found him standing over the body with a gun in his hand. Mm -hmm. Well, then why is Tony hiding? And why would Bert's sister want me to find Tony unless she was sure he could free her brother? All I know is we had all the evidence against Bert that we needed. He tried to borrow money from the bookie. Bookie refused. They had a fight. Bert shot him. Open and shut kiss. Mm -hmm. well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, Walt. I'm still going looking for Tony Garibaldi. Any leads on him? Nah, I'm afraid not. Chances are some of the petty rackets might know where he is. Tony's worked all the cheap rackets. Got a lot of friends. Well, I guess I start covering the petty rackets then, huh? Yeah, good luck, Rick. Bird is innocent. I'd hate to see him burn. Well, uh, if I find Tony, I'll bring him into you here. I'm glad you said if. If you find Tony and if he can clear Bert Collins. That's right, Fatty. If. <laughs> New York is a big city, and like any big city, it has a lot of rackets. Everything from fake panhandlers to phony insurance salesmen. But someone in these rackets might know where I could find Tony Garibaldi. So I began checking. One racket after another, charity rackets, used car rackets, everything. Yeah, a lot of people knew Tony, but they hadn't seen him in months, or so they said. It was late afternoon by the time I pulled up in front of Sneezy Williams' apartment. A few years back, Sneezy had organized every pickpocket in town, formed a sort of a union. There was a chance he might know Tony's whereabouts. I got out of my car and started for his apartment. Don't turn around, Dan. Uh, hmm. Well, it couldn't be your finger sticking in my back, could it, friend? No, it couldn't be. Walk toward that alley, Diamond, or I'll put a hole right through you. That's a pleasant thought. Now, pal, if this is a stick-up, you're in for a disappointment. The only green stuff in my wallet is moss. Shut up and don't turn around. That's far enough. Diamond, I, I hear you've been looking for me. Oh, you're Garibaldi? Shut up. I'll do the talking, Diamond. I don't know what your angle is in this or why you're after me, but I want you to lay off. Well, why are you hiding, Tony? What are you afraid of? Never mind that. Now, look, I've heard you're a right guy. I'm... I hate to do this, but you got to understand I'm not kidding. Keep away from me, or next time you won't get off so easy. Tony, Tony, listen to me. I don't... Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. Listen to this report by leading throat specialists. After making more than 2,000 weekly examinations of hundreds of smokers from coast to coast, smokers with normal throats who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That's proof of mildness. Proof offered by no other cigarette. Start your own 30-day camel test. Smoke only camels for the next 30 days. You'll soon see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. You'll see how well camels agree with your throat. Pack after pack, week after week. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see that smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I 
I was looking for a little racketeer named Tony Garibaldi. Only instead of finding him, Tony found me. And he left a bump on my head as a not-too-gentle reminder that he didn't appreciate me searching for him. But now I was even more determined to find him for two good reasons. One, he might save Bert Collins from the chair. And two, I wanted to repay him for that crack on the head with interest. After I'd come to in the alley, I went to a cafe on the corner, smoked four candles, had two cups of coffee, and washed my face. I felt much better as I walked back up the street to Sneezy Williams' apartment. I climbed the stairs and knocked on Sneezy's door. When the door opened, Sneezy stood there, his face screwed up like he'd just bitten into an unripe persimmon, then... (laughs) Relief spread over his pudgy features, and he held out his hand. Ricky Diamond. Long time no see. How are you, Sneezy? Bad, Ricky. Awful bad. Come on in. Well, thanks. I... Ooh, what's that smell? Fumes. For my vaporizer over there on the table, I gotta breathe them. It clears up my head. No. Oh. I hear you've uh, gone up in the world, Sneezy. Pickpocket union, huh? Diamond, please don't use that word pickpocket. In a trade, we call them cadets. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be disrespectful. A common mistake. Mm. Yeah, I organize the boys. It keeps them out of each other's territory, and I get a percentage of all their takes. Mm. Well, that explains the fancy apartment. Uh-huh. Only what would do when you're a sick man like me? I got a cold all year round. I've been under a mustard plaster so long I feel like a hot dog. (laughs) What brings you here, Ricky? I'm looking for a man, Sneezy. Thought you might know where I could find it. Well, it all depends. Come on, let's sit over here by the vaporizer. I gotta sniff those fumes. Who are you after, Rick? Guy by the name of Tony Garibaldi. Tony, huh? You know him? Oh, sure. Worked for me a few years back. I haven't seen him lately, though. Where was he living when you knew him, Sneezy? No, let's see. Excuse me a sec. Ooh, them fumes feel good. Uh, about Tony. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. I should know it. Uh, oh, oh, sure. He lived with his mother. Yeah, that's a nice old lady. I've been over there a few times. Over where, Sneezy? What's the address? The address? Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Ooh, them fools. You know, uh, these uh, vaporizers come pretty high these days. Uh, this one set me back ten bucks. Mm. Uh, all right, Sneezy. Here's ten bucks. Vicky, you are a kindred soul. Just make with the address, Sneezy. The, the old lady runs a dry cleaning shop over on 79th and 3rd. Right on the corner, you can't miss it. <sighs> Ooh, damn fool. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> That last one must have registered on the Caltech seismograph. I left Sneezy with another gazunite and went out the door before he blew me out. Then I went to my car, drove across town to the cleaning shop on 79th and 3rd. Inside, I found a tired-looking old lady marking clothes. Yes? You've come for clothes? No, Mrs. Garibaldi. I'm, uh, I'm looking for your son. Tony? Tony. What is it you want with him? I'd like to talk, sir. You threatened the police? Well, indirectly, yes. Go away. Now, Mrs. Garibaldi... Go away. You're not dressed like a policeman. You're not from the police. You wish to harm my Tony. Go away. Uh, Mrs. Garibaldi, your son's in a lot of trouble. He might be able to save an innocent man from dying. I intend to find him. Tony's in trouble, yes, I know. He comes here months ago, tells me he must hide... He does not tell me why. Why must the Tony hide from men like you? Why? Your son witnessed a murder. This is a crime? No, no, but Tony ran away. Now, if he tells what he really saw, perhaps an innocent man will go free. Tony is a good boy. He would not wish harm to innocent men. Uh, perhaps Tony's afraid, Mrs. Garibaldi. Afraid some harm will come to him if he tells the truth. Is this true? No. The police will protect your son. But they can't protect him if they don't know where he is. He's in more danger now. How do I know you speak the truth? 
You're not Fran, please. I know you're not a harm to any yourself. You can check with the police. Lieutenant Lemonson, 5th Precinct. He'll vouch for me. Oh, I do not know. You would not tell me to check unless you spoke the truth. But I do not know. Where's Tony living, Mrs. Garibaldi? Tony says I'm not to tell anyone. Your son's afraid. People in fear don't think clearly. Now, where's Tony? Uh, Tony's a good boy. There is no God he must hide. Where is he? Tony must hide no more. Tony must tell the truth. If I do wrong, me, I'll be forgiven, but I will tell you where Tony hides. Mrs. Garibaldi wrote the address on a slip of paper. I called Janet Collins and asked her to meet me at Tony's hideout. Together, we might be able to persuade him to tell the truth about the murder. When I got to Tony's rooming house, Janet hadn't arrived yet, so I went up alone. And after five flights, I didn't bother to knock. What? Hello, Tony. Dennis. Yeah. Now, punk, we'll have a little talk. You get out of here. Leave me alone. Now, stay right there, Tony. I've got the gun this time. And I'm missing to pay you back for that wallop in the alley. I had to do that, Diamond. You, you don't understand. Well, then suppose you want to like me. Who are you hiding from? You know as well as I do, they hired you to find me, didn't they? And it all depends. Who do you mean by they? Colin's sister Janet and that Freddy character, they hired you, didn't they? That's right. To find a chicken-hearted punk who might be able to save Bert Collins from the chair. You're quite a guy, Tony. Let Bert die because you're afraid you'll risk your own neck. Oh, come on, Mr. Diamond. You must know why they want me. Sure, I was in the pool room the night of the murder. That's why I gotta hide. I don't follow you, Tony. Now, who was it you saw? You're trying to tell me you don't know. I never ask questions if I know the answers. Okay, then here's your answer. Sure, I seen the killer. It was Bert Collins. What? I was at a back table. Bert come in. He didn't see me. And after the shots, I got out of there fast. Ah, oh, you're lying, Tony. Why are you hiding if Bert really did it? He's been convicted. He can't harm you. No, but his sister and that Freddy guy can. After the murder, they got in touch with me. Told me I had to swear I saw a stranger come in and kill the bookie. They told me I had to swear Bert didn't do it. So that's why you ran? Sure, I didn't want to get in trouble with the law. But if I didn't lie, I'd be killed, so I hid out. Mm. Well, Tony, if what you say is true, I'm the biggest stoop in town. You've got to believe me, Mr. Donovan. I swear I, I tell the truth. And, and please don't tell them where I'm hiding, please. It's too late for that, Tony. You already know. What? Yeah, come on. Let's get out of here. We'll get you to a safer place. Then we'll have to... oh, oh, hold it right there, kiddies. I to fight the one, I'll pull a trigger. Well, well, well. Yellow vest, purple sports coat, and gray gun. Freddy, you're a regular Technicolor nightmare. Better drop your gun, Diamond. Hmm. Hello, Janet. Drop it. That's a sweet little boy. You're bleeding now, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, Tony, only don't rub it in. Diamond, I'm sorry this has to be... I wanted you to find Tony, but I wish you hadn't talked to him. Oh, Janet, you're a dreamer. This won't work. Even if Tony does swear Bert's innocent, the police will break his story. Your brother dies in the chair tomorrow night, and the lie can't save him. We'll see about that. It's a chance, anyway. Mm. Well, what about it, Tony? You gonna let him take you downtown and lie for them? Well, I, I, I don't know. I know, Tony Diamond. Don't try and fill him with false bravado. He knows what Freddie will do with him. Unless he does exactly what we tell him. Don't you tell me. Yeah, kid, you know. And the odds are 50 to 1, you'll say just what we want you to say. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Diamond. I guess I got to do what they want. Oh, don't be a fool, Tony. Shut They're... up, Diamond. You, you, you've talked enough. Freddy, I'll leave you here with Diamond. Tony and I'll wait in the car. Don't be long. Go on, Tony. Diamond. Diamond. Oh. Now then, Diamond. Just you and me. Ah, uh, you make the most brilliant statements, Freddy. Yeah, and the odds I have, hey, to keep your hands out of your pocket. Oh, take it easy, Freddy. There couldn't be a gun in this pocket. She's got a half dollar. See? What's I gave? Well, Freddy, old boy, the way I see it, I'm about to be shot. That's even money, all right. Well, I can't figure out whether to die a hero trying to rush you or just stand here and wait for you to shoot. Huh? Now, either way, I die. So I might as well decide which way I want it. Thought I might flip a coin. The, the, the diamond, you must be a little off, huh? Ah, oh, Freddy. Freddy, I, uh, 
I didn't admit it before, but you see, I'm, uh, I'm crazy about gambling, too. Just like you. Yeah, sure, huh? sure. You can appreciate a sportsman wanting to go out like this to die on a gamble. I don't know. Oh, Freddy, Freddy, relax. Either way, I die. Now, I'll flip the coin, two out of three. Heads, I die rushing you. Tails, I wait for you to shoot. It is sort of interesting. Hmm? Huh? Here we go. Up. There. Mm. Tails. Are you right? Uh-uh. Two out of three. Up. Hmm. What is it? Heads. Well, go on, go on. This one tells the tale. Yeah, Freddy. This one tells the tale. I held the coin against my thumb. Freddy was interested now. He was the type who liked any kind of a bet, and in this one, the odds were all in his favor. But I always did like long shots. I flipped the coin high. Only this time, I didn't catch it. I let it fall to the floor, and Freddy's eyes followed it. This was what I needed. I threw him off balance, and the gunman clattering to the floor. Then my right hand plowed into a yellow vest, and my left hand followed through. And that took care of Freddy. But there was still Janet outside with Tony in the car. I stripped Freddy of his purple sport coat, put it on, and went downstairs. Outside, I saw Janet and Tony in a blue sedan parked at the curb. I lowered my head, went around to Janet's side as fast as I could. Get in the other side, Freddy. Diamond. Take it easy, honey. Let me go. Let me go. Oh, just relax Let me now. Go. You'll go somewhere in a minute. Tony. Yeah? Run out the corner and get the cop of the beat to take care of our little friends, will you? And make it snappy. I got a date at 7 o'clock. Hmm. I wonder how Helen will like me in a purple sport jacket. Hmm. I beg your pardon, Helen, dear? I said, hmm. Well, that's what I thought you said. Now, dear, please stop staring at me. It makes me self-conscious. Oh, I just can't help it, Rick. I don't think it's right for a woman to tell a man how to dress. No, I agree. Only sometimes. Well, that purple sport jacket. <laughs> I was wondering when you'd notice it. Oh, I noticed it when you first came in. I'm just getting over the shock. Oh, I knew you'd like it, dear. Wait until you see my red, white, and blue slacks. I'm saving them for Lincoln's birthday. Oh, now, Rick, what's come over you? Personality, dear. Now settle back and listen to your colorful boyfriend sing a sweet song. Ah, oh, what a way to spend an evening. A purple coat, a piano, and a private detective. And I'm the gal who graduated from Vassar. And so to sleep again. As if I'll ever sleep again. These restless nights go on away from you, and so to dream again, as if I'll ever dream again, my darling, since you're gone. My dreams are through No other arms Can ease this ache Within my heart No other lips Can kiss away These tears that start And so to sleep again as if I'll ever sleep again as if I'll ever love again anyone but you It's very nice. Thank you. Only I'm surprised you didn't sing a louder tune to go with your clothes. Oh, Helen, Helen, from your tone, one would think you didn't approve of my new apparel. Yeah, one would, wouldn't one? 
Want with off? No, Rick. Rick? Rick? Yes, dear. More. Well, I'll be romantic tonight. Romantic, nothing. As long as you wear that jacket, I'd rather keep my eyes closed. Come here. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? When that question was asked of doctors from coast to coast, doctors in all branches of medicine, the brand name most was Camel. Why don't you smoke Camels, too? And say, why not give a carton of Camels for St. Valentine's Day? Camels come in a special carton all dressed up for the Valentine season. Give your Valentine Camels. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to help bring pleasure to hospitalized veterans and members of our armed forces, the makers of Camel send thousands of packs of Camel cigarettes to service in veterans' hospitals every week. This week, the gift Camels go to veterans' hospitals, Fort Harrison, Montana, and West Roxbury, Massachusetts, U.S. Naval Hospital, Quantico, Virginia, U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Carson, Colorado, and the Military Air Transport Service, which evacuates virtually all overseas wounded personnel. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond was written and directed by Dick Carr with music by Frank Worth. Virginia Gregg played the part of Helen Asher, and Alan Reed was Lieutenant Levinson. Others in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Gene Bates, and Parley Bear. Be sure to listen to another great camel show, Vaughn Monroe and the Camel Caravan, every Saturday night. Here's old Prince Albert, the National Joy Smoke. The bite is hot and the pleasure's in when you smoke Prince Albert. It's specially treated not to bite your tongue. The bite is hot and the pleasure's in. So pack your pipe with Prince Albert, the largest selling pipe tobacco in America. It's smooth, cool smoking. And say, there's more tobacco in the pocket tin now. So get Prince Albert tomorrow. <laughs> Listen next week for another exciting adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, who follows Transcribed in 30 seconds. Later tonight, over most of these NBC stations, Duffy's Tavern comes your way. And on the menu at Duffy's tonight, there's a blue plate special of grilled English language, served up by the delightfully ungrammatical Archie. Plus, laughs garnished with chuckles, brought to you by Archie's remarkable crew. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial tuned to NBC. And this Sunday means another broadcast of the big show. And your guests include Fred Allen, Douglas Fairbanks, Danny Thomas, and many, many more. Tallulah, of course, is your hostess on the big show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. Hello. The mountain of a man engaged in deep thought in the oversized right. armchair right. is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf, we've got a case. I'm not sure whether somebody's going to kill a rabbit or a rabbit is going to kill somebody, but either way, it's going to be murder. Please, Mr. Wolf, even orchids have to eat. Oy. Yes, sir, Mr. Wolf will take the case. As a matter of fact, he's working on it right now. Money, work, bah. Huh. Greatest detective in the world. Only trouble is, he is. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Archie is right. Nero Wolf is the greatest detective in the world, and the fattest, and the least energetic. Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet.
Tonight, it's the case Nero Wolf likes to remember as the case of the friendly rabbit. He sometimes prefers his proverb scramble. It began in lots of places. Let's take a look at a few of them. In particular, the richly appointed library of a man named Veek. Mr. Veek, what's happening? Relax, Haynes, your blood pressure... I thought it was a gag, but you really are shutting the club down. I'm shutting it down. Why? I got the joint roll and the suckers are pouring in. And next week, the governor's committee. Huh? It's moving out of Baylor County. Our joint enterprise is in Baylor County. I think the club needs a rest. Crime committees so rarely admire gambling. Oh, that's different. So it is. The club needs a rest. You need a vacation. Florida, perhaps? I don't like Florida. Pick any place you like, just so long as you get out of reach of a subpoena. Oh, the heat's on, huh, boss? You've just coined a phrase that may very well catch on. Get out and stay out of the state until I send for you. Okay, Mr. V. Sure, Mr. V. Marshal? Yeah? That about covers us in Baylor, am I right? You're yeah, right. The dear governor's dear committee will be sorely disappointed. However, I doubt it'll give up quite so soon. I wouldn't think so. Therefore, have the truck driver deliver another shipment of carrots to the rabbit farm. Eh, Marshal? Okay, boss. Come in, Williams. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Williams, I'm disturbed. The crime committee, sir? It was doing well, very well. And then... I know, sir. There's a leak. Someone is passing on confidential information. Who? That's the problem. Who? Started three weeks ago. A three-man committee, Wilson, McCarthy, Tolliver. One of them, Williams? I'd stake my life, sir, no. Then who? You've forgotten Collier, committee secretary. You have reason to suspect him? No, nothing that means anything. Except... You do suspect him? He's been watched, telephone calls checked, mail. I have no reason to suspect him. Except that one thing bothers me. What's that? He has a small farm in Greendale County. He rarely went near the place in all the time he's been up here at the Capitol. But that suddenly changed. Three weeks ago? Yes, sir. He's been staying at the farm for three weeks. Is there anything unusual about that farm? Nothing unusual. Except Jimmy Collier has gone in for raising rabbits. Jimmy. Who is it? Oh, hello, Claire. You've been hiding from me. I... I've been out here with the rabbits. Jimmy, what's wrong? With what? You. There's nothing. You're with... lying. We grew up together, remember? We lived next to each other, Jimmy. We were going to be married. Hey, wait a minute. We still are, last I heard. You haven't heard recently enough. What does that mean? It means we're not getting married. But, Claire, You've I... been avoiding me. And you've been getting money, lots of money, from someplace. And in a shady way, I feel. All right, you know. So what? I've been concerned about your sudden devotion to these... These rabbits... And the kind of men you've been seeing. What do you mean? Like the one up at the house now, waiting for you. Oh, there's somebody waiting? That's why I came down here after you. Uh, I'd better get up there. He's a crook, Jimmy. Look, I... All right. I sort of got myself in a mess. I needed money and... But it's over, Claire. No more. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I wish I could believe you. For your own sake. But I feel I can't. Not anymore. <laughs> Okay. Yes, Mr. Wolf. I either stop breathing so heavily or... Take the evening off? Stop breathing. Old Dr. Tidmouse wouldn't approve of that. Who in blue and assorted blazes is old Dr. Tidmouse? My family doctor. May have escaped your puny mind, but you don't have a family. Answer the phone. Oh, but it might be a case. It might be very important. It might mean work, Mr. Wolf. Okay. W-O-R-K. You've got millions in the bank. Why worry? Confound you. Do you want me to answer their phone myself? Now you've got me. No, Mr. Wolf. Couldn't let you knock yourself out lifting a telephone receiver. Nero Wolf's office. Archie Goodwin speaking. What? What? Wait, Mr. Wolf is to go up to Greendale at... Oh, now look, friend. Mr. Wolf does not go anywhere, and that includes Greendale. He wouldn't stir out of the house for anybody short of the... Uh, what? I see. Yes, sir, in an hour. Goodbye. Mr. Wolf, brace yourself. You've got an appointment with a Mr. Williams at the Starlight Hotel in Greendale for one hour from now. You're insane. No, I'll admit I've been tempted. Fury, 
Were it not for the fact that often the native hue of resolution is sickly door with a pale cast of thought... Quoting Hamlet will get you no place. I would fire you. And then who would drive you to the Starlight Hotel in Greendale? I'm not going to Greendale. Nevertheless, in an hour you will be there. And who, may I inquire, Cecil? The governor of the state. Is that all, Mr. Williams? That, Mr. Wolfe, is all anyone knows about the situation. Except the guilty man, of course. An admirably clear summary, Mr. Williams. Obviously, our meeting here at the hotel was necessary. I couldn't be seen entering your house, nor would it have been advisable for you to visit the governor. I can appreciate that. You're quite sure I need pay no attention to anyone on the committee except James Collier? Quite sure. Police surveillance of Collier is deemed unwise. He has suddenly taken interest in rabbits, but although keeping them may perhaps be considered suspicious, it is hardly in itself of value. You have no other evidence against Collier? I know we're clutching at straws, Mr. Wolf, but there is a leak and work is being nullified. Something must be done. Hence the governor's call for you. Very well, sir. I shall uh, attempt to be more than uh, a man clutching at a straw. <laughs> I said attempt. Archie. And back. We shall stay at Greendale near Collier and his rabbits. Mr. Wolf? Mr. Wolf? Oh, naturally, I know that shutting your eyes and pushing your lips in and out indicates you're thinking feverishly, but there's nothing for you to think about. Three. Oh, I accept your correction. What are you thinking about? Hotel beds, they're notoriously flimsy. Oh, you gave up on the case so soon. Fiddlesticks. I already know exactly what role the rabbits play in our problem, therefore... We're going to drive out to Collier's farm? You are. While you test the hotel beds, fine. It'll be necessary for you to spend the night at Collier's place. You'll drive out there and pretend you've lost a cylinder or something. <laughs> oh, a lost cylinder. Oh, fine. Confound you, Archie. You can invent something plausible as a pretext. And if you are properly charming, Mr. Collier, I will, I hope, invite you to stay the night. And during the night I sleep, hmm? Happily breathing the fresh country air. <laughs> Trust not. <laughs> okay, Mr. Wolf, I accept the assignment. I will learn all I can from Mr. Collier's rabbits. Incidentally, remember the play Harvey? I do. Why? Harvey was an invisible rabbit, a figment of a man's imagination. I hope this rabbit venture is more tangible, Mr. Wolf. It is, Mr. Goodwin. Will you desist and depart? Okay, okay. Oh, uh, if anyone calls, just say I've gone out to Greendale to cross-examine a rabbit. Hmm? Ah, Jay. I think you're going to be quite surprised. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Running out of gas, and me such a big boy. Hmm. Ah. <gasps> hello. Uh, hello. A tree, a friend of yours? The, the tree? Yeah, the one you're clutching. Oh, I, I was leaning against it. It's an idea, but not a good one. Trees are notoriously skittish. The instant you really need one, they're out sowing wild oaks or something. You sound as if you know a lot about trees. Oh, I do. I was brought up in one. Look, now, if you really have to lean, I can recommend No, thanks. It. Huh? I tried. Nice moonlight we're having. My name is Goodwin, and blondes call me Archie. I'm not blonde. Brunettes call me Archie, too. And what do redheads call you? <laughs> we'll just skip that, huh? And your name is... Claire. Claire. I approve. Now, you may not believe this, but I have just run out of gas. You think I might wangle some up at your house? My house? You mean Jimmy's house. All right, I mean Jimmy's house. Well, I I don't know. He might have some. Now, why don't we go up to the house and ask him? Well, all right. Mm -hmm. Jimmy who? Collier. Uh-huh. I like to be formal when I'm borrowing gas. Would you mind waving your left hand in front of my nose? Waving, Mike? Yes, just try it. Don't worry, I won't bite it. All right. I did. And very gracefully, too. No ring on the third finger. You're not Mrs. Collier. There isn't any Mrs. Collier. 
Are you applying for the position? Mr. Goodwin, I... Now, remember what I confided in you about brunettes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Archie, you're a little rapid. Maybe. But I always remember what old Dr. Titmouse said. What did he say? Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. Robert Herrick wrote that. He did? Dr. Titmouse is a liar. How much farther is this house? Well, it's just beyond those trees. I... Oh! What? Uh... Oh, I... There was something ran across the path. It brushed my legs. It frightened me Must so. have been a rabbit. I... I guess it was. Oh, I'm sorry. That was silly of oh. me. Oh. Don't worry about it. Also, you will have noticed how much more satisfactory I am than a tree. We're clutching at it. Moments of stress, I mean... Archie. Mm-hmm. But you'd better let go now. What I... And we'll get on to the house. See, I don't need a haircut, and you're not the right type for Delilah anyway. You mean something by that. Something nasty. Well, that depends. What I meant is you've already signaled whoever you're supposed to signal. Nothing frightened you back there. Why? That scream had a lot of carrying power. Well, that's the house, huh? Looks peaceful enough. Archie, I... Who were you supposed to warn if anyone came up the path to the house? Well, no one. Something did frighten Honey, me. Honey, I've I... been lied to by experts, and you're not one. Ah. Oh. Think I ought to knock? No, we don't think I ought to knock. Dark inside. Except for a handful of moonlight filtering in through the windows. Kind of early for Collier to turn in, isn't it? I... Wouldn't know. Let's go find out. <gasps> now relax, relax. Grandpa's making with the chimes. Time is... Yeah, ten o'clock. Oh, it's getting late. Come on. This would be the living room. Filled with early American furniture. The early Americans would be pleased. Nothing here. What's that door lead to? I... I don't know. Or won't tell? Smaller room. Darkest. Come in. Put the beer on it. Oh, you're not the bellboy. I'm sorry. I should have remembered to bring some beer. Indeed, and you are? I'm a fellow guest at this hotel, Mr. Wolf. My name is Leek. Big, ah, uh, yes. A criminal of moderate intelligence and in moderate pretensions. We won't quarrel, Mr. Wolf. I have something to offer you. You and your boy Goodwin didn't drive up to Greendale for the exercise. I dislike exercise. Shortens life. James Collier lives nearby. The Governor's Committee on Crime is unhappy. There's been a leakage of information. It hasn't helped them in their work. But it has helped you. You wouldn't have left your house in New York on any ordinary job. A request from the Governor, however... Shall we stop fencing? Hmm. I don't have to fence with you. The committee's work doesn't particularly bother me. I've already made my arrangements for retiring from active business, shall I say. However, I don't want you messing around in the meantime. Indeed. In your effort to discover how the committee's information leaked out, you might also discover a number of things about me that I prefer to remain undiscovered. No one has employed me to do anything about you, sir? Not directly, but indirectly you might have to. I want to insure myself against any such possibility. I want to make a deal with you. I'm ready to supply you with the name of the man responsible for the leak and papers proving his guilt. I have them here. In return for which you expect... A quick conclusion to your activities and your return to New York, leaving my name out of your reports. I'm neither a public official nor a philanthropist. I should do nothing about you unless it becomes necessary. You may remove your hand from your pocket. You wouldn't dare shoot me. Now then, the name of the man. James Collier. Proof of his guilt? These. A series of reports on the committee's meetings in Collier's handwriting. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. And I hope for your sake that we do not meet again. Phew. Archie, answer the... Oh. Hello? Mr. Wolf? Yes, Archie? I'm at the Collier place. Since it takes only ten minutes to get there, may I congratulate you on your speed? I've been at the Collier place for nearly an hour. Doing what? Oh, meeting Claire for...
for one thing, discussing Rosebud. Your delay has been explained. Good night. And for another, I was being around when someone got murdered. Ah, you laid hands on the murderer? No, the room was dark. The time I got Claire untangled from me and started looking for somebody with a gun, he'd left. I see. And the dead man, of course, is James Collier. No, sorry. Found it, it had to be. Who was he? Total stranger. Ah, gee. I'm not being difficult. There was no identification on him. Strange. A description. Early 30s, height maybe 5'10", weight around 175 pounds. Blonde hair, blue eyes, a very natty dresser. Suit custom tailored with a built-in shoulder holster. Don Juan shirts. Manicured but very dirty fingernails. And he... Uh Uh-oh. Company. The police? Mm Mm-hmm. Very well, you tell them whatever you think proper, without mentioning the governor's committee, of course. You then bid them farewell and come to the hotel. Can't I say goodbye to Claire, too? You cannot. Confound you, Archie. Do you think I want to wait up all night? Police were not happy about letting me go, but I threatened to tell you on them, so they gave up. You have told me the entire story of what occurred at the Collier Farm, Archie? Mm Mm-hmm. All details. If you like, I wouldn't mind repeating the parts about Claire. Phooey. You may call it phooey, I call it love. By the way, did you know that it was Robert Herrick who wrote that book? Confound call... you, be quiet. Okay, push your lips around, but you've missed something. I have? Mm-hmm. The burning question of the day. Good night, brother. Which is? Where is James Collier? Ah. Stop buying. The cops want him on suspicion of murder. The way it shapes up, he shot our unknown pal and then headed for the nearest border. Nonsense. You mean he didn't shoot our unknown pal? I mean, Collier's whereabouts are not a mystery. You know where he is? I know where he is. I don't believe it. You couldn't know. You haven't been out of the hotel. You haven't had any calls. Archie, I use my intelligence. If you had used yours instead of holding the girl... I still wouldn't know where Collier is. Never mind. I'm impressed. What do I do now? You get Mr. Veek on the phone. Huh? He's staying here at the hotel. Oh, old home week. Operator. Mr. Veek, please. Hello, Mr. Veek. Who is this? Mr. Wolf wants to speak with you. Just a second. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Mr. V, where were you at 10 o'clock? Why, on my way to the hotel. You checked in at... 10.15, and then came directly to your room. One other question. You have an employee, a man in his early 30s, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and well-dressed. Am I correct? Yes, that is Marshall. No, that was Marshall. Good night, sir. Having done that, whatever it meant, we now go to sleep? Three, we go to the Collier Farm. Okay, but why? Because, Archie, uh, <laughs> the time has come to cross-examine the rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Confound you, Archie. You're not driving a truck. Be careful. Truck drivers are careful. Also, they're courteous. Indeed. Furthermore, they will always stop to help a motorist in time of trouble. Archie, are you training to become a truck driver, or have you fallen in love with a truck driver's daughter? Her name is Susie, a hair the color of wheat fields at high noon. Never mind turning purple. I'm about to change the subject. Boss, I have a theory. Stick to truck drivers. As follows... Our boy Collier, who'd been selling information to Veek, had a change of heart and decided to turn ethical. But Veek's man, Marshall, at Veek's orders, tried to apply pressure, so Collier shot him and headed for Canada. Uh, and the girl's robe. Must have brightened my life. Uh, oh, you mean about her playing sentry? Well, she's in Veek's employ, too. Sorry. Don't like my theory. It's charming. It merely happens to be wrong. It merely happens to be. Why is it wrong? Because Archie of a dead man's dirty fingernails, Marshall's fingernails. Oh. Well, you made me bring you to the rabbit hutches. We have arrived. There are the rabbits. Go ahead, cross-examine them. Hmm, good many hutches. A large pen for the rabbits to run about in. Notice that they're all cowering at the far end of the pen, ran as we entered. That's because they don't like us, maybe, huh? (laughs) One of them, however, seems to be friendly. The one up here, and at the corner opposite us. Oh, yeah, there is one here. He's not friendly, Mr. Wolf. Indeed? He's dead. Somebody stole in his skull. Interesting. What's interesting about a dead rabbit? He may be dead now, Archie, but he was friendly. Too friendly. 
Claire, this is Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, this is Claire. Claire, I'm Archie. Ah, a chair, Archie. A chair. Try this one. Be gentle with it. If you break it, all the early Americans will hate you. It was her. Uh... Steady. Oh. Ah. Well, now then. Mr. Wolf, I'm dreadfully tired. The police have... Are idiots. What? For example, do they know that you were posted as sentry outside this house in order to warn James Collier of any intrusion? Well, they don't... I wasn't. I... Do they know that James Collier and the dead man Marshall were quarreling? No. Do they know that James Collier had armed himself in preparation for this meeting with the gunman? That isn't true. It I... is true. I don't have to say anything. You've already said more than enough with your actions, my dear. What, what do you mean? According to Archie's report, and Archie is always meticulously accurate, when you and he opened the door of the room in which the murder took place, you screamed at the shots. Well, of course. Any girl would scream with... Then you clung to Archie with sufficient force and for sufficient length of time to prevent him from chasing the murderer. Why? I... Because you had seen and recognized the murderer as the man you loved. It was too dark to see anything. True. Therefore, you didn't have to see the man. You thought you already knew who the killer had to be. That, that's a lie. You're shielding James Collier, aren't you? I'll never admit any of it. Never. May not be necessary. Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Get all of that policeman outside and remember what happened to one particular rabbit. Well, uh, look around for freshly dug earth. Midnight. What What are we waiting for? A return? Archie's? No, it'll take him longer. Well, then who's? <gasps> Mr. Veeks, of course, complete with revolver. Come in, Mr. Veek. It couldn't have been easier. No one outside, only the two of you here. I warned you, Wolf. Fiddlesticks, you merely tried to use me as a prop for an alibi and a rationalization for a motive. I don't understand Mr. That... Wolf does. Need I do? Did you really think me fool enough to believe your proposal, Mr. Veek? It was plausible. It was nonsense. You pretended you were handling James Collier, plus the proofs of his guilt, over to me in an effort to keep yourself out of the picture. But your proposition was silly. No matter how much I might have wanted to help you, I would have been powerless once James Collier went before a jury. You are too intelligent not to know that. That couldn't have given you enough to go on. It didn't. You yourself gave me more. I did. When you came to my room, you told me you knew Mr. Goodwin and I had come to Greendale, checked in at the hotel. I did. However, when I phoned you later and asked for an account of your movements between 10 and 10.30, you replied that you had driven to the hotel, signed in, and came directly to my room. Obviously, you already knew of my presence in the hotel. How? I, uh... Only one way you could have known. You had seen Archie at some time prior to the time you checked in at the hotel. And the only place where Archie was... Was here, at the farm. Yes, which told me Mr. Veek had been here at the time of Marshall's death. What was Veek doing here? Only one thing. Murder. <gasps> then he killed the gunman. No other possibility. But Jimmy, I thought he did it. James Collier couldn't have killed Marshall because at the time he was killed, James Collier was already... Already dead. Archie! What's this? Me, Mr. Veek, let's play. Untrap that gun first. My arm! Oh. That's nice and cooperative, so... Oh. He'll be quiet for a while. A cop is back in the rabbit pen, Mr. Wolf, guarding Collier's grave. Grave, Archie? Yeah, with James Collier in it. Oh, poor Jimmy. Veek knew the expose was coming. He had to shut Collier up. So he had his gunman, Marshall, kill Collier and bury him in the rabbit run back of the hutches. You spotted that, boss, because of... A dead rabbit. The others scurried away from the man who bore James Collier's body to that lonely spot. But one rabbit overcame his fear. He was too friendly. And got killed for it. There was that and... And the... the dirty fingernails of Marshall, the gunman who killed and buried James Collier. Your description indicated extreme neatness. The dirty fingernails were a wrong note. Yeah, indicated he'd been digging. So we know now, don't we? Vic killed his own trigger man to frame a dead man for it. 
Collier would be thought guilty. He'd be hunted among the living. And all the while... Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Claire. It's all right, Archie. I didn't love Jimmy. That was all washed up. Mr. Wolf, I understand everything, except why did Jimmy suddenly start staying at the farm with the rabbits? He knew he'd be watched. He couldn't risk conveying his information by telephone or the mails. Nor could he be seen holding conversation with men who might be traced to Veek. But who would suspect a truck driver delivering carrots for the rabbits as being the go-between for Jimmy Collier and Veek? Nero Wolf. Which is why I hope there's an adequate bed in this house for Mr. Wolf. Well, I'm sure I'll be able to find one. Splendid, Archie. You will have the police remove Mr. Veek and then... And then maybe Claire would like to uh, go gathering rosebuds, huh? By moonlight? I... Would like to. Truly. I shall go up to bed now. I've seen the moonlight more times than I care to remember. However, while you and Miss Claire stroll through the moonlight, Archie... Yeah? You might remember that rosebuds have thorns. <laughs> You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Martha Shaw, Hal Gerard, Herb Butterfield, Howard McNear, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Impolite Corpse. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial on this NBC station this evening as Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his remarkable friends serve up another blue plate special of grilled English language, fresh laughs and whimsy a la mode. Another Friday fun favorite is the delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as the beleaguered Chester A. Riley. Now it's Sam Spade. Then, the magnificent Montague on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello. The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. And the mountain of a man engaged in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolfe. What was that? Somebody's going to be murdered who has no manners? Well, what do you want Nero Wolfe to do? Teach him manners? Oh. Hold on. Mr. Wolfe. Yes, Archie? We've got a prospective client. In case someone she knows gets murdered, she'd like you to do something about it. Very well, however, advise her. Yes? <laughs> Not to get murdered herself. I never take a corpse for a client. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest detective in the world. Yes, Archie is so right. He is the greatest detective in the world. And the fattest. And the least energetic. He's Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's the case of the impolite corpse. It began on a certain night at 8.40, when Walter Channing, an advertising executive, was dictating in his office to his charming secretary, Brenda Barkley. Brenda, take a memo. Yes, Mr. Channing. This is to be mimeographed and sent to the entire staff. The entire staff, yes, sir. Notice. Effective at once, one-hour lunch periods will be strictly enforced. Employees will post time of departure and time of return. Yes, what is it? 
Mr. Channing... Bennett, I'm busy. Well, I've got to see you, Mr. Channing. About this afternoon... uh, This afternoon was unfortunate, Bennett, but it happened. I lost my temper. I'm sorry. So am I. Mr. Channing, I've been with the firm 14 years, and I... Well, because a man blows up once in 14 years... Mr. Channing's office. Oh, you've got to reconsider. That's all, Mr. Channing. I never reconsider, Bennett. It's your wife. But, Mr. Channing... That will be all, Bennett. It won't be all. You can't wipe out 14 years of a man's life. Even you can't do that, Channing. It's Mrs. Channing on the phone. Oh. Hello? You're where? That's in this building. Since when has Dr. Ellis kept evening office hours? I told you there's nothing wrong with you. No, I can't. I don't know when I'll be through. And I don't want you hanging around up here. Well, take a cab or walk. I don't care what you do. What? I can't understand you. What? What? Goodbye, Doris. Where was I? Walter. Yes? You are going to reconsider about Tom Bennett, aren't you? Bennett was insolent this afternoon. I won't tolerate insolence. Yes? Shine, Mr. Channing. Shine? No! What's he doing down here this time of night? Half the staff's working overtime. Kerry's an enterprising shoeshine boy. Might have missed someone on his rounds this afternoon. Walter, about Tom Bennett. Forget Bennett! Look, do you upset the inkwell? Oh. Quick, <clears throat> block the stuff. Yes, of course. Did any spill on you? Spot of my trouser cuff. Lucky you didn't get on the carpet. Walter, about Tom Bennett. I told you to forget Bennett. All right, Walter, all right. Well, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you'd be better off to use him as a model. A model? If he knows he's not wanted around here, he'll have the self-respect to get out. Meaning? Well... You've known for a long time you're not wanted. And you're still here. How you'd like to fire me. Denying that would be silly. I've been with this firm 15 years in January. Employees get a bonus of stock shares after 15 years' service. That's what I'm waiting for, and you know it. Suppose we get back to that memorandum. You'd like to get me out before I collect those shares, wouldn't you? I said let's get on with the memo. You'd be petty enough to do it, too, if you knew how. There may be a way. There isn't, and you know it. I'm too careful. You can't fire me without cause, and I've given you no cause, Walter. Nothing you can possibly dictate one of your vicious little memorandums about. Don't try my patience too far, Brenda. Walter, what? This this can't be us talking like this, you and me hating each other. (laughs) I find it remarkable there ever was anything between us except hate. Walter. I mean it. Look at you. You were flashy when I met you. You're getting flashier. That means cheaper, Brenda. Stop it. Too much lipstick? Too much rouge? Hair too bright? Dress too tight? You're trying too hard, Brenda. You're labeling yourself like a sound wagon. I wonder what it is that stops me from killing you. Cowardice, of course. Now, when you've stopped sniveling, we'll get on with a memorandum. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Notice. In the interest of economy and efficiency, junior executives will confer in the conference room, not in private offices. Mid-afternoon coffee and personal phone calls and daily shoe shines will be eliminated. Your name is Barclay, Brenda Barclay. Very well, Miss Barclay, what can I do for you? Mr. Wolf, I... I don't know how to begin. Well, maybe I can make this easier all around by briefing Mr. Wolf on the Walter Channing case. Uh, hey, that's funny. What? Violet eyes. I always thought there was something the poets made up. Archie. Huh? Oh, the, Ch- the, the Channing case, yes. One moment, uh, Miss Barkley. Look this way, please. Hmm? To me, an eye is functional object found in mammals, birds, fish, potatoes, and horticulture. Thank you. Go on, Archie. Walter Channing was the boy wonder of advertising. At 33, executive vice president of Winslow Hart and Stratemeyer. Just 24 hours ago, they found him at his desk, shot through the heart. They? Who is they? A night porter and a shoeshine boy, is that right? Yes. Hmm. He'd been dead about an hour. The bullet went through Channing, his desk chair, and lodged in the windowsill behind him. Police thought at first it was suicide. The gun? Uh, 38, found it on the floor, 10 feet away. 
No fingerprints. Anyhow, no clear ones. Sell them out on a gun butt. You say suicide was suspected. Why? The gun was ten feet from the body. It was the... the smudges. Smudges? Powder burns. According to the papers, he was sitting at his desk. There were no signs of a struggle. The gun was held against his chest and fired. But it wasn't suicide, Mr. Wolfe. Walter Channing would never have killed himself. The police have already decided that, finally, according to the evening papers. And I presume you, Miss Barclay, are a suspect. No, not yet. But you expect to be. That's why you came to me. When the police talked to her, I... Her? Doris, his wife. I've been Walter Channing's secretary for eight years. At one time, we... We thought we were in love. Mrs. Channing was aware of this? Yes. Oh, it was a long time ago. It was over. It was finished a long time ago. But she never believed that. Neither did Alan. Alan who? Alan Melick, head of the media department at the agency. We were going to be married when I... When Walter and I... Well, we... Decided you were in love. Miss Barkley, who finally decided you were not? You or Mr. Channing? He did. I see. Mr. Melick believes you did not share this change of heart. Yes. Oh, he's such a fool. I dare say you fear Mrs. Channing or Mr. Melick or both will reveal this ill-fated romance. You know what the papers will make of it, what the police will try to make of it. Uh, Miss Barkley, did you kill Channing? No. Oh, no, I swear I didn't. Oh, Mr. Wolf, I didn't. Please, for heaven's sake, no tears. Archie, put her in a cab. Yes, sir. Then come up to the plant room. There are some things I want you to execute for me. Yes, sir. Women. Bah! Yes, Mr. Goodwin, I'm Abe Jackson, a night porter. It was working late that night. Mr. Channon, his secretary, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Melick, and his secretary. Uh, about 10.30, I met the shoe shine Kelly, on Mr. Channon's floor. There was a light burning in Channon's plate. We went in to turn it off, Kelly and me, and there he was, sitting at his desk, a hole as big in his chest. Tell me, Mr. Bennett, did Channing have any enemies in the agency? Uh, Channing was a slave driver, Mr. Goodwin. The girls hated him and men were afraid of him. He'd send out memos like this one around. Here, yeah, take a look at it. It's typical. No coffee, no shoe shines, no office conferences. If you want my opinion, as one employee out of 150, whoever killed Walter Channing did the rest of us a favor. You're Amy Long, secretary to Alan Mealick. Now, what can you tell... I can tell you plenty. How she jilted Mr. Mealick, took up with Mr. Channing, got thrown over by him. I, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say Brenda Barkley would murder anyone. But if she did, Walter Channing would be 1A. Channing, get his shoe shine by you? I called the agency man, sir. You know, it was Jackson and me found him. Everyone else had gone and left himself, poor soul, sitting at his desk, dead. Uh, this specimen, a Manama's trained orchid. Beautiful, isn't it, Mrs. Channing? Hmm. Mr. Mellick? Hmm. I could never quite like orchids. They have no smell, you know. It's pretty all right, but tulips are more in my line, Mr. Wolf. Tulips, Mr. Mellick? I had a stand of emperors this spring. Emperors, come in, Archie. Emperors, Mr. Mellick? That's the name of a tulip, Mr. Wolf. A peasant flower, I've heard of it, of course. Archie. Mrs. Channing, Mr. Mellick, my assistant, Mr. Goodwin. Mr. Goodwin. I didn't know you had company. Mr. Wolfe asked us here to explain why Brenda Barkley is worried. And you have both agreed to respect her position. Brenda ought to know I'd never tell the police anything to get her into trouble. Fooey. Sir? He said fooey, Mr. Mellick, meaning he doubts what you say and does not admit your right to say it. Archie, Mr. Mellick, you say you would never intentionally inform on Miss Barkley. Certainly not. The tongue slips, sir. We would expect you to guard your... What? Do you think What that... I started to say, you asked us here because Brenda Barkley is your client. I despise Miss Barkley. Everyone knows that and why. But I wouldn't stoop to implicating her in murder. You believe her innocent then, Mrs. Channing? I believe she lacks the gumption to pull a trigger. Poison, I wouldn't put past her at all. Mr. Melick, would you be kind enough to see me home? Of course, Mrs. Channing. Good day, Mr. Wolf. Good day. And Mr. Goodwin. You have, I suppose, an exhaustive report from me, Archie. Seven pages of notes. Save them and get me a bottle of beer. You're in a rosy mood. What happened? I said I would like a bottle of beer. No, you wouldn't. 
Ah, gee, you better... Don't puff up about it. Those vest buttons won't stand the strain. I can't get you a bottle of beer. Why not? You ordered me to hold you to four a day. I rescind the order. You also ordered me not to let you rescind the order. What's the matter with you, anyhow? I've had to entertain two very dull people too long. Both those dull people are prime suspects. Mrs. Channing is a woman scorned. Melick lost his girl to the guy who was killed. I can't blame her for throwing him over. Archie, the man grows tulips. What? Tulips. <laughs> well, give me a report. I checked the agency, everybody who was working down there the night of the murder. Also, I dropped in on Inspector Kramer at Homicide. Also, I visited the morgue. Why the morgue? Because if I hadn't, you'd have said, why not the morgue? Go on. I drew a blank there. Kramer let me look at the clothes Channing was wearing. There was an ink stain on the left trouser cuff. An ink stain? And a hole through his shirt front with plenty of powder smudge like the paper said. He was shot with a thirty-eight at point-blank range, sitting down. An impolite corpse. What? Discourteous. He didn't rise to meet his murderer. That is most significant, Archie. I know. I've got a theory about this case. No theories, facts, if you please. But look, Channing owned a thirty-eight. That's a fact. It's disappeared. That's another fact. The murder gun was a thirty-eight with the numbers filed off, and it could be Channing's own gun. Thereby proving what, Archie? That his wife had access to it. Your theory involves Mrs. Channing, then? And Malik. She decides her husband is less trouble to her, dead than alive. A regrettable tendency of wives. Have you noticed? <laughs> and she sells Malik on the idea. Now, that wouldn't be hard. They figure to make it look like suicide, but Melik loses his head and runs, drops the gun on his way out, and... Oh, you don't buy it. Enough of theories, the facts, Archie. Out of your notebook. One. Nine people were on the scene that night, working late for one reason or another. Mrs. Channing tells me she was visiting a doctor's office in the same building, by the way. Two. Every one of those people hated Channing. Three... Here's a sample of why he wasn't popular. Memorandum. Dictated the night he was killed. The staff got it the next morning. Hmm. A whipcracker, ah, uh, Mr. Cheney. Fact four. The ink stain on his trouser cuff was partly rubbed out. With what? Cleaner of some kind. I didn't get the brand. Fact five. There's a spot on the carpet near Channing's chair. Spot of what? Ink? Blood? Looks like ink. It looks like ink. Well, I didn't analyze it on the spur of the moment. My chemical set isn't working so good, boss. And... Fooey. Archie, I want two things. Yes, sir. Get over to headquarters. The police have Channing's trousers. Suggest to Inspector Kramer that he have the stain analyzed. Suggest also that the spot on the carpet be analyzed at the same time. Be around him when the information arrives. This is be kind to the police week? Fooey. I never have sought to beat the police on matters of fact, only on interpretation, deduction. Get going. Oh, and Archie. Yes? When you return, I should discourse upon the sanctity of deskhood. The sanctity of what hood? Deskhood. Now be off with you, and please remember you're tracking a murderer. Don't stub your toe. Goodwin, the thing on the carpet was a dye of some kind. Dye, huh? Uh-huh. How long will it take the lab to give you the analysis on it, Inspector? Oh, not very long. I've got the report on what was used on the trouser cuff right now, though. And? They found traces of carbon tetrachloride. Wait a minute. This goes in the notebook. A carbon tetrachloride. And something else. Goodwin, what's Wolf after? Interpretations was what he said, Inspector. You object? No. Maybe I'll get an interpretation, too. The something else was perchloroethylene. Perchloroth... Why, Inspector, such language. The phone. I... Oh, not back yet. Hello? Mr. Wolf? Yes? This is Brenda Barkley. Oh, Mr. Wolf. What is it, Miss Barkley? You've got to come to Mr. Channing's office right away, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Goodwin has been to your office. Everything I need to know, You've he... You've got uh... to come, Mr. Wolf. 
Nonsense, I don't go out. My digestion disapproves of it. I disapprove of it. But, Mr. Goodwin, he's in danger. What? What's that? Terrible danger. He needs you here at once. Archie, in danger? Let me talk to him. Please, come. Hurry. What's happened? Hello. Sparkly. Fritz, get out of the car. Bring me my wool muffler and worsted vest. See if you can find my galoshes. Confound it, I've got to go out. Go on up. Step to the rear of the car, please. <laughs> Mister, will you please step back? I'm back as far as I can go. <laughs> you are? Elevators. Contraptions for little men. Come, come. Take me up, young man. Hold it. Hold that car. I'm late for a date with a blonde. 16th floor, buddy. Evening, Mr. Goodman. Good evening. I was told you were in danger. Danger? I... Mr. Wolf! You were... What are you doing out down here? Sparkly's idea. About me being in danger? Obviously, she was lying. I suspected at the time. But I fell in with her suggestion. I'm anxious to end the case. My presence here is needed. Don't understand why she'd do such a thing. And why is your presence needed? Sixteenth floor. It's a matter of uh, <laughs> perspective. <laughs> Brenda's got a very nice perspective. She'll be around here someplace. The agency's got this whole floor. Her office? Down this corridor, next to Channing's. Well, Kramer came through on those reports from the lab. That smudge on the carpet wasn't ink. It was a dye, powdered aniline. Brenda! Oh, oh, Mr. Wolf, thank heavens you're here. Hey, I'm here too. The police, they questioned me again this afternoon. I'm so frightened, Mr. Wolf. You've got to find the murderer before they... Before Baby, they... take it easy. Well... Oh, hello, Archie. Hello. What's the idea of trying to pull a fast one on Mr. Wolf? Well, I just had to see him. Please understand. Is this Channing's office? Yes. You told him I was in danger. Ah, at last. The place to sit down. Well, I had to tell him something to get him down here. He's not happy. Are you comfortable there, sir? Miss Barkley, come here. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I can explain. I-, I thought if you were here where it happened... I mean, if you could see for yourself, then you'd... Young woman, there are many things I'd like to say to you. Oh, now, wait a minute. She was scared, boss. However, I am too short of breath to do them justice. Uh, Archie. Yes? Round up everyone concerned with this case. Right now? Including Mrs. Channing. Get them in here. Yes, sir. You help him, Miss Barkley, and close that window. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Fresh air. I've had enough today, thanks to you, to last me a lifetime. If after all that exposure, (laughs) I live a lifetime. What's going on here, anyhow? A tea party. Find yourself seats, keep your knees steady. All right, Mr. Wolf, everybody's here. Mr. Shushine Kelly? Uh, Here, sir, here. It was you who found the body. Him and me, Miss Wolf. I'm Abe Jackson, a night man. You gentlemen can help us, if you will. Oh, to be sure, Mr. Wolf. I'd like to know the exact position of the body when you found it. Well, he was sitting up. Uh, that's it, sir. Sitting up straight as you please. You'll oblige me if you'll demonstrate. Sit in the chair, please. His chair, sir? If you please. <clears throat> Abe. You. Yeah. Oh, no, no, not me. Not on your life. Uh, there's no easy thing you ask, Mr. Wolf. I... Uh, but uh, I'll oblige you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it was like, uh, like this, I'd say. You agree, Mr. Jackson? A little more to the right, maybe. Yeah, that's the way he was. Archie. Yes, sir? Help me with a brief recapitulation. Well, um, so far as we know, Channing made no outcry. Therefore, he could not have been startled by the appearance of the killer. There were powder burns on the body. Therefore, the gun was against Channing when it was fired. His own hand couldn't have held it closer. Nobody heard the shot, probably because this office is soundproofed. The gun that killed him was lying on the floor ten feet from the desk. In the direction of flight through that door. Go on, Archie. The killer was almost certainly well known to Channing, or Channing wouldn't have let him come that close without a struggle or an alarm. Also, the killer had access to this office, another proof that he's not a stranger. One more point, if I may, Archie. The killer, he or she, is present here now. Quiet, everyone. We come now to the point I mentioned to you last night, Archie. 
The paint I call the sanctity of deskhood. Sanctity of what? Deskhood, Mrs. Jennings. Explain, Archie. Still figure it's so important? Absolutely essential. Well, I wrote it here somewhere. Oh. Deskhood refers to that area behind a desk where a man earns his livelihood, makes his career, builds his reputation. You mean here? Where I'm sitting? So long as a man sits at his desk, he enjoys a curious area of privacy. He is remarkably safe from intrusion. That's it, Mr. Wolf. The sanctity of deskhood. Think about it a moment. You'll see what I mean. Nonsense. I've gone around that desk hundreds of times. I'm sure she has many more hundreds. If you mean what I think you mean, Mrs. Channing, you Please, are... lady. Mrs. Channing, when you approached your husband at his desk, what did he do? What did he... Why, he stood up and... He stood up. Sparkly, you agree? Well, yes, he'd have to stand up. At least he always did. But for his murderer, he did not. Archie, resume from your notes, please. Well, whoever killed Walter Channing went around the desk without Channing rising, held a gun to his chest, and pulled the trigger. Excuse me. If you will go behind the desk and stand facing Mr. Kelly, Archie... Here. This the way you mean? You know the angle of the body wound or the hole in the chair? There wasn't any angle. One was in a straight line with the other. From where you stand now, in front of Mr. Kelly... If you wish to inflict an identical wound upon him, could you do it? Not from where I stand. I'd have to kneel. You'd have to kneel. Do so. No, please, the murder tableau. Oh, no, 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 his motive is crystal clear. The memorandum. Memorandum. You have a copy, Archie? In my notebook. Ah, yes. Miss Barclay, read the part which could explain Mr. Kelly's action. No, no, no. Why, no the you memo was all over the office. Kelly must have seen oh, it. Oh, wait a minute now. A notice effective at once. Yes, here it is. In the interest of economy, daily shoe shines will be eliminated. That'd cut off Kelly's bread and butter. Kelly, I can't believe it. No, can I? What? It's obvious Kelly murdered Walter Channing. Mr. Wolf, now listen, I did nothing... But the obvious can be too obvious. Meaning what exactly? Archie? Yes, sir? Brief these people on the ink-stained trousers. Channing spilled ink on his trouser cuff the night he was murdered. Somebody tried to clean the spot off. With what? According to the police analysis, carbon tetrachloride and perchloroethylene showed up. Both non-inflammable ingredients used in many commercial cleaners. Exactly what are you getting at, Mr. Wolf? One moment, Mrs. Channing. Mr. Goodwin also has an analysis of the spot on the carpet behind the desk. Argy? A powder form of dye, aniline dye. Used in what, perhaps? Well, uh, the lab suggested a shoe dressing. I got no powder dye. I, I, I swear I ate, Mr. Wolf. I'm sure you haven't, Mr. Kelly. You'll find this particular type of dressing is used on women's shoes, suede shoes, usually. I don't understand. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes, Archie? If a woman... To... Now, su suppose a, a woman knelt in front of Channy to clean that ink spot off his trouser cuff. That smudge could have rubbed off the tip of her shoe onto the carpet. Exactly. I believe you'll find a typewriter cleaner contains tetrachloride and perchlorethylene. Something else just occurred to me. That memo was sent around the morning after Channing was killed. I never thought of that. True, Archie. And for only one purpose, to point suspicion at Kelly. But when the police didn't take the hint, Go on, Archie. Why then? Somebody else was brought down here who would. Comes around to three questions, doesn't it? Who knew about the memo? Who had access to Channing's file where he kept his gun? And who made sure Nero Wolf would see the evidence against Kelly? Three questions, Archie, with one answer that spells the name of the murderess. Our own client, Brenda Barkey. Steak, Archie, man, did you like it? I'm not hungry. Indeed, I suggest a tonic. That reminds me. <laughs> I had a call. You had? Doris Channing. She had some idea about my uh, explaining things to her. She found my explanation insufficient? No, but she felt it lacked the personal touch. Phooey. Hand me a can of beer. <laughs> However, you do have the evening off. Yes, sir. Keep out of trouble. Hmm. Doris Channing is a blonde. 
That is try to keep out of trouble. In the company of a blonde who wants to. Good night, sir. Good night, Archie. Good night. You have been listening to the new adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by William Kendall Clark was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Donald Morrison, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, Mary Lansing, and Barney Phillips. Next week, at this same time, Nero, Wolf, and Archie will bring you the case of The Girl Who Cried Wolf. John Storm speaking. <laughs> Nero Wolf, Archie, and all of our cast hope that our listeners have taken time out from this busy Christmas season to help brighten some youngster's Christmas day. Be sure to send a thing, your choice of anything you think a child would like for Christmas, to the groups in your own town who are distributing these toy gifts to less fortunate children. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The FBI in Peace and War, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS five weeks from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's an enchanted island or a prison, a crazy happy dance, or a funeral march in blues time. It's a sorcerer's palace with golden mirrors and jeweled fountains, or it's a wailing wall corroded with pain. Call it anything you want, it's My Beat. One of the ways to get on my beat is to infiltrate through the grim lines of people trying to buy tickets to South Pacific. Those people are going to mutiny someday. It was about nine in the morning and a good thing happened to me. The good thing was a kid named Paul Thomas. A sweet kid, a gentle kid. A kid who'd wrapped himself in iron to stall off the pain so many people handed to him for free. Mr. Clover, Mr. Clover, could I talk to you for a minute? Sure, Paul, sure, any place, any time. How about in the lobby here? Okay, lobby it is. I'm sure glad to see you, Paul. It's been a long time. Not so long, Mr. Clover. It's only five, six months since you got me that job. Maybe seven months since you caught me breaking into a store. Uh, Who remembers what happened seven months ago? How's the job, Paul? How's it working out? Mr. Eric Karen has been treating me fine. He's even had me bonded so I could deliver all that jewelry and stuff. I bet your folks are proud. Yeah, they're real proud, Mr. Clover. I've been meaning to get up to Harlem to visit them. Your mother's a fine woman, Paul. Give her my best. I'll do that, Mr. Clover. She keeps asking about you. Paul, it's a good thing to see you the way you are. I'm in trouble, Mr. Clover. I think I'm in big trouble. Oh? You want to tell me about it here? We could go someplace and get a quiet cup of coffee. I better tell you about it fast, Mr. Clover. A couple of days Danny, ago they came... Danny, Clover, how's Broadway's grabber boy? How's the finest of the finest, oh, eh? Oh, hi, Kirk. <laughs> Am I interrupting something, Danny? The boy won't mind being interrupted, will you, boy? Maybe I mind, Kirk. Oh, no offense, Danny. Come on, ask me how I am. Ask me how I've been doing. How are you? How you been doing? Oh, great. Very, very great, Danny. Yes, sir. Don't I rate an introduction to the boy, Danny? Paul, this is Jerry Kirk, a private investigator. Paul Thomas, Jerry Kirk. 
Hi, Mr. Kirk. Danny, you don't keep up. A smart detective like you should keep up. I'm not a private eye anymore. No? Well, so long, Kirk. See you around. No, no, no. I'm not a private eye anymore. I'm in the plush, Danny. Plush office, plush stipend, furnished by Acme Insurance Company. I investigate insurance losses for them. Oh, it's a lot easier than breaking down doors to haul apartments. But not so much fun, huh, Kirk? <laughs> more, Danny, more. It even gives me the price of a couple of tickets to South Pacific here. But, uh... How about you, Danny? You still hitting the triple features in the grind houses, Danny? Goodbye, Kirk. <laughs> yeah, it's been swell seeing you, Danny. I'm sorry about him, Paul. Now, tell me what's on your mind. I can, Mr. Clover. I got to get to work. I'm late. I'm late. Paul, Paul, come back here. That's how the day began, with the kids starting to tell me a big trouble and then running away. It was about five when Paul's big trouble started to catch up with me. A patrolman leaned out of a squad car and handed me a slip of paper. J. Arakarian, the paper said. It said the Paramount Building, and at the bottom it said, Urgent. I'd been there before. J. Arakarian, lapidary and dealer in precious gems, was on the 14th floor. You went through a door and past the beam of an electric eye and waded through a carpet to a desk and an olive-skinned girl with tight black hair. You gave your name and you got nodded past another beam and some carved oriental wall hangings to a young man. Morning coat cut to hide the lines of his shoulder holster and sneer cut to fit the scar that ran from his eye to the corner of his mouth. Then a chaperone hike through another doorway. And there he was, J. Arakarian. Impeccable in ascot, striped pants, and a Legion of Honor ribbon in his satin lapel. He had another thing, a guest. I asked Mr. Jerry Kirk to be with us, Lieutenant Clover, because his interests lie in the same direction as ours. Hiya, Kirk. What's all this about? Mr. Arakarian will tell you, Danny. You see that, Lieutenant. What do you want to see me about, Mr. Arakarian? About the boy you asked me to hire. About Paul Thomas. You know Paul Thomas, don't you, Danny? What about Paul Thomas? Mr. Arakarian is a polite man, Danny. He's trying to tell you the kid absconded with an awful lot of jewelry. Uh, please. This matter is very dolorous to me. A hundred thousand dollars worth, Danny. How about letting Mr. Arakarian tell it his way, huh, Kirk? I was just phrasing it neatly. A hundred grand, Danny. Right now, you just listen, Kirk. What did Paul Thomas do, Mr. Arakarian? He failed to deliver a consignment. He failed to let me know the reason why. He has been gone since this morning. Disappeared. Like a puff of smoke, huh, Mr. Arakarian? That's what you said? They, they assign a bright eye like you to this, Kirk? Like me, Danny. Uh, Mr. Jerry Kirk is from the insurance company. If you're in a matter like this, one thinks of insurance. In a case like this, one also thinks of how maybe Paul got slugged. One also thinks he could have been robbed, Mr. Arakarian. Uh, uh. Paul Thomas turns up in an alley, Kirk. Slugged. A bet? Yeah, sure. I know human nature, Danny. He's gone a long way with those rocks. Absconded. He's stolen. Now, in a matter like this, the amount is not a pittance, Lieutenant. A hundred thousand dollars worth of first water gems, jewel cases, settings. Got a list of what's missing? Uh, right here. You see? It uh, makes not an inconsiderable... Yeah, it's not inconsiderable. It is very dolorous, Lieutenant. Uh, you'll get them back? Dollarus means it can make you cry. But Arakarian's dollarus was different from mine. His was a hundred grand he'd lost. Mine was a boy named Paul Thomas that maybe I'd lost. But it was still only a maybe. I had two things to do. Turn the list of missing jewels into headquarters, which I did. Then call it Paul's home in Harlem. Harlem is a guilt and a scar and a wound. And the wound is a tenement lighted by kerosene lamps. A tenement with barred windows through which you can watch the moonlight darting out on the backs of hungry rats. And Harlem is a place of quiet laughter that stops when it sees you walking up the stairs to the one room in which Paul's family of five live. Yes? Oh, it's Mr. Clover. Hi, Miss Thomas. I hardly expected to. Please forgive the way I look. I... Oh, you look fine, Mrs. Thomas. Fine. May I come in? Why, of course. Of course. The children outside playing. It's just as well, Mrs. Thomas. I want to talk to you. Please sit down, Mr. Clover. Sue? Is it about Paul? Why did you see him last, Mrs. Thomas? This morning. 
He stopped by on his way to work. Is there anything... He doesn't live here anymore? No, Mr. Clover. Paul's a man now, and he needs a place of his own. Where is it, Mrs. Thomas? Is my boy in trouble, Mr. Clover? Well, we don't know. I, I don't think so, but I have to be sure. Where's his place, Mrs. Thomas? It's a rooming house on 137th Street, 26 East. It's clean. You can actually see the sun. Paul couldn't do anything wrong. Not anymore, Mr. Clover. Paul's good. He's good. He hasn't been by here tonight. No, but that doesn't mean anything. Lots of times he doesn't come by at night, but he'll be here in the morning. He's always here for breakfast in the morning. Well, I think I'll run over to that address you gave me, Mrs. Thomas. Uh, sorry I can't stay and visit with you. You'll let me know about my boy, Mr. Clover. Whatever way it is, you let me know. It'll be all right, Mrs. Thomas. It has to be all right. <laughs> Outside, it was one block north and two to my left of the subway station at 125th and Lenox. In those three blocks, you could feel the breeze from the East River fighting a losing battle with the heat. But it wasn't the heat that stopped me. It was squad car 15, patrolman Florio at the controls. Eh, not bad, Florio. Three-point landing. Hi, Lieutenant. Come on, get in. Thanks. Are you headed uptown? Well, that depends, Lieutenant. Wherever you say. Uptown? Yeah, you better call headquarters first. I've been cruising, looking for you. Headquarters said you were in Harlem. Yeah, I'll call them, Florio. Sure. Patrol car 15 calling headquarters. Come in. Patrol car 15 calling headquarters. Headquarters receiving patrol car 15. Go ahead, 15. I right, take it, Danny. Yeah. Danny Clover speaking. Danny, Cartaglia speaking. About that Arakarian robbery. Guy named Jerry Kurt called you. Yeah. Said he wanted you there when he took Paul Thomas. Oh, where's all this taking place? 137th Street, a condemned tenement, three houses from the the northeast corner on Lennox. Ten o'clock, the guy said. That's right now, Tartaglia. Thanks. Let's go, Florio. You heard the man. Right. Florio. Yeah, Lieutenant? You're only giving me a lift down the block. Turn off that siren, huh? you showed. Headquarters said you had Paul. You got him, Kirk? He's in that tenement, Danny. But he materialized out of that puff of smoke? How do you know he's in there? Look, Danny, a guy steals $100,000 worth of jewelry. It's hot. He can't get rid of it. So he makes a deal with the insurance company. The deal Paul made was for fifteen grand. He got in touch with you? Yeah, sure. He said meet him here. So I got in touch with you. I'm double-crossing him, Danny. I called in the cops. You wouldn't want it any other way. Yeah, let's go in. And, Kirk, keep your gun in your pocket. Danny, you know I seldom carry a gun, and tonight's one occasion when I don't. Come on. Hey, it's pretty dark. Lucky I brought a flash. Paul. Paul Thomas. Let me handle it, Kirk. Paul. Paul, it's Danny Clover. Paul. Paul. Maybe he isn't here, Kirk. He's here. That sound came from down in the basement. Hey, Kirk, somebody's shooting downstairs and not at us. Yes, and somebody's taking a powder, too. Let's get him. Don't you think it's time you got out your gun, Danny? Yeah, it's all changed now. Hey, huh? shine your light over there. Where? Back of the staircase. Yeah. Hey, Danny. A body. Danny, look, he's got a gun. Paul. Paul. He's dead, Danny. Your boy's dead. Why was he killed? He was a bad boy, Danny. A bad boy with bad company, and the company just took a powder. How do you like your boy now, Danny? <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
Casey, crime photographer, finds an innocent-eyed young woman riding a murder-go-round tonight. As he joins her, his girlfriend, reporter Ann Williams, and Ethelbert, the magnificent bartender, caution him to go slow. For a merry ride with murder, join Casey and his pals tonight. And also be around for Second Class Passenger, another thrilling study in Escape. Crime photographer and Escape are Thursday night features of most of these same CBS stations. Now, back to Broadway's My Beat. One thing about Broadway, you can become a name overnight. All you have to do is have three current wives or ride four winners in a row. Or you can do it the way Paul Thomas did. Get caught up in a $100,000 jewel theft. Keep your mouth shut about it by being found dead in a Harlem tenement. Not that Paul Thomas would make much of a splash, but he would make a fast 30 seconds conversation piece over cheesecake and coffee. A cop uses up the night begging, pleading, grubbing for a break in a murder case. Then he goes home and begs for sleep. And in the morning he goes back to his office at headquarters and starts all over again. And that's where it broke. Come in. Come in. Come in. Danny. Well, Danny, open your eyes. I got a surprise for you. You open them, I'm tired. I got something on the Paul Thomas case. What? Yeah. See? You open your eyes all by yourself. It's not hard, is it, Danny? I could close yours just as easy. What do you got? Hmm. Well, one of the Arakarian jewels showed up at a pawn shop. When? 10.30 last night. 10.30? That was after Paul's murder. How come you wait till now to give it to me? Easy, Danny. Take it easy. All right, all right, but how come? Larry of Larry's Pawn Shops Limited just phoned it in. Says he didn't get our list till 10 this morning. Larry, sir. Give me a squad car, Tartaglio. I'll pick it up up front. Okay. Uh, Danny. Yeah? I know what this means to you. Sorry I kidded. That's okay, Sergeant. It's okay. But get that squad car, huh? <laughs> Danny, boy. Danny, you. This is quite an honor. Hi, Larry. Hi. I, I could have saved you the trip if you just called me. You needed the air. Okay, Larry, what do you got? Yeah. Danny, you, do you mind stepping in the back room? I'm trying to close a deal. Sometimes sometimes it embarrasses my clientele to see me consorting with a detective. Ain't it a shame. Give it to me, Larry, and quick. Oh, Danny, this isn't like you. To... You want me to show you what I can really be like? Okay, okay, Danny. Okay, I'll get it for you. Uh, think it over, miss. I'll be right with you. Uh, here. here it is, Danny. Here you see? Hmm? This diamond ring matches up exactly with the one on the Arcarian issue boy sent me. If I say so myself, it's a beauty. Yeah, yeah, but who pawned it? it it's on a ticket. A guy named Alan West lives at this address on 115th Street. At least that's the name of the address she gave me. Uh, you know where to send it. Send the ring. Uh, it hides me to part with it. Say, so isn't it polite the way I cooperate with you boys, Danny? You'll remember it, won't you? Sure. By the way, what did you give the girl for the ring? It's worth two grand. I gave her six hundred. Can't hear you, Larry. How much? Six hundred. Still can't hear. It was worth two grand. I gave her six hundred dollars. Oh, oh, Danny, I could kill you. Hey, mister, you didn't hear what I said. I, I, I was just kidding. I, pay no attention. I didn't mean it. I'm ready to offer you a little more. The girl whose name might be Ellen West lived in a street that might have been anywhere. It could have been a market street in the slums of Madrid or Rome or Athens or New Orleans. It could have been anywhere. But right now it was under the bridge of the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad. Right now it was a street where Paul's murderer might be waiting in a dark room behind a locked door, waiting for a knock that had to come. Yes? Who is it? The police. Open up. Please, why you come here? I haven't done anything. Are you Ellen West? That's right. That's my name. How you know my name? I don't know you. Uh, I'm Danny Clover, Ellen. Broadway special detail. I'd like to ask you some questions. Mr. Danny Clover? Uh huh? Paul told me a lot about you. Please come in, Mr. Clover. Thanks. You knew Paul Thomas? 
I knew him. I knew him better than anybody. We were going to be married. How old are you? Sixteen, Ella? Eighteen. Going on nineteen. That's not too young to get married, Mr. Clover. I mean, it wouldn't have been. Ellen, you pawned a ring yesterday. Where'd you get it? Did Paul give it to you? Where would Paul get a ring like that, Mr. Clover? Where'd you get it, Ellen? Came in the mail. So you have the package it came in? I threw it away, Mr. Clover. I threw it away. Because I didn't want to know where to send it back. Maybe you should have given it to the police. Maybe I should have done what I did. I got $600 for that ring, Mr. Clover. With $600, two people like Paul and me could get married. Did you tell Paul about the ring? I didn't see Paul yesterday, Mr. Clover. I didn't see him to tell him about the ring. Or anything. I've got so much to tell him. <laughs> Paul's mother said he had a room of his own. Did you ever see it? I saw it. I met his roommate, Joe Kendall. His roommate? Well, not exactly. You see, Mr. Clover, where Paul lived, that room of his own, that was just a place where he could sleep for eight hours. Joe Kendall had it for the other eight hours. They do that a lot up here. Yeah, I know, I know. Now, that's all, Ellen. Just one thing. You won't go away. Where would I go, Mr. Clover? Mr. Clover. Yes, Ellen. Here's the six hundred dollars. I got no use for it now. The hotbed address of Paul's roommate, Joe Kendall, didn't pan out. But a suddenly forgetful landlord suddenly regained his memory when he put on a pair of wire-rimmed glasses and examined my police badge. His cooperation from that instant was a thing of joy. Joe Candle was working right now, mister. Joe Candle worked in the change booth in the subway station at 59th Street. You want some change, mister? No, Jay. Information. What kind of information? Your name, Joe Candle? Uh, that all depends on uh, what connection the name's being used. In connection with the police. Uh, show me. Try this. Yeah. Yeah, that badge says you're the police. Says my name's Joe Kendall. What can I do for you, Lieutenant? It's about Paul Thomas, Joe. I read about him in the papers this morning. I'm sorry about Paul. How sorry? Lieutenant? Now, uh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, here you are, lady. Two dimes and a nickel. Lieutenant, it's this Maybe way. Maybe I asked you a bad question, Joe. Not at all. I'm... Sorry about Paul, Lieutenant. As sorry as I am for any man who died the way Paul did. What about Paul? What did he tell you about himself? Well, things like I'm tired, Joe. That's what he used to say to me. When he woke me up because it was his turn to sleep, he'd tell me things like that. That's all? Other things too, Lieutenant, but that was a general idea. Something else, Joe. That ring on your finger. Where'd you get it? Are you going to believe me? Okay, Lieutenant. I'll tell you anyhow. I got it in the mail yesterday. You should have let the police know. I should have, but I didn't. Maybe I was going to. Maybe I was going to pawn it. I don't know. You'd better let me have it. Uh, sure, sure. Here. Take it. Lieutenant, I'm in trouble now, huh? I guess right now you come under a couple of laws in the penal code, Joe, but which one escapes me? Just don't run away. I'll be here, Lieutenant. Here or in Harlem, one place or the other. It was a decision I had to make about the girl Ellen West and about Joe Kendall. And it was a decision I made. They turned up with a part of the missing jewelry and a strange story how they'd got it, and I didn't book them. I didn't put a tail on them. If they told the truth, it gelled an idea that was shaping itself. If they'd lied, I'd know it before the day was over. Back at headquarters, I made out my report that way and turned it in. Then there was nothing to do but trade stairs with Sergeant Tartaglia and wait for the report from the technical boys. Well, I don't know, Danny. I don't know. I'm not sure you did the right thing. Those two might have been holding back. Technical I'm... lab reports, Lieutenant. Ballistics, chemical, prints, all of them. Thanks. Okay, Lieutenant. 
Ballistics, nothing. No, I figured there'd be nothing there. Hey. Hey. So long, Tartaglia. Hey, Danny, where you going? Take a look at those reports. They'll make your red face even redder. Those photoelectric eyes wink even at you, huh, Eric Carrion? They make no distinction, Lieutenant, between friend or enemy. They're ever alert, ever suspicious. Yeah, you kept me waiting a long time, Eric Carrion. A jeweler has many things to take care of, Lieutenant. Sometimes you must keep even the police waiting. But you're not lonely. Did not Monsieur Artu amuse you? Oh, so that's his name. No, your flunky Artu didn't amuse me. He's so silent, so sinister, is that the word? <laughs> it's a good word for Artu. Tell me, Artu, that shoulder holster you wear under your morning coat, how do you avoid a bulge? You must have a good tailor. I wish I had a tailor like that. I will send you the name of Artu's tailor, Lieutenant. Is that all you wanted? That's just part of it. I'd like to have a look at your vaults. You wish to buy some jewelry wholesale? No, no, I'd just like to find some lost jewelry. Stolen, it says on this list. Stolen from a Mr. Eric Carrion. That's why I'd like to have a look at your vaults. You're insane, but I will humor you. But uh, first, a trifle. You have a warrant, Lieutenant? Now, what do you know about that? I clean forgot to get myself a warrant. But as you say, it's, it's a trifle. Now, how about the vaults? I do not think so, Lieutenant. In your country, I have learned to do everything. Comme il faut. How? Comme il faut. Translation, as it should be. Thanks. I like to learn new words. A warrant would be as it should be. Well, then I'll just have to get the vault open myself. Atto! Tell your flunky to take his hands off me. Atto is a very difficult man to tell things to. Not only does he not talk often... Often he does not listen. Tell him to take his hands off me. Perhaps you could persuade him yourself, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, perhaps I could. Oh, oh, oh had to. I went and spoiled your creases. You, you release me, I, I, Kirk. Well, Kirk, the eminent investigator, today on occasion for carrying a gun. You didn't have to shoot Eric Carrion. I did, Danny, to save you from getting knocked off. I had to do just that. Save me? What are you talking about? Well, look at him. Look at Eric Carrion's hand. He was just getting ready to pull a Luger. Yeah. Okay, Kirk, this wraps it up. Let me have your gun. Huh? What for? Ballistics will want it to check it against the slugs in the body. But you saw me shoot him, Danny. The gun, Kirk. Are you off your rocker, Danny? The gun. I've got a permit for this the gun. The gun! Oh. Ow. Yeah. Thanks for the gun. Oh, well, Sure. Sure, Danny, now that I know you were sincere about wanting it. Well, uh, like you said, this wraps it up. <laughs> you figured it a little ahead of me, that's all. Tell me how. Oh, easy. Eric Carrier never parts with the jewels and reports them stolen for insurance money. Yeah, true, true. Tell me, Kirk, how do you figure Paul Thomas figures? Also simple. Eric Carrion tells the kid to uh, make it look like the kid ran away. Well, uh, maybe Eric Carrion wanted to do it another way and the kid, well, the kid barked. Yeah, that's right, Kirk. Paul came to me yesterday and started to tell me he was in trouble. It adds up. Huh? It adds up neat. You know what else? Two of the gems showed up with two of Paul's friends. Eric Carrion mailed them to throw off suspicion. Clever, real clever. Yeah, but here's the twist. The gun Paul was holding in that tenement cellar had no fingerprints on it. Huh? He was dead before he went in that tenement, Kirk. Dead men leave no prints. Paul Thomas was dead before I saw you, Kirk. Hey, that is a twist. That scene in the condemned tenement. You and Eric Carrion staged it. That's why I want your gun, to what? check it against the slugs they took from Paul's body. You're crazy, Danny. Listen, how else I'm crazy? You killed Paul. You propositioned him and he'd have none of it, so you killed him. And you killed Eric Carrion so he wouldn't implicate you. You stink, copper. You stink, but you won't take me. I've been waiting for you to do that, Kirk. You are... Waiting. Ow! That's for Paul. Ah! For Paul. For Paul. Ow! Ow! What stopped me was something gentle. A tap on the shoulder, it was all. But it stopped me. The man from headquarters looked down at me and his tap was gentle. He said that was enough. I quit, but I didn't believe him. He said Kirk was something the law had to take care of. Then I had to believe him because I'm a cop. In the mid-afternoon heat, 
Broadway is a desert, a desert littered with mirages of what might be men or women. You touch some and they vanish. You touch others and they snarl and slink away. It's real or it's phantom. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for Broadway's My Beat. Mr. Keene, the famed tracer of lost persons, goes to society tonight. Knowing Mr. Keene, you'll realize at once that it's not so much the question of which fork, but which suspect. Mr. Keene's latest adventure, the Society Murder Case, will follow in just a few moments on most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's my beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's my beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. On Christmas Eve, Broadway's natives dance their Christmas dance to the music of carols flowing out of tinseled loudspeakers. The kids mash their noses against plate glass, lick it, and watch the mechanical clown, the mechanized tour army, the tin man dancing a jig on a tin box. Their eyes are dark with desire and hunger. They make a wish on a neon star. That's how it is on Christmas Eve on Broadway. My beat. On the morning of the day before Christmas, creatures are stirring at police headquarters. There's the patter of tired feet and the sound of manly giggles as little gifts are hidden in desk drawers or poured into Dixie cups or slipped under the police blotter. And in my office, there's a kid I knew, name of Marty Wednick. Danny, I don't like to disturb you at this unmentionable hour. Ten o'clock in the morning, unmentionable? You kidding? Sleep has not yet fled from my starry eyes. What makes me bounce from my pillow at an hour which is for the squares is a problem. What's your problem, Marty? Am I or am I not the child president of your branch of the Police Athletic League? You are. So I promised my constituency of fellow former delinquents a Santa Claus for Christmas. That's the problem. When are you going to give with a Santa Claus? <laughs> Don't laugh, Danny. A former delinquent shouldn't be disillusioned. Could make him a neurotic. So I repeat, on behalf of my constituents, where is Santa Claus? <laughs> oh, he'll be here in a minute, Marty. Sergeant Tartaglia... Oh, here he is. Come on in, Sergeant. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what This fun. guy's a sergeant? Huh? Hey, Tartaglia, this is uh, Marty Wednick. He wants Santa Claus. Oh, he's coming, Danny. He's coming. Come on in, Sandy. Everybody, make way, everybody, oh, for Santa Claus. Oh, <laughs> and what's your alias li- uh, uh, name, little boy? Ho, ho, ha. Hey. This guy's a Santa Claus. Who's the kid? The punk, Danny. Who is he? Marty Wednick, that's who I am. So you're Santa Claus, huh? <laughs> Audition me something. What? Why, you crummy Take little... Take your hands off me, Santa Claus. Is this the Christmas spirit? I'll give it to you in the mouth, fresh kid. You and how many rain? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, you two. Marty, this is Nick Norman. Nick Norman, the ex-con? How do you like this monster? For 15 years, I've been playing Santa Claus at Sing Sing with no complaints, mind you. The first day I am a free civilian playing me old part, the squirt gives me the hook. I resign from Sandy Claus. 
I didn't get treatment like this even from the guards. Well, take it easy, Nick. Marty didn't mean it. Did you, Marty? How was I to know that Santa Claus here was the world-famous light-fingered safe cracker? Ex-light-fingered, world-famous safe cracker, you. Well, does he meet with your approval, Marty? Well, the costume is sloppy, the beard's moth-eaten, but... Yeah, he'll do. Don't do me no favors, punk. You want to know something, Nick? What something? I like you. I think you are the best Santa Claus it has ever been my privilege to present to my constituents of the PAL. This is from the heart, Nick. Oh, that's better. You gotta show respect for Santa Claus. What time's your party? Eight o'clock tonight. You'll be there? I'll be there. Well, so long, Danny. Sergeant. <laughs> Santa Claus. See you at the party. Merry Christmas. That's a good kid. Appreciates the finer things. Feels good to be out, huh, Nick? Fifteen years is a long night without sleep, Danny. Yeah, feels good. And thanks for the job of Sandy Claus. I would miss it after all these years. And the deal we made. That feels good, too, huh? The de- oh, yeah, yeah, the deal. Sure, Danny. I'll keep my promise to you. That's good. You won't forget what happened 15 years ago on Christmas Eve. How can I forget? It was like today. I was all dressed up like Sandy Claus. I had a few idle hours, and right in front of me there just happened to be an idle safe. So I cracked it. So, so I got caught. Uh-huh. Now, what are you going to do now, between now and 8 o'clock, the time the party starts? Walk the thoroughfares and wish everybody joyous tidings and pat kids on the head. And, and leave you... their mother's purses alone. Oh, Danny, how can you talk to Sandy Claus that way? I promised you oh, that... I'm sure you did. Hey, Tataglia. Uh, yeah, Danny. Tag along with Santa Claus. Fresh air will do you both good. Oh, gee, thanks, Danny, thanks. You know, the fresh air will do us both good. Yeah, but hold his hand, Tataglia, so he won't get lost. We don't want him to get lost, do we? Oh, no, Danny. No, because what's Christmas without Santa Claus? Have fun, boys. So everybody was happy, and that was good, because it was the season for it. Sergeant Tartaglia was happy because I had not only given him permission to leave the room, I'd told him to go out and take a walk with Santa Claus. And everyone knows that Santa Claus is always happy, even if once upon a time he had to spread his glad tidings around Sing Sing. I considered it a while, and then I decided to inhale the bloom of Christmas as it filtered through police headquarters. And it made me feel happy, too. It lasted for two inhales. The sign on the door says Lieutenant Danny Clover. I don't believe in signs. What's your name? Uh Uh-uh. What's yours? I came prepared for a question like that. Here's my card. Uh, Thanks. Simon Larrabee. Real estate and rentals. You're renting something, Mr. Larrabee? Ah, that would give you the upper hand. Two questions to my one. And you haven't answered it yet. Danny Clover, like the sign says. That's my name. You're quite right. I am renting something. Go ahead. Rent away. I like to watch. I'm doing it now. Just looking at you. I'm renting that property known as the warehouse at 2290 East Grand Street. Well, if it makes you happy... Wait a minute. That's our clubhouse. That's where the kids are having our Christmas party. Are you? <laughs> What's the... <laughs> what else can it be? Where's the rent? Rent for what? Rent for that property known as the warehouse at 2290 East Grand Street. You mean it hasn't been paid? How much is it? It's sixty two fifty a month. Oh, that includes utilities. I'll pay it. The club's treasurer will reimburse me. You don't understand, Mr. Clover. When I rent something, I get a year's rent in advance. That comes to $750. And I want it before there's any party there. Are you kidding? Why are those kids going to get money like that? Oh, well, I'll give you until 8 o'clock to get the money, and I'll just sit right here until then. All right. Grab yourself a police gazette. Never touch the stuff. Suit yourself. Oh, excuse me, Simon. Danny Clover speaking. Danny! Yeah, what is it? I can hardly hear you, Curcio. Yeah, yeah, well, no wonder. Listen what I gotta talk through. Listen, Danny. Hey, you see what I mean? Why the sirens? What's the trouble? Sergeant Tartaglia is up a tree. What? Sergeant Tartaglia is in a tree on the Avenue 8 playground, Danny. He flipped his lid. He's telling anyone that'll listen that there ain't no Santa Claus. Hey, you better come on down, Danny. When I got down to the Avenue A playground, it was having the Christmas party of its life. A 30-foot tree complete with tinsel, candy canes, colored popcorn balls, firemen, and a scared sergeant policeman, forlorn and lost, pinned to its top branch. The fire department finally convinced Tartaglia that a ladder was a safe invention for getting down out of tall trees. At the bottom rung, he almost believed it. When his feet touched the ground, they gave him a blanket because he was suffering from shock. He was about to tell the newsreel boys his ordeal when I faced him. 
Oh, Danny. Danny, I, I was about to tell the newsreel boys my ordeal. Well, just tell me first, Otaglia, because I hardly ever get to the movies. I, I, I'll be with you in just a minute, sir. Oh, Danny, it was awful. It was something awful. I only ask this because there's so much about you I don't know, Tartaglia. Why do you climb trees? Oh, I don't, Danny. The height scares me. When I was a child, a tree threw me on the ground. Still, you climbed this tree. Why? Well, because I'm a policeman. That makes sense. But how? Well, sure it does, Danny. The kids see me. I am a policeman. They need to put a star on top of their Christmas tree. They ask me because I am a policeman and can do such things. I couldn't let the department down, Danny. So, so you leave Nick Norman alone all by himself because you don't want to let the department down. Oh, I knew you would say that. But I trusted Nick because he is Santa Claus. He told me I could trust him. Sure you can, Tartaglia. But what happened to Santa Claus? He's not around. That's right. There ain't no Santa Claus, like I've been saying. They told me you were saying that. What happened to him, Tartaglia? Well, Danny, whilst I was up in the tree pinning the star, below me I saw a big black bulletproof sedan. What kind? A big black bulletproof sedan. Now I know. Then what happened? Well, this big black bulletproof sedan stopped by Nick, our Santa Claus. Two men got out, talked him for a minute, then took him one by each arm, deposited him in the car, closed the door, and away they sped careening on two wheels. I yelled to them to stop Danny, eh, but I guess they didn't hear me on account of the hustle and bustle. Our Santa Claus, to tell you. Where is he? Where'd he go? Well, if I was Santa Claus, I know where I'd go. Not that it matters, but where? Well, to my mother. On Christmas Eve, she deserves something like that. I'm sure she does. Well, we have you now, Sergeant Tartaglia. Oh, make good in the newsreels, Tartaglia. This may be your big chance. Yeah? Are you Mrs. Norman? Hi. I'm Danny Clover. Yeah? May I come in, Mrs. Norman? Why? I want to talk to you. About what? About Nick, about your son. Come in. Thanks. In here, in the parlor. Sit down. Thank you. No, not on that seat, that one. What do you want to talk about, about Nick? Do you know where he is? No, you don't tell me no more. One day when he was nine years old, Nick said to me, he said, Ma, don't ask me where I've been no more, cause I'll lie to you. That's what he said. Then you don't know where he is. Don't make me go through that again, Sonny. Say, who are you to ask me questions? I told you I was... Yeah, yeah, you did. You said you Danny Clover. That don't mean nothing to me. Oh... You must be the guy come about, uh... Aha, uh-huh, I am. That's why I came. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, you tell me what you come here for. For, you know, just as you said. Oh, this I like. This lets me play cagey like in the old days. What are you talking about? You know your son, Nick. You got to square more than that, kiddo. What about Nick? We want him to be our Santa Claus. Bingo. That's good. Oh, it must be a good feeling, a young man like you. Big, strong, looking for Santa Claus. Me? I just sat here in my rocking chair. Mrs. Norman. Thinking about the times we had. Me and Big Ed, my husband. The time... I have to go now, Mrs. Norman. Where is your son? Oh... You made me go through it again. One day, when he was nine years old, Nick said to uh, me... Yeah, oh, thanks, Mrs. Norman. Ma, don't ask me where I've been. Hi, Danny. Uh, did you find Santa Claus? No, uh-uh, Tartaglia. What are you doing about it? Uh, me? Nothing. That's good. Anyone to see me? Uh, yeah, in your office. Uh, hey, Danny, Danny, well, what are you angry at me for, huh, Danny? Hey, Danny, what's this I hear about Santa Claus taking a powder? Uh, you'll get your Santa Claus, Marty. You still here, Simon Larrabee? Yes, 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 I'm waiting, just as I told you, I'm waiting for my 750 rent. Can you imagine this kind of Danny? On Christmas Eve, he wants his rent. 
This is a Christmas, no Santa Claus, no party. What am I going to tell my constituents? It'll work out, Marty. We'll get the money someplace. By 8 o'clock, Mr. Oh, Corbett. shut up, Simon. But Danny, no Santa Claus. Hold it. Hold it, everybody. I got a solution. Communications? This is Sergeant Tartagli in Danny Clover's office. An all-points bulletin. Pick-up man. Description? As follows. Height, 5 feet 11. Weight, 235. When last seen, was wearing a red suit, a red hat with bells and black boots. Identifying marks. Has a long, snow-white beard. What's his name? Santa Claus! You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. $51,000 in cash and wonderful prizes. Danny Seymour might play Santa Claus to you tonight, and he might fill up your stockings with that fifty-one grand if you can identify the phantom voice. Listen in just a little later tonight to Sing It Again. Broadway brings you Christmas in a lot of ways. You get dribbled around by the opposing teams of last-minute shoppers. You ride backwards on up escalators so you can be in a good position for the down escalators. You get mauled and shoved and picked over, and finally you get gift-wrapped and sent on your way. My way was out to lunch and back to police headquarters, holding my Christmas stocking in my hand. I had two things, no rent and no Santa Claus. Two nothings which made for an empty holiday. Sergeant Tataglia wasn't enjoying himself either, and he expressed himself with sentiment. Ah, humbug. What did you say, Tataglia? Bah, humbug, Danny. Uh, that's a Christmas expression I picked up to be used when you wished it was the 4th of July instead. Yeah, me too. Yeah, uh, you uh, seen the afternoon papers, Danny? Yeah, take a look at it. Uh, you look at it for me. What does it say? Well, first it has got a picture on the front page of a tree. In the tree is me. Mm-hmm. Then it says under it, it says, Officer Gino Tataglia... Yeah, hey, Danny, they spelled it right. Now, Officer Tartaglia spent the afternoon cavorting in a tree to the delight and applause of all the little... Well, it runs on like that. Oh, forget it. It wasn't your fault. Then that's what I tried to tell Mrs. Tartaglia. Doesn't she believe you? Danny, she called me on the phone. I said, hello? She said, signal Tarzan. Then she started laughing, hysterical. I can't get her to talk. Every time I pick up my phone, all I hear is Mrs. Tartaglia laughing. <sighs> I got my problems, too. Yeah, this is probably the first time in the history of Santa Claus that he's ever heisted from his appointed rounds. Maybe. Hey, did you get in touch with Nick's mother again, like I told you? Oh, Danny, she ain't nowhere to be found. The old day must have skipped, and the 200 Santa Clauses that the boys investigated, not one of these is Nick Norman under the beard. Oh, I'll get it, Danny. Thanks. Sergeant Tartagli... Huh? Yeah, he's here. It's for you, Danny. Thank you. Danny Clover speaking. Danny? Maxine Riddell. Yeah, how are you, Maxie? I'm in lingerie, Danny. Come on down. What? In the lingerie department at Fletcher's department store. Working. I got news for you. News about Nick Norman. You interested, Danny? Yeah, yeah, I am. Hold on to everything, Maxie. I'll be right down. Here, mister. Take this black knight down over to that girl over there. She'll gift wrap it up. Hi, Danny. How am I doing? Great, Maxie. Only great. How long have you been working here? Only for the Christmas season, Danny. But the way I've been operating, I think maybe they'll keep me on. No no questions about your background? You mean about me being a shoplifter? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's the reason I got the job. The way I was lifting things, I told them it'd be cheaper for them if they put me on the sales force. So they did. So for 22 bucks a week, I'm an honest mouse. Anyway, it's steady. Keep it that way, huh, Maxie? Anything you say, Danny. Well, now that we've had our tea, I guess you want to know about Nick. Yeah. Breaks my heart to be a stoolie. You know how it is, Danny. Me with my former alliances. But it's different now. Yeah, different. I want it to be different for Tussie, too. You remember how it was between me and Tussie? How was it? It was gorgeous. That's why I'm being a pigeon, Danny. If Nick made up his mind to be a kosher citizen, he should stick to it. Not fall back into the arms of a mob like a doll who says mama. Which mob, Maxie? Tussie Cons. 
Such a name for a gorilla. Tussie. How do you figure a name like that? I don't know him. Where do I find him? Tussie just got back from Chicago. He bought the Domino Club. I happened to be passing there on my lunch hour, and I saw Nick in a Santa Claus suit drinking grape juice with Tussie. Oh, excuse me, Danny, a customer. Yes, madam. Something for yourself. Thanks, Maxie. For what? We have some gorgeous outside girdles, madam, for everyday wear. They're right over here. The Domino Club in the West 50s is a bright and shiny joint plastered with black glass. It stands close to the ground between two peeling brownstones. When you walk into it, you have the feeling you're walking into the mouth of a beetle. Its walls are lined with black mirrors, and its ceiling is draped with folds of scarlet silk. And at six o'clock of a Christmas Eve, the boys, complete with Christmas-wrapped girls, are beginning to gather. You ask a busboy in white tie and tails, where's Tussie Carnes? And he lifts an eyebrow to a guy standing near the bandstand. A guy grinning like an alley cat, while a girl pins a sprig of mistletoe to his lapel. You wait till she kisses Tussie. Then Tussie kisses her. But his eyes are open and flicking around the joint, so he sees you and pushes the girl away. Beat it, Blitzen. I got company. Merry Christmas, stranger. You want something from Tussie, boy? Same to you. And I want Nick Norman. Oh, that's a big desire on a holiday. Why you want Nick? Uh, tell Tussie, boy. Maybe I gotta explain. I'm Danny Clover, a cop. I want him. Don't everybody? Come with me, Sonny. Santa's right down at the end of this hallway. Merry Christmas, Melvin. Ain't it, though, Tussie? Merry Christmas, George. Likewise, I'm sure. I brought you a present, boys. Goody. Likewise. Where's Nick Norman? This fella here, he says to Tussie boy, he wants Nick Norman. Our Santa Claus. Uh-oh. What big eyes you have, mister. And you know something else that's plain precious, boys? No. Do tell us, Tussie. The fella says he is a cop. Isn't that cute, huh? I could die. Yeah. So show the fella Santa Claus, huh, fellas? Merry Christmas, Danny Clover. Oh, Tussie boy said that, didn't he? Stay away from me. But first we want to wish you on a star. Like that. Are you too crazy? Stay away from me. They think that was not enough stars. I'll give them another package. You know that Tussie is good to us. He gave us the best Christmas present two fellas could ever have. Uh, don't be greedy, Melvin. Leave some for me. <laughs> oh, look at that. It's all gone. <laughs> Come on, Danny, open your eyes. What? Yeah, open your eyes, Danny. It's getting late. Ain't you heard? Christmas is coming. Hey, it's you, Nick Norman. Oh, Danny, call me Sandy Claus. That's the nicest alias I got. Now, look, Nick, I'm going to... Oh, here, I'll help you up, Danny. Yeah, sit on the edge of the sofa there. Yeah. Sandy Claus, Danny. Santa Claus, huh? Sure. So help me, Nick, where I'm going to put you. You'll spend the next 94 Christmases in solitary. Take it easy, Danny. Come on, let's get out of here. I'll be late for that kid's party. Come on. Look, you mean let's get out of here just like that? I don't have to beat my way out of here? What for? What's all this about, Nick, uh, Santa Claus? You're adult today, Danny. What's the matter with you? But you were kidnapped. Kidnapped? Me? Who would want to do a thing like that to jolly old me? A man in a tree said two guys pushed you into a car. He only had a bird's eye view, but he said kidnapped. You... Oh, you mean Melvin and George. <laughs> I mean Melvin and George. <laughs> two pals from Chicago, Danny. They heard I was out and wanted I should be Sandy Claus to a private party they was given. That's all. Harmless guys, pals, buddies. We enjoy each other. Yeah, they enjoyed me, too. Uh, before they left town for this party, they said to tell you... Oh, wait a minute. I wrote it down. Uh, it says... Uh... Dear Danny Clover, sorry we made a mistake and beat up your head. May the bells ring a joyous Noel for you. Signed, XX. That's Melvin and George, yes. A X. mistake, huh? Sure. They knew some mob or other might try to get me as Santa Claus. They figured you was a mob, so they protected me from you, like, like you was fibbing about being a cop. After they walloped you unconscious, they went through your pockets and saw you was really a cop. So they wrote this note. 
the running ink you see here on the note, Danny, I, that's tears. You'll forgive him, won't you, Danny? Yeah. How about your mother? Well, that was your error, Danny. You didn't tell Mom you was from the police, so she taught just like Melvin and George. You gave me the double talk. Mom. Yeah, that's my mom. A grand old dame. You know you know what I told her once when I was nine years yeah, old? Yeah, you know, I, my sleigh's outside. I'll give you a ride back to my office. That means the whole thing was an error in identification and motive, as they say, huh, Danny? That's right. Isn't that right, Santa? Sure. I'll tell it to you again if you want. You no, know, never it's mind. The... What happened to Simon Larrabee? Oh, he went out for a feast of spud nuts and coffee. Hey, you don't look very happy, Tartaglia. Uh-uh. No, Danny. I ain't happy. Unhappy. Very. What's the matter? We've got Santa Claus? Come on, smile. It's going to be a fine Christmas. I can't, Danny. I just can't. It's Mrs. Tartaglia. Hmm? Yeah, now she ain't laughing anymore. The neighbors are laughing and Mrs. Tartaglia is crying. Why? Well, the later editions of the paper said that the Santa Claus was heisted. It was because I was in a tree. Yeah, the papers say I, single-handed, messed up Christmas. Bad as that, huh? Mm. Well, I'll tell you, Tartaglia... Hey, what about my Christmas party? Oh! oh, oh well, not oh, yet, Santa. Oh. Wait till you get to the party. Say, the press was saying that you were snatched, Sandy. What gives? It said that mobsters grabbed you. No, it was just a little misunderstanding. That's right, Marty. Nick was grabbed by mobsters. Huh? Yeah, well, then how'd you get away? Sergeant Tartaglia. Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Sergeant Tartaglia. The kind of policeman who tracks down criminals to the lair. I am, Danny? The kind that single-handed rescued Santa Claus from the jaws of disaster. This guy did that? Yep. I'm just about to call the press boys and tell them about it. Oh, Danny. I mean it, Tartaglia. Don't be so modest. I'm going to do just that. Danny. Put Marty in a cab, Tartaglia. I'll send Santa down the squad car in a little while. Yeah, sure. Well, come on, little tyke. Uh, I mean, uh, Marty. Okay. Merry Christmas, Danny. Whatever you tell the press guys, Danny, I'll swear to it. Sure. Sure you will. Yeah, that's a fine Christmas you're giving everybody, Danny. How about yourself? Oh, I'll have fun at the party. I always do. Oh. Where, where, where is it? Where's my money? Oh, look, Mr. Larrabee, it's Christmas. Of course it's Christmas. That's why I want my rent, so I can have a Merry Christmas. Hey, Danny, who is this guy that needs rent to have a Merry Christmas? This is Simon Larrabee. He wants a year's rent in advance for that warehouse where the kids are having their party. Or else, no party. Yes, that's who I am. Oh, like that, huh? That. So that's how you are, huh, Simon? Stop breathing in my face, Santa Claus. All them kids wanting to have a party, and a Simon like you wants to louse it up. I'll put him down, Nick. Yes, please. I ain't doing nothing, Danny. Just holding Simon up so I can breathe in his face. Oh, please, I want please. you to think about something, Simon. Think about all those kids that are looking forward to that Christmas party, which ain't going to happen on account of you. Think about it. All right, I'm, think, I'm thinking, yes. I'm Maybe thinking. you could think better with a pen in your hand, Simon. Yes, a have. pen that will write out a receipt for a year's rent in advance, huh, Simon? Of course, of course, of course. Oh, Christmas spirit and all that. Yes, I'll get my receipt book. Uh. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I haven't felt so good in years. Ah, yes, here you are, Mr. Glover. A receipt for a year's rent in advance. And tell the darlings, Merry Christmas with us. Yeah. Yeah, I will. Ain't he a nice fella, Danny? Come on, nice fella. I'll take you to a party. Merry Christmas, Danny. He said, Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas, Danny. Merry Christmas. Yep. Merry Christmas. On Christmas Eve, Broadway is almost like any other place in the world. The bells ring out, the horns blow, there's laughter. The Mazdas on the Translux spell out slowly, word by word, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And you read it, you believe it. Because on Christmas Eve, you believe a miracle. Then a whirl of confetti is in your eyes and you're pushed along with the crowd and you never see the next news bulletin. You don't try to look back. It's Broadway. The merriest. The shiniest. Lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. 
My Beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Gil Stratton, Jr., Howard McNear, Hal March, Bert Holland, Shep Menken, Estelle Dodge, and Peggy Weber. On Christmas afternoon, Jack Benny will be heard as guest star in a full one-hour version of the comedy The Man Who Came to Dinner. Charles Boyer, Gregory Peck, Rosalind Russell, Dorothy McGuire, Henry Fonda, John Garfield, and Gene Kelly will be starring alongside Jack in this special holiday hour. Then an hour later, Jack will be back with his own Sunday night gang for 30 more minutes of holiday hilarity. In fact, the best idea really is stay tuned to CBS all day Christmas Day. Now stay tuned for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you'll find Broadway is my beat every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Say, when you were a kid, did you like to go sheing? Now, by that, I don't mean chasing the girl next door around the block, but rather the manly art of climbing the nearest snow-capped hill and then returning down said hill on a pair of shees. Of course, you probably know them as skis. Oh, but that's become a peasant term. Now, if you were to use that outmoded expression around the Sun Valley set, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. On the other hand, George Valentine had never heard of sheing, as you will find out in our Let George Do It adventure. It's called Red Spots in the Snow. And you can take it from me. It wasn't borscht. My dear Mr. Valentine, I have never been a violent man. So when I'm threatened, I need a professional to, uh, well, frankly, to act as my bodyguard. I don't expect you to follow me around ostentatiously withdrawn revolver, but I will expect continuous protection night and day. You will fly to Snow Snow Valley Valley Lodge, Lodge, where you will be my guest. Oh, George, did you hear that? Snow Valley. Yes, I heard it, folks. Snow Valley is fabulous. The latest, most up-to-date resort in the whole country. I've read the circulars, too. Oh, we could have a wonderful time there. Well, you'd better finish the letter before you start packing. Oh, where you will be my guest. Uh Uh-huh. I don't think you will find your duties too arduous. There's skating, skiing, dancing, and entertainment. Oh, George, it sounds heavenly. Yes, it does. Who's it from? Oh, it's signed uh, Herbert Judson. Oh. George, do you think it could be... Only one Herbert Judson, I guess. Oh, who'd threaten a famous picture director like Herbert Judson? (laughs) Probably not over half the population of Hollywood. Well, he's handsome, he's famous, he's clever. And quite a lady killer. I was reading about his latest heartthrob in one of the gossip columns. Well, then you don't want to take the case. Oh, I didn't say that. If you'd like a vacation... Oh, come to think of it, I'm not invited. The minute Judson sets eyes on you, I'm sure you will be. Oh, thank you. That was a compliment, wasn't it, George? Uh, no comment. Well, write him, we'll be there. I'll telegraph him. Hey, I'm not made of money. Collect. Oh, George, it'll be wonderful. Skating in the moonlight, dancing under soft lights. Yeah, and Herbert Judson in person. All right, go home and pack, Angel, and don't forget, plenty of woolies. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. 
Now back to George Valentine and Let George Do It. Good of you to take the morning plane, Valentine. And to bring Miss Brooks. Oh, thank you, Mr. Judson. Mm. After lunch, we'll go out and try the she run. She? That's the right way to pronounce SKI, George. Ah, oh, thanks. You're welcome. Sorry I wasn't here to welcome you when you arrived. Special events on the she run this morning. Oh, well, that's okay. We spent the time looking at the photograph albums in the lobby. You're on almost every page, Mr. Judson. Oh, yes. The publicity men here, you know, always snapping off the record pictures of well known people on the she run. Well, if I may be permitted a pun, there was one she in particular who was posing with you in a good many of the pictures. <laughs> oh. Well, all the girls like to have their pictures taken with me. Well, this one was very pretty, in spite of the fact that her dark glasses almost covered her face. Did you ever think of going in for pictures, Miss Brooks? Me? Oh, heavens, no. Oh, really? Extremely photogenic, you know. I can get you uh, a screen test. <clears throat> Incidentally, Mr. Judson... Now, don't worry about your fee, Valentine. It'll be over and above your hotel expenses. Everything's on me. Yeah, well, while we're waiting for lunch, perhaps you'd tell us just how you were threatened. I found this note under the door to my room. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, words cut out of the newspaper. Better keep your promises if you expect to remain healthy. Is that all? It's enough, isn't it? Uh -huh. What promises does it allude to? I haven't the faintest idea. I was sure a clever man like you would find a lot of clues in this. Well, I'm not a movie detective, Mr. Judson. Just a troubleshooter who occasionally gets a good idea. Well, whatever the danger is, I'm sure you can cope with it. Mere fact that you're here is very comforting. Ah, Oh, here's little Mary with the succulent viands. You know, Pierre used to be chef at the saint -Moritz. You're Mr. Valentine, aren't you? Yes, Mary, this is Mr. Valentine. Well, the desk clerk said that this note was left for you. It was marked deliver at once, so he sent it in. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, sir. Will you excuse me? Why, certainly. Well, who's sending me? Uh -huh. Look at this. What is it, George? Just like yours, Mr. Judson. Words cut out of a newspaper. With your advertisement at the top, George. Uh -huh. If this is you, you're wasting your time. A man must pay for his sins, and you can't stop it. Better leave here at once. I won't warn you twice. Well, whoever's sending these threats isn't wasting any time, is he? Say, tell me, have you had any disagreements with anyone here? Why, no. No, nothing of any importance. I had a little argument with Jacques, the she instructor. Maybe you'd better tell me about it. I might find it more important than you think. No, it really isn't anything. Little Mary, the, the waitress here, is quite a she expert. The help, you see, are allowed to use the hill back of the lodge. Jacques and Mary are great friends. Or at least they were until the girl who sings arrived. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going too fast. The girl who sings? Uh, her name is Jill Drew. She sings during cocktail hour. Hasn't anything to do with the argument I had with Jacques. I mention her because, uh, well, Jacques is infatuated with her and Mary is crazy about Jacques. Quite a little triangle. Well, this trouble you had with Jacques... Well, Mary's quite pretty, as you may have noticed. I uh, have always been on the lookout for photogenic faces. I asked her how she would like to have a screen test. Jacques didn't seem to like the idea. But now that his interests are elsewhere, I'm sure he doesn't care. I'd like to meet this Jacques. Oh, you'll meet him, yes. We'll go up the mountain right after lunch. Well, Miss Brooks, you manage your she's wonderfully. Well, they don't bother me, but that chairlift frightens me. Now, it's really very simple. You just climb aboard one of the chairs as it swings round. You mean those little chairs hanging like a swing are all you have? Well, surely you've been on a she lift before. <laughs> they didn't have one on the little slope back of the schoolhouse where I learned. <laughs> well, you won't have any trouble. As soon as you get on, you rest your feet on the footboard, and then you pull the bar down in front of you and you're locked in. Well, the wire that it swings on, suppose it should break. Uh, that wire is good and strong. <laughs> but it goes up so high, and when it stops, you're dangling there. Oh, 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 and this is the girl who couldn't get to Snow Valley fast enough. <laughs> you know, for myself, I've always thought this was a silly sport. Twenty minutes to go up, twenty seconds to come down. Well, I thought I could just play around down here. Well, you don't have to come down the she trail if you don't want to. Jacques gives his lessons on that plateau up there at the top. 
See that space between the trees where the lift goes over the hills? You can watch Mr. Judson, Angel. Yes, and when you're ready to return to the lodge, you can ride back on the chairlift if you want to. Now, let's see. I'd better take the first chair. Mix, uh, Miss Brooks, you take the next, and Valentine the rear car. Okay. Well, all right, here goes nothing. I'll show you how it's done. You see how slowly the chairs move? You just jump on and put your shoes on the footrest. Pull down the bar, and there you are. See you at the top. Okay, you're next, Angel. I'll help you. On you go. We're awfully high up, George. Yeah, it's a beautiful view, though. I'm afraid to look. I get dizzy. Surely you're not frightened now. We're almost there. And did you ever see a clearer day? Yeah, it is pretty, but those treetops down there look awfully sharp. Oh, don't look down. Look ahead toward that opening between the trees. When we get through there, we'll be only a few feet off the ground. And just beyond, you'll be able to get off. Hey, look back and see how far we've come, Angel. I wish I were an angel. With wings. What's that? Someone in the woods must be hunting. I didn't know they allowed it. They must have hit something, George. Look down there. Red spots in the snow. Hey, that's blood. Hey, good night. Look, Angel, Judson slumped over the bar. He's been shot. Mr. Judson? Someone in the woods there to the left. Hey, Brooksy, look down there. What? Yeah, going down the far side of the hill out of the woods. Someone skiing awfully fast. Yes, and not on the regular ski run. That must be the person who shot Mr. Judson, a blue sweater with a yellow band. Too far off to see what he looks like. Oh, I wish this plane contraption had moved faster. I'll phone down the minute we get to the top and see if we can head him off. Hey, hey, you up there. Help Mr. Judson off. He's been hurt. Yes, sir. What happened? Someone shot him from the woods. All right, I'll get him off the chair. Well, someone will have to help me, too. Just a minute, lady. Where will I get him on the ground? <laughs> well, wait now. Don't try to jump off. Don't. There. There you are, man. Oh, Thanks. George, he seems to be hurt badly. Yeah, okay, I'll be there in a second. All right, give me a hand. There, there you are, sir. Okay. All right, let's have a look at him. Now, phone for the police. Tell them to hold anyone wearing a blue sweater with a yellow band around it. Yes, sir. Shall I send for a doctor, too? Too late for that. Mr. Judson is dead. Please, please, folks, keep back. Will you, everyone, keep back? Don't touch him until the police arrive. They'll be here shortly, sir. Did you phone the lodge about the blue sweater with the yellow band? Oh, no, sir. I for, I'm afraid I forgot oh, it. Oh, fine help you are, Buster. You know anyone who has an outfit like that? No, sir. Jacques might know. Well, where is he? Get him. Well, he left a little while ago, just before you arrived. He left? I thought his job was here. Well, he said he had to pick up some supplies in town, and he'd be right back. Hey, Brooksy. Yes, George. Looks as if we have to ski down the hill back there. Are you game? Well, I've never tried a long hill like... Well, whatever you say. All right, come on, then. Now, look, don't let anyone touch the body. No, sir. Hey, you're going the wrong way. The ski run... We're taking the same route the killer took. Come on, Angel, don't break your neck. Oh, George, I'm so glad you care. Oh, you bet I care. Oh, George. All right, I'll need you to help me when we get down. Lots of things that have oh, to be... Oh, George. Come on, hold your hat. Here we go. It's like flying, isn't it, George? Yeah, pretty fast. George, look out, that snowbank. Huh? Be careful. Oh, hey, oh, uh, oh. oh hey, Brooksy, help me out of this, will Are you? Are you all right? Yeah, I guess so. Half the snow on the country went down my neck. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> but it was certainly bumpy. Yeah. Man must have been an expert. Yeah, but he slipped up. Nice of him to leave a trail in the snow for us to follow. Yeah, that's right. Well, come on. What are we waiting for? He's way ahead by now. I know, but we can tell the way he went. Duck down. Get behind that snowbank. We've caught up with our friend, the killer. Listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now, 
back to George Valentine. You are invited to Snow Valley Lodge to act as guardian for the well-known Hollywood director, Herbert Judson. And now Judson is dead. Shot while riding on the ski lift just in front of you and Claire Brooks. And now that you've followed the suspected killer's trail, you find yourself hiding behind a snowbank trying to avoid being a target. Well, if your name is George Valentine, that's only going to make you more anxious to catch the person who's been doing the shooting. <laughs> Okay, Angel, according to my calculations, that's the last shot in his gun. Be careful, George. Okay, I'll take a look. No sign of anyone. From here on, he followed the road, and there isn't any more trail. Yes, road's too cut up by automobile chains. Let's get to the hotel. I want to check a few things before the police begin their inquiry. You check the drying room and ask about blue sweaters and yellow stripes. I'll phone Hollywood and get the latest dope on Judson. Any pay dirt, Brooksy? None. The man in the drying room says there are several people who have sweaters like that, but none of them wore them this morning. Was Jacques one of them? No. Jacques always wears black. Did you talk to Hollywood? Yeah, yeah, I did. Signet Studios was very much upset at the news, naturally. Everyone seemed to like Judson. Due back at the studio next week to make a picture. No recent scandals, no big romance since last year. But one of the newspaper boys said that his death would cause a lot of weeping and wailing among aspiring actresses. Popular, huh? Well, he was always promising to get girls into pictures and never making good. Hey, didn't he ask you if you wanted a screen test? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> George, that note he received warned him he'd better keep his promises. Do you suppose one of the girls... I can't imagine why failure to get a screen test is motive enough for murder. But we mustn't pass up anything. Okay, promise Mary a test. Let's see her. George, do you remember these photo albums we looked at before lunch? Yeah, sure. Judson and his she's. Well, maybe one of them had a dark sweater with a light stripe. Oh. Brooksy, what would I do without you? Well, I hope you couldn't, George. If I thought... Here they are. Oh. Anything wrong? Yeah. Someone tore out all the pages from the front of this book. Do you suppose it might have been someone who had a dark sweater with a light stripe? I wouldn't be surprised. Come on, let's find Mary. I beg your pardon. I'm looking for a waitress named Mary. Have you, well, uh... You wouldn't find her here now. She's off in the afternoon. So... Oh, I see. Now, you're Jill Drew, the singer, aren't you? Yes. My name is Valentine. This is Miss Brooks. Oh, hello. How do you do? You uh, heard about Mr. Judson, I suppose? Yes. Well, I'm asking a few questions before the police arrive. Would you mind telling me if you were one of the girls Mr. Judson promised a screen test to? I hardly knew Mr. Judson. By any chance, do you have a ski outfit? A blue sweater with a yellow stripe? No, I don't ski. I'm engaged to sing and play the piano. Where would I find time to ski? Now, if you don't mind, I have to practice. Yeah, the uh, show must go on, I see. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. I knocked them over to the floor. Sounds like a junk cart. Here, I'll pick them up. They're beautiful bracelets you have, Miss Drew. Rather heavy, aren't they, when you're playing the piano? Oh, I never wear them when I play. But I don't like to leave them in my room. It's marvelous what they can do with costume jewelry these days. My dear young lady, those are real. They're from Elwood's in Beverly Hills. Oh, singing for your supper must be profitable. Oh, I have admirers. I don't doubt it. Now, if you don't mind... Oh, sure. Yes. Sorry to have interrupted your practicing. If you're looking for Mary, you might find her in her room. And where is that? In the annex, back of the main lodge. If she isn't there, she may be skiing on the hill, back of the annex. She's very proficient. Mary, you've been crying. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Poor Mr. Judson. You liked him a lot, didn't you? Well, he was always so kind and generous. Next week he was going to take me back to Hollywood with him for a picture test. Well, look, Mary, murder is a serious matter. You're in the dining room a lot. Did you ever hear Mr. Judson in an argument with Jacques? What? No, Mr. Valentine. Well, Jacques would Mary, never... there will be an inquest. You'll be asked questions and you'll get yourself into a lot of trouble if you hide anything. Mr. Judson admitted he and Jack had an argument about you. Well, he only warned Mr. Judson not to make any promises he couldn't keep. And Mr. Judson was going to give me Jacques the test... Jack threatened Mr. Judson? Oh, no, Mr. Valentine. He wasn't a threat. 
Just a friendly warning. Don't you think you'd better tell us all about it? Well, Jacques and I... Well, he used to be kind of attentive until Miss Drew came. I... I wanted to make him jealous, so I told him about Mr. Judson promising me a chance in pictures. And he warned Mr. Judson not to make any promises he couldn't keep. That was all. Where can I find Jacques when he isn't teaching? Well, if he isn't with Miss Drew, he's usually in his cabin. And that is? Back at the lodge. Jacques doesn't live in the lodge. He has a cabin of his own. It's number 26. Okay, thanks. I'll see you later. seem to be at home. Maybe the door is open. We can try. A man who leaves his door open can't have anything to hide. Usually. Well, that's a nice cabin. Fireplace and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Quite cozy. Well, I'd like to have time to look at all the pictures he has on the walls. Well, go ahead and look. We'll see what else there is. These must be his pupils. Oh, uh, publicity stills. Well, let's see now. The table and there. Scrap basket. Huh. What is it, George? This newspaper. I have the slightest doubt that both Judson's message and mine were cut right out of this. George, if he wanted to hide it, why didn't he burn it? I was thinking the same thing, Angel. I'll keep it anyway. Now let's have a look at the pictures. <laughs> well, Jacques seems to have had his picture taken with every well-known star in Hollywood. To Jacques, who helped me stay on my feet, Grant Cooper... To Jacques, the best there is, Norma Lewis. And here he is with Mr. Judson and Jill Drew. In memory of a happy vacation. George, isn't this like one of the pictures from the book? Uh Uh-huh. Only she isn't wearing the dark glasses here. Mm, She was prettier then. She wasn't posing when we saw her. Her sweater has a stripe. Only it's a light sweater with a dark stripe instead of the other way around. Thought she couldn't ski. Doesn't mean you can ski just because you're photographed with them on. George, do you smell something burning? Mm. Yeah, it smells like cloth. Hey, it is. You're in the fireplace. I wonder we couldn't locate the missing suit. Where are you going? Well, to get some water to throw in the fire. Hasn't been in the fire very long. I'll get it out with a poker. There we are. Now, well, it's a shame to spoil this Don't rug, Don't burn but... your hands. I'm getting the water. No, I got it, Angel. Just have to stamp on it a bit more. Look out, George. Huh? Oh, good. Well, what do you know? Blue sweater and yellow stripe, all right. I'm glad we found it before it had time to burn completely. Let's see if there's anything in the pocket. Nothing but what's left of this handkerchief. Hey, his initial, too. Well, that sort of settles it, doesn't it, George? Yeah, perhaps. We'll hold it for the sheriff when he arrives. What are you doing in my room? Oh, uh, <clears throat> hello there. I suppose you're Jacques. Didn't think you'd be back so soon. Effortly, you did not. I ought to turn you over to the police. Well, for the moment, I represent the police. You're lying. Now, listen, Buster. Maybe you don't know that you're the number one suspect for a murder. What's that? (laughs) Good imitation of a man indicating surprise. You think I killed Mr. Judson? Now, look, your ski suit... Oh, that isn't mine. I never had one like that. Your handkerchief was in the pocket. Oh, that isn't mine either. It's... It's none of your business. Now, will you get out of here? Look out, George. Another bit of evidence, huh? All right. Put that gun down, Buster. Drop it, I say. Drop it, Buster. It isn't loaded. What? Yeah, don't you remember? You used up all the bullets shooting at us. Okay, pick it up carefully, Brooksy, yeah. while I hold our friend here. All the shots have been fired, George. Yeah, I thought so. Come on, Buster. We're going to find the sheriff. Sorry to disturb you again, Miss Drew, but have the police arrived? I haven't seen them, Mr. Valentine. Come along, Jacques. Jill, I... I... Mr. Valentine, where are you taking Jacques? We're on our way to the police, Mary. This fool is trying to say that I killed Judson. We found the gun and the ski suit in his room. He tried to burn it. We got there in time. Jacques says the suit is too small for him, and I'm inclined to agree with him. But it wasn't Jacques. He didn't do it. I, I know it. Mary, be quiet. He didn't do it because... Because... I did it. It does look like a girl's sweater, George. What's left of the handkerchief looks like a woman's. Mary, are you trying to protect Jacques? 
No, no, I... She might have done it, George. She knows how to ski, and the sweater could fit her. Okay, motive, Angel. Mr. Judson promised her a test in pictures. He hadn't kept his promise. Well, not a very good motive for shooting a man, as I remarked before. Would you say so, Miss Drew? Please, can't you discuss this somewhere else? I have oh, to... Oh, yeah, rehearse. sure, I know, I know. You have to rehearse. We'll only be a minute. And you might be interested in this. Do you think failure to give a girl a screen test is good and sufficient reason to... Mr. Judson made fun of me because Jacques had fallen in love with Miss Drew. Please, leave me out of this. You say you shot her, Mary, huh? Yes. And then came down the other side of the mountain and reached the hotel in time to go to work? That's it, George. And then planted the suit and the newspaper and Jacques' gun back in his room? She tried to burn the suit. Jacques' cabin was the only one with a fireplace, and it was only natural that she should return the gun. But she happens to love Jacques is even willing to confess to a crime she didn't commit to save his life. Why would she leave the stuff in his room for the police to find? Well, maybe she was jealous and then changed her mind when she saw he was suspected. Girls in love often do strange things. Oh, yeah, they certainly do. Well, it's an interesting theory, Brooksy. Only if you remember, when we started up the ski lift, Mary was still at the bottom. We just left her in the dining room. She couldn't possibly have reached the top before we did. Yeah, you're a sweet kid, Mary, trying to save the man you love. But it isn't a good idea to get mixed up with the law. Then you think it really was, Jack? Oh, no. No, I agree with you that it was a woman, all right. A woman's sweater, a woman's handkerchief. And do you remember the initial on the handkerchief? Yes. J for Jack. Why not J for Jill? Don't go away, Miss Drew. Oh, this is ridiculous. Is it? We saw your photograph in a blue sweater and a yellow band. You destroyed the pictures in the album, but you forgot the one in Jacques' room. But she had on a light sweater with a dark band. The strange peculiarities of photography, Angel. Unless you're using panchromatic film, blue comes out light and yellow comes out dark. And I think when I check with Elwood's and Beverly Hills about those bangles, we'll find that Judson bought them. Yeah, I think we'll find out that they were presents from him before he got tired of her and started sheing elsewhere. All right. All right, I did it. I didn't mean to kill him. I just wanted to frighten him. But he deserved to die. He was a pig. He was always promising women the world and giving them nothing. He even promised to marry me. Then he met this little nobody and treated me like the dirt under his feet. I tried to make him jealous by pretending I cared for Jacques. Uh -huh. Brooksy, I'll turn this little lady over to the sheriff. Phone the jeweler in Beverly Hills. And then I'll meet you back in the lobby. <laughs> Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Well, I was right, Angel. Judson bought those presents and braces for Jill. But, George, did she tear the pictures out of the book so we wouldn't know she could ski? That's right. I don't think she meant to implicate Jacques, but his cabin was the only one near hers that had a fireplace. So when she went there to return his gun, she thought of burning the sweater, which she knew we'd seen from the chairlift. Well, how did you know Jacques didn't do it? Well, he didn't know the gun didn't have any bullets in it, for one thing. And now Mary and Jacques can live happily ever after. <laughs> can anyone really live happily ever after? Oh, George, you're so cynical. If you don't look out, some girl will take a shot at you for a warning. Not from a ski lift, Angel. The only girl who'd take a shot at me doesn't like dangling from the sky. You have just heard Red Spots in the Snow, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. Davis Kent wrote the story with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine when you'll again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details.
Greetings, friend. Time again for Let George Do It. Oh, which reminds me. How would you like to sit in on a nice little card game? I happen to know four charming fellows who are just dying for a fifth. On the other hand, though, maybe you'd better forget about it, because these boys would not only take your bankroll, they'd just as soon take your life. But it's a pretty good game at that. So while we're waiting for George Valentine to show, let's take a look in on this happy foursome. Well, it's ten o'clock already, gentlemen. Shouldn't we... <laughs> I mean, my watch says ten. Chester has the cards and... Sure, what are we waiting for? We're going to do it. Let's get... No! Back. No. Ames, Salto, this is crazy. It's insane. It was your idea, wasn't it, Norton? Yes, but a man's guilt is no more to be bandied about. Oh, him. get off the words. There's the good name of the man to be thought of afterwards. Let's get it over with now. Now! It's all right. Need a piece of paper. Envelope here in your jacket. Do you mind? Of course I do, if it's got my name on it. Valentine. George what? Valentine. What? Oh, your wife's letter from somebody named Valentine. Uh, if I'd know her friends. Here, here's a blank sheet. Club stationery. Uh, couldn't we get on with it? Dear Mrs. Ames, I am so sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Naturally, I will do whatever I can to help. Sincerely, George Valentine. You mean a uh, concern? How do you oh, like... For heaven's sake, stop the stalling, both of you. Will you get... All right. I draw one. Go on, draw a card. Me? Go on, Salto. All right. Nine of diamonds. Yeah. Norton. <laughs> Nine of clubs. Nine again. Give me one of those. Jack. Diamonds. All right, Chester. Chester. Huh? Your turn. Draw. Oh, I, I'm all right. Draw. Oh, yes. King. <laughs> king of hearts. Look, Chester drew the king of hearts. Shut up. You understand, Chester. High card. Yes. Yes, the paper. Here, here. You can use the pen there. Uh, I'm all right. <clears throat> I, Jeffrey Chester, hereby confess one year ago to this date, it was I who murdered... Miss Dorothy Fullman. It is after ten o'clock now, Chester. I'd like to have a drink or two. I'll, I'll have to run down to my boarding house. There's a bill I should pay. Uh, the watchman's spare gun is in the locker room, and it would look better if you did it at the same place that... Leave him alone, Salto. I'm all right. I could run downtown first, then come back, have the drinks, if I could borrow your car, Mr. Ames. Sure, Chester. Let's go over and get you my car. Sure. Thank you. You can mail my confession of guilt to the police. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to George Valentine and Let George Do It. Where are you, Sylvia? It's the big idea, that letter in my coat pocket. Miss Valentine, who is he? Honey? Oh, there you are. So sorry to hear of your concern over your husband. Of all the meddling... Please. Hello? This huh? is Mr. Valentine. Miss Brooks, my husband, Mr. Ames. Oh. How, how do you do, Mr. Ames? Huh. With my foot in my mouth. 
Just who are you? Did you have a nice time, darling? Where have you been? Huh? Oh, over to the club. Yeah, they let me in. Just playing a little cards, that's all. Look, Mr. Rames, I had a letter from your wife. My wife is leaving me. What difference does it make? Go on, get out. She's hired snoopers before, my friend. I tell you, Carl. Oh, shut up. Listen to me. You were beaten up the other night. Get them out of here. Get yourself out of here. Oh, no, you won't. Stop it. No, listen. What's the matter with you, friend? Victor, that was your car, wasn't it? Driving away? Yes. Yes, I loaned it to Somebody needs it for a while tonight. He's got some things to do. Mr. Ames, I know I'm butting in, but your wife has been worried. And Please. I'm, here. I'm going back over to the club. There's nothing anybody can do now except to make things worse. What? Darling! Send him home, Sylvia. I'll take care of myself. Oh. I put your letter in his pocket on purpose, Mr. Valentine. He'll never listen to me or believe in it. It was certainly an understatement when you said he was upset. Yes. But you haven't said why yet. Now, just what's going on tonight, Mrs. Ames? Where's your husband really been? I don't know. Playing cards, I guess. He doesn't generally, but no harm could come out of that, could it? Maybe not. You said he'd been beaten up. Oh, yes, I know he's in danger. Go on, go on. Your husband's a lawyer, isn't he? He was until a year ago. His practice disappeared on him. What do you mean? Suspicion, distrust, whispers. This is a small town, Mr. Valentine. A very nice town. My husband used to be a very nice person. What happened? Have you ever heard of the Dorothy Fullman murder case? Well, yes, yes, I think so, only I don't remember the It was never solved. She was murdered, beaten up. It was horrible. They never even found the weapon. Police, experts, everyone's been over it a million times. It was a whole year ago. They'll never get a confession from anyone. Mrs. Ames, was your husband... My husband was very nearly tried for that murder. Oh, I see. But then if he weren't tried, then... There uh... are people in this town who believe, who really believe that he killed her. Who will always believe it. There wasn't any actual evidence. But the circumstances... Horrible, sordid, awful. Mrs. Ames, just tell me one thing, will you? Do, uh... Do you think your husband killed this Dorothy Fullman? Mr. Valentine, I, I don't want anything worse to happen. I... That's all. I say, excuse me. Mm. You're Mr. Valentine, aren't you? George Valentine? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was looking for the club doorman. My name is Norton. This is quite a pleasure. I've heard of you. Seen your name here and there? Oh, is that so? Uh, See here. Uh, Join me on the veranda for a cup of coffee, will you? Hospitality of our little club isn't I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. I'm looking for a man named Ames. Oh, yes. Victor Ames, splendid chap. Haven't seen him in some time. Might be here later. Uh, We can wait together. I said I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. (laughs) Well, I certainly don't intend to be pushy. Oh, wait a moment. Uh, Perhaps I should be a bit more honest and say there's a little matter I'd like your advice on. I'd still go looking for Mr. Ames. Even if I said the little matter concerned, Mr. Ames? (laughs) You twist my arm. (laughs) Then we can do better than the veranda, I think. People there. There's a lounge in the locker room. All right. Through here? Uh, to your left. Generally closed at night. But, uh, there we are. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, what's the story? <sighs> Nothing so very important, but uh, sit down, sit down. How do you know who I was out there? Well, Ames had mentioned your coming. You said you haven't seen him lately. Try again. Really, Mr. Valentine. Shh, shh, shh. Who's that? Hey, anybody in here? Walking up. Blue shirt. Private police? Uh, just a moment. Yes, yes, he is, uh, Mr. Valentine. Let go of me? Well, what are you doing here? Ah, what do you mean? Stop it. Who are you? Hey, hey what is it? Jimmy, Jimmy, I, I hey, found this man. Break it up, break it up. Break hey. what up, John? I found him in here. I, I left my wallet in, in wallet my locker. All, the... all right, you... all right. Oh, it's you, Mr. Norton. He was snooping, Jimmy. 
Now my wallet's gone. He took it. He must have. Oh, brother. If what am is... I supposed to do? Search him. Oh, but he won't have it, really. Uh, that, that's not the way they work. Uh, but uh, he's trespassing. You can lock him up for that. I'll see the steward for search charges. I'm sorry, Mr. Norton. What? I said I'm sorry. You're not going to prefer anything. Good night. Jimmy, my father was the founder of this club. When I issue an order to one of the paid employees, I expect yeah, that... Yeah, 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 sure, sure, issue away. Only someplace else, huh? I'll handle this end. Good night, Mr. Norton. Jimmy, I have never in my life been... So... Good night. Yes, good night. <laughs> well, that was something. Okay, bud, hand it over. What? Oh, now, wait a minute. You don't mean you believe that old school ties gag about... And still you put him out? The wallet, bud. Oh, sure. Mine. Here. Credentials. The works. But enough. Oh. Well, I didn't exactly figure. Valentine, huh? Yeah, that's right. Only look, Buster. Why? Why'd you treat him like that? Will him like lettuce before you even know what he had because to say? Because I have no use for the high and mighty Mr. Norton. And don't worry, I won't get in trouble either. <laughs> he maybe don't know it, but he's being eased out the side door of this club anyway. All four of them are. All four? Will you clear that up? You ever hear the Dorothy Fullman murder? Well, that nice, dignified man there, that Norton. For my money, he's the one that killed her. All right, so you've got your opinions, Jimmy. It's just an opinion. I'll stick to it, Mr. Valentine. But there wasn't any concrete evidence against either him or Victor Ames. And what did you mean, all four of them? And why did Norton want to stall me like that? That's all he was trying to do, keep me away from something. You're the detective, mister. Uh, oh, excuse me. Huh? <laughs> yeah, hello, Mr. Chester. Oh, Jimmy, just standing here having a couple of drinks. I, I was downtown. Yes, that's done. Looks like you've had enough. Oh, no, no, no. I'm all right. I'm fine. I'm all right. Sure, sure, Mr. Chester. See him? Hmm. Oh, that guy? He's one of them. Say it faster, will you? One of the four. Dorothy Fullman was murdered in her house just over the bluffs across the golf course. Yeah. They never got enough evidence. They never will. But the police did prove that it couldn't be anybody else. It had to be one of the four men mixed up with it. Who are they? Mr. Norton, Ames, big fool, always in trouble. Another man named Salto. He asked me he couldn't have got to first base with it. And Chester there. Oh, I get it. Not much left of Chester, is there? All of them have changed. But he don't even know what he's doing anymore. <laughs> Nobody will confess, no evidence. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, come here. Now, excuse me, steward, back to business. No, no, I'm right behind you. Huh? That's Victor Rains with him, isn't it? With the steward? Sure it is. Valentine. Yeah, we catch up again, friend. It's a busy night. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, Jimmy, there's trouble in here. What? The card room, the one with the back entrance. I put those cards in there myself just this evening. Valentine, I've got to see no, you alone. Hold it, will you? Go on, Stuart. Uh, this deck of cards. Uh, some men have been playing in there, apparently, or drawing high man or something. Well, what is it? What's the matter? Uh, well, sir, it's uh, more puzzling than anything else. At a club like this, uh, someone was being dishonest. A rather hasty job, but uh, here you see, this deck has been marked. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Back to George Valentine. Nine of diamonds. Nine of clubs. Jack, diamonds. Your turn, Chester. Draw. Yes, I'm king of hearts. I hereby confess one year ago it was I who murdered Miss Dorothy Fullman. I got the high card. I'll be dead by midnight. Oh. 
Only if your name is George Valentine, all you know is that Dorothy Fullman murder case has never been solved. That there were four suspects, but the police have despaired of ever finding out who her murderer was. Yes, all you know is that Mrs. Ames was worried about the strange behavior of her husband. And more recently, that four men have been playing cards in the back card room of the local club. And that the steward says the deck of cards is marked. No! No, they can't be given. Hey, hey, take it easy, Mr. Ames. Let's see, Stuart. They're not marked. What's bothering you so much, Mr. Ames? Kind of a crude job. Yes, Jimmy, little ticks on the edges, like this. But the person who did it could tell the cards, all right. Get out of here, both of you, Jimmy Stewart. Hey, hey, slow down, Buster. Look, I've got to see you, Valentine. I've got to see you alone. Have you been sampling some of that stuff Chester uses, Mr. Ames? What's so important about Chester? Chester. Uh, hey, uh, where are you going, Miss Ames? He was downtown. He's back now. Oh, Buster, will the you bar, please? He's here in the bar. He's having those last two drinks. Well, there you are. Oh, hello, Angela. Oh, Mr. Ames, I saw your wife to the station. She said to tell you. Yes, yes, uh, of course. Where is he? What? Little guy, Brooksy. He was in here a few minutes ago. He was having a couple of drinks. Yeah, he's gone now. Well, I did see somebody leaving just when I came in. He looked like he could use a little sleep. It's five minutes to twelve. Time for you to clear it up, friend. Where's Chester going? What's happening tonight? Could have been any one of us. I mean, the cards marking them. But I didn't try to save my own skin. I would have gone through it if I'd been high, man. What on earth? I'm trying to remember. The watchman's spare gun, that was it. Quit pulling, Buster. What? Yeah, the closet, the back hall. Come on, hurry, will you? The watchman's gun, that was it. Only the cupboard was bare. He's taken it already. Chester. There's certainly no gun in here. We drew. High man. He had the king of hearts. Little Chester, the weakest one in the whole bunch. Didn't even seem to react. What do you look? I, you... I, I, I know I'm talking wildly. I'll explain later. We've got to find him first. Hurry. Well, we're with you, all right. But who's he going to use this gun on? Who's he? Oh. Isn't it perfectly obvious, Mr. Valentine? On himself. <laughs> Just like Jimmy said, house over by the bluffs across the golf course. Certainly deserted looking for sale, for lease. Chester must be here. It's where he'd come. It's Dorothy Fullman's house, huh? Where she was killed? Yes, in the living room. Found her body there. Beaten to death. Doors open, you see? Chester? Chester! Well, he's not here. The fall guy. Well, we're a long way on the outside of that old crime now, aren't we? Perhaps we beat him here, missed him in the dark... Chester! What do you mean, George? Ames here knows what I mean. This is where it happened. It wasn't a pleasant crime. And inside a man, a terrible thing like that can get bigger in a year. Huh? Mr. Valentine, I didn't kill her. Sure, sure, that's what they all say. But Buster, I'm just finally beginning to realize what a hopeless, crazy thing is happening tonight. Wait a minute, George, listen. Upstairs. Come on. Chester? Where are you, Chester? It's me, Victor Ames! Salto. Salto, what are you doing here? Mr. Valentine's all right, Salto. He knows the whole story now. But I didn't mark any cards. It wasn't me. Then what are you doing here, Salto? Hiding Leave him waiting. alone, Ames. Leave him alone. And never mind who marked the cards. But what do you think, Brooksy? Four men actually drawing to see which one would be a fall guy. Which one would confess to a murder? I don't believe it. Oh, yes, it's very easy for the two of you to talk like that. I told them it was ridiculous. Same as Russian roulette. Spin the cartridge wheel. See who gets the bullet. Yeah, they couldn't stand to be pointed at. The suspicion, the shadow of guilt. The crime that would never be solved otherwise. Yes, I told them that, but Ames and Norton kept You were willing that. enough, Salter. You didn't have any solution, any way to keep yourself from going insane. Maybe you can't believe it, Miss Brooks. Why should you? You don't have a private hell to live in. I don't think that's exactly what she meant, Ames. Sure, I know it's not like in books where people just forget about murder. But to try to dig yourself out of a swamp by drawing, taking one chance in four of being tapped for guilt, just to lay all the ghosts for the others. If we did it, so what? We did it. We've nearly killed each other trying to make each other confess anyway. I was thinking about the second part of the bargain. Suicide for the elected guilty one. Yeah, to make sure the police would accept that confession. 
Mr. Ames, you might have gone through with it. You're that kind. But I just don't believe that most men Shake, would... Angel. All right, how about it, Soto? That's why you're here, isn't it? To see if Chester would go through with something that you wouldn't do yourself. That I... I'm sorry, Victor. I wouldn't have. I couldn't have. I went along with it. Of course I did. If I'd been high card, I don't know what I would have done, but... Okay, there's one down. Wet feet. By this time, Chester must be aboard the nearest freight train headed for parts unknown. Chester? He signed the confession. But he wouldn't do it. I know he'd been At drinking, the last but... moment, it's a little hard to pull the trigger. Is that so? You're so sure, aren't you? Huh? Moonlight out there. Window, come in. Look. It's him. It's Chester. But he's not coming toward the house. Just walking. That's the path runs up by the bluffs. Yes, and if anything happens to him, it's our fault, Salto. Come on, step on it. Run! Chester! Chester! What's the matter with him? He doesn't even listen. Oh, look out, George. Yeah, these bluffs are pretty steep, aren't they? Chester! I'm going to climb up this way, too. Oh, no, you don't, Buster. Huh? You what? just stay behind me with Miss Brooks. Valentine. There's another way this whole thing tonight can work. But I'm going to see that it doesn't. George, look, he's up on one of the edges. Stand yeah. still. Oh, what a... Norton. Get out of here. Leave him alone. Norton, wouldn't you know? Stand still. I'm warning you, I have a gun. Oh, yeah, sure. The one from the watchman's locker? He didn't take it. Chester didn't take hey, it. Hey, what's all this? So you did. Sure, sure. You guys wouldn't just make a deal for somebody to commit suicide. You'd get him to write a confession and then murder him. He killed her. He killed our woman. He confessed. George, he's up on the edge. Look at him. Leave him alone. He'll jump, I tell you. Look at the way he's acting. I just followed him. To give him the gun he didn't take. James, listen to me. It will all be over. For all of us. Are you inhuman, old... Let it happen. If you don't, it'll be the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, look. We can't stop him from here. And he does look like he wants to jump. Okay, so I've been wrong, so I... Valentine! Get out of the way with that gun! Okay, now you're all right, Martin. Stay there, all of you. Chester! Mr. Chester! I'm all right. Uh, Yes? Mr. Chester, now you listen to me. I can't reach you. But Uh, but get away now. There's something I'm going to do. Yeah, I know, I know. Kill yourself. But you were supposed to do it where she died, weren't you? Wasn't that the agreement, Chester, to make it look good? Can you understand me, Mr. Chester? I'm all right. That's it, that's it. Just keep looking at me. It should have been the living room, though. Or were they always wrong? She was beaten, bruised. I remember they said they never found a weapon. Was it really up here that she died? Was she thrown? It would have looked the same if somebody then carried her body back to her house. I'm going to jump, you know. Get back, get back. No, you're not. You're too curious, Chester. This year, since Dorothy Fullman died, must have been the worst for the one who really killed her. Don't you think so, Mr. Chester? What? What do you mean? But admitting it is worse. Some people can't ever do that. They'd rather die than do that. I'm going to jump. You can't stop me. But you don't even want your death to be a confession, do you? Well, they gave you a chance, the little card drawing. You know the masked deck, the marked one, would be found sooner or later. You deliberately left it behind. No, no, go away. The world would say your confession was a fraud. You are a poor little patsy. Well, any of them could have marked the cards, Norton, Salto, and... The high man marked them. The guilty man, Chester. All I've said is built on that. When there's a drawing, a man can't make another man take a certain card. So if he marks them, he only marks them for himself. Check? Yes, yes, I understand, but... To pick his own card. But the lowest card picked tonight was a nine. If a man wanted a low card, that's not very safe, is it, with 52 cards in the deck? You know, it baffled me for a while, until I saw that you really did want to die. She was faithless. She was bad. Get out of my way! Oh, no, you don't. Now, just hang on. You're going to live, Buster. You're going to write a real confession. to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment.
George, it did work out that way, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, Brooksy, they pieced it together again. That's why Chester went up to the bluffs instead of taking the gun. That's how he had killed Dorothy Fullman a year back. Mm. And if the first confession had gone through, if he'd shot himself, nobody ever would have believed it. Well, the other three would have always thought they railroaded the poor little punchy. Trade their private little hells for new ones. If Mrs. Ames weren't still in love with her husband and called you here. Mm-hmm. George, isn't it uh, remarkable what a woman will do for the man she loves? Remarkable. Forgive, forget, protect. I'll remember that. Darling. <laughs> the very next time I'm suspected of murder. Oh! Good night, Brooksy. You have just heard High Card, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. Personal notice, dangerous my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings, mystery lover. Time for your dead time story. That's right. Dead time. This Let George Do It adventure has so many bodies in it, you'd think the Black Plague hit town. It's called Angel's Grotto, and I think you'll find it a heavenly tale. As usual, it's all about George Valentine and his faithful companion, Brooksy. Companion? Oh, well, I better not tell you any more, as it might spoil the suspense, and that we cannot do. Dear Mr. Valentine, you are fired. I know that's a clumsy way to put it, but I've been a nurse too many years to learn parlor diplomacy. Besides, you've been here at the Grotto Farmhouse for almost a day now, and you haven't found anything. Not a single thing. Not that you should have. Perhaps I was just hysterical this morning when I called you out here. But now even the police seem to agree, don't they? Mr. Moraga's death last evening was an accident. Yes, an accident. And so much as I appreciate your coming to help, why should you stay on? Sincerely, Emily Flood. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Oh, Miss Flood. Miss Flood. Yes. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Oh, here you are. We've been looking all over. Did you get my note? Yes, back at the house, but we wanted to... I don't like it back there. I came Look, out Miss to... Look, I, I was a little surprised. After all, I've barely even had a chance to talk to you since we got here. You see, there's very little factual evidence of any kind. Here. Did you check here? There might have been fingerprints on the handrail that no, might no, show... No, 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 we checked all that. Best fingerprint man in the state found nothing to prove anything. Not even on the wheelchair. No sign of a struggle. He hated that wheelchair. Imagine a man only 45 who usually couldn't sit still for a minute... 
having to spend six months in that thing. It was from a sailing accident. The bone wouldn't heal. Uh Uh-huh. Most of the nurses were scared to death of him. But he liked me, because I wasn't good-looking and I didn't have an eye on his purse. And he had told me about this grotto. The Angel's Grotto. It's beautiful, isn't it? All that moss and the ferns. Yes, I saw it first about this same time yesterday. I just brought him out from the train, and he had to come here first thing, even before supper. Did you try to find the angel like we did? Oh, it's just a legend. Indians who used to work at the mission across the ranch, angel of stone, they say. Crossed by the waterfall, I guess. Yeah, only it's like all those things, huh? The face and clouds, the mountain shaped like a man's head. You can never really see it. Angel of death. He used to come out here and just sit when he was a little boy, you know. It was all so different then, he said. A farm, I mean. Just a place in the woods. And an exciting, scary grotto for boys to tell stories about and dare each other to come close to the edge. They were lovely boys, I guess. Herman hadn't met the bottle and the blondes yet. And that whiny stepbrother who still lives here was just like the real brothers. And John hadn't taken up sailing or broken hips or even gone out to the city to build his steel mills to become the richest man in the state. Why? All been murdered. Mr. Valentine. All right, lady, we're sorry. We we know you're upset. Anyway, there aren't any facts. But last night at supper, well, those guys aren't boys anymore, are they? He hated his family. He said this was the last time he'd ever come back. You want the rest of it? If you're going to fire me, you want my report why I say murder? Go on. Well, you were there. You and he and the boys last night, remember? You were all sitting around the table. No, no, I don't want to talk business tonight. I don't want to talk anything. I'm tired. Emily, have you done my unpacking yet? Well, I thought as soon as supper is over, while you sit outside for a while... Sure, your nurse will take care of things, John. Here, have another glass of wine. It's special. No, 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 I said. Well, the farm isn't business. I only waited till you came, John, to talk about buying a new tractor instead of riding. Oh, for the love of Leave him alone, Jake. He's tired. Can't you hear what he said? Well, I got a setter coming around tonight. Got to get out there and help her with the pups. I only thought if he could spare a thousand dollars or so... Leave him alone. (laughs) Jake, you... You'll just never understand us businessmen. Well, farm's a farm. You can't operate stop on it. Stop it. Both of you, stop it. I came here for a one-day visit, that's all. That day starts tomorrow. Oh, sure, Johnny, sure we understand. I don't come out to the old place often myself, but a little reunion is different, huh? No. I wish I'd stayed in Florida. <laughs> don't blame you. All those classy nurses... Please. Mr. Maraca. Well, Johnny, I know the farm isn't very important anymore to you, but all I wanted to say was... Oh, get out to your barn. Go go be a midwife, (laughs) whatever it is. Now, you nurse, see if you can't give the cook out there a hand with the dishes. I notice Mary's not as speedy as she used to be, Jake. Stay where you are, Emily. Herman, for your information, I'm sick and tired of the steel business, too. Huh? You heard me, Mr. Vice President, in charge of gas and wind? Oh. Oh, yes, yes. Get everybody out. Leave us brothers alone. Have some wine. (laughs) You don't want to talk business, not old Herman. Herman, the diplomatic sponge. Well, I wrote you I'm going to retire, didn't I? In the prime of life, and why not? And that means for my family, too. I'm here to cut all strings at once. Lazy relatives, steel mills, old family homesteads, the works. I'm sick and tired of supporting a worthless bunch Please, please, don't. You're tired. Yes. You'll upset yourself. You said everything could wait till tomorrow. Everything you have to say to him. Yes, yes. All, all right. All right. I'm sorry, Emily. Uh, you two fellows. Wheelchair doesn't make a guy like me very friendly, but but I mean it. I'm moving to Florida for good. Only, well, we'll talk tomorrow, huh? Sure, Johnny, sure. Sure, we, we understand. No, you don't. You're going to work for a living, Herman. Well, what's the matter with you, Jake? Huh? Earn your own tractor. <laughs> me? I'm tougher than all of you, I guess. Well, what's the matter? Want to murder me or something? Well, come on, come on, say something. Want to murder me or something? 
And then, Miss Flood, you brought John Moraga out in his wheelchair to sit in the evening air, and you went back to do the unpacking and clean up the dishes for Mary, the cook, who was out helping Jake. Brother Herman, he went to his room, so the testimony says, where he drank that wine all by himself. Jake, he came out and smoked a cigarette for a while with the impatient invalid, then went to the barn and was busy for some time delivering a litter of puppies. Your testimony's very complete, Mr. Valentine. So what? So, ten o'clock, you came out to bring Mr. Moraga in for the night, and he was missing. Because around nine o'clock, according to police reports, the doctors, his wheelchair parked here overlooking the grotto where you left him, got a little bit too close to the edge. Hey, look out. Oh. 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 But there wasn't any evidence. You couldn't find anything. No. No, no evidence to show whether the brakes just slipped and the wheelchair rolled over, or whether Mr. Moraga was pushed off the edge. 200 feet down to the rocks. And all those hatreds and everything. Even motives. But everybody's story seemed to check. Yeah, that's it. Nothing so far can be proved. Mr. Valentine, you kicked that rock just now to see how I would react. Mm, maybe. Well, I think you should understand. There won't ever be any evidence. His death was an accident. I believe that now. So get out. Get out. Please, go Johnny couldn't have been too surprised, Mr. Valentine. Said he saw the angel clear as death. Omen, I guess you'd call it. We smoked a cigarette together down there, you know, half hour before his death. Surprised at what, Jake? Huh? Well, the brake slipped on his chair, don't you think? You figure he was unconscious when it happened. We don't even know that. Look, uh, we're leaving. I only asked... His see. own fault in one way. Had a fixation on that place he did. Ought to be the devil's grotto, I always claimed. Or maybe we could blast the marble and make a quarry. Did you see me, Mr. Valentine? Oh, yes, Mr. Moraga. Uh, look, Jake, do you mind? Uh... Yeah, sure, sure, Mr. Valentine, sure. Got to see Bob. Mr. Mr. Moraga, testimony showed that last night your brother called you vice president uh, in charge. In charge of gas and wind. Yeah. Uh, old Johnny was the only one who had any brains here. Any... Are you part owner of the Moraga Steel Mills or just a paid employee? You mean am I just the boss's brother? Yeah. Yes, if you like. Uh huh. And now that he's dead, you're you leaving, Mr. Valentine. Oh no, no, don't get me wrong, Jake and I, we appreciate what you've done. But also we're tired of everybody looking cross eyed at the guys who benefit. I should have told that nurse she was being officious to get you up here in the first place. She was badly upset. Well, so am I. Johnny was my brother. Ah. These little nurses are get more conscientious the richer the patient is. Oh, oh how dare you! Mary, listen to me. What in the name? I will not, and I won't leave here until I'm I... sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hit you, but you can't talk like that to me. I'll talk any way I please. I've been here 15 years. I'll call you all the names I Stop can. Stop it, I said. Stop it. All right, nursey, now cut it out. Cut oh. it out. What'd she do to you, Mary? Huh. What'd she do? Don't look at me that Miss way. Flood? Hey, hey, easy, please. Huh. Miss Flood. Know what she was up to, Mr. Moraga? She was firing me. Yes, she fired me. You... She. You what? Now, look here, Miss Flood. You've been fighting Take it easy, will you? Here, Emily, you're all right. It was the way she looked. The way she... I'm sorry, Mary. I didn't mean... You see, Mr. Moraga, I happened to overhear this young lady and a policeman Please, talking. Please, no. You just Let found me... out the nurse is really a wife, eh, Mary? <gasps> What's that, George? Just guessing... But it would explain why she could try to fire you, Mary. Why you laugh at the word miss. Not to mention some things John Moraga said last night. Or why just a nurse should be so curious and hire me you and try... this mousy little flat Yes, heel. yes. We were married a week ago in Florida. I did tell the police, Mr. Valentine, I wanted to tell you, but I wanted to wait until... Oh, just because I'm his nurse and he was wealthy. Just because... Stop looking at me like that! Nobody's looking any way they shouldn't. I wondered what his big announcement today was going to be. What made that hot-headed sucker want to sell his business, cut us off, go gallivanting off... Get out of here! 
Every one of you. This is my house now. Get out! So you married a week and now he's dead. Yes. He's dead. He's dead. Don't look that way. Can't you understand? I loved him. And he loved me. Don't give me that. Oh, I wish I were dead too. Leave me alone or I will be. I will be. Yes. A good act. Good act, Mr. Moraga? Are you changing your mind? I thought you were so sure your brother's death was an accident. You're listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Back to George Valentine, Angel's Grotto, a place of great beauty, a place where a man fell 200 feet to his death on the rocks below, a man in a wheelchair sitting alone in the moonlight. But, according to the police, that death was an accident. There's no further reason for you to stay around. Still, if your name is George Valentine, well, what can you do except stall for time, pretend you can't start your car? Say, uh, look, uh, Jake, is there some rope around here? I may need it when the mechanic comes to give me a tow. Yeah, in the shed over there helps out. Mm. Oh, okay, thanks. Get out of the way. Good idea. So that fool Emily won't hang herself. Huh, there's a good one. <laughs> Come on, Brooksy. Let the rest of them think we've gone. You realize how short our time is? You mean what he just said about Emily? George, I want to go back in and no, talk to No, Brooksy, we got to find evidence before somebody else gets murdered. <laughs> Tracks, all right, Brooksy. And here's where the wheelchair stood. George, you and the police went over it inch by well, inch. Jake gave me an idea. He was wondering earlier if John Moraga was conscious when he fell, remember? Yes. Okay, now look, I'm John Moraga. I'm in a wheelchair, see, and I'm sitting here. I'm a strong guy. Strong? George, John had been laid up for six months. Well, that's not long enough to break down a dynamo like him. The point is, when he was sitting here, it would have been pretty hard to take him by surprise. You mean somebody slugged him I first? Don't or... know. There's no sign of a struggle. Police thought he might have fallen asleep. George, suppose he'd been drowned. Huh? I mean, remember that wine last night at Oh, Sunday? yeah, I thought of that. But it's like everything else. Nothing left to show. Nothing left but the tracks of the two wheels here. And... Hey, Brooksy, look. They just go in practically a dead straight line all the way out to the edge and over. Okay, Brooksy, throw me that rope there. George, It's all right you... now. It's all right. This tree will hold me. Oh, George. Just take it easy, will you? There we are. This is one thing we didn't check. But, but they combed every rock down below there. They when I kicked that rock loose this afternoon, remember what happened? It bounced. Okay, I'll find out what happened last night, and I won't bounce either. I hope. Hey, Brooksy, I can see the angel from down here. Yeah, it really does look like one, you know. A cross by the... George, your rope's twisting. I'm all right. There's some stuff to hang on to here. Angel of death, huh? I can't even see you anymore. Brooksy. What'd you say, George? Hey, not so loud, will you? I was just looking down before. It's a watch. What? No, no, no. Piece of watch chain. Sure, sure, he did hit here before he dropped to the rocks. I thought so, the way the cliff curves out. It's... Don't go any farther. What if he did lose part of his watch chain? It doesn't tell you anything oh, about... Oh, doesn't it? Hooked on a little twig, some scrub trees here growing in a crevice. Well, you know, it doesn't have any bark. Yeah, that's right, two places here, no bark. I'll tell better in the daylight. But, Brooksy, there are kick marks, too. 
He, he grabbed here as he fell. Must have hung on for some time, several minutes maybe, before his strength gave out. Somebody's coming, George. Mayday. Hey, I called you, but I didn't hear you answer. Well, I went to see George. I, listen. Listen to what? Oh, it's gone now. Okay, come on. Get this rope out of sight. Here, duck back here. Yeah. In the bushes. Yeah, that's better. Oh, George, I hate high places. You crazy. But I little... learned something, Brooksy. The fact he clung there proves John Moraga was conscious. He couldn't have grabbed on there unless he was perfectly all right when he went over. He wasn't slugged, doped, anything. Just pushed. But those straight line tracks. Well, I can think of a person he might have trusted. Never guess what was going to happen until the last minute. Oh, George. Any of them could have come down here without being seen. His shouts when he was hanging there wouldn't have been heard. Oh, Brooksy, look, stop evading it. You know who I'm talking about. All those tears don't hide her motive. George, I, I just can't believe that a girl would... Yeah. You see what I see? Little Emily. George, she's crying. That's what I heard before. Yeah. Walking like she didn't know where she was. <laughs> George, she was she were dead, too. She was hysterical, but she said I'm she... I'm like Jake. I didn't take it seriously. But she's going where we were. George, grab her. No, she's no, gonna... stop. Uh, uh, Emily? Oh, you stunned me. Oh? <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean to. It's Herman. Beautiful night, isn't it? Mr. Mag. What are you doing down here, anyway? You know, don't you? Why do you ask? Oh, well, I, I didn't believe a good-looking girl like you with her head and her shoulders would seriously think of carrying out a threat You like think that. I'm ugly. You said so. A stupid, flat-heeled nurse. Uh-huh. Oh, well, really, it isn't anything. No, stay where you are. I don't think there's room for both of us here, Mr. Moraga. All right. All right. I loved your brother. I loved John. I'm 35. I'm not pretty. I know what I am. But he loved me, too. Now, now. No. Please don't touch me. Don't come any closer. Oh, it's all right. I know how you feel. It was an accident. Leave me alone. Oh, just an accident, that's all. I told you, don't touch me. Well. You big fat fools. Miss Swan. You walked right into it, didn't you? Look out, my arm. I've handled patients ten times as tough as you are. My arm. Look out, the edge is right. what I said, didn't you? I believed I'd come down here and be thinking of jumping when it's you who's going Look to go. Come on, Bessie, step on him. He's the one who's liable to be killed. I'll see you! I'll see you! Get back here, I said, get back! Let go of me! Okay, sister! <laughs> All right, all right. Oh. Take it easy, all of you. Good Lord, what's the matter She's with you? She's all right, George. Let go. Leave me alone. She would have killed me. She was trying to I push know, me. I know, I know. We saw We it thought it was going to be the other way around. Oh? But it never occurred to me. She has the same motive for getting rid of you, Mr. Moraga. You're the only real brother. You're in her way, too. Uh, Herman, for the love of Pete, why the crazy little fool? I thought that she was... Shove me. She was she trying right, to... Will you please stop it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We prevented a murder. Now I can prove it. Murder number two. Hey, did you find out something? That... Mr. Fellinger! Lady, will you stop crying for one minute, please? I didn't say you killed your husband. You didn't kill John Moraga. George. Emily, the tragedy we prevented tonight was you killing for vengeance because you thought the murder would never be solved. Herman did it. I was sure. The police couldn't find any clues for you, but you were like I was. You knew it had to be murder, and so you tricked Herman into following you down here. The only trouble was when you tried to take the law in your own hands, you picked the wrong person. I... What? Yeah, that's right. He didn't do it. He's demonstrated that pretty well right now, hasn't he? Only, uh, uh you, uh, what's your name, Cook? Uh, Mary? Oh. oh. Did you ever see the angel? Did, did I? What? Come on, come on, the angel on the rocks. You've lived around here 15 years, you said. You've heard the legend. Oh, that. No, no, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no angel in the rocks, Valentine. That's oh, just Oh, old... yes, there is. Because I saw it. And John Moraga said he saw it, too. Oh, no. No, he After didn't. you left He's... him down here, Emily, he supposedly said it while smoking a cigarette. With you, Jake. Yeah, wait a minute. I never said oh, it. Oh, yes, you did. I remember it, George. And that was your mistake. Because Buster, that angel turns out to be a real angel of death. 
You can't see that rock formation from any place except halfway down a straight cliff. No wonder the Indians had a legend. So when could John possibly have seen it except when he was climbing down there after he'd been shoved, clinging there, hanging there? Why did John scream out that he saw the angel? Was he pleading with you to help him? And did you just stand there and laugh at him, Jake? No, no, you're crazy. Me, I'm just a farmer. I sure, don't... you're a big, strong guy. And that's why the tracks of the wheelchair were nice and straight, Brooksy. A man strong enough could just tip it back, load and all, and give it a roll. Now, you listen to me. I was up with that setter of mine. I was clean out in the barn. Mary, help me. Mary, do the... you know what the penalty is for providing a false alibi in a murder case? No, no, I, I don't even know what you're You'd talking... better tell me fast, lady, how many of those puppies you delivered. Mr. Valentine... How much of that two me? hours Jake really spent with you in that barn? Oh. Hey, get her, she's running. No, no, we'll get her all right. I don't believe anything that dumb old thing... That's that... all, Jake! <laughs> Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. Angel's Grotto. And the angel really did solve it. Well, Brooksy, the weak need accomplice didn't help Jake much. Yeah, but Mary wasn't really mixed up in but the... But she started the ball rolling. Nothing else he could do but confess after that. I suppose she wanted to keep the farm as much as he did. And Moraga was going to take it away, sell everything. Mm -hmm. And to think it all started with our being fired. <laughs> Emily tried to do it the right way, George. She hired you to find evidence of what she thought had happened. Yeah, and... By woman's intuition. So, just on the basis of that, she tries to play angel of destruction, of vengeance. Well, it's crazy and wrong. But she loved John Moraga. Those tears were all true. Hmm. She told us how much she loved him. First and only love of her life. I could tell. And he loved her just as much. I know, I know. Love, love, love. Hey, how come you're such an authority on the subject, Brooksy? With you around, I'll be darned if I know. You have just heard Angel's Grotto, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly, inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs> The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. A detective as well known as Mike Shane is in the limelight pretty much of the time. This evening, Mike is not in the limelight, but behind the footlights. Or rather, he is just about to be. A new review is opening at the Empire Theater, and for reasons still unknown, Mike has been asked to attend the rehearsal. Right now, Mike and his pretty associate, Phyllis Knight, are waiting at the stage door. Yes, what do you want, son? We'd like to see Miss Beverly Fire, please. I'm sorry, son. Rehearsal going on but now. She asked it? us to come. It's business. Oh, business. Well, then, I guess it's okay. Come on in. Miss Pryor's dressing room is number four. Well, thanks. Mike, how long is it since you've seen Miss Beverly Pryor? Oh, years. <laughs> Ten years. 
We got to be good friends when I spent a couple of vacations down in New Orleans. Seems to me she could have told you what she wanted over the phone. Well, we'll know in three seconds. This is dressing room four. Come in. Oh, my. Hello. Oh, darling, let me give you a... <laughs> Bev. Mike, I've been gracious to see you, Mike. It's so wonderful to see you again. <laughs> oh, I'd almost forgotten you were so handsome. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Oh, I almost forgot, too. Phyllis, I mean, uh, Beverly, I want you to meet my... I mean, uh, I want you to meet well, Miss Phyllis. Oh, Mike, you haven't gone and got yourself married. No, Miss Pryor. Not yet. I'm Phyllis Knight, Mike's associate. Oh, uh, just in a business way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you do? Beverly, I didn't know you'd gone on the stage. Oh, I was always good at dancing. You remember, Mike. <laughs> I've got a specialty number in the review. Oh. South American dances, rumbas and sambas. Do you like my costume? Oh, sure. It's uh, <clears throat> very colorful. <laughs> <laughs> Shows off my legs very well, don't you think? Uh-huh. <laughs> you remember what skinny legs I used to uh, have. Miss Pryor, Mike and I don't want to hold up your rehearsal. Oh, no, no, that's right. Beverly, you said on the phone that you were afraid of something serious happening. Somebody connected with your show. Oh, oh yes, I, I was pretty scared yesterday. But some changes are being made tonight, and, well, I think things will all straighten out now. Well, what was wrong? Well, maybe it was my imagination. We've all been so nervous and hot-tempered. Yes? Well, I thought somebody was planning a murder. Somebody would... Mm -hmm. What made you think so? Oh, you're beautiful. Ready for your spot? Larry says you're going to follow up. Oh, come you, in, then. boys. I want you to meet an old friend of mine. Mike, this is our comedy team. Sweeney and March. Mike Shane and Miss Knight. Hello. Is the salt sent to the pepper? Shake. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do? They're just dandy. Snug as a rug in a bug. <laughs> you get the switch. Snug as a rug. <laughs> All friends of Ben's, huh? Uh, well, you believe me, this little gal's going places. You know, this show's just third base for her. Next strike will be home plate or Hollywood. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sweeney thinks he can sell me to Hollywood. If he'd stick to comedy and forget the age of you wait, well. you wait, you'll see. I'll have Sammy Goldwyn and Louis B. strangling each other for you. Hey, come on, Sweeney. We're late for us. Okay, yeah, we'll be seeing you. Yeah, uh, sure. A <laughs> slap-happy pair. Mike, why don't you, Miss Knight, go out in the wings and watch their routine? Well, I want to get your story first. Now, who was planning a murder? Oh, it's all straightened out now, Mike. After rehearsal, we can have a little supper, and I'll, and I'll tell you all about it. Now, go on, Scoot. I've got to finish dressing. Well, all right. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Haven't you anything to say? Angel. Your vacations in New Orleans must have been very pleasant. Oh, <laughs> yes, very pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss a joke? You missed something. <laughs> uh, the hotter a woman gets, the more she freezes. <laughs> Okay, Sweeney, let's take that railroad spot again. All right, fine, you all set? Let's go. Right. Uh, it doesn't really matter, Mr. March. Any train will do, but I must have a ticket for Hollywood. Well, I understand that, Mr. Sweeney, but I can't let you have a ticket unless your trip is essential. Uh, what sort of business are you in? Oh, well, I'm president of the 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company. 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, we manufacture a sausage that's 12 inches long and contains 12 different kinds of meat. Well, what's the advantage? What's the advantage, Mr. March? Just this. If you're slicing a piece of our sausage and someone comes up to you and says, no matter how thin you slice it, it's still baloney, they're probably wrong. It may be liverwurst. Oh, oh, come now, Mr. Sweeney. After all, how can I give you a train reservation for something like that? Well, if you must know, I've got to get to Hollywood to see my doctor. Oh, oh, you have a serious illness, do you? Yes, I suffer from very bad attacks of bakery face. <laughs> bakery face, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, under uh, my doctor's orders, I wash my face in baking powder and lemon juice. Well, then what happens? I break out in cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sweeney, it seems to me that the thing... Help, 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 help. Wait a minute. What's, what's going well, on? Mike, Mike, it's the old man, the doorman. Yes, and he's pointing into that dressing room. Come on. Estelle! Estelle! She's murdered! Wait a minute, I see her. Hell, I see her, Mike, in the dressing room. All right, stand back, everybody. Stand back. You're not coming in here. Who says we're not going in there? I do. I'm a detective. Dad, you keep him out. I sure will. Oh, it's not a pretty picture, Mike. Stabbed in the back right at her dressing table. Hmm. Done with a huge knife. A special kind of knife with a gold hilt. Mike. Yes? Look the mirror right above her head. Oh, uh -huh. some letters and lipstick. Yeah, she tried to tell us something. It spells 
B E V E. The rest of the letters are just a red scrawl. Oh, I'm afraid we know where they were meant to be. B E V E. R L Y. Beverly. Beverly Pryor. <laughs> return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, since we told you last week that post-war gasoline was here, many of you have already tried a tank full of the powerful new 76. But just in case the Minuteman in your locality hasn't been able to supply you with the new 76 gasoline, be patient. As fast as the modern 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company can make and blend it, our tankers and trucks are hurrying post-war 76 gasoline to you. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing its arrival. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tank full of the new 76. Performance of the new 76 gasoline far exceeds pre-war standards. You'll like its lighter, faster, more powerful action. And you'll like the price, too. It sells at regular prices. No increase. So, to make your old car act like new, put in a tank full of the gasoline of the future, the new 76. Now going on sale wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76, your Union Oil Minuteman Station. Mike's backstage visit to the Empire Theater has taken a grim turn. Mike and Phyllis have found a girl stabbed to death. Behind a closed door in the Dead Star's dressing room, Mike and Phyllis tell their story to the inspector. And that's about it, Inspector. The old mm. fellow who watches the stage door discovered the body. We were out in the wings watching a comedy routine when we heard him yell. The murdered girl is Estelle Carroll, Inspector. She was the dance partner of Vic Hunter. Carroll and Hunter, they're listed on the billboard. Yeah, sure, kids. But this gal, Beverly Pryor, you say she called you here tonight because you thought a murder was cooking? How does Beverly know so much? Well, you see, Inspector... I see plenty. I see in that mirror right above Estelle's head the letters B-E-V-E written in lipstick. Estelle tried to write the name of her murderer. I was coming to that. Just give me time. Now, Phyllis checked through Estelle's purse, and according to Estelle's driver's license, she was five feet four inches tall. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm six feet tall, Inspector. Yet these lipstick letters are three or four inches above my head. Now, I've heard you, Inspector, lecture your boys on the squad. That a person will usually write on the level with his eyes. Sure, it's a safe generality. Well, then, Mike, you think somebody else wrote the letters B-E-V-E, -E, huh? Some tall person to give us a false clue? That's possible, Phil, but we can't prove it. No, no, but I would like to see a woman who has been stabbed in the back rise clear out of her chair, take a lipstick, and scrawl some letters 12 inches above her eyes. All right, while we're on the subject of clues, what else have we got? Well, I searched her dressing table. It's just the usual stuff. Except for one thing, this old-fashioned locket necklace. Hmm. Smear of blood on the locket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From the murderer's fingers, probably. We found it thrown in the bottom drawer. Yeah, mm -hmm. but more important, Inspector, look at the inside of the locket. There, you, you can see a patch of glue and a trace of paper sticking to it. Yeah. Well, there was a photograph pasted inside this. And if we can find out whose photograph it was, I think we may know why Estelle was murdered. Okay, let's start asking questions, beginning with Beverly Pryor. No, oh, if you want, Inspector, I'll go get her for you. Thanks, Phil. Hmm. Mike, has Beverly seen the body in this writing on the mirror? No, no, we kept everybody out of the dressing room. Good, and I think I'll drape this towel over the mirror. Just as well if Miss Pryor doesn't see our own name on the glass. Or any of the others, for that matter. Hmm, this peculiar-looking knife. Gold-painted hilt. Must be a theatrical prop. Mm, probably. Whoever the killer was, he or she must have stood behind Estelle as she sat at the dressing table. And while they were talking, plunged the knife in. Assuming the killer was supposed to be her friend. Well, sure, sure. There's no signs of a struggle. And no closet for a murderer to spring out of. And this may be this window here. Seems to open into an alley. Well, we checked it, Inspector. It was locked. Uh, Miss Pryor, this is the inspector of homicide. How do you do, Miss Pryor? If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions. I, uh, no, no, of course not. You want to ask me how I knew there was going to be a murder? Yes. Well, uh, I didn't know. But I saw something during rehearsal last night. Well, that's why I telephoned for you, Mike. And what did you see, Beverly? Well, uh, I was standing in the wings, waiting to do my number. Estelle was out front rehearsing her solo. She was supposed to do pirouettes clear across the stage into the opposite wing. And, well, just as she reached the curtain, 
I saw long, thin swords slide out through the curtain. I, I screamed and, well, I still stopped. That's all that saved her life. You didn't see who held the sword? I, I couldn't. Did anyone else in the cast see who it was? Oh, I, I didn't tell them. I, I said I screamed because I saw a rat. May I ask why the deception, Miss Pryor? I didn't know who it might be. I, I mean, I wasn't sure. Maybe I just imagined I saw a sword. The stage lighting is so uncertain. Yet you it... took it seriously enough to ask Mike to come here tonight. Beverly, we want you to examine the knife here in Estelle's back. Oh, it's... Ghastly. Yes, but do you recognize the knife? Is it a theatrical prop? Yes. It's it's from Harry's act. Harry? Harry Frizee, the magician. The famous Frizee. Would he have any reason to kill Estelle? I don't know. Okay, let's find out. Let's talk to everybody. Oh, hi, Tubbix. Hey, hi. hold on. Come back here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who are you? I'm, uh, I'm the doorman, sir. I was just passing... Oh, yes, and you're the man who found the body. Yes, sir. I had a telegram to deliver to Miss Carroll and her partner... I thought they were both in the dressing room. When I opened the door, man alive, there she was. You didn't tell me anything about a telegram. Well, uh, I, I forgot. Here, I got it in my pocket. Let me see that. Oh, it's addressed to Vic Hunter and Estelle Carroll. Yeah, two or three telegrams in the last uh, couple of days. Think so? Oh, Sergeant. That's Inspector. Check with the telegraph office. I want the text of all wires received here in the past week. Right away, sir. Inspector, listen to this. Yeah. Carroll and Hunter have booked you three weeks, Club Belvedere, starting next Sunday. Stop. Top deal. Regards, sign McGlynn. Yeah, I have that telegram, please. Huh? I'm Vic Hunter. Oh, Estelle's partner. Mr. Hunter, do you know if Estelle had any enemies? No, not real enemies. She, well, she had several bad quarrels the last couple of days with March and with Beverly. I huh? heard that, Vic. You know it wasn't Beverly's fault. Estelle was jealous. She knew Beverly was going to steal the show. Don't be silly. Nobody can steal a show from Estelle. Then why did she tell me she'd fix it so I'd never dance again? Okay, okay, okay. Estelle was jealous. Let it go at that. Now... What about this fight with March? All right, I'll tell you. I suppose everybody knows about it anyway. I was trying to get Estelle to marry me, but she kept turning me down. We began a fight. I and... told you, March, you were wasting your time on her, but oh. no, no, you wouldn't listen to me. You even had to take our paycheck, my paycheck, to buy her an engagement. Well, she right. gave it back to yeah, me. Yeah, she gave it back. Look at your money. Don't worry about your money. Quiet, quiet. 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 Did any of you notice anything strange in Estelle's action the past few days? Did she seem afraid or worried? No, she no, just her fight with Beverly and March. Mr. Hunter, we found a necklace and locket in Estelle's dresser, an old-fashioned gold chain and locket. Yes, she always wore it. She called it her good luck charm. Whose picture did she keep inside the locket? Why, I think it was a man's photograph. I assumed it was some fellow she was or had been in love with. She never told you his name, Mr. Hunter? No, Estelle was very close-mouthed. Mm -hmm. I want to establish the time element in this case. Estelle and Mr. Hunter finished rehearsal and then went back to their dressing rooms. Now, sometime during the next 15 minutes, the murder occurred. Now, during those 15 minutes, where was everybody? Well, I was in my dressing room. Part of the time, Mike and Miss Knight were visiting with me. And Sweeney and I were just buzzing around. We stopped in and gabbed a minute with Beverly and her pals. Yeah, well, we're in the clear. A comedy guy couldn't carve a hole in a gal's back and then go out front and panic him with gags. Sure. We'd be laying turkey eggs all over the place. I'm not the one to say that you didn't, Mr. Sweeney. Huh? Didn't which? Say, listen, if you mean that... Inspector... Our... We were going to talk to the magician, the famous Frizee. Yeah, it's about time. Anybody know where we can find him? Well, he was in his dressing room a few minutes ago. I'll show you where it Never is. Never mind if you'll just tell us. Oh, all right. You go right down here. The famous Frizee's dressing room is the last on the left. Okay. Thank you, Beverly. You kids got any ideas yet? I have. Huh? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know why none of these people voluntarily mentioned the famous Frizee. They know everybody in this theater is under suspicion. Yet nobody refers to the magician, mm. the owner of the knife which stabbed Estelle to death. Right. Well, probably because none of them noticed the knife. Aside from Beverly, I'm not sure the others even know how Estelle was killed. Mm, one of them does, Mike. Huh? He said a comedian couldn't carve a hole in a girl's back and then go out and do a gag routine. Swing. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. This must be the dressing room here. No answer. Well, there's his costume on the chair, but no Mr. Frizee. That's blame funny. We haven't seen him anywhere around the theater. He's just disappeared. Mm, it's not surprising for a magician. <clears throat> hey. Hey, that window curtain. It's blowing. Yeah, and the window's wide open. And an alley right outside. I'll bet he ducked out the window and up the alley. Oh, great. Now I'll have to drag out the old net. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Low gear for a moment, Inspector. Look at that sword rack on the wall there. Sabers, swords, daggers... Yeah, 
in several blank places in the collection. The rack is minus two daggers, the same type that killed Estelle. And also minus two swords. Swords. Oh. Huh. Oh, what, Angel? I just remembered. When I went out to get Beverly for you boys, I found her in Sweeney and March's dressing yeah, room. Yeah, and... And I saw one of those swords on top of their trunk. Uh-uh. And last night, Beverly saw a sword come out of the curtains intended for Estelle. Mike! Mike and Fetch! What's about it, Beverly? What's wrong? I just got a phone call. A man told me he knew who killed Estelle. Huh? He asked me to meet him in my hotel room. I didn't know what to do. Well, I said yes. Could you recognize his voice? Oh, I think so. He was trying to disguise his voice, but it sounded like... like Harry Frizee. Frizee, swell. Then we know where to find him. Oh, I'm scared, Mike. Everybody in the troop knows I called you in tonight because I knew something. Maybe he's trying to lure me outside. That's exactly what he's trying to do, Beverly. Now, you're going to stay right here. We'll keep that appointment for you. Give me the key to your room. Uh-huh. Here it is. It's 9.05. Frizee is right across the hall, number 906. What time did he say to meet him? At 9.30. And it's 9.10 right now. Okay, Inspector, we've got ourselves a date. Ninth floor. Room 905, that would be this way. Yeah, yeah, here we are. That's for Z's room across the hall. And a light shining over the transom. Okay, let's talk to him in his own room. We may get a chance to see something. That's funny. His lights are on. This is another vanishing act. Let's try the door. Unlocked. More than that. Look at the doorknob. And my hand. Blood. Mike, is... is that the famous Frazee? I'm afraid the word is was, Inspector. It was the famous Frazee. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane in his adventures. How about it, friends? Have you gotten your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline? It's available right now at no increase in price at many Minuteman stations. The new post-war 76 is freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company. That means you're getting the benefit of the latest in war-proven refining methods when you get the new 76. It's lighter, faster action beats all pre-war performance. You'll notice the difference as soon as you come down on the accelerator. So for a real motoring thrill, get a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. If your minute man doesn't have the new 76 today, please be patient. Our tankers and trucks are making deliveries with all possible speed, but some outlying districts of necessity take longer to supply. But whether you're able to buy the new 76 right now, or whether you have to wait a few more days you'll find it the gasoline you've been waiting for. It's the new 76 gasoline, now going on sale at your Union Oil Minute Man stations. For the second time tonight, a murderer's knife has struck. The prize suspect, the famous Frazee, has been killed. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have just completed a search of the dead magician's hotel room. Ransack, turned upside down, pulled apart. I wonder what under the sun the killer was looking for. Well, we haven't the foggiest idea what to look for or what's missing. Mm. But at least this time we know the motive. Frizzi was killed because he knew the identity of Estelle's murderer, huh? You can't even say that, Phil. Huh? Don't forget Frizzi's knife was found in Estelle's back. He may have committed the first murder tonight, then somebody else killed him. Oh, I want to take a really good look at that body. Hmm. Still wearing his overcoat, so he had just come in. Wound on the back of the head showed the murderer first tried to put him out quietly. Hey, Inspector. What? His wristwatch, it's smashed. Yeah, it stopped at, let's see, 8.57. 8.57? Inspector, when Beverly rushed in and told us about Frizee's phone call, remember I looked at my watch? That's right, you said it was ten minutes past nine. Hey, hey, then Frizee was already dead. He wasn't disguising his voice on that phone call. Somebody was trying to imitate for Z. And I'll bet you that somebody made the phone call from right inside the theater to get us out of the scene for a while. Well, if you're right, Mike, it's a darn good thing I phoned the sergeant to bring these people here to the hotel. Hey, kids. Yes, what? Angel? 
Y you notice that Frizzy's right hand is closed tight, in fact, awfully tight. Yeah. You suppose maybe he's got something in his fist? Well, we shouldn't disturb the body till the coroner gets here. Go ahead. Perhaps if I just pried his fingers open. You're right, honey. Mm, let's see it. A photograph, a tiny round picture of a baby. Yeah. And look at the back of the photo. Dried glue. This is the picture that was torn out of Estelle's locker. Inspector, I've got everybody outside for you. Sweeney, March, Hunter, and Sprayer. Okay, Sergeant. We'll talk to them one at a time. Bring in Sweeney. Yes, sir. Mr. Sweeney. This thing gives me the creeps. When are you guys going to stop finding bodies? Mr. Sweeney, you have one of Frizzy's swords in your dressing room. Mind telling us what for? Oh, that. Well, March and I borrowed a couple of them from Frizzy. We were cooking up a burlesque on his magic act. Oh. We figured we could get some laughs. I it. see. And now, uh, will you look at this photograph here? Sure. Do you recognize this baby? No. That's all, sir. Okay, Sergeant, bring in March. Mr. March. Mr. March, would you explain why you had one of Frizzy's swords in your dressing room tonight? Sure, we've had him a couple of days. Sweeney, now we're going to do a takeoff on Frizzy's act. Yeah, oh, that checks up. Do you recognize the baby in this photograph? Mm, no, sir. Okay, thank you, that's all. all right. Sergeant, Mr. Hunter. Yes, gentlemen? Oh, Mr. Hunter, we found that photograph which was missing from your partner's locket. You have? Good. Yes, yes, here, this is it. A baby's picture, and as uh, we recall, Mr. Hunter, you said that there was a man's picture inside. Well, there was the last time I saw it. She must have changed photographs recently. Do you know who this baby might be? Not the slightest idea. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Will you send in Miss Pryor next? Oh, yes, Inspector. Yes, I will. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. One of the boys just came from the telegraph office. Here are the copies of all the telegrams sent to the theater. Swell. Then hold Miss Pryor outside till we've read them. Yes, sir. Let's see. The first wire is four days ago from Chicago. Regret to inform you your father passed away last night. Stop. Will you attend funeral? Sign Norman L. Tyre, gang cop and tire attorneys. Well, the second wire is a duplicate. Two days later. And the last is dated yesterday. No word from you, so funeral tomorrow. Stop. Have been named administrator of your father's estate. Stop. You are again beneficiary because of John Jr. Signed Norman L. Tyre. John Jr. Again beneficiary because of John. Well, maybe I'm crazy, but I say the baby in this picture is John. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Back at the theater, I asked everybody if Estelle acted in any way peculiar the past few days, if she'd been frightened or worried. Yeah, and they all said that she was not upset. Well, then that's our answer. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. Somebody had better go back to the theater and pick up Dad, the old doorman. <laughs> Now, Dad, now I want you to be very careful. Okay. How many telegrams did you receive addressed to Estelle? Why, three to Estelle and one to the team of Carol and Hunter. Uh-huh. Now, um, you all remember that I asked uh, whether or not Estelle had shown any signs of being worried or upset? And you all said no. Yes, yes. right. Three of these telegrams told of her father's death. Well, she certainly didn't say anything or show any signs of grief. The answer to that is easy, Mr. Hunter. She never saw those telegrams. They were deliberately withheld from her. But, but uh, I delivered them. At least I gave them to Mr. Hunter. You're right. I did withhold them. I didn't want Estelle to go to pieces and ruin our act. How long did you and Estelle work in that act, Mr. Hunter? Over three years. And during that time, your impression was that the locket she wore as a good luck charm contained a photograph of a man? Some fella she was or had been in love with, I think you said. That's right. You're lying, Mr. Hunter. What do you mean? Does this look like the photo of a man? It's a baby. Estelle's baby. I don't know. I told you. You told us a lot that you didn't mean to, Mr. Hunter, but you didn't tell us that Estelle's baby was your baby, too. That you and Estelle were married, that you that you had the killer. I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. And you killed Frizzy because he knew. Frizzy found the baby's photograph. How, I don't know, but that doesn't matter. Frizzy put two and two together. You had to kill him. I can only guess at your original motive, but uh, that's something I'm quite sure the inspector will ring from you when he gets you down to police headquarters. <laughs> There it is, Angel. I know, Mike, but I still don't see how Hunter could expect to get away with it. But didn't he know somebody would check up on those telegrams? Well, certainly, honey, but he miscalculated on one thing. Hmm? He didn't know a private detective was going to be backstage right after the killing. 
He didn't have time to plant the telegrams in Estelle's purse or dresser. Well, I don't understand how that would help. I'm sure it would. Then he would have played it differently. Hunter would have admitted the marriage. He would have told us Estelle and he were planning to leave the show because Estelle had come into her father's money. Uh, as I see it, the reason he had to kill her was because she was going to divorce him. Oh, that would cut him off from Estelle's inheritance. Yes. Mike. Yes. Thought you'd like to know we just got a confession. Seems Estelle was planning to divorce Vic and... Ah, just what I finished telling Phil, Inspector. Oh, oh, but there's one thing, one thing. How did Hunter make that phone call imitating Frizee? From the theater, Mike. He called Beverly to give himself an alibi. He wanted us to think Frizee was still alive while Hunter was in the theater. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the one question that worried me. <laughs> okay, Inspector. Thanks a lot. Mm, Michael. Uh, yes? Uh, there's one more question, and it worries me. Hmm? When you were down in New Orleans, just how friendly were you with Beverly? Oh, why, Miss Knight? Well? <laughs> uh, I may have an eye for figures, but, Angel, you certainly haven't got a head for them. <laughs> how old would you say Beverly is right now? Mm, 22, 23. She's 22. I told you I knew her in New Orleans ten years ago. Yes, ma'am, we were the scandal of her grammar school. Mike Shane, you deliberately led me on. You allowed me... Oh, come here, you big lug. Oh, oh, Bev. What? I mean, the angel. Remember, friends, the new 76 gasoline will give you a driving performance that will make you think of jet propulsion. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing the first shipments at your Union Oil Minuteman stations. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tankful of the powerful new 76 gasoline, freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company, now going on sale at your Minuteman stations. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. The characters of Sweeney and March were played by the comedy team of Sweeney and March. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is Mr. Moto, the Mr. I. A. Moto. Once again, NBC brings you Pulitzer Prize winner John P. Marquand's fabulous and mysterious Mr. Moto, international agent extraordinary, the inscrutable, crafty, and courageous little Oriental whose exploits have endeared him to millions of Americans in another adventure in the world of mystery and international intrigue. Tonight's story concerns the Schramm Method and stars Mr. Moto. Mr. I. A. Moto. The affair of the Schrau method began in Honolulu with an overseas telephone call from my chief in Washington. Uh, Mr. Moto speaking. Moto, this is Captain Beresford. Oh, yes, Captain. Tell me, how quickly can you get to Hong Kong? 
I believe there is a clipper leaving this morning. Now you get on it. You're to contact a man named Max Mason. He'll be registered at the Victoria Hotel on Regent Street. And my assignment, sir? Well, this Mason is senior partner of a firm called the Inter-Ocean Company. They're importers of tea and spices. Yes. He discovered his Hong Kong representative has been short-weighing his cargoes. Thinks it may be a blind for a major smuggling operation. We were going to send a man out there with him, but he jumped the gun on us. His wife says that he got himself all worked up against this crooked representative of his, and that he may get himself into trouble. So see if you can head him off and learn what's really cooking out there. Uh, very well, Captain Beresford. I will do my best. I boarded the Hong Kong Clipper two hours later. Uh, from Kowloon Airport, I took a taxi into Victoria. At the hotel on Regent Street, I obtained the number of the room registered to Mr. and Mrs. Max Mason. Uh, Mr. Mason was not there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Mason was uh, very, very present indeed. I'm at my wit's end, Mr. Moto. I really don't know where to turn next. Uh, then perhaps I've done everything short of the police, and that I cannot do. Well, let me tell you Max this. left New York last Tuesday night from LaGuardia Field. My sister drove us to the airport. Uh, yes. My other sister, uh, the one whose husband is with Mama Costaville and Cloutman. He used to be in advertising. Batten, Barton, Durston, and Osborne. And before that, he was with Marshall and Fetelson. Uh, but uh, anyway, that doesn't matter, because we only went in her car because there was room for the luggage. Uh, Mrs. Now, Mason, anyway, excuse me, but... My time is limited, yes, and I yes, should very yes, much I know. like... And that's why I'm telling you everything as fast as I can. As I say, Max left New York... Last uh, Tuesday, you mentioned that. And he was coming here to Hong Kong to have it out with this man. And this man is in that building down on the Bund. Uh, you know where all the offices are. And his name? Uh, Rossmore. Donald Rossmore. Yes, now, and I, I just arrived the day before yesterday, and I can't find him anywhere. Now, please, And I'm Mrs. absolutely Mason. at my wit's end. I, I don't know where to turn, Mr. Moto. Uh, Mrs. Mason, and will you please be quiet for one moment? Oh! Mr. Moto, you, you, you shouldn't have said that. I've been in the care of a doctor, and Dr. Schramm warned me against having people shout at me. That is enough, Mrs. Mason. Oh. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're so kind, Mr. Moto. I, I feel better already. I am so happy to hear that. Now then, please, restrain yourself while we try to ascertain the facts. Your husband is the senior partner of a firm called... The Inter-Ocean Company. Now, please, give me the name of the other partner and remain silent until I ask you another question. Charles. That's better. Uh, that's his last oh. name. Uh, really, it is. Uh, Stuart Charles. And I'm Laura Mason, Max Mason's wife. Now, what is the name of the man your husband came to see? Donald Rossmore. Uh, that's what I was trying to tell you, Mr. Moto. Only you insisted on changing the subject all the time. Well, uh, Max said that he was going to force this Donald Rossmore to give himself up and take full responsibility for everything or he'd kill him. And I tried to get in the office to see, but it's locked. So I was hoping that maybe you could get in, because Dr. Schramm, he's my analyst, says that you should always face your problems squarely. And if Max has killed Mr. Rossmore, then, then I must face it. Very well. I will investigate the matter, Mrs. Mason. Oh. I'll let you know if I find out anything. My fate is in your hands, Mr. Moto. You won't forget me. I will keep you informed, Mrs. Mason. But do not call me. I will get in touch with you. But, uh, Mr. Moto... Uh, good day, Mrs. Mason. I returned to my hotel and made some inquiries by telephone. The offices of the Inter-Ocean Company were closed for the day. Uh, Mr. Rossmore was not at his home, but was expected momentarily. I left my number and was on the point of going out to dinner when there was a knock at the door of my room. Mr. Moto? Uh, I am Mr. I.A. Moto. Thank you. My name is Dr. Schramm. I come from Prague. Uh, my credentials... Vienna Institute of Psychoanalysis. Uh, what is your problem, Doctor? That, uh, that question is most amusing. You say to me, what is your problem, Doctor? I find I do not resent this. So, in New York, I have been treating this patient, Mrs. Mason. She fancies in her sick mind that her husband wishes to kill a man. I followed her here. So, I must know, what did she ask you to do? Uh, I am not obliged to answer that, Doctor, but... Uh... Since she mentioned your name in connection with it, 
Uh, she wished me to accompany her to a certain office. Aha. Uh -huh. And she thinks there is a dead man in there and that her husband killed him. Yes, she seemed to entertain some such fear. Ah, yes. Complete relapse. She has this fantasy, Mr. Moto. I have it. We will try a therapy, you and I. The Shroud method. The Shroud method? A shock treatment of the emotions. Now, you will do as she asks. Go to the office with her, break in, and there on the floor will be I. So, now you are Mrs. Mason. I am the dead man. Now, what is the first thing you feel? Uh, perhaps you had better tell me, Doctor. So, first you see the body. It is Mr. Rossmore. Your husband has killed him. No, it, it is your husband. You have killed him. Success, relief, remorse, shock. Then I get up. Uh, please, uh, give me a hand. Oh, yes. Here you are, Doctor. Uh, there you are. <clears throat> now, I am the doctor again. I grasp your hand in mine, Mrs. Mason. You are cured. Here is the bill for my services. Goodbye, dear, brave little woman. What are your consulting fees, Dr. Moto? I am afraid you are laboring under a mistaken impression, Doctor. I am... Mistaken? A... I? I tell you this round method never fails. I do not question that, Doctor. However... Good. Eight o'clock, then. You accompany Mrs. Mason to the office of Rossmore. Please be prompt. Remember, success, relief, remorse, shock. You are cured. Eight o'clock. It was not the Schraum method that intrigued me. It was the Schraum motive. I therefore decided to cooperate in his little charade. At eight o'clock, I proceeded to the building that housed the offices of the Interocean Company. Mrs. Mason arrived a few moments later. Oh, Mr. Mozart, I'm late. I'm sorry, but I could hardly bring myself to come at all. Yes, I too had some misgivings, Mrs. Mason. Uh, shall we go in? All right. I, I suppose we should. Yes. Uh, do you mind if I hold on to your arm? Uh, please do. I feel a little shaky. Oh, I hope I don't go all to pieces in front of the elevator man. I am sure you will not, Mrs. Mason. Now, please, please. Building's closed for the night. Uh, my husband's working late at the Interocean Company. Oh, him. He left orders nobody was to go up. But well, I expect it's okay for you, Mrs. Rossmore. I don't trust him, Mr. Moto. Did you hear that he called me? Uh, please, uh, try to remain calm, Mrs. Mason. Always a bit dark, Mrs. Rossmore. Like me to turn on some light? Oh, no. Uh, no, please don't. I know the way. Whatever you say, Mum. You say you know the way? Right down here. Ah. In here? Yes. Can you unlock the door? It appears to be a simple lock. Let me see. Ah. Oh, uh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to go in. It, it's dark. Now, one moment. Ah, here is the light switch. Rossmore killed him. No. No, it's Rossmore. I killed him. I killed him. <laughs> All right, Doctor. You can get up now. But Dr. Schramm? Doc... He was lying with his head turned away and resting in the crook of his arm. I leaned over and tugged at his shoulder. It was stiff. I saw his face. It was not Dr. Schwab. And he had been dead at least three days. I searched him, but found no identification. In his vest pocket was a small, unattached gold key, which I transferred to my own pocket. Then I turned back to Laura Mason. She was gone. I reached the hall just as the door of the service elevator slammed shut. I did not know whether Laura had entered it but Dr. Schwamm was walking up the hall in my direction. Ah, I have been delayed. Interviews with the press. So much excitement. Yes, indeed, Doctor. Now we proceed with our experiment. Laura, where is she? She has already sampled the Schwamm method. How? Success, relief, remorse, shock. Is that the proper order? Ha. Who is that at the floor? 
You have called in another consultant after engaging me? He was called, Dr. Sham, but not by me. Uh, who is it? Who is... Aha! He's dead. Do you know who that man is, Dr. Sham? It must be Rossmore. She had this irrational fear that her husband would kill a man named Rossmore. A delusion, of course. A, a mere fantasy. Mr. Moto? Uh, yes, Doctor. Mr. Moto, is it possible that her fears were not irrational? Fifteen minutes later, the police arrived in response to my call. Thirty minutes later, Mr. Rossmore's wife arrived to identify the body. She took one look at the body on the floor and turned away. I had the curious impression that she was disappointed. It... it's not my husband. But did you know him at all, Mrs. Rossmore? No. No, I never saw him before. You are quite, quite sure of that? Positive. Never saw him in your husband's company? Mr. Moto, the lady has said no twice. Thanks, Inspector. Can I go now? Not just yet, no. Yes, what is it? Mrs. Mason. Oh, bring Mrs. Mason in here, please. Oh, Mr. Moto, I'm sorry to be such a coward, but I felt I just couldn't face it without Dr. Schramm, and I couldn't find him anywhere, so... Why, you were here all the time, Doctor. Now, now, there is no cause for alarm, Laura. Uh, so I brought Mr. Charles instead. Uh, Stuart, uh, this is Mr. Moto. I guess you were Mr. Mason's business partner. Is that correct, Mr. Charles? Yes. And I'm certainly glad that you were on this case, Mr. Moto. You have a reputation for getting results. Uh, thank you very much. I am Inspector Harkness, Hong Kong Police, Mr. Charles. How do you do? I shall want a statement from you later. Anything I can do, Inspector. That woman... Who is that woman? Laura, please, you must analyze these aggressions, not act them out. That's all right, Doctor. I'm Mrs. Rossmore, Mrs. Mason. Mrs. Rossmore? She's the wife of the man who killed Max. Did, did you know that, Stuart? Have we met before, Mrs. Rossmore? Why, no. Not that I recall, Mr. Charles. Tell me, do you think my husband killed him? That is for the inspector to say. It's a bit too early to draw any conclusions, Mrs. Rossmore. In the meantime, we shall have to ask you not to leave the colony. Sergeant, you please drive Mrs. Rossmore home. Thank you, Inspector. Mr. Moto... I will I... call on you later, Mrs. Rossmore. I'll be home all evening. Yes, very well. Now then, if the rest of you will just make yourselves comfortable, I have a few questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, purely routine, of course. Hardly routine, Inspector. This is more than a case of murder. Would you care to explain that remark, Mr. Moto? I can do so very, very briefly. Uh, Mr. Mason was killed... Because he had learned that Rossmore, who ran the Hong Kong office of his firm, was engaged in a vast smuggling operation, which was a matter of grave concern to my government. I see. Well, then perhaps you had better take over, Mr. Moto. Inspector, as Mrs. Mason's doctor, I must absolutely insist that she not be required to answer any questions at this time. You see, she had this delusion that her husband was going to kill Rossmore, and the shock of thinking it had come through, ha has unsettled her. You led me to believe it would have the opposite effect, Dr. Schramm. Well, she is cured, yes. But now she feels this deep sense of guilt. Unconsciously, she wished her husband dead and... Did you say unconsciously, Doctor? Ha! Ah, you have raised an important point. I must reanalyze that material. Well, then, if you and Mr. Charles will give me your statements, Mr. Moto, I shall leave the rest of it to you. Mr. Charles' statement seemed to satisfy the inspector. Mine did not. The only statement that would have interested me at that moment would have been won by Mr. Mason, who was unfortunately too dead to speak. An hour later, Dr. Schramm, Mrs. Mason, Mr. Charles and I rode back up the hill in a taxi cab. The elevator dropped the doctor at his floor in the Victoria Hotel and shot up to Laura Mason's suite. In spite of their protests, I said I would be delighted to come in for a drink. It's so late, Mr. Moto, and we've already answered so many questions. I have no intention of asking any questions. Well, what is your opinion of this case, Mr. Moto? I am not interested in who killed Max Mason, if that is what you mean, Mr. Charles. My interest is solely in Mr. Rossmore's activities before the murder. Well, I feel responsible for this whole thing somehow... Max never even met Rossmore. I hired him after we decided to open an office here in Hong Kong. I knew that he'd been short wedding shipments a couple of months before Max did. Indeed? Yes, yes. I came out here on a surprise visit and caught him red-handed. Ah. However, I promised to keep quiet if he'd make an honest effort to pay back what he had stolen. And then we learned what he was really up to. Smuggling. 
Why did Mr. Mason not follow my superior's advice and meet the agent who was to have accompanied him? Well, I didn't know that he'd appeal to you people for help. He just packed a suitcase and we took the first plane. Uh, when did he get in touch with Rossmore? Well, not right away. Rossmore was out of town when we arrived here. So while we were waiting around for him to come back, uh, Max found a girlfriend somewhere. I didn't see much of him for several days. Ah, this gold key was in his pocket, Mr. Charles. Uh, did you ever see it before? Why, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, Mrs. Mason? A gold key to some woman's apartment. I never would have thought it of Max. Uh, go on, Mr. Charles. Well, Thursday night, he didn't come back to the hotel. However, I didn't worry especially... Later, I was on the point of going to the police when Laura arrived. She naturally didn't want the business of the girl published in the newspapers, in case that's all it was. So we awaited your arrival. And that's the whole story, Moto. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Charles. Uh, you have been most helpful. Well, I was Max Mason's best friend. If you can find the man who killed him... I will do my I... best, Mr. Charles. Oh, I think it's so wonderful the way you find people and things, Mr. Moto. Uh, I wouldn't know where to begin. Uh, frankly... Uh, neither do I, Mrs. Mason. Uh, but I think I will start with this gold key. The late Mr. Rossmore's apartment was on the ground floor of a converted mansion near the summit of Victoria Peak. I entered the building and was on the point of ringing the doorbell when I remembered the gold key. And, uh, just on a hunch... I tried it in the spring lock. It worked. What's the big idea? You've got a nerve busting in here like this, picking locks on doors. I am so very sorry. Here is your key, Mrs. Rossmore. Oh. Thanks, Mr. Moto. I, I didn't realize it was you. Now, supposing you tell me all about it, Mrs. Rossmore. Well, I guess I have to. You know about the key. You need not feel obliged to because of that. Then I will. I'll even tell you the truth. Sit down. Yes, thank you. Max Mason came here the first time looking for my husband. Huh? The next time, he he came to see me. Now, he's a nice guy, only only kind of mixed up like me. He told me his wife was involved with some other guy in the States. He'd sent her to a psychiatrist to get over it. He was really broken up about that dame. After seeing her this afternoon, I wonder why. But then how did I ever get mixed up with Rossmore? Uh, tell me about Mr. Rossmore... Uh, do you have a picture of him? He burned every last one of them before he lambed out. Even the one I had of him. Not that I cared about it anymore, but he ruined the frame and it was a good one. Yes, speaking of frames, Mrs. Rossman. Uh, I thought of that, too. No, he's guilty, all right. The morning he got back, he said he had an appointment with Max Mason. And he didn't know what he'd do if Mason threatened him with the police. But he'd kill him if he had to. Yes, if I may say so, that sounds a little pet. Uh, do you also have a tape recording of that threat? No, but I've got something better than that. Huh? A murder weapon. Do you want it? At the moment, no. You don't? Uh, tell me some more about Rossmore. What can I tell you? Looks, he was hefty like a football player. Had sandy I meant hair. the man himself, his character. Well, that was the surprise. Oh, he looked jolly enough. Maybe he was at the club or those late dinners with visiting firemen or on those trips back to the States. But at home, he stayed here or cooped up in that office. He never took me out or anything, had no friends and resented my having any. He made trips to the States, to New York? Sure, I drove him to the airport lots of times. Strange he never called on Max Mason there. He didn't. Why, he told me he did. Did Mr. Mason say so? He never said one way or the other. Mason's partner, Mr. Charles, says that Mason and your husband never saw each other. <laughs> That's funny. How do you do, bang, bang, you're dead? Do you think you'll ever see your husband again? No, and I'm glad. I was beginning to have the same idea. You mean you think he's dead? I do not think Mr. Rossmore is alive. But what makes you Do think... you mind if I have a look at your husband's room? Well, not at all. It's, it's just in here. Yes, thank you. Say, there's something in that wastebasket I didn't notice. Ah, very interesting. What? This seems to be his birth certificate. Born Hankout, China. Funny he didn't burn that. Do you recognize this snapshot? Oh, it's his parents. They were missionaries in China. And the child? Oh. Uh, that would be Rossmore as an infant. No Looks doubt. like him. Yes, American passport. Photograph torn off. He really intended to get lost. 
The fireplace appears to have been used recently. The nights are cool sometimes in Hong Kong. Say, if he burned any papers or anything, aren't there ways to dope out what they were? No special process is needed for these. Cancel checks, bills of lading, a very fine record of Mr. Rossmore's smuggling activities. What are you doing? Burning the contents of this wastebasket. Isn't it incriminating or something? Yes, yes. In fact, I have never known a criminal to take such pains to incriminate himself. I note that he even left a number of very clear fingerprints on the glass ornament there, on the desktop. I'll just get rid of those, too, while I'm at it. Why are you doing all this? I think you know the answer to that question, Mrs. Rossmore. And if you have any plans involving Mr. Charles, I warn you, he is a very, very clever man. So you think I'm lying? No, but I do not think you are telling the truth. And you do know the truth, don't you? I think I do. It's worth plenty if you'd throw in with me. Thank you, but the answer is no. Scared of him? Apparently, you are not. <laughs> Not a bit. I am sorry to hear that, Mrs. Rossmore. Why? Because you are basically a very nice person, I would like you to remain alive. Well, nobody can say I didn't try. Do you want that revolver now? It's the murder weapon, I'm pretty sure. Uh, where is it? In his bureau drawer. One shot fired out of it, and when he left it there, it smelled of powder. That will be it. It will be registered to Rossmore, and will probably have his fingerprints all over it. However, it may interest the Hong Kong police. That's funny. Uh, what is it? Come here. Yes? It's gone. I put it back here after the police left. I know it was Mrs. here. Rossmore, what? What? Ah! Ah! Mrs. Rossmore, watch out. Mrs. Rossmore. Mrs. Rossmore. You were right, Mr. Mardo. You were so right. I am so sorry. So very, very sorry. Be nice to stay alive. The gun had not been in the bureau drawer because it was in someone's hand outside the bedroom window. I was still leaning over Mrs. Rossmore when the gun dropped inside the room and spun across the floor. Since there was nothing further I could do for Mrs. Rossmore, I made a thorough search of the apartment. I did not intend to call the police until I was quite sure I had destroyed every clue to Rossmore's identity. Then I wiped the fingerprints off the gun and hid it. The only evidence I preserved was some photographic equipment in a closet, a small can of rubberized gelatin and an alcohol lamp. Then I made a telephone call, not to the police, but to Mr. Charles' room in the Hotel Victoria. Hello? Mrs. Mason? Oh, who is this? This is Mr. Moto. I have found Rosmo. Rosmo? I don't understand. I mean, how... Where? He shot his wife through the window of their apartment. I gave chase and caught him. Uh, has he confessed? No, I was forced to shoot him. He died before he could make a statement. Oh. But Mr. Charles should be able to identify him. Uh, stay there, Mr. Moto. We'll be right down. And Mrs. Mason, uh, you had better bring your doctor. Uh, seeing Ross Moore may be quite a shock to you. <laughs> Well, Moto, that was quick work. Where is he? There is no hurry. Please sit down, all of you. Oh, can't we get it over with, uh, Dr. Schramm? She suffers but... the most grave anxieties, Mr. Moto. It, it is possible. quite all right, Doctor. Just relax. Well, if you have found Rossmore's body, I demand to see uh, it. Do not worry, Mr. Charles. It will wait. There is only one difficulty. Uh, the fingerprints are not as clear as I had hoped they would be. And someone seems to have destroyed virtually all the evidence. But the gun... I am so sorry. I fear that was my fault, Mr. Charles. I absent-mindedly wiped the fingerprints off it. What kind of a gag are you trying to pull? I said I found Rossmore, Mr. Charles. And I have found him. As for the evidence, it should be simple to manufacture some. There is all the necessary equipment here. Photostat machine, engraving outfit... Rubber gelatin? We should be able to turn out some very fine fingerprints in an hour or so. Uh, whose do you suggest we use? Okay, Moto, what do you have in mind? Uh, we will need someone for the two murders. Mrs. Mason might be a good choice. She is mentally distraught and has a motive. What motive? You did not get along well with your husband. And Mr. Mason carried a gold key to Mrs. Rossmore's apartment. Max was involved with her? Uh, that is not too surprising. 
they had things in common. I don't think much of your proposition, Moto. I admit it has its drawbacks. If Mrs. Mason is convicted, you will not get your late partner's money. Uh, Mr. Moto, may I speak? Yes, yes, of course, Doctor. Please, I am in a dilemma. I do not understand anything. Are you trying to say that Laura and Mr. Charles, uh, how do you say, uh, frame Mr. Rosmo? That is correct. Except that there never was any Rosmo. Mr. 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 Moto. Charles invented him, right down to manufactured fingerprints. Even Mrs. Rossmore was deceived until she saw Mr. Charles in the office after Mason's body was found. But she foolishly kept silent in the hope that she would be paid for her silence. She was paid, but not in precisely the way she had in mind. Then my diagnosis was right. There is no Rossmore. He was a, a delusion, a fantasy. Mr. Moto, you have saved my professional reputation. It was not the Shroud method, but Charles' stupidity in leaving behind the equipment with which he had manufactured the evidence of Rossmore's identity that led to the final solution of the case. But the doctor's conclusions were correct in one respect. Rossmore really was the invention of Charles' disordered mind. When his partner, Mr. Mason, learned of the fictitious Rossmore's smuggling activities, Charles was forced to act quickly to prevent discovery of his double life. He planned to murder Mason and blame it on a man who could never be caught because he never existed. There was only one thing seriously wrong with the Schrau method. He had been using it on the wrong patient. You have just heard the world's greatest secret agent, Mr. I.A. Moto, in The Schramm Method. James Monks is starred as Mr. Moto. The script was written by Robert Tallman and directed by Arthur Hanna. Mr. Moto is produced by Doris Quinlan for Carol Irwin. Members of the cast were Alice Frost, John Larkin, Danny Ako, Eileen Heckert, and Walter Grisey. The music was transcribed. This is Fred Collins speaking. And here with a preview of next week's story is Mr. I.A. Moto. It is said that a crooked log makes a better fire than a straight one. The fire, in this case, was worth a million dollars. And the clue was a portrait of a dead man who would not stay dead. Join us next week for the case of the Crooked Lock. And now, may sleep fall upon your lidded eyes as lightly as the falling of an autumn leaf. And may your dreams... Be as a fragrance of sandalwood in the clear air of an October morning. Good night. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, transcribed in 30 seconds. The chimes are all set to wish you a happy new year this Sunday with a gala broadcast of The Big Show. The unpredictable Tallulah will MC with a host of leading stars of stage, screen, and radio, including Ken Murray, Gloria Swanson, Margaret O'Brien, Jose Ferrer, and many more. And there's a carnival of fun with Theater Guild on the air also this Sunday when the sparkling Lockhart family, Jean, Kathleen, and daughter June, co-star with Van Heflin in Theater Guild's presentation of the exciting story, State Fair. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Near Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Who? Oh, I see. Oh, do you think Mr. Wolf might be interested in going over and... Hold on a minute. Archie, I'm not interested in going anywhere. Ill-considered movement is the curse of our times. Not to mention the mania for fresh air. Phew. Bottle opener, if you please. Here you are. 
But that was Zabro's flower shop, Mr. Wolf. Indeed. Got a new shipment of orchids from upstate. In that case... Mr. Wolf, remember the curse of our times, not to mention the mania? But... I'll be there. <laughs> He'll be there. After all, a man must risk his life sometimes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chairborne genius, Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Orchids don't grow up overnight. They have to be carefully planted, tended, watered, and watched. And the same thing goes for murder. Take Zabro's flower shop minutes after we got that phone call. Zabro! Uh, yeah, oh, Mr. Hansen, I did not notice you are here. I'm here, and what's more? You, you like the, the way I display your orchids, hmm? I don't like the way you've been avoiding meeting your obligations. Please, please, it is better not to shout. It would be still better if you paid me what you owe me. Mr. Hansen, uh, business has not been so good. I will pay. You'd better. I, I intend to... My lawyers aren't going to be satisfied by intentions. You... Your lawyers? I've no particular desire to own a flower shop, but it looks as if I'm going to, unless you raise some money. Mr. Hansen, I have worked years. I have given of my blood to make a success of this establishment. You cannot take him from me. You are a rich man. You... I intend to stay rich, too. You've got 24 hours, Abro. A man can accomplish a lot in 24 hours. Yes, Mr. Hansen. Even maybe murder. Mr. Zabro? Hmm? Oh, good afternoon, Miss Hansen. Is Uncle here? Yes, he is here. At the display, towards the back of the store. Oh, thanks. How is he? Oh, I, I mean... He is the way he always is. Hard, vindictive. Mr. Zabro. I am sorry. Excuse me now. Hmm. Uncle? What is it, Enid? I, um... Have you seen my display? The lilies? Uh-huh. Yes. Pretty. Oh, thank you. Uh, He's not here. Well, I didn't say... You didn't have to. John Arndt is not here. Why he is not here, I don't know. His job was to look after my display. Perhaps he doesn't need a job anymore. You know he does. Fiddlesticks. After all, if he marries my heiress... Uncle! My dear girl, John Arndt is a fairly capable man with orchids. Outside of that, I have no use for him whatsoever. Especially in the role of your husband. Well, isn't that for me to decide? Of course it is, except that... Pretty as you are, John Arndt is seeing you through a golden haze. To be precise, the money that will come to you from me when I die. That's nasty. It's the truth. Oh, you can't know that. <laughs> I'm going to find out. What? I saw my lawyers this morning. Among other things, I instructed them to draw up a codicil to my will. A codicil to the effect that all my money goes to you on one condition. Oh, you couldn't. I did. The condition was that you refrain from marrying John Arndt, either now or at any time in the future. Well, that's not fair. It's a very good way of discouraging Mr. Arndt. What did you bet his ardor cools off quickly, hmm? You... you told him? Yes. Probably why he hasn't appeared as yet. He's sulking. You really signed that... that codicil? I will, as soon as the papers are drawn up. Where are you going? I don't know. I've got to get away someplace and think. Very well. Think about forgetting John Arndt. Best thing in the world for you. Uncle... Do you really think you can manage other people's lives for them? I don't see why not. No? Well, people don't like to be managed. They get desperate sometimes. And sometimes they kill. Mr. Wolf, what are you doing? Getting up. I'm up. Well... That makes you eligible for the Explorers Club or something. Ah, uh, my coat and muffler, Archie. I got him here. Thank you. You're really going out into that that weather outside? 
Archie, must you try to be witty? It amuses me no end. Haven't you seen enough of those weeds yet? An orchid is not a weed. A- another muffler, Archie, the woolen one. You've already got two on. Please, fresh air clogs the lungs, Archie. <laughs> sure, everybody knows that, but they won't admit it. Of course not. The conspiracy of silence. Archie, I'm ready. You sure? I can see a square inch of skin showing. Tom, you're driving me to Zabra's. Mm-hmm. All right, careful, and take a deep breath. I'm going to open the door. You ready? Yeah, very well. Open it. <laughs> Be brave, Mr. Wolf. We'll keep the car window shut, and maybe you'll make it. <sighs> careful. The risks one takes. In you go. Uh, oh. Uh. Well, okay, boss. Now, where is Zabros? 45th Street. Gee, (laughs) ten blocks. Grit your teeth, Mr. Wolf. We're off. I'm glad you are here. Those orchids you wrote me about had better be worth a trip. The trip? But I think you live only a little way from here. Don't forget it had to be made in the open air, Mr. Zabro. Where are the orchids? Uh, Towards the back. They are from Hansen's place. He is a fine grower. I have made an exhibit. Good. Oh, excuse me. uh, Others are here. You go look for yourself, no? Very well. Archie. Hmm? Oh, uh, I, I was just noticing the... Uh, the, uh, the did a girl the... just enter the store? A girl, a goddess, tall, graceful, Venus de Milo with arms. Arms that were made... Never mind, let's go look at orchids. Thank you. Mmm, very fine. The exhibit is laid out like nature, huh? Reminds me of a spot in Central Park that I spent some of my happiest moments in. Then you do like flowers. I don't go to Central Park to look at flowers. I went there to, uh, forget it. Gladly. Now go away and annoy someone else. Venus? I want to concentrate on these orchids. Goodbye. Okay. I'll leave you alone with your loved ones. Let's see. Maybe I can arrange to be left alone with something I could very easily learn to love. Hey, boss. Don't bother me, Haji. Oh, this is serious. There's a lily display just like this one over at the other end of the store. Nothing connected with lilies could possibly be serious. Maybe not, but there's a corpse planted among these lilies. Indeed? A lot of ferns were banked up in back of the display. I saw a foot sticking out, so I slipped back, lifted a few ferns, and found a body. Fresh? Very. The wound was still bleeding. Knife wound. Sad, very. Now run along. Well, aren't you uh, going to do anything about it? Why should I? Anyone who would permit himself to be found dead or alive among a display of lilies is beneath contempt. Well, maybe the poor guy didn't have a chance to crawl into an orchid display before he died. However, if that's the way you feel, I'll tell the police all about poor Mr. Hansen and let who? them... Who? Hansen, the orchid grower. He's one of the finest in the country. Not is. Was. Wasn't me who pushed him under the lilies. And the lilies, bah, he would have hated that. Have you told Zabro? No, no, Zabro's been busy up front. Uh, Where is this display? Ah, right along here. There's been a number of people in the store since we came. Someone else may have noticed that dead man's foot. Uh Uh-uh, I covered it. Satisfactory. At times you give the illusions of intelligence. Is this the display? Yep. Come around to the back. There's a little space between the back of the display and the wall. Uh, Oh. (laughs) Now, here, right under this pile of ferns... Of ferns? Yes, aren't you? Hey, that body. What about it? It got bashful. It's gone. Indeed. The corpse was dead. Corpse is off now. Confound you, Archie. Have you been drinking too much milk again? Now, look, boss. I saw him there. The blood's still coming out of his back. And I tell you that... Let me understand you. Are you suggesting the corpse rose and walked away? No, but somebody could have dragged it away. Somebody will put it here in the first place. Pictures, no doubt. Come along, Archie. If this is some half-witted trick to distract me from the orchid... Oh, no, no. I never come between a man and his love. 
Hey, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. Yes? Do ferns bleed? Oh, let me see. Oh. Indeed. Yes, there is blood. Fresh arterial blood on these ferns. Bright red color. Which means there was a wounded person among these lilies recently. Thanks for the late vote of confidence. Hmm. Whoever killed Hanson apparently found a better place for him. Mm -hmm. Took him home to put him over the mantelpiece. Unlikely Hanson wasn't very decorative. Okay. Now shall for the police? You have nothing to show them except a fern leaf covered with blood? No. Don't tell me you smell a fee among all these flowers. Hanson was a man I admired. Good heavens, Archie. The number of first-rate orchid growers is small enough without one of us being murdered. Mm -hmm. Unsportsmanlike, huh? Okay, we won't stand for it. What next? The body was removed from the building. How? Well, I wouldn't swear to it, but there's a window here that leads out to an alleyway. Could the alleyway be seen from the street? I don't think so. There's a bend in it. Wide enough for a car? Yep. Bring Zabu to me. Oh, don't bother. He's coming himself. Well, Mr. Wolf, what do you think of the... Mr. Wolf, I do not believe this. What don't you believe? You are looking at lilies. Not exactly. Whose flowers are these? Uh, Mr. Hansen's niece grows lilies. I see. Zabro, did you get all your orchids from Hansen? Oh, yes, yes. He is an artist. Practically an old master at the moment. How much money did you owe him? Who, Who tell you I owe him? I... You do, don't you? Well, yes. Business has not been so good. But did he speak to you? No, I guess you owed him money. But I do not understand. Was Hanson in the store today? Yes, yes, he came. You hear us quarrel, eh? Where is he now? Oh, I do not know. He, he leave, maybe. I rather think he did. Zabra, who else was in the store within the last half hour who might have known Hanson? Oh, Miss Hansen was here, and uh, uh, John Arnold. He is Mr. Hansen's assistant, and how you say, uh, sweet on uh, Miss Hansen. Was she the tall girl came in shortly after we did, Mr. Zabro? Tall? Yes, yes, I think so. Are either of them still here? No, 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 they go. Together? Uh, Miss Hansen goes first. Very well. Come along, Archie. Okay, Mr. Wolf. Uh, you will not tell Mr. Hansen you know... You know of my debts, sir. No, Mr. Zabro, I won't tell him. As a matter of fact, even if I wanted to, I don't think he would listen. I love these long drives in the country. Where are we going? Hanson's place. Oh. You think he returned to it to haunt it, huh? He's returned there, I suspect. Uh-huh. In order to cast suspicion on himself. Miss Hanson lives with him. Mr. Arndt works for him on the premises, therefore... Miss Hanson will be there? I imagine so. Why? Oh, well, nothing. Nothing at all. Boss, can we stop at the next town? Why? I want to buy a book on lilies. This sudden... In... <laughs> you mean Miss Hanson grows them in there? Uh-huh. You see, that way we'll have something in common. Perhaps, but Archie, is an interest in fairs what you want to have in common with her? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the house that Orchid's built, huh? Snazzy. Very handsome country home. For streamlined zombies. I... Hello. I take that back. Miss Hanson? Yes. I'm Nero Wolf. The person ogling you is my assistant, Mr. Goodwin. Oh. Well, Uncle's spoken of you, Mr. Wolf. Oh, come in, please. Thank you. I was not ogling. I was merely tracing a resemblance. Oh, between Uncle and me? Between you and my heart's desire. Archie, stop being poetic. It doesn't become it. In here, please. My uncle isn't at home yet, but... Oh, John, this is Mr. Wolf, Mr. Goodwin. John is Uncle's assistant. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Hanson hasn't returned from town yet, Mr. Wolf. Are you quite sure? Why, oh, yes. Unless Enid saw him. Oh, no, I didn't, John. Indeed. In that case, if you don't mind, we'll wait for him. Well, of course. We'd be delighted. Sure. Uh, excuse me, won't you? I've got some work to do. On orchids or uh, lilies? The orchids. Well, then go right ahead. See you later. Oh, uh, 
Can I get you something to drink? Beer will do, thank you. I'd better help you bring the bottle in, Miss... Uh... Archie. On the other hand, maybe you can manage your lawn. Well, of course I can. I'm a big girl, Mr. Goodwin. I noticed. I mean, uh, uh, why not uh, Why not call me Archie? It takes less time. Oh, I'd like to, Archie. Swell. Remember what old Dr. Tidmar said? I want a bottle of beer. He said, I want a bottle... Oh. oh. No. <laughs> Never mind, Enid. You better uh, go gather some beer for Mr. Wolf. All right. I'll be back in a minute. Mmm. So much of her and all so nice. Archie, are you I... forgetting why we are here? I don't care why you're here. Me, we I... We are have... waiting for Uncle. Uh-huh. Mr. Wolf, it's unlikely that Uncle is going to walk in through that front door. True. That is why you're sneaking out the back door to find him. How do you know he'll be around here? This is where he lives, isn't it, Archie? Yes, but if you'll remember, Uncle gave up living earlier this afternoon. You mean he was persuaded to? Nevertheless, I rather think he'll be around, body and all. He wasn't in the house, so I tried the conservatory, hothouse, what have you. It was hot in that steam-heated orchid paradise. Also, it was full of orchids. Unfortunately, it wasn't full of Miss Hanson. I wandered hither and yon for a moment, dreaming of her, until I noticed a foot. Same foot I'd seen back at Zabro's, and peculiarly enough, the same corpse was attached to it. Uncle's. I was bending over to take a closer look when I felt a thud. I realized that thud was the sound of something hitting my head, and I began to realize, too, that I'd been knocked almost unconscious, which the second blow did. understand where my uncle is, Mr. Wolf. He's staying away so late is unusual, then. Of course it is. Which reminds me, Archie's been gone for several hours. Yeah, where did he go, Mr. Wolf? To look about? Were you in the hothouse, Mr. Hunt? No, I was packing some plants. You, Miss Hanson? Well, after I brought your beer, I went upstairs and rested for a while. Why? Because if either of you harmed Archie, I shall personally murder you. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Uh. Come on, we've got to find the boy. Why should either of us want to harm him? Because he probably found your uncle's body. His body? Huh? What are you... I don't understand. Mr. Hanson has been murdered. Oh, oh no. Enid, Enid. Oh, stop that, Miss Hanson. You're a perfectly healthy young woman. There's no reason for you to swoon. Now, look here, you. Besides, I rather suspect she lost no love for him. Am I right, Miss Hanson? He, he was my uncle. You're aware of the fact? He opposed your marriage to Miss Arndt here. That's none of your business. Which means he did oppose it. Mr. Arndt, Mr. Hanson was a friend of mine. I intend to find the murderer after I find his body. It shows a lack of proper respect to transport a corpse about the countryside. Come, both of you, we must find Archie. This whole thing's like a nightmare. So if you can't wake up from it, let's go on with the same. Oh, look, there on the ground. Arch. Oh, I'll see if he's all right. Why, this is fantastic. Mr. Hanson stabbed to death, and now Goodwin. He's oh. just been stunned, thank heavens. He's, oh. he's coming to. Oh, I died. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm dead. Archie? Archie, speak to me. Oh, I went to heaven. Are you all right, Archie? Uh oh, the other place. Ah, uh, get up. Sure, if somebody will hold my head. Oh, miss. Are we having an earthquake? You poor boy. Take my arm here. Mm, I'll take both. Boy, he's normal. What happened, Archie? Somebody hit me when I wasn't looking. Yeah? Why? I don't know. Oh, yes, I remember. Yes? I found Uncle lying right there. Right there. The poor boy's delirious. Don't tell me he's gone again. I'm afraid he has, Archie. Are you sure you saw him? I'm positive, and then somebody slugged me. That corpse is the shyest one I've ever met. Blood would have dried. There'll be no signs of his having been placed here. Bad. Why? Your testimony would be valueless, especially since you were found unconscious. The jury would suspect you of having hit the bottle. <laughs> Why 
didn't we stay the night? I'm a sick man. Enid would have nursed me. Ah, you're not sick. And I won't have you taking advantage of that girl. In my condition, I couldn't have. But maybe she would have taken advantage of me. Hooey. Is that what they call it in your day? The Zabro. Stop the car. Okay. Um, ba, dee, dum, dee, dee, dum. Here we go. Uh, uh, mm. Oh, I can manage. You don't. I'm not entirely helpless. Yeah. Place is closed. Dark. I was afraid it might be. Don't tell me Zabro's gone traveling, too. Possibility, Archie. You mean he killed Hanson to cancel the dead he owed him, then followed us out to the country house and dumped Hanson there, hoping to, to pin suspicion on Eden and John? Perhaps. Uh-huh. Slugged me when I found the body too soon, and then... Uh-huh. Guess we'd better get into the joint. Door's locked. Um... Uh... A guy I know got out of jail the other day. Yeah? Uh, he's reformed, so he gave me all his skeleton keys. You have them with you? Mm-hmm. And we'll find out in a minute just how good a burglar he was. Mmm, very good. Will you come in? Shut the door. Okay. Now, what's that? Somebody's been hurt. The lights. Nothing up front here. Back of the store where the exhibits are. I'll go see. Maybe you better stay here. Nonsense. Oh, where? Uh oh, among the lilies again, but this time there are two bodies there. Sabro. Quick, Archie. Mr. Sabro? Uh, Mr. Zop? He's been shot, boss. Bad. I, I, he's trying to say something. He, in the lilies. Mr. Mr. Hanson. Yes, yes, we know about him. Who shot you? From the window. Alleyway. Came in. Desabro, who? He inherit money. Inherit. Down, Mr. Wolf, quick. Somebody shooting from that window. Haji. All in one piece. Are you all right? Yes, that car. It's gone. Brought the body here and. Desabro. He couldn't duck. He's dead. Yes. Police boss, this time we've got more than a fern leaf smeared with blood to show them. Not yet, Archie. I'd prefer handing the murderer over to them along with the victims. I'm going home. Archie, get Miss Hanson and Mr. Arndt there as soon as you can. Well, suppose they don't want to come. Knock them unconscious and drag them there. Not Enid, boss. Enid's... Hey, what Zabro said about inheriting. Don't anticipate, Archie. When you get them to my office, we'll identify the murderer then. Mr. Wolf, don't you think this is all a little high-handed, dragging us here in the middle of the night? Murder is even more high-handed, Mr. Arndt. Please, John. Miss Hanson, do you inherit? Well, well, I guess so. I'm I'm Uncle's only relative, so I suppose... Wait a minute, Enid. Mr. Wolf, are you suggesting that she had anything to do with this invisible corpse? The corpse is no longer invisible, Mr. Arndt. You... Oh, you've seen, Uncle? Yes, dead, in Zabra's establishment. Lying with a knife in his back, in his own orchid display. Now you're trying to pin something on me. You know I set up that orchid display. Indeed. The police will be interested in that information. But he wasn't found in the orchids. He was... Yes, Mr. Arn. He was found where? I, I don't know. You were about to say the lily display, weren't you? I wasn't going to say anything. You're a little late. You already informed us that you knew his body was not placed in the orchid display. How did you know? I... I, I, I just guessed... Jury will be very much impressed by your remarkable clairvoyance. Especially since, uh... Archie, ask Mr. Zabro to come in. Mr. Zabro? Okay. Don't bother, Goodwin. John, that gun! Shut up, you little fool. Enid's a big girl. I don't know how you tumbled, Wolf. Lucky guessing, maybe. Oh, come now. Neither of us has indulged in guesswork. You killed Hanson, placed his body in the lily display to attract suspicion towards Miss Hanson. You felt sure she wouldn't be convicted, so you were safe. She would inherit, you would marry her, a marriage which your uncle opposed. But when you saw that Archie had discovered the body too early for you to establish an alibi for yourself... Then he sneaked the body out of the window into his car and then dumped it in the hothouse. For time. Go on, Mr. Wolf. 
He didn't intend it to be discovered there, which was why he knocked you unconscious, I think. Oh, I'm so glad he had a good reason for it. He had a body on his hands. He decided to double back, put the body in its original place, and carry through his plan. But Zabra caught him at it, poor fellow. I thought Zabra was in the other room. Last you, you fool. Do you think I, too, am addicted to carrying corpses about? Zabra is dead. And you've given yourself away unnecessarily, Archie. All right. Archie, quick. What? quick. Let, let go, Edith. I've got his arm. I'll give him mine with a fist attached. Very satisfactory, Archie. Now call the police, inform them you have two corpses and a murderer for them. You should have heard Mr. Arndt's language, boss, when the police took him away. Oh, I don't think he loves you. I don't think it matters anymore. It used to, to me. Growing pains. You'll get over it, Miss Hanson. Uh, you trapped him, Mr. Wolf, but what made you so sure he did it? At the hothouse, when you were unconscious, Archie, Mr. Arndt deplored the fact that Mr. Hanson had been stabbed in the back. And no one had mentioned how he was killed. Therefore... The reason Arndt knew was because he himself had killed Mr. Hanson. Hmm. Murderers seldom get away with it, no matter how tightly they button their lips. Hmm. Well, mine, however, are not buttoned up. Archie? Oh, the beer is on your desk. Thank you. Miss Hanson, stop brooding. Try some of this beer. But, Mr. Wolfe, my, my heart's broken. As a man who's lived a good many years, Miss Hanson, permit me to assure you that the easiest way of mending a broken heart is by filling the stomach. <laughs> ah. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and G.G. Pearson, J. Novello, Herb Butterfield, and Byron Kane. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Deadly Sellout. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Friday means another visit with that entertaining eating establishment, Duffy's Tavern. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. The proof of cigarette mildness is in the smoking. Steady smoking. Make your own 30-day camel test. The thorough test of mildness. Smoke only camels for 30 days. Enjoy camels' rich, full flavor. See how mild camels are. How well they agree with your throat, pack after pack, week after week. You'll soon see why, after all the mildness tests, camel is by far America's most popular cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency? Diamond Detective Agency? What? Hi, Helen. Well? Well, what? Where's the slogan? Uh, Diamond Detective Agency is enough. 
This week, I've decided to conduct my business on more of a refined level. Why? I need the change. I'm getting tired of defending myself. You haven't defended yourself since kindergarten. Are you forgetting the other night in your study? Rick. Now, don't give me that sweet innocence. I should have been decorated for that campaign. Weren't you? Helen. Now, you hang up, and I'm going to call you right back. Hang up. And when you answer, I expect to hear the old Richard Diamond slogan and all. Yes, Miss Asher. Bye. No, oh, women, women. Slogan. Uh, slogan, let's see. The Diamond Detective Agency. Gumshoes resold while you wait. What's the matter with your voice? This is the old Richard Diamond. Oh, Rick. Well, make up your mind. Mr. Diamond? Uh, hold it, Helen. Something I can do for you? Me? No. Yes, if you're Mr. Diamond. Client? I think so, dear. I haven't seen the subpoena yet. Well, I'll talk to you later. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Well, get it over with. Hire me or serve me. I beg your pardon. Just trying to second guess you. Have a seat. Thank you. My name is Stevens. Arthur Stevens. What can I do for you, Mr. Stevens? A great deal. I charge a great deal for a great deal. I'm prepared to pay you handsomely. How handsomely and for what? $500 for a quick trip to Florida. Well, that's easy. Now, what's going to make it tough? Lucius Timken. Is that a man? Yes. He'll try and stop you. How? Kill you, if necessary. Well, that statement just cost you another 250 I anticipated that. 750 then? What do I have to do? Pick up something for me. How old is she? No, no, this... This is an object, a very rare object. Blonde or brunette? This is an antique. You're turning into a good straight man. It's a rare European art object worth a considerable fortune. Anything else you'd like to know? The 750 should compensate for your inquisitiveness. Why can't you just go get it? Lucius Timken. He anticipates my arrival. Why did you pick me? Reputation. I've heard I can trust you. All right, Mr. Stevens. How much of a down payment will keep you trusting me until I get back? Let's say, uh, 250 Let's say, uh, 350 and we can trust each other. It's a bargain. Only if I live long enough to spend it. Stevens gave me some instructions, handed me the cash, and I agreed to meet him at my office early in the morning after I had returned with the item. He gave me a round-trip ticket to Miami, Florida, a wet handshake, and a smile that reminded me of a man who'd swallowed a mouthful of sour milk. Now, in my business, I expect trouble. I can usually spot it quicker than a lonesome blonde. And as I watched the door close behind Stevens, I spotted it. Trouble all over the place, and Richard Diamond up to his shoulder holster in it. I called Helen, told her I'd ship her back some oranges, went home and packed, and by two in the afternoon was on the plane heading for Miami. Stevens had instructed me to register at the plaza and wait for a man named Shelton, who was supposed to be my contact and deliver the item. I arrived in Miami took a cab to the hotel, registered and went up to my room to take a shower and lose some of the stiffness. A half hour later, I went down to the bar to see if I could get some of the stiffness back. Is this seat taken? Not a bed. Climb up. Thank you. Nice and cool in here. Yeah. Can I buy you something to go with it? Thank you. A martini. A bartender. A martini for the lady. Do you uh, live here at the hotel? Yes. Do you? Just moved in. My name's Albright. Mary Albright. Richard Diamond. Hello. Hello. Staying in Miami long? Depends on the weather. Mm, your martini. Oh, yes. Cheers. To the weather. Oh, uh, what kind of weather are we drinking to, anyway? Sun, rain, any kind of weather, as long as there's something to do. Then let's drink to something to do. What do you do, Mr. Diamond? Oh, start by asking attractive blondes to call me Rick. All right, Rick. What do you do? Oh, make a few bucks. Work when I have to. Enjoy a cool drink in a bar with a girl named Mary. Mary? Not a bit. Have you made the trip yet? Once. 
Didn't like the weather. Why don't you buy me dinner, Rick? Oh, sorry you said that. Another date? Hmm, business. Then I've got to get right back to New York. Well, it was a nice idea. The nicest. Well, i got to be going. Nice meeting you, Rick. Goodbye, Mary. Rick? Yeah? What's the weather like in New York? Cold when I left. If you ever fly up, give me a call. I'll do that. Maybe we can melt some snow. She could have melted an ice floe in the Arctic. I left her sitting at the bar looking lonesome and went back up to my room and enjoyed myself by running into the walls until I got tired and lay down to rest. I must have dozed because when I came out of it and looked at my watch, it was nearly eight. My contact was overdue, so I sat up, smoked a camel, and by eight I called the desk. Uh, hello, this is Mr. Diamond. Has anybody been asking for me? Are you sure? Okay. Uh. Oh, it's about time. Close the door. Hey. Close it. Look, look, friend, you better... Listen. Go to La Granada. Look, you're hurt. La Granada. Hey. Oh, why does everybody pick my room to die in? He was lying on his back with his eyes open and staring up at the ceiling. I rolled him over and wondered how far he'd travel with a bullet hole in his back. He was heavy set, wearing a navy pea jacket and dungarees. The identification in his wallet showed him to be my contact, George Shelton, and his ship was the Rio Queen. I searched him for something that looked like a rare antique, but the sailor was bare, so I sat down and made up my mind. He'd said something before he died. La Granada. I thought about the rest of the money I was going to be out if I didn't bring the antique back to Stevens and call the police. In ten minutes, Lieutenant Breek of Miami Homicide was looking at my license. Richard Dunn. 180, licensed in the state of New York, brown hair and the loveliest blue eyes. I can read. Yeah, but that description doesn't do me justice. You're a pretty fresh guy. I was influenced by the Florida propaganda. Well, you're out of your territory. You don't carry any weight down here. Uh, maybe if I ate a big dinner... I think you should know I don't like private cops. Hmm? I'm glad I have your confidence. You uh, see he just staggered in here? That's right. Ever see him before? No. You weren't expecting him? No. You called the desk and wanted to know if anybody had asked for you? I always do that to get lonesome. What are you doing in Miami? Spying. I was hired by California Orange Grower. You know something? Occasionally. I feel like slapping you around. Well, don't decide on it. I get nasty. You're in trouble here. Oh, call Walt Levinson, 5th Precinct Police, New York. He'll give you references. I'll do that, but I still want to know why this guy picked your room to die in. All right, all right, I'll tell you. I flew all the way from New York just to confuse you. Yeah? Yeah, I haven't killed a man in a hotel room in years. I'm the compulsive type. I just couldn't help it. I think I'll lock you up. Well, do that, and I'll be out in an hour. And I'll sue you for so much false arrest, you'll be pounding a beat so far they'll have to pipe orange juice into you. Look, there's been a murder. Well, I didn't do it. The victim died in your room. You'll have to stick around for questioning. Then question me. There's plenty of time. You look like the type that breeds trouble. Yeah, I took it up after I lost my mink business. I won't let you run around for a while. If you're mixed up in this kid, and I'll find out about yeah, it. Let me know when you do. You'll be the first to hear about it. I watched while the cleanup boys hauled away my dead contact. Then I promised Lieutenant Breek I'd meet him at the Miami Homicide Division at 8 o'clock the next morning. They left, and I waited until I was sure they were clear of the hotel. Then went out to find something or someone called La Granada. Out on the street, I decided a cab driver was my best bet. I spotted one about halfway down the block and started for it. I never made it. Hold it. Right there. Oh, give me one good reason. This gun in your back? Hmm, I'm glad you said that. I was going to be brave. Don't. Who'd know you were brave if you did? Oh, what do I have to do to stay alive? Just be good and get into that car. Okay. 
Where are we going? What difference does it make? Well, I might like to look at the scenery. Oh, I hate to disappoint you. <clears throat> See, Mr. Diamond? Doesn't make any difference now, does it? Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here's an important question. Will camels agree with your throat? Here's what noted throat specialists reported in a famous coast-to-coast 30-day camel test. Hundreds of men and women, people in different climates, people with normal throats, smoked only camels for 30 days. The specialists made weekly examinations of their throats, 2,470 examinations in all, and reported... Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Will camels agree with your throat? Make your own 30-day camel test. The sensible, thorough cigarette test. Enjoy camels' rich, full flavor for 30 days. See how mild camels are pack after pack. How well they agree with your throat, week in and week out. You'll make camels your steady smoke. For mildness, for flavor... For constant smoking enjoyment. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. He'd sat me behind the ear with the barrel of his big gun, and I went down like a block of cement in a well. I don't know how long I stayed on the floor of the car, but when I finally pulled myself out of it and shook the cotton out of my head, I found I was in a room sitting in a chair, looking up at the biggest stomach I'd ever seen. Suddenly, over the stomach, a large, round, red face appeared. It smiled, and I tried to return the cursey. Feeling better, Mr. Diamond? Well, I, uh, I haven't felt. Uh, yes, Mr. Timken. Get Mr. Diamond a drink. Right away, Mr. Timken. Well, let me find my head first. I wouldn't know where to pour it. I don't generally resort to violence. Uh, but this time you made an exception. It was necessary. I shouldn't want you to find this place again. I shouldn't want to. What happens when I leave? That depends on how much you care to tell me while you're here. There's your drink. Thanks. What happened to that big gun, Sonny? Would you like to see it? Not especially. Oh, how long did it take you to water this thing? I'm sorry. I didn't know you were a heavy drinker. Not heavy, just determined. Enough levities. Let's get down to business, Mr. Diamond. What kind of business, Mr. Temkin? Do you know who I am? I was warned. Then we understand each other. Where is it? What? Oh, don't be absurd. The white cow. Have you tried the stockyards? Do you insist in this humor? Only if it gets a laugh. Mr. Diamond, I intend having the white cow. Why? Has butter gone up again? I know Mr. Shelton came to your hotel room earlier this evening. Yeah, yeah. He brought a bullet along with him. We were able to catch him just after he landed, but he eluded us. And Sonny tried to slow him up with his forty-five. Well, shall we say he met with an unfortunate accident? Somewhere between this accident and your hotel room, he deposited the white cow. Where, Mr. Diamond? He didn't mention it. I'll give you a thousand dollars for the information. I'd love it, but I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come, come. Martin followed you all the way from New York. Mm, Good for Martin. He should have been a boy ranger. Look, Martin. Plenty of time for your talents. Two thousand, Mr. Diamond. For two thousand, I'd sell you my grandmother's bridge work, but I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, well. Martin? Yes, Mr. Tinker? Go turn on the radio. Get some music. Yes, Mr. Tinker. Oh, I really don't feel like dancing. I'm still a little dizzy. Three thousand. Last offer. Charming, but I'm at a loss. Indeed you are. Martin. Yes, sir. Sonny gonna get rough? Where is the white cow? Sorry. Change his mind, Martin. Certainly. Now, look, I... The white cow, Mr. Diamond. I tell you, I don't know... The white 
cow, Mr. Diamond? I don't know. <coughs> Where is it, funny man? You... You can go to... <coughs> Where? No. <coughs> Where? <coughs> really, Mr. Diamond, is it worth it? Uh, no. I wish you thought so. Just tell me where it is. I don't know. All right, Martin. Oh, look. <coughs> Maybe he's telling the truth. Maybe Shelton didn't tell him where he put it. Then he's of no use to us. But then again, maybe Mr. Shelton did tell him. Mr. Damon. Uh, he's an obstinate young man. Oh, I'll change that. No, he might kill him. If he does know, he can still lead us. Put him to sleep and deposit him in some alley. Yes, sir. <coughs> It was like taking a ride on a loose rocket. There was a burst of fireworks, and everything seemed to drop out from under me. This time, I went up, turning round and round and trying to hang on. Then the lights were gone, and I was sailing through the darkness, wishing I was someone else. Finally, the rocket slowed down and started to fall, and I slipped and went off on my own. Just a poor, tired, beaten-up little private detective looking for some place to land. When I came out of it, I found myself sitting in an alley. I thought about all my aches and the money Temkin had offered me. I pulled myself up and thought about the miserable seven fifty I was getting from Stevens. Then I staggered out in the street and thought about going to some quiet rest home and turning myself in for an idiot. I spotted a cab and hailed it. Uh, take me to the... Uh... Oh. oh, good evening, Miss Albright. You don't have an old quart of plasma on you, do you? The world happened. Oh, nothing in the world. I was jumped by three saucers. Let me help you in. I'm afraid you'll have to. I was just on my way to the hotel. Go ahead, driver. Oh. Convenience. I had the driver pull over when I saw you. What in heaven's name happened? Oh, I was just washing dishes. Honest, honest I was. It's those those new garbage disposals. Well, if you don't want to tell me. Let's take the swelling out of my head first. I'll get you right up to your room. Uh, no, no, let's use your room. I don't want to explain this to Lieutenant Brake. Lieutenant Brake? Narrow-minded cop. Would never believe the story about the disposal. Put your head on my shoulder. Which one? This one. I mean, which head? This will sting a little. Put it on the numb spots, hmm? Mm. I'm sorry. Oh, well, I'll be right home, Mom. Oh, you're not hurt that bad, Rick. Would you be satisfied with, uh, shall we say, a corpse? You're going to be all right. Yeah, yeah, but I'm going to need nursing. I'd love it. Exactly the way I feel. <sighs> going to tell me about it? <sighs> uh, I can't. Secret? Mm-hmm. Just what kind of work do you do? Whatever it is, I'm underpaid. You must make a lot of enemies. I try. Thought you were going back to New York tonight. I nearly did. In a crate. Hey, uh... What's the matter? Have you ever heard of, uh, La Granada? La Granada? In New York? No, no, here in Miami, I think. No. What is it? I don't know, but I've got to find it. You ask anyone? I've been too occupied. How about the phone book? Now, isn't that just like a woman, always being practical? Well, it's just a suggestion. Hmm. One that might make me look even more stupid than I am. Have you got a book? I'll get it. Granada. Granada. La. Granada. There are two of them. What are they? Restaurant on Opal and a hardware shop on James. Mm, well, it's, uh, it's 11.30. I'll try the restaurant first. Can I go? Uh, sorry, no, no. You've got to stick around with the iodine. I might be back for a nightcap. The 
two Granadas in the phone book didn't seem like a place the dear Mr. Shelton would leave an antique, but I went up to my room, put on a clean shirt, and went downstairs to grab a cab. As I started to crawl in, a large arm shoved its way in front of me. Lieutenant Breek was on the other end. You've been busy. Idle hands, you know the old saying, Lieutenant. Where to now? To blow up the city hall. Want to come along and hold the bomb? Look, Diamond, I'm keeping score. I've been checking on the guy who died in your room. He got off the real queen, all right, but not when he ducked. Some guy named Samson picked him up in a small boat about five miles out. Evidently, he didn't like customs. Evidently. It's an old habit of his, I found out. Two previous arrests for smuggling. What does Samson have to say about it? Nothing. He's too dead to say anything. Uh-huh. Well, it's nice talking to you informally like this, Lieutenant. Now, give me a parking ticket or let me get in the cab. Got a date? Yeah. You ought to check up on the people you've been keeping company with. Another beating like that and we'll have to put you in Brian. Yeah, I think how horrible I'd look. Then you could tell everybody I was your twin. I got out of the cab a half block from the La Granada restaurant and did everything but walk backwards to look like I wasn't going there. I looked the place over and went in. It was just closing, and a little balding man with an accent walked over to me. Uh, I'm sorry, but the kitchen is closed, senor. Uh, that's all right. I'm looking for the white cow. Uh, perdón? The white cow. I, I, I don't believe... A man that... named Shelton left it here for me. She... Shelton, white cow? Shelton's a seaman off the Rio Queen. The Rio Queen? Yeah, he told me he left the white cow here. She... Well, senor, you can look around, but you can bet me we got no white cow. Uh, it's an antique. Okay. Uh, what? What? The white cow, a very rare antique. <laughs> you uh, been in a fight, huh, senor? Yeah, now, now, now. You no, got no. hit on the head pretty hard, huh? You haven't got it. Oh, sure. Sure. You have? Sure. We got a white cow and a blue cow right out in the kitchen. We're going to have both of them for breakfast. Okay. okay. Only I don't think I could show them to you. They don't like strangers. <laughs> So that took care of the first bet. As I walked out of the restaurant, I made up my mind. If the hardware shop didn't pay off, I was going to get back to New York and hibernate for the winter. The La Granada hardware shop was all the way on the other side of Miami, on a dark street that looked like the inside of a coffin. Evidently, nobody was interested in buying any hardware at midnight because it was closed. I banged on the front door for about ten minutes, and then, as I was just about to give up, I saw a light, and the door opened a crack. Yeah? Uh, Shelton sent me. Beat it. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Now, listen, listen. A guy named Stevens sent me to meet a guy named Shelton. Shelton was supposed to give me something called the white cow, but Shelton died. What? Yeah, and while he was doing it, he said, La Granada. Now, if this is the place, say so. I'm running out of nerves. Phil's dead? Oh, you know him. He's my brother. Shut the door. You've got the white cow? What's your name? Diamond. Yeah. Bill said you'd be by. He led me to the back of the shop, and I watched while he reached into a bin of ten penny nails. He fished around and pulled out a small, square-shaped object wrapped in oil skin. As he turned to hand it to me, he froze. Don't move. Who's this guy? Oh. oh, his name's Martin. He likes to beat guys up. I'm not going to beat you up this time, Diamond, but you shouldn't have lied to Mr. Timken. We're going to have to kill you for it. This is probably the guy who killed your brother. Yeah. Give me the package. Sure. Toss it. Stay right there. You killed Bill, huh? You didn't tell him enough about me, Diamond. <laughs> now you're going to get yours, funny man. <laughs> Miss Albright, you do everything well, don't you? I try. Take the package over here, Rick. Mr. Diamond. Oh, now you're mad. You don't resent it, do you? No. Kick it over here. Thanks. Oh, now I see. Pick me up in the bar, wait outside that alley. And if you knew I was in that alley, you must know the people who put me there. Mr. Timkin and I are old friends. He's not going to like you killing Sonny. Won't make a bit of difference to him. Oh? You kill him, too? Yes. 
This package is worth about a half million dollars. An antique? It's what's in the antique. You buy it in China for about a thousand dollars. You refine it here and sell it for 500 times that much. The federal government won't like it. Who's to tell them? Certainly not Stevens. He contracted to smuggle the stuff in. Everybody else is dead. But me. Sorry about that. I was beginning to like you. Oh, but uh, not a half million dollars worth. No. Drop it, ladies. <coughs> well, Don't do it. <coughs> Looks like Grand Central. I'm glad nobody locks doors around here. How did you find me? I told you I was keeping score. <sighs> You better get an ambulance, Lieutenant. I wish she hadn't tried to shoot. Uh, Here, lean on me, dear. It's the least I can do. The gun will probably be the one that killed this Timken guy. Get the ambulance, will you? Yeah. Rick. Yeah. Looks like nobody gets anything. I got three fifty in a beating. I guess I come out on top. Sorry. Won't be able to come to New York. So am I, Mary. There's going to be a lot of snow this year. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. A few years ago, 113,597 doctors were asked what cigarette they smoked. The brand named most was Camel. Again and again, a cross-section of America's men of medicine were asked the same question. Every time, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to these repeated surveys, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody deserves our appreciation as much as the hospitalized men and women of our armed forces. As a token of appreciation, the makers of camels send them gift cigarettes every week of the year. This week's camels go to veterans hospitals, Fort Meade, South Dakota, and Washington, D.C., U.S. Army Station Hospital, Fort Hood, Texas. U.S. Naval Hospital, Yokosuka, Japan. Now until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond was written and directed by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Virginia Gregg played the part of Helen Asher. Others in the cast were Sidney Miller, Ted DeCorsia, Tony Barrett, Alan Reed, Herb Butterfield, and Tony Michaels. Be sure to listen to another great camel show, Vaughn Monroe and the Camel Caravan, every Saturday night. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Why are camels by far America's most popular cigarette? Two of the reasons are flavor and mildness. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor. And no other cigarette offers this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people with normal throats, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Try camels yourself. Then you'll know why Camel leads all other brands by billions of cigarettes per year. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we make crime pay for a hundred a day. Hi. Plus expenses. 
Hi, Helen. I'd like to hire you. No cut rates for attractive redheads. But I'm a working girl. I only make $12.40 a week. Doing what? Running an elevator in the automat. My dear girl, there are no elevators in the automat. Oh, no wonder they wouldn't give me a raise. Oh, that's funny. I want to hire you to protect me from a man. He's been bothering me. And just who is this man? His name's Richard Diamond. Well, no wonder he's been bothering you. You've been bothering him. Will you take my key? Just as far as my apartment. We'll open it up and have a party. Oh, you're ridiculous. Only when I try hard. I miss you. I saw you last night. You're just bored. Uh Uh-huh. And I miss you. I'm lonesome. I'm broke. I've got to hang around and pray for a client. Well, I've got a wonderful suggestion. Why don't you Uh come Uh-oh. What? Mr. Diamond? Why, yes. Come in. Rick, who is it? I don't know, but I'm making plans for some extensive research. I didn't mean to disturb you. I don't know how you could help it. Rick, who is that? I'll call you back when I find out. That's a girl. It certainly is. Rick! Bye. Now, Rick, you... Your girl? Hmm? On the phone. Oh, oh, uh, just an old wealthy aunt. She's leaving me her lumber fortune. Oh, nice. Yes, uh, sit down, uh, sit down, Miss, uh... Simpson. Mrs. Oh. Yeah. So you have an aunt in lumber... Oh, yes, yes. Broke one day, made a million the next. Discovered trees on her property. Trees on her property? Well, what are you going to do? I came in to hire you, Mr. Diamond. You have a kind heart and plenty of money, I hope. My husband needs protection. Yeah. I beg your pardon? Nothing, nothing. Just snapping at judgments. Occupational hazard. My husband is John Simpson. Perhaps you've heard of him. The John Simpson? Yes. No. He's retired. He discovered oil on his property. Oh, that one. Oh, sure. He was responsible for my bearings burning out at 700,000 miles. He was walking in the garden the other day. Going to drill in a daisy bed? Someone shot at him. Oh. He's all right. They didn't hit him. But I've been terribly worried ever since. Not to mention how your husband feels. He wouldn't call the police and wouldn't give me a reason. But he wants me to protect him. He doesn't even know I've come to see you. Oh, what's he going to say? I'm hiring you and I hope he'll understand. Well, I hope so, too. I charge a hundred a day at expenses. I have my own bank account. Oh, no. Diamond Detective. Who is she? Well, Aunt Hannah. What? Oh, that's nice, Aunt Hannah. I think Spruce is just the thing. Aunt Hannah. Spruce. Richard Diamond, you... Of course, Aunt Hannah. I'll talk to you later. I knew it. She's a blonde. She sure is, Aunt Hannah. Aunt Hannah. The one with the trees. Thinking about buying a carload of spruce. How nice. Am I hired? Of course. Then let's get out of here. Aunt Hannah might be over with a bat. Spruce? Of course. Well, that's how it started. A lovely blonde named Simpson with a wealthy husband. The husband had ducked a bullet in his garden, and now the lovely blonde wanted protection for him. A few casual jokes, a fat retainer, and Richard Diamond was once more in the ranks of the employed. We left the office and climbed in our station wagon. Forty minutes later, we were pulling up in front of the Simpson house on Long Island. Ah, quite a place. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, if you like money. John's probably in the study. May I take your hat? Well, I'll just keep it with me. Your husband might not want a bodyguard. Well, you're back in a hurry. Oh, hello, Ralph. This is Mr. Diamond. Glad to meet you, Mr. Diamond. Hello. This is Ralph Simpson, Mr. Diamond, my stepson. People are more inclined to think we're brother and sister. Oh, I can understand. Ralph was the one who suggested you. Oh, why me? Reputation. Looks like everyone knows about me but the man I'm supposed to protect. And he won't like it much at first. I've already been briefed. But whether he understands or not, it's most necessary he has protection. Well, let's get it over with. Hello, dear. What is this, a convention? Hello, Jane. Hello, Professor. Who is this man, this person with the hat? This is Mr. Diamond, John. Mr. Diamond, this is my husband, Mr. Simpson. Yeah, charmed. 
And this is Professor Fisher. How do you do, Mr. Diamond? Hello, Professor. What do you do, young man? Do? Mr. Diamond is a private detective, dear. You what? Now, dear, it was my idea. A, a private detective? Now, just relax. Oh, uh, go away, you quack. I've been relaxing enough. I can't think straight anymore. You've been making me relax so much. If you're not careful... Jane, I told you I didn't want anyone. But after being shot at... Did she pay your retainer, Diamond? Yeah. Did she explain my feeling on this subject? Well, yeah. And you still took the money? I've been poor. I told every one of you I can take care of myself. You know, I think he's right. Here's your retainer, Mr. But, Mr. Diamond, please. Where do you think you're going? Out to find the guy who took a shot at you and give him some target practice. You've been paid a retainer to do a job. Now, let's see you do it. Ah, oh, John. I had a feeling you were going to do something like this. Bring in a private detective or a policeman or something. Well, if he's supposed to give me protection, that's what he'll do. Now. All of you, get out of here. I want to talk to this Mr. Diamond. Thank you, John. I'll see you at dinner, dear. Now, you take care of yourself, you old scoundrel. Oh, beat it! Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Nice meeting you, Professor. Well, Mr. Diamond, I have a feeling you might regret this job. It's possible. I really wanted you. I was just... Keeping up a front for the benefit of the family. Is Professor Fisher one of the family? An old friend. Professor Fisher's a psychologist. After my stroke, he came to help me. He teaches me how to relax. You had a stroke? Three months ago. The professor has been a great help. You have a physician also? I don't need one. Now, as long as you're here to protect me, I might as well tell you what it's all about. Answer me one question first. I'll try. Why not call in the police? I have you. Do I need the police now? When someone takes a shot at someone, I think the police should be the first to know about it. Now, if you are quite done, Mr. Diamond, I'll continue. I'm well done. This morning, if my wife had brought you in, I would have had you thrown out. I didn't want any outsiders mixed up in this. What changed your mind? A letter. Here. Mm Mm-hmm. Type. Oh, read it. All right, I will. I missed you in the garden. I won't miss again. You'll pay for Ashanti. Ashanti. It's in Africa. Oh. Twenty years ago, I was in the mining business. I had a partner, Frank Victor. We didn't get along, and there was an argument one day in the mine. It was quite a scrap, and there was a cave in. I got out. Frank didn't. There was an investigation, and I was cleared. Why tell me? The shooting in the garden could have been any crackpot. I didn't want any publicity, so I didn't want any outsiders. Then this letter. I have to confide in someone so they'll know who to look for. Who else knew about it? No one that it should make any difference to. Victor was a bachelor, without a family. Could be blackmail. Someone who was there, or at the investigation. Then why shoot at me? To give you a good scare. You'll probably get another letter demanding money. This person must be caught. In my position, I can't afford the scandal. Now, you say I'm the first one you've told. Outside of your family? I haven't told my family a thing. Even my first wife didn't know about it. Mm. You've heard nothing of the incident for 20 years? Nothing. Well, I'll see what I can find out. I promised John Simpson my confidence. He offered me a large bonus if I should discover who had sent him the threatening letter... Then I borrowed one of his cars and drove back to the city where I looked up an old friend. Lieutenant Levinson, 5th Precinct Police Station. Well, the smiling gumption. Well, hello, happiness and light. Want to do me a favor? Depends. Well, if you can strain your arches, I'd like some confidential information on a few people. What is in it for me? <laughs> I promise not to tell anyone what a mercenary policeman you are. I'd like dinner, maybe a big steak. You'll get dinner, maybe chow mein. You got a deal with that restaurant? Certainly. They saved me all the leftover fortunes stuck in the cookies. (laughs) Who are you interested in? I want to know about a young guy named Ralph Simpson, an attractive blonde named Mrs. Simpson, and a man named Professor Fisher. Simpson, Simpson, and Fisher. The boy named Ralph is the son of John Simpson. No. Yeah. The John Simpson? Know who he is? No. Well, unlike my Aunt Hannah, who discovered trees in her property... Your Aunt Hannah? Simpson discovered oil. Oh, that one. His wife is the blonde. Which blonde? The one I want you to check on, Mrs. Simpson. Oh, how silly of me. I should have known. Don't forget the professor. I thought you said his name was Fisher. I did. How does he fit in with Simpson? A friend of the family. Now, you got everything? Sure, sure. Blonde named Mrs. Simpson, a son named Ralph. He's not her son. Well, you just said... He was John's son. 
Who's the blonde? John's other wife? John's other wife. That's right. Oh, he's her stepson. Oh. Well, why the devil do you want me to check on these people? I'm thinking about having a bridge party. Uh, give me the rundown on them. Sure. Uh, Walt. Huh? Put your shoes on. Oh. I gave Walt the rundown he wanted and headed for the newspaper where I knew I could wallow through the morgue file and not be disturbed. I went back 20 years and after wallowing for three or four hours found a small article dated Ashanti, Africa, 1930. It didn't say much more than what John Simpson had already told me. It mentioned the mine cave-in and the pending investigation on the death of Frank Victor. In an edition dated three weeks later, I found the account of the investigation and it verified Simpson's story. I left the newspaper and went back to my office to check on a few things. Then, as I was about to leave and close up until I'd finished the case, I got a phone call. Yeah? Diamond? Yeah? This is John Simpson. I took a chance you might be in your office. Oh, I was just coming back out there. This is John Simpson. I took a chance you might be in your office. Yeah, 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 you said that. I'd like you to pick up something for me. Oh, sure. It's a package. It's at a bar on 57th Street. The Blue Pheasant. The Blue Pheasant on 57th Street. Mr. Diamond, this is John Simpson. Yes, yes, I, I, I know, I know. Anything else? Hello? Mr. Simpson. Bring it out to me right away. It's very important. I'll pick it up and bring it right out. Something wrong, Mr. Simpson? Hello? Hello? Hmm. Funny. Before we continue with Richard Diamond... Here is an important question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked a few years ago of 113,597 doctors. The brand name most was Camel. Recently, that question was again asked of tens of thousands of doctors across the country. Doctors in all branches of medicine. And again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to these nationwide surveys... More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Friends, smoke the cigarette so many doctors enjoy. Change to camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. Yes, change to camels for 30 days and you'll stay with camels from then on. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the camels 30 days test. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I left the office and went down to 57th Street in the Blue Pheasant, where I told the bartender who I was, and he handed me the package Simpson had wanted me to pick up for him. I drove back out to the house on Long Island. The maid let me in, and Mrs. Simpson met me at the study door. Hello. Well, hi. Where's your husband? Oh, I think he's still in the study. He was a little while ago. You going out? Some shopping. You're staying for dinner. Hmm? Where's your stepson? Ralph went out just after you left. Did you want him for something? No, no, no. Just wondered. Then shopping? Oh, this is a package for your husband. He wanted me to pick it up. Dinner's at seven. Uh, Mrs. Simpson. Yes? It's Professor Fisher. What about him? How long have you known him? Since I've been married to John. Your husband said he was helping him to relax. Yes. Is there something wrong? I don't know. I talked to your husband earlier when he asked me to pick up this package. He sounded rather strange. Kept repeating himself. Since he had his stroke, he does that sometimes. Well, shouldn't he have a nurse? He should, but he won't. If something should happen, Professor Fisher's number is in the book on John's desk. Or call the maid. Mm. I'll see you at dinner. Bye. Well, hello, Mr. Simpson. I've got the package. Give me the package. Uh, Mr. Simpson. Give me the package. Uh, Are you feeling all right? Give me the package. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, I did some checking on your story about a shanty, and I... Give me the package. You've got it. Mr. Simpson. 
Hey, what's wrong? Mr. Simpson, did you hear me? Oh, I better get the maid. The maid? Maid! Mr. Diamond? Yeah, Ralph? Yeah. What's wrong? I don't know. Your father's acting... <laughs> felt like the whole building was coming down around my ears. Ralph and I were thrown back against the wall, and by the time we got up, the study was a smoking black hole. Dad! Dad! I stumbled in after Ralph, but there wasn't much to stumble in after. John Simpson had been blown to kingdom come. You're sure it was Simpson on the phone? Sure, I'm sure it was Simpson on the phone, Walt. He asked you to pick up the package. That's right. He wanted it when I brought it in to him. He wouldn't say anything else. He just demanded that package. He'd been pretty sick, hadn't he? Yeah, but a man doesn't go to that much trouble to commit suicide. No. Well, maybe somebody planted the bomb. Now look, let's uh, let's check with that bartender at the Blue Pheasant. Yeah, I want to talk to the rest of the family first. Now, by the way, uh, what did you find out about them? No police records. Can't find out much about the professor. He has no practice, no license in the state. I'll see if you can find out something. Interested? Yeah. It's funny when a man has a heart condition and won't have a doctor. I'll drag the professor in if you like. No, no, no. You go talk to the family. I'll go and check with the bartender. Uh, Wait a minute, Sherlock. You better tell me how you got into this mess. Okay, Fatty. Guess it won't hurt now. I told Walt everything the late Mr. Simpson had told me, then headed back to town in the Blue Pheasant on 57th Street. By the time I got there, the place was pretty well filled, but the bartender who had given me the package that afternoon wasn't in sight. Yeah, well, it be. Uh, where's the bartender who was working this afternoon? How do I know? He just works in the afternoon. Now, where does he live? Why? Well, I'm collecting addresses of bartenders. Now, where does he live? You collect addresses. I collect wise guys. Beat it. Mm-hmm. You mean I got to show my little old badge? Your little old badge? Well... <laughs> Why didn't you say so? Complex. He lives at 500 West 157th Street. What's his name? Earl. Earl Collins. No relation to Tom. <laughs> no relation to Tom. Well, what are you going to do? I piled out of the bar and back in the car. Drove across town to 157th Street and 500 West. It was a big apartment house, and Earl Collins was registered in 405. I climbed the stairs and knocked. Gave him a few minutes while I knocked my knuckles loose. Then went and dug up the landlady to have her open the door. She was a charmer, about four years older than Grant's tomb, with a gin disposition that would make a lost weekend seem like a Miami vacation. The type that should never have been dug up. Look, honey, I got cleaning to do. Sweetheart. uh, Sweetheart. Oh, an expression of fond endearment. Look, Buster, don't give me no words longer than one syllable. Cop. You? Yes, mother. Mother. Sweetheart. Some cop. We'll discuss my qualifications as soon as you open that door. Okay. Sweetheart. There you are. Holy... You said it. Is he dead? As dead as he can get. Mm, Still warm. I'm not interested. I need a drink. Did you see him come in? No. Did you see anybody else come in? I've been in my apartment all afternoon. I'm going back there. Killer used something awfully sharp. Neat job. Neat? (laughs) What are you looking at? What's that other room? Hi, what's wrong? Keep it quiet. What's that room? Oh, good gosh. Bedroom. Any other rooms? Hi. Answer me. Bathroom. Fire escape? Huh? Where is it? End of the hall. Look, there's some blood leading to that bedroom. Oh. Now, shh. Take it easy. Go downstairs and call Lieutenant Walter Levinson. Oh, Lieutenant Levin Walterson. Walter Levinson. Oh, goodbye. At the fifth precinct. Fifth precinct. Oh, yes. There were several drops of blood leading to the bedroom door. There was a good chance that the killer had been surprised and couldn't get out. I went to the door and tried it as quietly as I could. It gave, and I kicked it open. The shades were down. The room was dark enough to make it difficult to spot anyone. I moved in with my gun in front of me. He was standing right by the door, and he had a knife. Drop it. 
No. You should have listened. Didn't want to. Sorry, Professor. Don't be. It's better this way. Now look, look, you're in bad shape. You better tell me about it. You fired the shot in the garden and sent the letter? Yeah. Help me sit up. Okay. Yeah. Lean against the wall. Thank you. Oh, I, I still can't figure why Simpson had me pick up that bomb. I made him. You did? I've been treating him for nerves. I started giving him a hypnotic when he had his first spells. During one of those times, he reenacted the Ashanti affair. So you decided to blackmail him? At first. Then when you took the case, we decided to eliminate him. We? Well, Mrs. Simpson and I have been... <coughs> I haven't got much time. Internal bleeding. Police will be here pretty quick. Decided to kill the old man and Jane would get the estate. I thought you'd be blown up with him. Mr. Simpson was under some sort of influence when I walked into the study. My profession. After you left, I returned and talked him into a deep sleep. I had him call you at your office. He nearly messed it up. Hypnosis. Nothing unusual. Simple suggestions. And when I walked into the study... He'd been ordered to ask for the package and open it. You mean he was asleep when I walked in? Yes, you see? Uh, it's too late. You'll have to guess the rest. Bleeding in. Oh. Yeah. Well, you better lie down again, Professor. You'll have to get used to it. Why did he kill the bartender? Well, Walt checked and the professor had been coming into the bar for some time in the afternoons. He made friends with Earl, the bartender, and left the package with him. When he found out I hadn't been killed in the blast, he killed Earl to keep him from identifying him. Oh, charming. Yeah, like an asylum in an earthquake. Well, I told you to stick to redheads. Oh, really? Well, you know any available ones? One. <laughs> How available? Um, you'll have to do some extensive research. Okay. After dinner. I do not do any research on a schedule. Don't you want any dinner? Well, sure. Well, it get cold. Let it. Rick. What? I'm hungry. Oh, for Pete's sake. You sing something. While I go put the food on a tray and we can eat in here by the fire. You're going to get fat and sassy. Rick. I take it back. You're already sassy. You sing something. I'll be right back. Nah, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Got to sing for everything. Oh, dee doo 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 That's nice. Just get the food, huh? Just thanks, huh? Um, I think of you with every breath I take. And every breath becomes a sigh. Not a sigh of despair. But a sign that I care for you. I hear your name with every breath I take On every breeze that wanders by And your name is the song I remember the long years through Even though I walk alone, you guide me in the darkness, you light my way. And all the while inside me, love seems to say, Someday, someday. And when I sleep, you keep my heart awake. But when I wake from dreams divine, every breath that I take is a prayer that I'll make you mine. Rick. Hmm? 
Is there really anything to this hypnosis? Well, there sure is. The old professor made Simpson open that package. Is it hard to do? Ah, uh, look, I'll show you. Just sit right there. Rick, I... I... It's all right. Just look me right in the eye. All right. You're going to sleep. You're going to sleep. You just want to go to sleep. Nothing makes any difference. Just sleep. 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 Wish. Deep, deep sleep. A deep, sound, peaceful. Oh, for Pete's sake. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. To find out how well camels agree with the throats of smokers, this far-reaching test was made. Hundreds of people from coast to coast, people with normal throats, smoked only camels for 30 days. Each week, leading throat specialists examined the throats of these smokers. They made 2,470 examinations and reported not one single case of throat irritation. Due to smoking camels. Try camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of camels have sent more than 198 million gift camels to our armed forces. This week, gift camels go to hospitalize servicemen and veterans at... Veterans Hospitals, Framingham, Massachusetts, and Durban, Michigan. U.S. Naval Hospital, San Diego, California. And to all hospitals operated for the U.S. Air Forces in the Far East. Now until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond was written and directed by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Virginia Gregg played the part of Helen Asher and Alan Reed was Lieutenant Levinson. Others in the cast were Gene Bates, Herbert Butterfield, and Tony Michaels. Be sure to listen to another great camel show, Vaughn Monroe and the Camel Caravan, every Saturday night. Here's a question that was asked of 113,597 doctors in a nationwide survey a few years ago. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Again and again since then, a cross-section of America's doctors has been asked that same question. And again and again, every time, the brand name most has been Camel. Yes, according to repeated surveys, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Now we bring you another transcribed adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, our fee deductible on next year's income tax... Richard Diamond, private deduction speaking. I beg your pardon? Sorry, it's much too wordy to go over again. <clears throat> yes. Uh, Mr. Diamond, this is Fred Lane speaking. You once did a job for a friend of mine. Well, if your friend wants his money back, tell him I've already spent it. Oh, no, nothing like that. He recommended you. Well, well, wonders never cease. I'd like to hire you, Mr. Diamond. May I inquire as to your fee? You may. A hundred dollars a day in expenses. Oh, well, that is rather steep. But I think I can manage. Spoken like a true millionaire, Mr. Lane. I live at 1482 Riverside. Please get here as soon as possible. Well, I'm pretty busy, but I'll try to. I Please do, Mr. Diamond. I'll have a check waiting for you. Hmm. Mr. Lane, go to your front door. I'm there. People who promise to have checks waiting are people for whom Diamond loves to work. I went downstairs, picked up my car, and drove to the address on Riverside. Rang the doorbell. The door opened. 
Then my blood pressure started doing push-ups. She was tall, blonde, and wore a dress that would have even been banned on television. You must be Mr. Dunn. Well, how can you tell? Don't other men drool? Come in, please. Fred's expecting you. Fred? Mr. Lane, my husband. Oh. This way, please. Fred's in the den. I do hope you'll be able to help us, Mr. Dunn. Well, so do I. Mrs. Lane, what seems to be the trouble? I'll let Fred explain to you. This whole business is, has got me rather upset. I... It's in here. Fred? Yes? Mr. Diamond's here. Oh, good. Come in, Diamond. Come in. I'll be upstairs, Fred. Of course, dear. Sit down, Mr. Diamond. Thank you. Ah, you got here in a hurry. You're certainly true to your word, sir. Uh, I owe it all to my Boy Scout training. Well, here, as I promised, to check. Ah, oh, good, good. Now that we're both men of our word, let's make with some more words. Why do you want to hire me, Mr. Lane? It's about my wife, Mary. She's being blackmailed, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I see. It's been going on for a month now. Finally, last night she broke down and told me all about it. All about what, Mr. Lane? Why is she being blackmailed? She made a few mistakes before I met her. No reason to go into that now, but the blackmailer knows all about those mistakes. You speak as if you knew who the blackmailer was, Mr. Lane. I do. Perhaps I should clarify that a bit, however. I don't know the man personally, but Mary tells me he was a classmate of hers during her college years. Mm -hmm. She told me his name was Louis Dixon and that he was staying at the Brewster Hotel on 35th. I went there this morning to have it out with him. And? He checked out last night. Uh Uh-huh. Mr. Lane, I still don't see why you hired me. Now that your wife's told you about the blackmail, you could just report it to the police. Next time this Dixon guy calls, they'd nab him. I'm not interested in turning him over to the police, Mr. Diamond. I don't quite follow you. I'm only interested in seeing that he doesn't bother Mary anymore. When you locate Dixon, let me know. I intend to give him a thrashing he'll never forget. That's letting a blackmailer off pretty easy, Lane. Perhaps. But if we prosecute, well, publicity and all, I think Mary's gone through enough. Like I say, all I'm interested in is seeing that he doesn't bother her anymore. Call me about five and let me know what progress you made. Good day, Mr. Diamond, and good luck. And that was that. Go find a blackmailer, Diamond, so your client can beat him up. Screw it? <laughs> you bet. But the hundred dollar check in my pocket made up for my own feelings on the case, and I set out to find one Lewis Dixon blackmailer. Lane seemed to think Dixon would have a record, and if he was right, Lieutenant Walt Lemerson could give me a lead. It was almost noon when I parked in front of the 5th Precinct and walked into Walt's office. Well, oh, Ricky boy, pull up a chair. Just in time to watch me finish my lunch. Oh, you are so generous, Walter. No thanks. No thanks what? No thanks, I won't have a piece of your pie. What's wrong with this pie? My wife made it. That's what's wrong. Are you insinuating my wife's a bad cook? Of course not. She just makes fattening pies. They're too doughy. How do you know it's too doughy before you taste it? You can tell by looking at it. That's ridiculous. Here, now, let me cut this piece in two. There. Now, try it. Oh, wow. Go on, try it. Ah, well. Mmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is it doughy? Mm -hmm. Not in the least. (laughs) I guess that proves you. Wait a minute. Something wrong, Fatty? You've eaten my wife's pies at the house before. You never thought they were dough. Do. No, uh, pour me some coffee, please, Lieutenant. <laughs> you know, I should book you for swindling. What do you want down here, anyway? Oh, just a little peek at your files. Who is it you're looking for this time? Guy by the name of Lewis Dixon. Ever hear of him? Dixon? Well, Ralph Dixon, a pickpocket. Herbie Dixon, a con man. Well, I can't place a Louis Dixon offhand. What's his racket? Blackmail lately. Oh, charming. Why haven't we been called in on the case? But my client doesn't want publicity. Besides, he just wants to poke the guy in the snoot a few times and tell him he's been a bad boy. What? Yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, finish what's left of your pie while I go through the files. And, uh, uh Walt. Yeah? Have your wife bake lemon meringue next time, huh? Oh. I checked the files. There was nothing on Lois Dixon. I thanked Walt, went to my car, and drove across town to a little bar called the Bat's Cave. The Bat's Cave was as dingy as the name implied, but I didn't go there for entertainment. I was looking for Rabbit Jones, the guy who knew more about the underworld than Rudolph Halley. 
Like most informers, Rabbit Jones was a mean, whining character, and he didn't like me any more than I liked him. But he did like my money, and I liked his information. It was always a fair trade. I found him in the last booth, nursing a half-filled glass of beer. Ah, oh, hello, Rabbit. Oh. Well, now that's a cheerful greeting. You must have won a horse race today, or weren't you running? Mm, big joke. Ha ha. Bill. Oh, Rabbit, you spread sunshine wherever you go, don't you? Y- y- who asked you to sit down? Oh, damn, when I get sick of you private dicks, go bother someone else. Oh, drop the small talk, Rabbit. I won't pay over the usual price, so don't make your information hard to get. Maybe I got none to sell. Pal, the day you stop selling information, I start knitting argyles. Okay, okay. Who is it? Louis Dixon. Where's the dough? You know I always pay. Well, this ain't my week for trusting people. Fork it over. Search yourself. There. Now, about Louis Dixon. Uh, I never heard of him. And it, he let go of me. Don't get smart, Rabbit. I pay for talk, straight talk. Okay, okay, take your hands off of me. Hi there. Uh, uh, you rough boy's got to show your muscles, huh? Oh, shut up. You don't get my money unless you earn it, Rabbit, so start earning. Uh, like I say, I never heard of a guy named Lewis Dixon. But you know, with my contacts, I can find out about him, so drop the rough stuff. How long would it take? Uh, it all depends. What's this Dixon guy's line? Blackmail. There's a chance he might have been mixed up in some other rackets the past few years. Uh, give me two hours. If he's been around lately, I'll find out. Now make it one hour. I'll meet you back here. Uh, okay. A diamond. Yeah? I wish I had more nerve. If I had more nerve, I'd slip a shiv in you some night. Oh, I wish you had more nerve too, Rabbit. I'd enjoy beating you to pieces for trying it. On your way, punk. Rabbit shuffled out of the bat's cave with a slow, heavy step, like a man reluctant to step out into the sunlight. I spent the next hour checking contacts of my own, then returned to the bat's cave and waited for Rabbit. He came in a half an hour late, took the stool beside me, and ordered a beer before he turned to me. Oh, you picked some tough guys to get a line on, Darren. Oh, I had a bad time. Stop singing the blues, Rabbit. Uh, and if the guy has worked the rackets, he's been quiet about it. I couldn't find one guy or no. You sure of that, Rabbit? Oh, sure, sure. I did find a few guys who heard of him, though. Keep talking. Now, two different guys were at Squeaky Horner's floating crap game the other night. And they say a guy named Lewis Dixon was there. How did they know it was Dixon? Well, we was flashing dough around, telling everyone what a big shot he was. But they don't know where he is now. Well, if they did, I'd tell you. Maybe Squeaky Horner knows he ran the game. But where's Squeaky now? When the game folds for a few days, Squeaky hangs out around the Penny Arcade at Third and Chestnut. Now I know the place. Well, then go and talk to him. And let me drink my beer in peace. I passed a few more insults with Rabbit as I paid a check, then drove to the Penny Arcade, Third and Chestnut. Squeaky Horner was hunched over a pinball machine, and when he saw me, his eyes lit up like the tilt sign. Ricky Diamond, hey! How you been, Rick? No, not bad, Squeaky. You? Ah, great, great. Hey, look look at that score. Uh, got a nickel? Oh, sure, yeah. Thanks. What brings you down here, Ricky? I understand a guy named Lois Dixon was at your game a few nights ago. Hey, Rick, there's a lot of boys dropped in from time to time. It's hard... Uh, you say Dixon? That's right. Yeah, I remember him, a blowhard. Every time he rolled a dice, he said, Lewis Dixon's the best crap shooter in town. Prove it, dice. That's what he said. You ever seen him before, Squeaky? Let me see. No, he was a stranger. I got a good memory for faces. This boy I'd never seen before. Oh, great. Was he with anyone you might know? I'm afraid not, Rick. He come alone and he left alone. Wish I could help you, though. Thanks, anyway. Thank you for the nickel. Hey, look at that score go up. Squeaky's score was running very high, but mine was still zero. So far, not one definite lead as to the whereabouts of Lewis Dixon. I spent another half hour combing the known informers, but to no avail. A little after five, I went to a phone booth and called my client, Fred Lane. Hello? Mr. Lane? Who's this? Richard Diamond. Uh... It's Walt, Rick. Walt, what are you doing there? Can't you guess? Oh, no. Uh-huh. Fred Lane, your client, Rick? Yeah. 
better get over here right away. You are now unemployed. Lane? That's right. Murder. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here is an important question. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? How mild can a cigarette be? Here's a good way to find out. Make the 30-day camel mildness test a sensible test based on steady smoking. Smoke only camels for the next 30 days and compare them in your T-zone. T for throat, T for taste. See how much you enjoy Camel's rich, full flavor, pack after pack, as your steady smoke. See how well Camel's agree with your throat week after week as your steady smoke. You'll soon see why. Camel is America's most popular cigarette by billions of cigarettes per year. Yes, and you'll soon be a steady Camel smoker. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Fred Lane's body lay on the floor of his den. There was a letter opener lying beside the body, and it fit the hole on his back. Tomorrow morning's paper would carry Fred Lane's obituary. It would tell where he was born, what he did with his life, and when he died. But it wouldn't tell who killed him. And that's what I wanted to find out. Looks like you really put up a fight, Eric. Yeah, the room's torn up a lot. Who did it, Walt? Louis Dixon, the guy you've been out looking for. Do you have him? Uh Uh-uh. Mrs. Lane gave us the information. Seems Dixon came here to the house about two hours ago. He wanted more dough for Mrs. Lane. Pretty nervy to come right here. Yeah. Guess she figured Lane might be out. Anyway, Mrs. Lane called her husband. Fred came in, invited Dixon into the den for a talk, and sent Mrs. Lane upstairs. Oh, well, that fits. Lane starts beating up Dixon, and Dixon grabs the letter opener and kills Lane. Huh? Uh-huh. That's where it figures. Mrs. Lane said she heard the struggle, but her husband had told her to stay in her room, and then she heard Dixon run out, so she came down and found the body and called us. Uh-huh. Did you get the prints off the letter opener? No. Mrs. Lane said Dixon was wearing a pair of gloves when he came in. Chances oh. are he never took them off. Oh. oh, that's great. Well, Fatty, I hope you have more luck picking up Dixon than I had. Nobody around town seems to know him. Well, Mrs. Lane gave us a good description. I put out an APB. What about you? You still on the case? I was about to give it up when I phoned. But I can keep going as long as my legs hold up. Good. I'd like to nab this Dixon guy as quick as possible. Me too, Walt. I don't like people to go around killing my clients. Just isn't good for business. The boys were taking the body down to the morgue as I left. It looked like a hard day for my shoe leather. The only thing I could do was keep pounding the pavement in search of someone who knew or had known Lois Dixon. Cigarette stands, boogie joints, cheap boarding houses, nothing. Down to the Bowery, Mission, small bars. Guys on the corner. Louis Dixon? Yeah, never heard of him. And so it went. I headed back to my office in the comfort that comes when you sit in a chair with your feet on the desk. But when I reached the entrance of the office building, Squeaky Horner was standing there waiting for me. Hey, Ricky, where you been? I've been waiting here a long time, almost an hour. Oh, what's on your mind, Squeaky? You still looking for Louis Dixon? That's a silly question. Why? Because I seen him about an hour and a half ago. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. I got a good memory for faces. After I leave the arcade, I'm walking up third and I see him. Big as life. Where is he now? I tell him, see? He goes into Henry's flop house. He's staying in one of Henry's rooms. Uh, and not in a hall like most of the guys. He's under another name. What name, Squeaky? Jack Lighton. You want I should take you to the place, Ricky? Yeah, Squeaky. I want that you should. <laughs> Here's the room, rookie. You want I should knock? Never mind. What? Just hold it right there, Layton. Or is it Dixon? What are you talking about? What's the idea of busting in here like this? What about it, Squeaky? Is he the guy? No doubt about it, Ricky. He's the same guy who was at the game a few nights ago. What game are you talking about? i never seen you before in my life. All right, Squeaky. I can take it from here. Thanks a lot. Anytime, Ricky. 
Hey. Hey, what gives anyway, bud? Suppose you tell me, Dixon. Why do you keep calling me Dixon? The name's Jack Layton. Well, we'll see about that. There's one person who should be able to identify you for sure. Fred Lane's widow. Get your hat, pal. Well, it looks like the end of a hard day. I forced Layton, or Dixon, outside and into my car. Then we drove to the Lane house on Riverside. The police had left and Mrs. Lane was alone. I took my man inside and Mrs. Lane looked at him closely. I knew it would be just like the movies. She'd point and say, that's him, that's the man, Mr. Diamond. I'm sorry, Mr. Diamond. What? I've never seen this man before in my life. This, dear children, is the story of why a detective gets ulcers. But as I was driving Leighton back toward town, I began thinking. Squeaky Horn had never been wrong about a man before. And why had Dixon been so hard to locate? I hadn't been able to turn up one man who knew him. So instead of driving Leighton back to his room, I drove to the Brewster Hotel, where Lane said Dixon had been registered for a week. There it was a different story. The desk clerk positively identified Jack Layton as the man who had registered as Louis Dixon. At last, things began to shape up. Why did you bring me here to your office? I want to get back to my room. You heard what the desk clerk said. You registered as Louis Dixon. Why? Oh, that desk clerk was loony. He made a mistake. You heard what Mrs. Lane said. She never saw me before. So she said. But I think differently, Layton. And up here all along, we can have a nice little chat. You're going to tell me all about it. I, I got nothing to say. No? Well, then suppose I open the conversation. <laughs> now, that was a first sentence, Layton. Now, do I start on a paragraph, or will you talk instead? I, I don't... I don't know a thing. Okay, stupid. We'll do it the hard way. <laughs> Yes? Oh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, hello, Mrs. Lane. Mind if I come in? Of course not. Please do. Uh, suppose we go into the den. I'd like to have a little talk with you, Mrs. Lane. Well, I'm sorry. I'm not feeling too well, Mr. Diamond. The shock and all. Oh, yes, yes, of course. It, it must have been trying, my bringing that latent man here for you to identify. Well, yes, it was. It, uh, if you could come back tomorrow, perhaps. Oh, I, I'm afraid not, honey. Now. Very well. I'm sorry you picked up the wrong man, Mr. Diamond. Oh, sure, yes. That's funny. Two other people swore he was a man known as Louis Dixon. Well, it's hard to identify someone accurately, I imagine. But I was certain he wasn't Dixon. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, well, you tidied up the den quite a bit. Just what is it you wanted to talk to me about, Mr. Diamond? Well, there's no hurry, no hurry. Say, this is a handsome room. Nice house, too. And all yours, along with everything else your husband owned. That's rather a cruel thing to say. Oh, come off it, Mary. It was a wild scheme. What do you mean? I mean that you invented a phony character, a Louis Dixon, and set up a murder with every clue pointing to a man who never existed. You're crazy. No, no, Mary. You were crazy to think a stunt like this would ever work. You hired a bum named Jack Layton, gave him money, had him register at the Brewster Hotel as Louis Dixon. Then you had him hit some of the gambling joints and make sure people heard his name as Louis Dixon. Then he was to disappear. I won't stay here and be insulted. No? Well, soon I'll take it down to headquarters. You can be insulted there. Well, I hope you have proof, Mr. Diamond. You'll need it. Well, Layton was reluctant at first, but let's say I persuaded him to talk. I dropped him by the 5th Precinct on my way over here. How much do you make as a private detective, Mr. Diamond? Oh, Mary, Mary, don't talk like that. First chance you got, you'd stick a knife in my back, too. Well, it was just a suggestion. After all... No, 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 no. drop it, drop it now. (sighs) Well, well, first a letter opener on your husband, and now you try to bean me with a paperweight. Honey, you're just not safe around a desk, are you? Yes, Helen, dear? I've been thinking. Show off. No, really. 
I think you should put your business on a more dignified level. You don't say. You should try and attract a higher type clientele. Oh, I don't know. This lame fellow I worked for today was no slouch. But what happened to him? He got killed. That's the trouble with your cases. They're too dangerous. If you don't get into trouble, your clients do. True, true. You should concentrate on more simple cases for wealthy clients like divorce cases and inheritance claims. Oh, great. Maybe I should even carry a powder puff in my shoulder holster. All right, so it wouldn't be as exciting. Get the same fee and you wouldn't get so many black eyes. Then I couldn't come here to you for sympathy, dear. Rick, I'm serious. Okay, honey, okay. Just, now tell me, just how do I go about attracting a higher type clientele, as you put it? Well, you start off by putting on a more pretentious front. Meaning I eat more? Meaning you act a little more dignified. Well, do go on, Miss Asher. You should also have someone at the office to answer the phone for you. Oh, Helen, it only rings once or twice a day. I think I have enough strength to pick up the receiver that often. Well, it's strictly for appearances. Oh, oh, I see. Anyone in mind for the job? Well, I have a lot of free time. Oh, fine, dear, fine. I'm glad it's free. I should be able to afford that. And then after we build up the business... Rick, are you listening? Hmm? Oh, sure, sure, baby, sure. You are not. You're just waiting for me to take a pause so you can sneak in a song. Oh, honey, how can you be so suspicious? But, uh, since you did bring up the matter... I I should have known better. Oh, live and learn, dear, live and learn. If they ask me, I could write a book About the way you walk and whisper and look I could write a preface on how we met So the world would never forget and the simple secret of the plot is just to tell them that I love you a lot then the world discovers as my book ends How to make two lovers of friends. Then the world discovers as my book ends how to make two lovers of friends oh very nice well thank you sweet only now let's get back to your business oh who wants to talk about business come here now Rick stop Mm. it Rick I wanted to Oh, Rick. Oh, now, now then. You were saying I shouldn't get on a more dignified level. I was? Oh, that's what I like. The gal with a one-track mind. Dick Powell will return in just a moment. What's America's most popular cigarette? Camel is in the lead by billions of cigarettes per year. One reason is that America's smokers have found out how rich, how flavorful camels are. Pack after pack. Another reason is that America's smokers have discovered how well camels agree with their throats week after week. Are you smoking the cigarette America enjoys most? If not, start smoking mild, flavorful camels tonight. How mild, how mild. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a token of friendship and to help show hospitalized veterans and service personnel that America remembers them, 
The makers of camels send thousands of packs of camels to service and veterans hospitals every week. This week, the gift camels are going to veterans hospitals, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Bay Pines, Florida. U.S. Naval Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee, to all hospitals operated by the Alaskan Air Command. Now until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Dick Carr with music by Frank Worth. Virginia Gregg was heard as Helen Asher and Alan Reed as Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Others in the cast were Benny Rubin, Mary Jane Croft, Howard McNear, and Peter Leeds. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. Be sure to listen to another great camel show, Vaughn Monroe and the Camel Caravan, every Saturday night. Buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Time now for Rocky Jordan, brought to you today by Del Monte Tomato Products. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Del Monte presents Rocky Jordan and this week's story, Memento from Adelaide. I first saw them standing on the sidewalk outside my tambourine. Two men, one tall and thin with a puckered mouth that looked like it had been eating sour apples, the other short and fat, fidgeting with a briefcase and pointing to the numbers that marked the address of my cafe. They stood outside for a moment, jabbering to each other. Then I guess they made up their minds because they came into my place, the fat one in the lead. A few seconds later, the fat one opened the conversation. You, sir, your name, sir, is... Rocky Jordan. As expected. My card, sir. J. Lampo of the PIC, the Pyramid Insurance Company, Home Offices, Alexandria. Huh? Insurance of all sorts, fire, theft, life, health, group annuities, fidelity, and surety bonds, etc. My associate here... My card, H. Manchek, similarly of the PIC, agent for the Cairo district. We are in business for your protection. Well, thanks a lot, fellas. I appreciate that, but I'm not in the market for any insurance. My briefcase. Mm. Uh, uh, now the papers. Shall I interrogate, or do you wish to man-check? Whichever you prefer. Look, why don't you start, Lampo, and man-check and fill in the gaps, eh? but make it fast. i got a lot to do. We all have, Mr. Jordan. I shall proceed. You could, if requested, secure affidavits from reliable persons attesting you are Rocky Jordan, as you say, and no other. I could. Since I am no other, there must be a point to all this. The Rocky Jordan we have in mind owned an establishment called the Cafe Tambourine, even as this cafe is called. Now, this cafe previously had been located in two other large world cities. Name the cities. Istanbul and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Am I warm? This Rocky Jordan we have in mind is not native to Egypt. He is an immigrant from another country. Name the country. How about the United States? In what city of this same United States was this Rocky Jordan born? Uh, I'll try St. Louis. Mr. Lampo, this is indeed the man. Our exhaustive investigations the last few weeks prove it to me. And to me. Mr. Jordan, I shall leave these release from claim papers with you. After you have studied them to your complete satisfaction, please to sign them. And then? H. Manchak shall return this evening to pick up the signed papers and deliver to you a check. Payment in full... $40,000. $40,000 in American money, Mr. Jordan. PIC shall then be relieved of its obligation to you. Well, $40,000 is a nice obligation, fellas, but... The I Pyramid don't Insurance Company prefers always to pay claims against it as rapidly as possible. In this case, there was unavoidable delay because you presented no formal claim. Since, however, you are beneficiary, the money is rightfully yours. Look, fellas, I don't like to be a wet blanket, but there must be some mistake. There is no mistake, Mr. Jordan, rest assured. We have investigated thoroughly. PIC owes you $40,000. 
ever since the death a year ago of Mrs. Adelaide Foss Jordan, your wife. <laughs> Lampho and Manchek walked out of the tambourine and left me standing there with my mouth open. I figured they were phonies, a couple of loonies working Cairo for laughs. But the insurance papers in my hand look real enough. So I put in a quick call to the Cairo office of the Pyramid Insurance Company to check. It turned out that Lampho and Manchek did work there, but I still wasn't convinced. So I put in a call to Captain Sabaya, Cairo Police, to have a few words with him. Captain Sabaya speaking. Uh, Sam is Rocky. Good afternoon, Jordan. If you have a moment, I'd like to ask you something. Mm-hmm. Proceed. What do you know about the Pyramid Insurance Company? Uh, why do you ask? Oh, curiosity, Sam. I, uh... Want to know if they're reliable? Absolutely. I have even taken out a policy with them myself. Ah, uh, all right. Thanks, Sam. Oh, uh, Sam. Yes? Does the name Adelaide Foss mean anything to you? Adelaide Foss? Ah. Uh. Uh, no, no, it does not. All right. Thanks, Sam. See you later. Pyramid Insurance Company was legit, all right. J. Lampho and H. Manchek worked for it. If they said I had $40,000 coming, I had. And if they said I had a wife, I guess I had that too. Even though the name Adelaide Foss meant nothing to me. Adelaide Foss. Things began to stir in my mind. I moved out of my office over to the bar to have a talk with my bartender, Chris. Oh, Chris. Yeah, Rocky. a minute, will you? Sure. What is it, Rock? Say, what do you know about the name Adelaide Foss? Adelaide? Adelaide Foss. Well, you know her, Rock. She used to work here. Work here? Yeah, about a year ago. Just for a couple of days. Waited on tables, and then she quit. Oh, yeah. I remember now. Sort of a small, skinny girl with a lot on her mind. Yeah, how do you remember so well? I dated her a couple of times. Sometimes you don't forget the girls you date. You know what happened to her? She died. Not long after she left here. How? Accident. She was hit by a car. Why do you bring it up, Rock? Oh, I just had a visit from a couple of insurance representatives. Seems she had an insurance policy. Insurance policy? Yeah, with me as beneficiary. You see, she's got it marked that I'm her husband. Why would she do a thing like that, Chris? I don't know, Rock. Seems a little funny, doesn't it? The day my barely no dies, a year goes by, her life insurance policy turns up, and I'm $40,000 richer. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, all right. I'd sort of like to know why. Then you have some answers. I could look for some answers. Why don't you leave it alone, Rock? Let it rest. What do you suggest I do? Just sign these papers and collect the 40000 Well, it's all legit, isn't it? Yeah, seems to be. Look, let it lay, Rock. I think it'd be better that way all the way around. Sign the papers, collect the money. It's coming to you. Then forget the whole thing. Yeah, maybe you're right, Chris. Maybe I'll just do that. That all, Rocky? Yeah. Well, I'll get back to these glasses then. Oh, uh, Rocky, I've got a doctor appointment this afternoon. Only time he could take me. You mind if... No, no not at all. Oh, well, Thanks. I'll leave in a few minutes, but I'll be back before the evening rush. Well, it didn't take a mind reader to figure that Chris knew more than he was saying. So when he left a few minutes later, I tailed him. First, he went to the Pyramid Insurance Company. Then he caught a cab and rode down to the Elmox Bazaar in Old Cairo. He wound his way through it and went in a tent under a crooked sign that said, Astrology, Prince Rico, the Divine. I waited up the street in front of a coffee and tobacco shop. The lady who ran it must have taken a correspondence course in high-pressure selling. The Effendi wishes to purchase from my fine shop fine articles of coffee and tobacco. No, the best selection in all Egypt. Observe the fine coffees from Java and Brazil. Very nice. Observe the unexcelled selection of the aromatic tobacco. She kept up her jabber coffee. and every once in a while tugged at my sleeve. I but I kept my eye on the tent of Prince Rico, the divine. Later, Chris came out again and started to leave the bazaar. But he never made it. Next thing I knew, Chris was rolling on the ground. There was a lot of reaction from the people in the crowd at Bazaar. Ah, let me through. Come on, come on, let me through. Do not push. Do not push, Effendi. I wish to see the happenings even as you. I saw it all. Yeah? I saw all that happened. This man had just I stepped saw. out of Prince Rico's tent. He started up the Sharia when all of a sudden... All right, let me get a look at him. He is a friend of yours, Effendi? Oh, too sad. The bullet seems to have entered the head. Uh, he's still alive. Call an ambulance, will you? He most certainly, Effendi. Then call Captain Sabaya, the Cairo police. Tell him what happened. I will, Effendi. I will do that most promptly. Rico! Which one of you is Prince Rico? Oh, sir, none of us is Prince Rico. No, indeed, these eyes of mine saw Prince Rico in his purple robes leave the bazaar. Fast? Very fast, Effendi, with the speed of the falcon on the wing. Upon the word, Effendi, Prince Rico the Divine is truly gone. <laughs> Now, 
Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. The secret is out. Yes, friends, the secret is out. The secret of Del Monte catsup's marvelous flavor. Let me tell it, Larry. Del Monte catsup is made with pineapple vinegar. Pineapple vinegar. In fact, Del Monte has been using pineapple vinegar for some time now. That's the reason you like Del Monte catsup so much. Everybody does. Catsup experts say the finer the vinegar, the better the catsup flavor. And Del Monte catsup made with pineapple vinegar certainly proves their point. It isn't that you taste the vinegar. It's the way pineapple vinegar brings out the very best in the other ingredients. Coke's is all the full, rich flavor from those plump, handsome, vine-ripened tomatoes Del Monte uses. Yes, pineapple vinegar gives Del Monte catsup flavor an extra lift. Lots more pep. And remember, it's made by Del Monte. No other catsup has it. So if you haven't already tried Del Monte catsup, you'll want to get some right away. Look for it at your grocer's. You'll be surprised at its price. For all its goodness, it's lower than many other quality brands. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Memento from Adelaide. In a little while, the ambulance showed and Chris was carted off to a Cairo hospital. He was in pretty bad shape. A few minutes later, Captain Sabai and his men showed. The crowd was still milling about in the bazaar and it seemed that... They all wanted to get into the act. I saw it, Captain. All I that saw, happened. I saw no. even more than he. Uh, yes. Question me. I requested Captain Sabaya question me about yes, the happening. Yes, he yes, will die, was... Captain. I wish to be questioned first I so that my I picture will be in the newspaper. Silence! I... Silence, all of you! Quiet! Now, all of you who claim to have pertinent facts shall be questioned in due time. Captain of the police, sir. Hmm? Uh, it would be most kind of you if you would allow the newspapers to say that the man was shot in front of my coffee and tobacco shop. Even though this uh, was not so, the publicity would be the most... Yes, later, <laughs> later, later. Uh, yes. Come, Jordan, let us walk away from the crowd. You are the one I wish to question. Right, Sam. Someday, Jordan, I shall learn your secret. What secret's that? How you manage always to be in close proximity of serious trouble. <laughs> this is far enough. All right, Jordan, proceed with what you know of this. There's not much to tell, Sam. There's always much to tell in a case of violence. What were you and Chris doing here at the bazaar? No, we weren't together. Chris came to talk to Prince Rico. Remember when I called you checking on the Pyramid Insurance Company? Yes. I also asked you if you knew anything about a girl named Adelaide Foss. Yes, I remember. Well, she died a year ago in an auto accident. Today, the Pyramid Insurance Company turned up with a life insurance policy for $40,000, with me as beneficiary. Hmm. Continue. The well, strange thing about it, Sam, is that she had me marked down as her husband, and I barely knew her. When I mentioned it to Chris, he got worried and came over to have a conversation with Prince Rico. Continue. That's all there is. That's all there is indeed. Jordan, a man is shot on the streets of Cairo. A woman leaves a life insurance policy to a man she barely knows. The man who is shot is connected with both, with the dead woman and the man to whom she has left the money, and you say that's all there is. All right, check with Pyramid. Talk to Lampho and Manchek. They're the ones who came to me with that screwy policy. I shall talk to Mr. Lampho and Mr. Manchek and Prince Rico. If you can find him. Then I shall talk to Chris when he is well enough to speak. If he is well enough to speak. Well, at any rate, Jordan, I suggest you keep yourself available for further questioning. There is an atmosphere about this entire case that is completely bewildering. Well, it was evening when I left Sam, and I headed straight for the hospital to talk to Chris, but the doctor said no. I left my number, and he said he'd call me at the tambourine when Chris was in shape to have visitors. I left the hospital and started to call another cab, and I caught a flash of purple robe coming toward the hospital. It figured to be Prince Rico, and I wanted some words with him. But that's when he saw me and started to run. I moved out after him. He started down a dark side street, but his robes didn't make it easy for running. Twenty-five or so paces later, I caught up with him and grabbed him by the back of the neck. He me with a skinny leg, but I held and yanked him toward me. A couple of seconds later, the prince and myself and a half a dozen yards of purple cloth were all entangled in the gutter. Unhand me. You're encouraging the anger of the prince. Uh, sure. But let me go. Uh, maybe, after we have some talk. I have nothing to say to one such as you. Uh, we'll see. Come on, now, on your feet. Oh. You have torn my robe. You have torn my illustrious garment. On your feet now. The star shall be angry. 
They shall avenge the ignoble treason. This afternoon, my bartender went to see you. I do not even know what you're talking about. Uh, maybe you need a little memory refresher, huh? Do not strike me. Why was Chris shot? What did he come to see you about? What do you know about Adelaide Force? And don't say you don't know anything. But who said I did not know anything? I know all. Prince Rico the Divine knows everything. I read it in the stars. You know, Effendi, that the world is not round, as some say, but is truly flat. That the sky is an inverted bowl, and the stars are the language of the infinite, telling man of his future. Uh, tell me about the past, about Chris and Adelaide. Prince Rico the Divine could give her the answer. But, alas, my mouth is sealed. The stars forbid me to speak. You know, some people are liable to think you shot Chris. I can keep no one from thinking as he wishes. I bet a five-pound note would open your mouth. It would indeed. My mouth would open as large as you like, but no words would come out. Chris knew Adelaide Foss. Knew her well, I'd say. I think maybe they went together for a while. I bet you know about that. It is as I have said. I know everything. It cost a lot of money to take out a $40,000 insurance policy. Adelaide was a poor girl. Where'd she get the money? Mm. Why'd she put me down as beneficiary? Mm. All right, Rico, come on. It, it, uh, where are you taking me? Consult the stars, buddy. They'll tell you. I grabbed Prince Rico the Divine by his phony royal neck and shoved him into a cab. Ten minutes later, I dumped him into the lap of Sergeant Greco and asked him to have Sam call me after he had a chance to question Rico. Then I went back to the tambourine and put on a call to the hospital. Chris was still unconscious. I sat out at a table and looked through the insurance papers that Lamphorn and Manchak had left for me to sign. A moment later, the door opened and H. Manchak walked in. Ah, good evening, Mr. Jordan. Good evening. Ah, sit down, Mr. Manchak. Thank you, thank you indeed. J. Lamphorn sends his respects. He had to go back to Alexandria. Huh? Ah, I see you have the insurance papers in front of you. Good. I have the check from Pyramid. If you will just give me those papers, I shall give you the check. I haven't uh, signed them yet. Are they not in order? Well, they seem to be all right. Well, what are you waiting for? Oh, I don't know. But you understand, Mr. Jordan, I cannot give you the check until you sign. Uh-huh. My pen, Mr. Jordan. You still do not sign? Perhaps, Mr. Jordan, it would be wise if you and I retired to your private office where we may talk this out more fully. Sure, I'll go for that. Come on. There we are. All right. Start talking. Mr. Jordan, it must be apparent to you by this time that there is more to this business than you are aware of, all of which makes it imperative that you sign these papers. I'm afraid you'll have to clear that up. Chris, your bartender, is a friend of yours? Yeah. You are aware that he and Adelaide Foss knew each other quite well? I heard some talk. But I would say that you are not aware of the fact that Adelaide Foss's death was not accidental. What are you getting at? I am simply stating a positive fact. Adelaide Foss's death was not accidental. Now... If suddenly the police get a suspicion of that fact and proceed on an investigation, they might learn that Chris was in love with the girl, but she was not in love with him. They might then wonder if he was not responsible for her death. Uh, get to the point, man, Jack. What are you after? This, Mr. Jordan, if you sign these papers. These are perfectly legal papers. Let me impress upon you. I then can turn over you to you this check worth $40,000. Go on. Should you then return $20,000 to me personally, I promise to keep certain information pertaining to Adelaide Foss's death from the police. They consider it a closed issue. It will remain so. Well, that makes a pretty sweet deal all the way around. Indeed. You make $20,000, I make $20,000. And Chris's secret remains hidden forever. Well, me taking that check, you make it sound like the thing to do. It is. My pen. Thanks. First, the insurance papers releasing Pyramid from claim. Uh -huh. Excellent. Here is the check. Thank you. Now, your check to me for $20,000. Well, I don't have that much money in my checking account. Uh, you will. Please endorse your check from Pyramid. Mail it to your bank for deposit tonight. In the morning, I shall be at the bank to cash your check to me. You got it all figured out, haven't you? Needs many years of experience in the insurance business. Now, you will endorse the forty thousand dollar check, and then write me one for twenty. I did as he said. Wrote him a check, scribbled an endorsement on the one from Pyramid, and sealed it in an envelope. Then Manchek walked me to the mailbox to be sure I dropped it in. 
After that, he left. But I knew that wasn't the last I was to see of H. Manchek. Before he came back, I had to move fast. The first thing I did was put in a call to Chris to see if he could talk. The doc still said no. Well, if Chris couldn't talk, his belongings could. So I caught a cab, went over to his apartment, started to look around. First the bureau drawers, then the closets, finally a small desk standing in the corner. When the bottom drawer failed to come open at a pull, I knew I had something, so I kicked it in. Inside, I found a framed picture of a very skinny, very unhappy girl, Adelaide Foss. The clip to the back of the picture was a faded piece of yellow paper. It was a short note, but it told a lot of things. And right then and there, I knew I had all the answers to the whole rotten mess. The next morning, I was but ready for H. Manchek. He put in an appearance around 10.45, and he didn't seem too happy. Mr. Jordan. Ah, oh, good morning, Mr. Manchek. This is a surprise. Mr. Jordan, I arrived at the bank this morning and attempted to cash the check for $20,000, which you made out in my favor. I was told there were insufficient funds in your account. Is that so? Would you please tell me how that was possible when I myself saw you deposit $40,000 by mail? I'm going to tell you a lot of things. I don't think you're going to like any of them. Mr. Jordan... Are you suggesting that I call the police and tell them of Chris and Adelaide? There's the phone. Call. <laughs> they thought not. Chris didn't kill Adelaide, Manchek. Her death was not an accident, I assure you. No, but Chris didn't kill her, and I can prove it. But I can prove something else that's going to hit you a little closer. You had a pretty good scheme, Manchek. And it went something like this. A lonely girl, shall we say, dies. You sit right down, write a $40,000 insurance policy for her, and predate it before her death. You send the policy and the premium payment to your home office. Everything's fine. You wait. A year goes by. Another premium payment is due. The company sends a bill to the girl. No answer. The letter comes back. But it's a big policy, so they investigate and find out the girl's dead. Now there's a claim against the company. Pyramid is a legit outfit, so they investigate some more. They find out I'm the beneficiary. Lamfo comes down from Alexandria to pay off the claim. How am I doing? Well, see. After the claim is paid, you move in and try to shake me down for half the money. Uh, uh, Mr. Jordan, may I ask how you intend to prove this? By a piece of faded yellow paper I found in Chris's drawer. It explains why he didn't want me digging into Adelaide's accidental death. It explains how she died. And the handwriting will prove that it wasn't Adelaide Foss who took out the insurance policy at all. Because it's not her signature on the policy. And what, Mr. Jordan, is this miraculous piece of paper? A suicide note from Adelaide. I see. May I see this note? Oh, no. no I do not believe that such a note exists. Now you'll be convinced. Sit down. Now you will not make that... I said sit down! down. That's better. <laughs> Captain Zabaya speaking. Uh, Rocky, Sam. Come on over to the tambourine, will you? There's someone here who wants to tell you how he tried to fleece the Pyramid Insurance Company. How he threw a bullet into Chris, and how he ended up sitting in my waste paper basket. Is that all he did, Jordan? Yeah, there are a few more things. Come on over, I'll tell you all about it. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. Friends, it isn't every day we can sit down to a tender, juicy steak. With most of us, that's just a once-in-a-while special treat. You homemakers know it's the everyday meals that count, the low-cost foods that come within the average family budget. Preparing such foods in new and interesting ways, giving them a hearty He-Man flavor is easy with Del Monte tomato sauce. It's been tested for flavor by a generation of good cooks. Why, it's almost as much of a staple with them as pepper and salt. For instance, Mrs. Blanche Clove of Los Angeles said, I use lots of plain meats in one-dish meals, lots of big vegetable casseroles, and I just wouldn't know how to make them without Del Monte tomato sauce. The flavor is just right for our taste. It makes any dish zesty and peppy and better looking, too. Yes, Del Monte tomato sauce has been my standby ever since we came to California 24 years ago. Thank you, Mrs. Clove. Yes, it is easy to make budget dishes popular with Del Monte tomato sauce. Just pour it on and cook it in. Then notice how that rich, spiced tomato flavor perks up those inexpensive foods. Watch your family enjoy every bite. Next time you go shopping, ask for Del Monte, the original tomato sauce. 
Back now to Rocky Jordan. Well, Sam came over and bundled up Manchek. He was all used up, and it figured Sam wouldn't have much trouble making him talk. Sam took him down to the lockup, and I said I'd be along soon. First, I stopped off at the hospital to check on Chris. The doctor wouldn't let me stay long, but he said Chris would be all right. So I scooted right back over to Sam's office to brush up some of the details. Sam was rocking back and forth in his squeaky chair, a dossier on H. Manchek in one hand and a pen in the other. Oh, George, and I'm glad you came so promptly. There are still a few questions I would like to ask to make this dossier complete. Uh, shoot, Sam. Oh, first, uh, how is Chris? Seems to be okay. Doc says he'll work it out. Good. A fine young man. Now, Jordan, if you please, would you trace Chris's movement up until the time he was shot? Sure, Sam. When I told him about the insurance policy Adelaide was supposed to have taken out, he knew something was wrong. He went to the insurance company to check. And that is when Manchek became aware that Chris might be one who could spoil his scheme. Yeah, right. Manchek followed Chris to the Elmox Bazaar when Chris went to talk things over with Prince Rico, who had also known Adelaide and how she died. When Chris left the tent, Manchek cut him down. Yeah, I see. Now, about the policy itself, the signature upon it will prove, of course, that it was not Adelaide Foss who signed it, but Manchek himself. Now, why did he choose to call you Adelaide's husband? Well, as near as I can figure it out, if the insurance company had to pay a claim to a husband, there wouldn't be much investigation. Why, I was picked to be the husband. Well, he needed someone who had some association with Adelaide. Yes. And someone he thought might be willing to shut his eyes and go along with his scheme for the $20,000. Now, one thing more, Jordan. Why was Manchek not able to cash the check you wrote him? Insufficient funds, remember? But the $40,000 check deposited more than covered the $20,000 check Manchek wished to cash. Uh-uh, Sam. The bank wouldn't accept the $40,000 check for deposit. Oh, and why? Because I didn't endorse it right. The name I wrote on the back wasn't mine. It was Adelaide Foss. <laughs> Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Donald Maynard, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Maynard. Haven't talked to you in a long time. Want to go to work? Sure. What is it? We insure a Miss Isabel James, Tulsa, Oklahoma. She's been killed. How? Murdered. Like you to leave as soon as you can, Johnny. Won't take me long. See you at your office in an hour, and you can fill me in on the details. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste... Plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will, too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Isabel James matter. Expense account item one, $103.65, plane fare and incidentals between Hartford and Tulsa, Oklahoma, after receiving from you the necessary information concerning the case. I arrived in Tulsa the next morning, registered at the hotel and went directly to the police station where I introduced myself to Captain Clifford Kissig. Yeah, got a teletype from your company. Said you'd be in this morning. Good trip? Fine. You're investigating the Isabel James murder. That's right. I was hoping you could give me some help. I'd sure like to, but it's got us stumped. 
We've had three others like this already. Three others? Yeah. All the same. Isabel James was the fourth. Looks like Tulsa's got a Jack the Ripper. All with their throats cut? Yeah. Four killings in the last three weeks. You're after a madman. Yeah. Pretty smart madman. Haven't got a lead. Not a one? Always picks a lonely spot, never a witness, never anyone who saw anything or heard anything. What's he use, a knife? The lab thinks it's a razor. Straight razor. Got the town a little jumpy. I can understand. But we'll get something. Sooner or later, the killer will make a slip or somebody will tell us something. What happens in the meantime? We just got to pray there ain't no more killing. Hmm. How far is Dawson from Tulsa? Not very far. Going over to see the dead girl's uncle. Yeah, he's the beneficiary. Mm-hmm. I found the policy in her belongings. I was the one notified your company. You know the uncle? Had him come down and identify the body. Uh, how much does he get? Ten thousand. Well, he can use it. Just an old farmer. Well, I'm going to run over and see him. All right. Uh, how long are you going to be in town? Well, I'm being paid to investigate a murder. I guess I'll be around until somebody catches a killer. Captain Kissig advised me where I could rent a car, and a half hour later I was driving a small coupe out of the Tulsa city limits heading for Dawson. The dead girl's uncle, Morley Parrish, lived a few miles east of Dawson in an old rundown farmhouse that was in the middle of six or eight acres of parched earth. He was a man in his late fifties, weather-worn and thin. He met me at the door with a look of suspicion. What do you want? Mr. Parrish? Yes? My name is Dollar. I represent the insurance company that covered your niece's life. I'd like to talk to you about it. About what? About your niece. Her death. She's dead. What's there to talk about? You're the beneficiary. You got $10,000 from the insurance company. Come in. <clears throat> Sit down. Uh, I get, um... How much you say? $10,000. You want a drink? Well, I don't... I got a jug of whiskey. I've been saving it. <clears throat> yeah. You say your name's, uh... Dollar. What company you work for? National Life and Casualty. I get $10,000. That's right. Yeah, have a swig. <coughs> oh, my, you swallowed wrong, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, give me that. Ah. Ah. <coughs> well, no wonder. I didn't shake it up. Shake it up? Oh, I sure. <laughs> Gotta shake it to make it smooth. <laughs> you sure that didn't come with a fuse in it? Emmett Willis made it himself. Brung it by last month. Here, you try it now. Well, I really don't think oh, I... Oh, go ahead. You got a bad sample. Okay. You see how much smoother it is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you just got to shake it up. No, I'll have one. Ah, yes. Oh, my. Yeah, well, that, that's right. Tasty. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about your knees. All huh? right. Let's talk. You know why anybody would want to kill her? <laughs> no, it's that fellow that's been killing all them other girls, ain't it? Yeah, I guess so. That's what the police say. Well, it seems to me he don't care who he kills. Just as long as it's a girl. <laughs> Another swig? No, no thanks. Your niece left you when she was 16, didn't she? Yeah, I think my niece said you ain't Yeah, yeah, 17, 17, I think. She ran off to Tulsa. You see her much after yeah. that? Well, not much. Maybe once, twice a year. When was the last time you saw her? Uh, the other day in the morgue. No, I mean before that. Oh, my. Well, that was about a month. She didn't write or... Oh, look, Mr. Police, they ask all them questions. I know it. You could ask them all over again, huh? If you want to get your $10,000. <laughs> well, okay. No, she didn't write. She never wrote. At least in the last five or six years, she never wrote. <laughs> when she first got to Tulsa, she used to write now and then. Last time I seen her, she didn't say nothing about what she was doing or who she was seeing or anything. So I can't very well help you find out who killed her. <laughs> Come on, have a swig. No, thanks. I'm in a rented car. Yeah, shoot yourself. And once I open a jug, it gets finished. <laughs> then you better finish it. Naturally, I will. Oh, 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 man, oh, man. 
Delicious, huh? Oh, you bet. I left before he finished the demijohn. It was getting dark, and he stood on the porch, leaning against a post and waving goodbye between the last few swallows. Back in Tulsa, I went to the hotel, where I took a hot shower, then stretched out on the bed to relax for a few minutes before going out to dinner. I smoked a few cigarettes and had just about decided to have some food sent up to the room when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. This is Clint. Huh? Captain Kissick. Oh, hi. Got back from Dawson about 40 minutes ago. What'd you think of the old boy? Quite a character. Thought if you weren't doing anything, you might like to drop down to the station. You got something? Yeah, just picked up a suspect. Might be our man. What makes you think so? He was following a girl. She spotted him and got worried. When he got too close, she began screaming and he ran. She gave us a pretty good description and about 15 minutes ago, a couple of the boys picked him up. The girl identify him? Yeah. Said he was the one who followed her, all right. Well, it seems to me you're going to need more than that. Well, we might have it. When the boys searched him, they found a straight razor in his pocket. Coming down? Right away. His name's Story. S-T-O-R-E-Y. Alvin Story. He hasn't said anything interesting. But you think he's it? Yeah, I think so. Nothing definite except the razor and his actions, but... I just got a hunch. What's he say about the razor? Not much. Admits it's his. Says he was just carrying it in here. You were just taking a walk. Yes, sir. That's right. I was just taking a walk. And you weren't following the girl. I told you I wasn't. I told you I was just taking a walk. If the girl thought I was following her, well, I can't help that. I wasn't. I was just taking a walk, like I said in the first place. Hello, Captain. Hello, Alvin. Back with someone to relieve Sergeant Haddock? I'm not tired, Alvin. Well, you're going to be if you keep on like this, because I've told you the truth, and I'll just keep right on telling it all night if you keep asking me. Have a cigarette, Alvin? I told you I don't smoke. Honest, Captain, this is just a waste of time. I've told you the truth, and you're just a waste of your time with all these questions. We've got a lot of time. Now, let's go through it again, Alvin. Where did you get the razor? Why, I bought it. Where? At a hardware store. You can check it. I bought it at a hardware store about three weeks ago. I used it to shave with. Not to kill anyone. Honestly, I didn't kill anyone. I'm not the one you want. I'm not that person that killed all those women. We never said you were, Alvin. But you think so. Just because that girl thought I was following her. Oh, well, weren't you? Well, no. I told you I was not following that girl. You were on your way home. Yes. You told me before. That I was on a way to a show. Yes. I wasn't on my way home. Keep asking me all these questions. I get confused. I made a mistake. What show were you going to see? Well... I... What show? Oh, no one in particular. I was just going downtown to see what was playing. You were headed downtown? Yes, to see what was playing at the shows. The girl says you were following her. Well, I don't care what the girl says. She's lying. I wasn't following her. But you were walking behind her. Yes, I... I might... Yes, I was probably walking behind her. Well, she was going in the other direction from town. Well, then I wasn't behind her. I tell you, I was going... Police sergeant named Haddock kept working on the suspect, quietly, persistently. Alvin Story, a tall, frail-looking man, dressed in blue jeans and a leather jacket, sat behind the table trying desperately to be calm and anticipate the sergeant's next question. After half an hour, the captain and I left and went upstairs to his office where he fixed coffee. Cream and sugar? Black will be fine. Well, what do you think? I don't know. He's a strange one. Yeah. If I had to pick types, I don't know. It's hard to tell about anybody in a police station. Maybe he was following the girl. She starts screaming her lungs out and he panics. The law picks him up, finds a razor on him. Maybe he's not the killer at all. He knows he looks guilty, so... He gets good and scared. Hmm. Guys act awful funny and make a lot of mistakes when they're scared. He just carries a razor around with him. Well, isn't it possible? Oh, yeah. But I still think he's our killer. Well, I have to admit I'm inclined to agree with you. But there's always a chance he's not. You never know. 
Kissing. Yeah. Okay. Well, we know now. Story? Yeah. He just confessed. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley's Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley's Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's Spearmint. Chewing gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Alvin Story still sat at the table in the dim, bare little room. He looked tired, but he looked relieved. A stenographer was set up at one end of the table, while Sergeant Haddock leaned against the wall and smoked a cigarette. Captain Kissig crossed to the table and sat on the edge of it, facing the suspect. Can we get this thing over with, Captain? Can we finish it up and let me go lie down? Well, the stenographer's ready. Tell us about it. Well... What's there to tell? I killed them. I killed all of them. Isn't that enough to say? That's what they'll hang me for. Anything else I say won't make any difference. Why'd you kill them, Alvin? I don't know. You know something? I really don't know. I I just wanted to. First one, I, I saw her and I just wanted to. I, I guess I thought about it before I saw her. Yes, I, I I used to lie in bed and think about it. I used to dream about it, too. I used to wake up and feel like I'd really done it. Sick all over and scared. I felt so terrible. All I, I feel now, kind of. Yeah. It's like a dream now. Right now, it's like a dream. But it isn't. Tell us about the first one. Do I have to? It'll help. Well, it's kind of hard to remember exactly. I bought the razor and I waited for it. On Garvey Boulevard? I guess so. Try to remember. Yeah, it, it was Garvey. It was late at night. What night? The night of the 11th? Maybe. I, I think so. I, I think it was Tuesday night. That's right. And I killed her. You knew her? No, not really. It's hard to explain. Well, did you know any of the other three girls? Two. No, with the last one, it makes four altogether. No, three. Now, think about it a minute, Alvin. There there were... Only three. I ought to know. Three girls. No, now, now, try to remember, Alvin. I don't have to try and remember anything. There were three. Just three. One, two, three. I know... Why would I want to lie? I'm not saying you're lying, Alvin. I, I, I even just... know the names. I cut the pictures out of the paper. Tell me the names then, Alvin. Well, certainly. Mary Knapp, Virginia Vitello, and Thelma Greer. I know all of them. I, I kept a record. What about Isabel James? Who? Isabel James. Oh, yes. She was in the papers the other day. That's right. Somebody killed her like the others. I read about it. I thought it'd be blamed on me, but it didn't make any difference. One or ten, what difference would it make? For a half hour, they questioned Alvin's story. Time and time again, he admitted the three killings. And time and time again, he denied any connection with the fourth, the murder of Isabel James. Expense account item two, $4.95, breakfast for Captain Kissig and myself. 
After which I returned to the hotel and crawled into bed. A lie detector test would be given to Alvin sometime late in the afternoon, so that gave me at least six or seven hours to catch up on my sleep. I left a call at the desk, turned over, and closed my eyes. Johnny Dollar. Three o'clock, Mr. Dollar. Oh, uh-huh, thanks. And a Mr. Parrish has been waiting in the lobby to see you. Parrish? Yes, sir. Mr. Morley Parrish. He's been waiting over an hour. Okay. Send him up. Yes, sir. Come in, Mr. Parrish. Have a seat. Thank you. I've been waiting downstairs for over an hour. Oh, I'm sorry. But I was up all night. I told the desk not to disturb me until three. Oh, gee, that's all right. I know you city fellas don't like to get to bed much before the sun comes up. <laughs> I didn't mind waiting. I was with the police. Oh? I've been working with them on the death of your niece. Oh, is that right? Well, uh, that's the reason I come to Tulsa to see you. I was wondering when I was going to get the... Uh, get the money. Well... See, I got a chance to get me a right smart section of land. Trading the place I got now, plus 8000 It's a real good buy. Oh? Well, Mr. Parrish, it might be some time before you get the money. Oh, well, how come? Oh, there's a routine that has to be followed. I have to finish my investigation. You're still then... investigating? Oh, sure. You see, your niece's death is still unsolved. Well, is that fella that's killing all them other girls? It so... certainly looks that way. You... You mean you gotta catch him before you can pay me? No, but I've gotta make sure that he's the one who killed your niece. You think maybe he isn't? Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Perry. Well, she got killed just like all them other girls. Not like... exactly. Huh? I said not exactly. You see, the razor that killed your niece and the razor that killed the other girls aren't the same. Well, how do you know that? The police laboratory report. They can tell if it was a different razor? Oh, no. Come on, Mr. Donner. Maybe I ain't the brightest. It's a fact, Mr. Parrish. How do you think they knew it was a razor in the first place? Not just a very sharp knife. Oh, they can tell, all right. Well, maybe the killer ain't using the same razor. Yeah, we've considered that, but we can't tell. He hasn't killed again. Maybe he never will. You mean I might never get my money? Well, now, Mr. Parrish, it's not quite that bad. I want to see you get your money. You've certainly got it coming. But I can't honestly recommend payment to my company until the case is solved. What do you mean, until you catch the killer? That, or until we're certain the same man that killed the others killed your niece. Well, it seems to me you got to catch him to prove that. Yeah, unless he kills again, with the same razor he used on your niece. Then we can be pretty sure that he's changed razors. Well, maybe he's got uh, two different ones. He... Mm, maybe. Uh, well... You have to go? Yeah, I gotta be getting back. As long as I ain't gonna get the money right away, there's no sense in hanging around. Don't be discouraged, Mr. Parrish. Just as soon as I'm convinced the killers change razors, you'll get your money. Yeah, Dollar, we just gave Troy the polygraph test. According to our experts, Story killed all the girls except Isabel James. Look, Captain, Morley Parrish was just in my room. I gave him a cock and bull story about his niece being killed with a different razor. A different razor? I think maybe he did it for the insurance. Read all the stories in the paper about the killings and decided to kill his niece. Uh, and then everybody just chalk it all up to Alvin's story. Right. Only I didn't tell him that Alvin's story had been arrested. Explain about that different razor. Parrish left here thinking he wasn't going to get the 10000 until I was certain the same man killed his niece that killed the others. He thinks your police lab proved that Isabel James was killed with another razor. And he quickly came up with a solution that the killer had changed razors or had two of them. So what? I think he'll go out and prove it. What? You mean you think... I think he's simple-minded enough to try and kill someone just to make it look like the killer has changed razors. Well, I sure hope you're wrong. Well, so do I, but it's the only way we could prove anything. Where is he? He just left. But holy cow, if you're right and he's wandering around... Lo- Relax. He'll go back to his farm in Dawson first. What makes you think so? He has to get the razor, doesn't he? Ten minutes later, Captain Kissig picked me up in his car and we drove well over the speed limit getting to Dawson. 
Just west of old Morley's farm, we pulled off the road and turned off our lights. Well, the house is dark. Where is he? Still on his way from Tulsa. We got here pretty fast, Captain. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Come on. Let's walk down to the house. He have a car? I don't know, but I doubt it. I didn't see one the last time I was here. Dollar? Hmm? What if you're wrong? What if you guessed wrong? What if he did have the razor on him? Well, that's a pretty good question. The night was warm with a big red moon. We walked down to the old farmhouse while a coyote howled way off in the distance. We found a spot by the side of the house where we could see the road and still be hidden in the shadows. We waited for Morley Parish to come and get his razor. About an hour later, the old man came walking down the road and went into the house. After a few moments, a light flared in the back room. We could hear him moving around, then the light went out. Hold it. Who's there? Who are you? It's me, Mr. Parrish. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. This is Captain Kissig with me. Uh, what do you want? Just came down to see you. Well, I got business. I got to be going. In a minute. Well, there's a drink in the house, another jug behind the stove. Go on in and make yourself comfortable. <laughs> I'll be right back. Hey, just a minute, Mr. Well, Perry. Look, I got to hurry. Where are you going? I got business uh, in Dawson. You going to walk? Oh, sure. I always walk. <laughs> I hitchhike if I get a lift. We've got a car. We'll give you a lift. No, I don't want to put you in no trouble. No trouble. Mr. Parrish, what did you pick up in the house? Huh? What? Oh, nothing. I... What have you got in your pocket? One nothing. But uh, no, what do you want? You ain't got no right to do. Do you own a straight razor, Mr. Parrish? You better give it to us, Mr. Parrish. And be careful how you do it. I've got a gun pointed at you. Well, you knew it all the time, huh? I had a hunch. Uh, now here you are. Hmm. Is this the one you killed your niece with? Yeah. You were going to kill somebody else. Oh, there ain't no difference after the first one. and I sure could have used that money. Gee. Man, oh, man, that was a wonderful little farm, but I... Oh, I just guess you can't beat them scientific police methods. <laughs> I sure thought I had it all figured out, too. Yeah, which... Oh, we going to go now? Yeah. What's going to happen to my farm? They'll sure hang me, and I ain't got no relatives the to take care of. The state will take care of it. Come on. Mm. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Why don't you just sneak back later on, get that jug? There's no sense in wasting it on some stranger who wouldn't appreciate it. We took old Morley Parrish back to the station where he gave us a complete confession. He'd killed his niece for the insurance the way I'd figured. When we told him that Alvin's story had confessed that afternoon, old Morley just shook his head and said something about policemen being a whole lot smarter than most folks give him credit for. Expense account item three, $11.80, dinner for me and Captain Kissick. After which I returned to my hotel, turned in and got a good night's sleep. Expense account... Items four and five, eighty-nine dollars and forty-five cents car rental and hotel bill. Item six, hundred and twenty-five dollars and nineteen cents plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, three hundred and thirty-five dollars and four cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, 
For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Joe Duvall, Parley Bear, Howard McNear, and Clayton Post. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Jeff Connors, Johnny. Oh, hi, Jeff. I haven't heard from what you. What are the and... chances of you making it down here to Dallas real fast like, huh? Well, I never knew you to be in a hurry, Jeff. It's a firebug, Johnny. Four fires in four weeks. Total claims to date, 95,000. This keeps up. I ain't got no job left. You just gotta get out of here tonight. You're kind of rushing things, aren't you? Well, it ain't me, Johnny O. It's the firebug. Thought you'd like to be here when number five goes up. That means you've got to be in on the 10 o'clock flight. Don't tell me he works on schedule. Every Tuesday night at 11 o'clock, whoosh. What do you say, pal? I'll be there. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office... Eastern Indemnity and Fire Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the punctilious firebug matter. Expense account item one, $113.20. Airfare between Hartford and Dallas, Texas. Your southwestern state's manager, Jeff Connors, met the 10 o'clock flight at Love Airport and drove me down to your offices on South Acard Street. There they are, Johnny. Number one, candy store out northwest. Number two, two family residents on the east side. Three, small factory out on Commerce Avenue. And four, garage and repair shop out southwest. 
Grand total of claims is 95000 and it's all yours. These all follow the same time pattern. Huh? Every one. Comes Tuesday night around 11 o'clock, and that firebird just naturally lights up. All new policies, Jeff. Written within the past six weeks to two months. That's right. Ink hardly gets cold on the premium checks when it gets all hotted up again on the claims. Any connection between the policyholders? Uh, can't find one if there is. All in different businesses, different parts of the city. The whole thing just don't make sense. It does if the bug is in your own organization. Yeah, that's what Len Borchardt says. Who's Borchardt? Detective Lieutenant Arson Division. He's been working on it. Well, how's he making out? Well, I got ten men out in the field, two gals in the office here, lots of alibis to check out. Takes time. So far, there's no reason to suspect anybody. Those fires are reason enough. But, man, why'd anybody want to do anything like that? Well, when it comes to firebugs, who knows? Could have a grudge against you or the company. Or maybe you'd just like to see them flames shoot up, huh? That's as good a reason as any. Well, whatever it is, we sure got to get this boy, Johnny. If this kind of thing keeps up, I'll be losing my job, my home, my wife, and everything else I... Mm-hmm. What's the time, Johnny? It's uh, four minutes after 11. Wouldn't want to lay a little bet why this phone's ringing at this time of night, would you? Eastern Indemnity, Connors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that figured. Where will I get that address? That's, uh, wait a minute. That's 725 East Westchester. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, thanks, Lieutenant. Be seeing you. Number five? Yep. Big apartment building out in Westchester. You're sure it's one of yours? Wrote the policy on it myself four days ago. Well, let's get out there and have a look, huh? Sure, a goner. Yeah, there's another one you can write off. You can say... Oh, oh, there's Len Borchardt over there. Didn't know he'd be down here so quick. Let's hear what he's got to say. Yeah, sure. Hi, Lieutenant. You got down here right fast. Seems reasonable to Mr. Connors. Not that there's much I can do before she cools down. I won't be before morning. Hey. I'd like you to meet Johnny Dollar, Lieutenant, one of our investigators from the East. Johnny, this is Lieutenant Land Borchardt. Glad to know you, Lieutenant. Looks like our firebug didn't waste any time showing himself off to you, Mr. Dollar. No question about it being torched. Well, like I said, I won't be able to get in there until morning. But when you figure the pattern, the way that fire roared up and took hold, no doubt in my mind. Who reported it? A fellow by the name of Hendrickson. At the second floor apartment west. Called in from a hallway telephone. What kind of a story did he give you? He didn't. Got trapped up there on the second floor, suffering third degree burns and shock. He's not in any shape to talk to anyone. Don't know that I care to be around when he is fit to talk, though. Oh, why is that? His wife and two kids. They're still in that fire somewhere. <laughs> Jeff Connors went back to the office to wire his preliminary report to Hartford while I stayed around to see if anything would turn up. By 1.30 a.m., the only thing we learned was that our only possible witness, Hendrickson, had died en route to the hospital. A preliminary check of the wreckage seemed to indicate that the fire had started in the basement, but it was still too hot to check into it thoroughly, so Lieutenant Borchard drove me back downtown. I'll dig into it in the morning, Dollar. I can tell you right now what I'll find. Oh, what's that, Lieutenant? There'll be four or five hot spots indicating the use of kerosene, gasoline, something like that. Amount of paraffin drippings. Sounds like a candle's used for a slow fuse. That's what we figured. Found the same drippings in all the other fires. Any idea how slow a fuse it is? Looks like an hour and a half, two hours. Gives a bug plenty of time to get away, fix himself up an alibi somewhere. Mm-hmm. Connor says you think it's someone in his organization. Old pattern points that way. Haven't been able to run him down, though. Takes a lot of legwork. Uh-huh. Connors has been a big help. Cooperating right down the line. You known him long, Dollar? Oh, four or five years, off and on. He's a good man. Yeah. He doesn't seem to be letting his personal troubles interfere with his work any. What personal troubles are those? Oh, he's been pretty broke for the past six months or so. Wife's been sick. Run up a lot of doctor and hospital bills. Had to buy a new home recently. Oh, why's that? Last one burned down. Lost his eight-month-old son in that fire. Been pretty rough going for him. Yeah. Well, when we get this firebug pinned down, might help him some. 
Take some of the pressure off. Relieve his mind, maybe. Here you are, Dollar. Oh, thanks, Lieutenant. Uh, check with me in the morning, Dollar. Think over what I've been saying. Maybe something will come to mind. Yeah. Yeah, I'll think about it. I had Borcher drop me off at your office building. I figured I'd pick up my bag and talk things over with Jeff before checking into a hotel. I let myself in with a key Jeff had given me and headed for his inner office. Well, good morning. Oh, you. Johnny Dollar? Mean anything to you? Johnny Dollar? Oh, and you're that insurance investigator Mr. Connors said was coming out from the east. That's right. Well, I'm plenty happy to hear that. You gave me a pretty bad start, Mr. Dollar. I'm sorry. I'm Sally Martin, Mr. Connors' secretary. And uh, the rest of it? Well, you mean what I'm doing up here? Well, I'm as curious as the next guy. Well, I promised to have some material ready for Mr. Connors in the morning. I left the office tonight in such a hurry I forgot it and, well, I just dropped by to get it ready for him. Well, you're a pretty conscientious employee, Miss Martin. Getting out of bed at two in the morning to come down to the office for something like that. Oh, no. It wasn't that way at all. Well, what way was it? Well, I had a date this evening. Dinner, theater, and the Club Romulo just down the street. Stopped up here on my way home. Mm Mm-hmm. Is uh, this the material Mr. Connors wanted ready in the morning? Yes, it is. Comprehensive fire policy on the property at 725 East Westchester. That's right. That's pretty coincidental, isn't it? What? Or maybe you didn't know that there was a fire out there tonight. A fire at the... Oh, no. Any idea why Mr. Connors wanted this particular policy out? I think if you have any more questions to ask, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Connors should be here to answer them personally. That sounds reasonable. And maybe we should ring in Lieutenant Borchard, too. Lieutenant Bo... Hey, Sally, what's keeping you so long? Oh, hi. Didn't know anyone else was up here with you. This is Johnny Dollar, one of our investigators, Bill. Mr. Dollar, this is Bill Trendler. Well, glad to know you, Mr. Dollar. I was telling Mr. Dollar about the wonderful time we had tonight... Dinner, then the theater, and being at the Club Romulo until just a few minutes ago. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. We did have a swell time. But, uh, honey, it's getting late, uh, so if you're ready, let's run along. Okay, Bill. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Glad to meet you, Dollar. Hope to see you again sometime. Being a firm believer in the ability of my subconscious to resolve any knotty problems... I checked into the Baker Hotel for the night. The bed was very comfortable, but my subconscious didn't come up with a thing. Expense account item two, three dollars and seventy-five cents. Texas-style breakfast, including steak and pan-fried potatoes. That supplied me with enough energy to walk over to City Hall and look in on Lieutenant Borchard. It was a little hit-and-run accident at the corner of Westchester and Gates by 9 o'clock last night, Dollar. It's just half a block away from where the fire was. Seems a 53 Ford stand parked down the street there suddenly took off without lights. Spun around the corner and tore the fender off another car coming up the street. You think there's some tie-in between that and the fire? Well, one of the boys in traffic thought so after a witness gave him the license number of the Ford. He checked it through motor vehicle. Who's it registered to? Jeff Connors. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, there are bound to be times when the job seems monotonous. You feel tense and restless, and you need something to give you a boost. Well, you'll be surprised how helpful a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum can be at times like that. You see, chewing on a smooth piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum is a natural way to ease tension and relieve that feeling of restlessness. The easy chewing gives you satisfaction you get a nice little lift out of it. And Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good, too. Its flavor is lively, refreshing spearmint, a flavor millions enjoy. 
Try it and see for yourself. Get a few packages of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum and chew a stick from time to time while you work. Chewing this delicious gum will make your job seem easier and pleasanter. It really will. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The traffic division's report of the hit-and-run accident on Westchester the night before added nothing to what Lieutenant Borchard had already told me. Jeff Connor's Ford had been parked halfway down the block. At approximately 9.05 p.m., it roared away from the curb without lights, turned the corner onto gates, smashed into the side of another car some 10 feet from the intersection, and kept right on going. There's got to be some reason for Connor's being there just two hours before the fire, and for taking off in such an old fire to hurry that way without lights. Well, let's get Jeff's side of the story before we jump to conclusions, Lieutenant. I don't believe much in coincidence, Mr. Dollar. Time element checks out, too. The two hours between the accident and the fire? We know those candle fuses burn an hour and a half to two hours. Leaving here at nine gave him plenty of time to ditch the car and meet you at the airport with a pretty clean alibi. He wasn't driving to Ford when he picked you up, was he? No, it was a Plymouth Coupe. Yeah, well, that's his wife's car. Well, what have you done about getting him in? Well, he's not at home and he's not at his office. Nothing else I could do but send out a pickup on him. Uh-huh. Leave word for me at the Baker Hotel when you get him, will you? Sure thing, Mr. Dollar. I know how you're feeling about it. I'm sure sorry. Expense account item three, $2.25. Cab fare out to the modern subdivision where Jeff Connors had his new home. Mrs. Connors turned out to be a sweet, nice-looking young woman whose recent illness was still apparent. I'm sorry you had the long ride out here for nothing, Mr. Dollar. Jeff's not home. He left early to get his car fixed or something. Too bad you didn't call first. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. Connors. It's you I wanted to see. Oh, yes. Well, I... well, I guess I knew that. It's about Jeff, isn't it? And those fires. That's right. Then you've noticed it, too. Terrible things worry and sorrow can do to a man. Well, until six months ago, Jeff was the happiest man I'd ever known. And then, well, our world just fell apart. That's when your home burned, Mrs. Connors? When we lost our son. Hmm. Something happened to Jeff then. Oh, it happened to me, too. I broke down. Had to be hospitalized. But with Jeff, well, it was different. How do you mean? He bottled everything up inside of him, refused to let it come out, never even talked about it. A person can't do that, Mr. Dollar. You mentioned the recent fires, Mrs. Connors. Any particular reason why? Yes. That's what has me worried so. Ever since they started, he's become terribly depressed. I'm afraid he's going to break down under the strain. That's the only reason you mentioned him? Yes. I've tried to do everything in my power to help him. I thought perhaps if we moved away from Dallas, it might help. But he wouldn't do that. Then I tried to get him interested in sports. That brought the first encouraging sign I've had in six months. Oh, what was it, Mrs. Connors? Well, usually on Monday and Tuesday nights, Jeff brings work home with him. All the mail that's accumulated over the weekend, the new premiums and renewals and so on. Uh Uh-huh. Well, for the past five weeks, Mr. Dollar, believe it or not, Jeff has gone bowling every Tuesday night. He's become so enthused about it, why... He hasn't come home before midnight on any Tuesday evening since. Now, don't you think that's encouraging, Mr. Dollar? Expense account item four, $15.75. Cab fare in and around the city of Dallas. I spent the rest of the day checking the neighborhoods where the fires had occurred, talking to policyholders, neighbors... Anyone who might give me a new or different slant. I came up with nothing. Around five o'clock, I called in to Lieutenant Borchard. Still the same answer, Mr. Dollar. Haven't been able to pick up Connors yet. We checked out Sally Martin and Bill Trendler, though. Anything there? Nope. It was dinner, theater, and the club 
Romulo, just like they said. Yeah, I see. For a while there, it looked like something might have tied in. Trendler used to work for Connors, you know. Trendler was with Eastern Indemnity? Until about two months ago, yeah. Left then to start a business of his own, a bowling alley. Expense account item five, a dollar and sixty cents. Cab fare to Trendler's Bowling Emporium on East Gatto Street. Five alleys and a drink and sandwich bar. Trundler was keeping score for a couple of high school bobby soxers over on alley number three. Don't let it get you down, honey. It happens to the best of us. Take off one of them anyway. Can I talk to you for a minute, Mr. Trundler? What? Oh, it's you. The insurance man, uh, Johnny Dollar, isn't it? That's right. What's on your mind, Dollar? I'd like to talk to you for a minute. About the fires? Yeah. Take over for the girls, Jim. We'll be right back. Let's go in the office, Dollar. Let's have it, Dollar. You used to work for Jeff Connors at Easton. Yeah, sure. Up until two months ago. Why did you quit? I just wasn't cut out to be a good insurance salesman. So you opened this bowling alley. Anything wrong with that? Well, they tell me it takes money to open these things. I had a few bucks saved. From uh, not being a good insurance salesman? Why the interest in my finances, Dollar? Well, I'm just curious. So be curious about something else, huh? Okay. Did Jeff Connors ever come bowling here? Yeah, a couple of times. Jeff's wife says he's been bowling every Tuesday night. I wouldn't know. Last time I saw him was four weeks ago last night. Any idea where he might have been those other Tuesday nights? Why not ask Sally Martin? What's she got to do with it? She's his secretary. She was with him the times he came here. Maybe they figured out something better to do with their Tuesday nights. She was out with you last night. Yep. Every minute from 6 o'clock till 2.15. Dinner, theater, Club Romulo. Well, you can always walk out of the theater before the final curtain. And a $10 bill can make a nightclub waiter pretty confused about time. Be kind of hard to prove anything like that, wouldn't it, Dollar? Well, there's no law against trying. Expense account item six, one dollar and eighty cents. Cab fare back to your offices. They were closed for the night. At the Baker Hotel, I put a call into Sally Martin's apartment and got no answer. While I was trying to figure out the next move, Lieutenant Borchard called and made up my mind for me. Be out front in two minutes, Donna. I'll pick you up. Where are we going, Lieutenant? Out near the viaduct over the Trinity River. What's out there? Another fire? Nope. Jeff Connor's board in 12 feet of water. Took about an hour for a mobile crane to get there, and another 35 minutes before the grappling hooks got a solid hold and swung the car up onto dry land. Borchard and I were beside the car almost before the crane put it down. Well, that's a big help. Disappointed, Lieutenant? Would have helped if he'd been in the car. Cost money to drag a river like this. I don't think you'll find him down there. We've got to look. On his way back to City Hall, Borcher dropped me off at the hotel. On a hunch, I went across the street and had a little talk with the night elevator man in your office building. Well, now, let's see. Seems to me somebody went up to Eastern Indemnity since closing time. Yep, here it is. Checked in at 8.17, out again at 8.23. Sally Martin it was. Anyone with her? Come to think of it, there was. Fellow waiting outside in the car. Say, now, I'm just wondering... Could it be it was Mr. Connors himself? Expense account item seven. Six dollars and ninety cents for a fast cab ride out to Sally Martin's apartment. The extra five was for the speed. Yes, what... 
Mr. Dollar. Where is he, Sally? Where's who? Jeff Connors. Is he still here? Then, then you know? That he was hiding here today? Let's say I guessed. All right, where is he? I... I don't know. Now, look. There have been five fires and three people are dead. You're hurting my arm, Mr. Dollar. I want to know what you were doing up at the office and where Jeff went when he left here. We, we went up there to get a list of the new policies that came in today. Why? What did Jeff want with them? I don't know. Well, there was some reason. What was it? I tell you, I don't know. I got back here tonight and told him Mrs. Connors had called about the new policies. He made me drive right down. His wife called the office? Well, Mrs. Connors always did that. Double-checked the policies with me because of the files he kept at home. What was different about her call this time? Well, nothing. Except the day, maybe. She always called on Tuesdays. There wasn't any real reason for her to call today. Only one new policy had come in. A fire policy? Yes, on an apartment building out on the west side. Where is it? Look, Mr. Dollar, I know what you're thinking. But Jeff didn't have anything to do with those fires. Believe me. Where's the policy, Sally? Over there, on the table. Expense account item eight, seven dollars and fifty cents. Cab fare with speed to the newly insured apartment building on the west side. I called Lieutenant Borchard from Sally's, and he was there waiting for me. You spotted him yet, Lieutenant? Yeah. Parked in Miss Martin's car back there in the alleyway. When are you going to take him? We're just waiting for you. Okay, let's go. There it is, Donna. Yeah. Keep your hands on the wheel, Connors. Don't worry, Lieutenant. I won't try anything. You expecting us, Jeff? No. Matter of fact, I was hoping you wouldn't show, Johnny. I wanted to handle this myself. You've been handling it that way too long, Connors. Yeah, I guess I have. I wasn't really sure till I saw the car last night. I read about the hit run in the morning papers. Is that why you dumped it in the river? It didn't make much sense, I guess. Trying to cover up that way, just getting kind of desperate. Where is she, Jeff? What? Your wife. Where is she? In the basement? Yes. She must be through by now. I was waiting for her to come out. Trying to delay until the last minute, I guess. I'll have to get her, Connor. You... You treat her gently, won't you, Lieutenant? Don't worry. I'll treat her gently. Sally Martin's not mixed up in this, Johnny boy. She was just trying to help her boss out of a jam. Didn't even know what it was. Don't worry about it, Jeff. Doesn't make much sense, does it, Johnny? My own wife. Firebug. I suppose maybe it was our home burn. Boy, I don't know. This doesn't make much sense. She was a lovely girl, China. I wish you'd known her then. She was such a lovely girl. Expense account item nine, $37.40. Hotel bill and miscellaneous. Expense account item ten, $119.10. Airfare back to Hartford. Expense account total, $309.25. Remarks? I've seen fires burn everything from blocks of tenements to a hole in a rug. But this is the first time I ever saw one actually burn the heart out of a man. I don't ever want to see it again. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, next time you chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, notice how cool and fresh it makes your mouth feel. That's because Wrigley's Spearmint Gum has lots of lively, refreshing, real spearmint flavor in every stick. The minute you sink your teeth in, that cooling flavor begins to freshen your taste 
and relieve that hot, dry feeling in your throat. It sweetens the breath, too. Millions of people carry Wrigley's Spearmint Gum with them wherever they go for quick, long-lasting refreshment and for real chewing enjoyment. Next time you're at the store, get some Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Enjoy its refreshing flavor and good, pleasant chewing often, every day. Remember, that's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Sidney Marshall with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Hal March, Barney Phillips, Gene Bates, Sam Edwards, Virginia Gregg, and Jim Nusser. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft clothes for men, and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's story, The Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place. And so once again we raise the familiar brass door knocker of Dr. John Watson. Well, well, Mr. Stark, come in, come in. This is indeed a pleasure. I've been told we'll have to get along with a substitute for Mr. Harris for a few weeks, but I had no idea he'd turn out to be an old friend. I, uh, well, I wore my clipper craft suit, Dr. Watson, so it wouldn't seem too strange in this program. Uh, what's on the agenda for tonight? Well, it concerns the strange and slightly horrendous affair at Soscombe Old Place, in which Holmes investigated the graves in an ancient burial crypt. Hmm, sounds promising. And unearthed the fact that certain bones had been disposed of in the furnace. Wow, my hair is beginning to stand Stand up on end already. <laughs> yes. The adventure began placidly enough one rainy morning. Holmes and I had just finished an excellent breakfast in our rooms in Baker Street. I was gazing idly through the sporting columns, trying to decide what horse to back in the forthcoming derby. And uh, Holmes? Uh, Holmes was pot- pottering around with a, a low-piled microscope, doing some sort of an experiment. <laughs> Daredevil quoted his favorite, eh? Up and Atom, odds ten to one. Shoscombe Prince, forty to one. Huh. Wonder what's brought the odds down on that horse. Aha! Glue, Watson. It's glue. Jack Horner and Break a Day. I were... What did you say, Holmes? I was merely telling you the phenomenal fact that the microscope showed that there's glue in this bit of dust. Glue? Hmm. What difference does it make? Glue or paste or even sticking plaster? Well, can't you see I'm busy? Lucky lady, bride of Cornwall. The fact that there is glue in this dust is going to cost a man his life. And, uh, I say, cost a man's life? Glue? Hmm. Now you're interested, eh, Watson? Well, come over here and take a peek through this microscope. Well, it's nothing but a blur to me. Wait, let me adjust it. There, what do you see now? Some long, matted hairs. Those are infinitesimal fibers from a tweed cap, the criminal's tweed cap. The irregular gray masses are dust. These are epithelial scales on the left. Yes, but what are those shiny amber-colored crystals in the center? That is the glue. 
Yes, but how does a man's life depend on those? In the St. Pancras case, you may remember that a cat was found beside the dead policeman. The accused man denies it's his. The stuff under the microscope was taken from one of the seams of that cap and proves the man was lying. But how? The man is a picture frame maker who habitually handles glue. Well, that case is closed. I had a new client who's due to call at ten. He's late. By the way, Watson, you have some knowledge of horse racing, I believe. Well, I ought to. <laughs> it's cost me about half my year's pension. Good. Then you can be my handy guide to the turf, as I believe you call your racing Bible. Well, what would you like to know? Does the name Sir Robert Norberton mean anything to you? Oh, rather. He lives at Shoscombe Old Place. Yes, but the man himself, what's he like? Oh, tall, muscular, has a devil of a temper. He once horsewhipped Sam Brewer, the Curzon Street moneylender, on Newmarket Heath. Hmm, interesting. Does he often indulge in such pastimes? Well, he has the reputation of being a dangerous man. The most daredevil rider in Europe. See, he won the Grand National a few years back. One of those men who have missed their true generation. <laughs> He would have been a buck in the days of the Regency. A boxer, a heavy gambler, a devil with the ladies, and a first-class shot. Capital, Watson. A perfect thumbnail sketch. Now, can you give me some idea of Shoscombe Old Place? Well, not much. Only that it's very ancient and situated in the centre of Shoscombe Park. And that the famous Shoscombe stables and training quarters are to be found there. And, and the head to... trainer is John Mason. I say, how did you deduce that? I didn't have to. John Mason's my most recent client. This letter asking for an appointment is from him. But uh, go on, what else is there of interest about the place? Well, there are the famous Shoscombe Spaniels. You hear of them in every dog show. Spaniels, eh? Uh, they're the special pride of the lady of Shoscombe Old Place. Sir Robert's wife? No, Sir Robert has never married. He lives with his widowed sister, Lady Beatrice Fulder. You mean she lives with him? No, I, not at all. I said what I meant. The place belonged to her late husband... Lady Beatrice has only a life interest. It reverts at her death to her husband's brother. Mm, her husband's brother, eh? Meantime, she draws the rents every year. And brother Robert spends them. Uh, that's about the size of it. They're always quarreling, and yet I've heard they're devoted to each other. But what's amiss at Shoscombe? That's just what I'd like to know. What the... And that, if I'm not mistaken, is the man who can tell us, the trainer, John Mason. Yes, here he comes up the stairs. Come in, come in. Ah, Mr. Mason. I am Sherlock Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. You read my note? Yes. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, Mr. John Mason. How, How do you do, sir? Please be seated. <sighs> now, Mr. Mason, what's the difficulty? Your note explained nothing. Her matter's too delicate for me to put on paper. Much too complicated. I had to see you face to face. We are at your disposal. Mr. Holmes, I think my employer has gone mad. My dear Mr. Mason, this is Baker Street, not Harley Street. We do not pretend to be brain specialists. Well, gentlemen... A man does one queer thing, or even two. But when everything he does is queer, well, I believe Shoscombe Prince and the Derby have turned his brain. Shoscombe Prince? That's the colt you're running, isn't it? Yes, sir. The best in England, if I do say so. I'll be plain with you, because I, I know you're a gentleman of honor, and it won't go beyond this room. Sir Robert has got to win the Derby. He's up to his neck in debts, and, well, it's his last chance. Everything he can raise or borrow is on that horse. If Prince fails him, he's done for. Hmm, sounds like rather a desperate gamble, but that doesn't necessarily mean the man's insane. Where does the madness come in? First of all, his looks, sir. His eyes are wild. I don't believe he sleeps at nights. He's down at the stables at all hours. And then, sir, there's, there's his conduct to his sister, Lady Beatrice. She loved the horses as much as he did. Every day she'd drive down to see him, and above all, she loved Prince. He'd trick up his ears when he heard the wheels of a carriage on the gravel and out he'd trot to get his lump of sugar. But that's all over now. She drives by every morning without so much as a good day to you. You think there's been a quarrel? Yes. A bitter, savage one it must have been. Why else would he give away a pet spaniel that she loved as if he were a child? To whom did he give it? To old Barnes, what keeps the green dragon three miles away at Crindle. Hmm. Curious, eh, Watson? Yeah. Of course, with her weak heart and dropsy, you couldn't expect her to get about much with her brother. But Sir Robert spent two hours every evening in her room. Now he never goes near her. She's taken it to art, she has, sir. Brooding and sulky and drinking, Mr. Holmes. Drinking like a fish. Hmm. Did she ever do that before this estrangement? Well, she took a glass regular every evening, but... Now, as often as not, it's a old bottle. There's something rotten about it, Mr. Holmes. Then there's the goings-on down at the old church crypt at night. The 
Haunted crypt, we call it. Haunted? Yes, Mr. Holmes. There's an old ruined chapel in the park. So old, nobody can fix its date. And under it, there's a crypt. A crypt where all the ancestors of Lady Beatrice's husband lie buried, including the man himself. Well, sir, that crypt has got a bad name among us. It's dark and damp enough by day with the weeds breaking through everywhere, but at night it's worse. Standing there in the moonlight, it's broken arches, gleaming like ghosts. There's not many in the countryside that have the nerve to go near it at night. But I gather you did, or there'd be no story. Yes, sir. Me and the butler Stevens. We was taking a walk in the moonlight, smoking a pipe before going to bed. When all of a sudden, we notices a light, sort of pale and unearthly like, shining in the old chapel. There we stood, Stevens and me, quaking in the bushes like two bunny rabbits. You see that, Mason? It's a light in the old chapel. Yeah. Someone's in there. Or something. I don't like the look of it. It isn't natural. What's going on in the chapel this time of night? Yeah, we'd best go and find out. Oh, for heaven's sake, no. Maybe it's something evil. Some bad spirit set its light there to lure some poor fella to his death. Uh, wait a bit, wait a bit. See that shadow moving against the far wall? It's a man's shadow, that is. Or a devil's. It looks more than life-size to me. Isn't that a tail he's switching around behind him? And nonsense. It's a piece of rope he's holding in his hand. Here. What's that? It, it's Pip, Lady Beatrice's spaniel. He's probably outside the old well house, howling at the moon. He was there all last night, howling to wake the dead. I don't say that. Maybe that's just what he's doing. Maybe that's what he's done. Waked all the corpses in the crypt and they're having a ghostly meeting. Rubbish, Stevens. You don't really believe in ghosts? Why, when you think about all this tomorrow morning, you'd be ashamed. Uh, but that's tomorrow morning. And tonight, standing here in the moonlight, well, I ain't so sure. Well, there's one way to find out. Come on, let's have a look at who's in that chapel. You, you're not going over there, Mason. I am that. You can stay here alone, if you like. Stay here by myself. Well, then, go back to the house. What? And pass by that well house and that howling dog all alone? It's only Pip. No, I'm coming with you. At least there'll be two of us. Right, start, lad. Come along, then. Don't crackle the bushes any more than you can help. Confound that beast! Hello. Light's disappearing down the stairs into the crypt. Huh? See? There's no one in here in the chapel. Oh, then what's the good of us coming down? Look, look, there's a crack in the stone floor. Over there, where the streak of light's coming through, see? We can get over to it without being heard. Maybe we can see what's going on down below. I wish I was safe in my bed. Now then, we'd best crawl along in our stomachs. Easy, does it? <laughs> yeah, here's the crack. By George, all right. It's two men. Uh-huh. That first one with a thin yellow face. I've never seen him before, I'd swear to that. But the big chap in the black cloak kneeling down. There's something familiar about him. If I could only see his Hello. face. Now he's standing up. By the Lord, Harry. It's the master himself, Sir Robert. What's he up to down here in the dead of night? What's that he's got under his arm? So careful. Now he's holding it up to the light. It's a head. The head of a mummy. What an eerie experience, Mr. Mason. Well, that it was, Dr. Watson. I'd have given me notice the next day, except that, well, uh, I didn't want to leave Lady Beatrice alone at the mercy of that ruffian. I tried to see her ladyship and tell her what was going on, but... She wouldn't see me. Sent out word by our maid, Carrie Evans, she wasn't feeling well enough. Not feeling well enough? Yes, Mr. Holmes. But she was well enough to go out driving all the same. How long has this maid, Carrie Evans, been with Lady Beatrice, Mr. Mason? Going on five years, sir. And she's devoted? She's devoted, all right. I won't say to whom. 
I can't be creating scandal. We don't have to. Sir Robert's reputation with the ladies is, shall we say, a, a trifle shady. Yes, uh, scandal's been clear for a long time, I'm afraid. I say, Holmes, perhaps that's the cause of the quarrel between the brother and sister. Being an invalid, she has no way of enforcing her will. So the hated maid is still at Shoscombe. Lady Beatrice sulks and takes to drink. Sir Robert becomes angry and gives away her pet spaniel. That explains everything, doesn't it? Everything but the nocturnal visit to the crypt, who the yellow-faced stranger was, and why Sir Robert was holding a skull in his arms. Just a few trifling omissions, Watson. Oh, go to blazes. Quite. Now then, Mr. Mason, you say Sir Robert gave his sister's spaniel away to the proprietor of the Green Dragon. Yes, Mr. Holmes. When was that? About a week ago, sir. Day after we saw him in the crypt. The very day Sir Robert left for London. Oh, he left for London, did he? Yes, sir. And has he come back? We're expecting him back tomorrow, sir. And has Lady Beatrice been taking her morning drives the same as usual? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Eleven o'clock sharp. She and Carrie go out together. I'm not quite clear what you expect me to do in this matter, Mr. Mason. Maybe this will make it more definite, sir. Yes, I've been wondering what you had in that paper bundle. It's something Harvey. He's one of our lads. Found in the furnace up at the big house when he was raking out the cinders yesterday. Hmm. A bone. Badly charred. I say that... What is it, Watson? Your knowledge of anatomy is more accurate than mine. That's part of a femur. A human bone. Exactly. When does this lad tend to the furnace? Every night he makes it up and then leaves it. Anyone could visit it during the night? Yes, sir. You don't think Sir Robert... Watson, you forget Sir Robert's supposed to be in London. He's a deep waters, Mr. Mason. Deep and rather dirty. But I'm beginning to see to the bottom. How is the fishing in the neighborhood of Shoscombe Old Place? The... The fishing, Mr. Holmes? Yes, the doctor and I are famous fishermen, and we haven't had an opportunity to show our prowess this season, eh, Watson? Well, if it's fishing you're after, there's nothing can come up to the trout in the mill stream. Good. You may address us in future at the Green Dragon. We shall reach there tonight. And now that you have Mr. Holmes started on your fishing expedition, Dr. Watson, may I step in to say a few words? Fair enough, Mr. Stark. Clipper Craft clothes are not merely good-looking at the time you buy them. They stay good-looking. Part of the reason for this is hidden from your eyes. That's the painstaking tailoring, the hundreds of stitches inside. Yes, fine tailoring and rich, long-wearing fabrics are the reasons Clipper Craft clothes are remarkable values at their more than modest prices. Naturally, prices low as these wouldn't be possible without the unique Clipper Craft plan. This plan concentrates the buying power of 1,036 great stores across the country, creating year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. That's why you pay only $40 and $45 for a Clipper Craft suit, only $40 for a top coat or overcoat, and only $26.50 for sport jackets. For your own sake, compare Clipper Craft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to our story, Dr. Watson. Well, suppose we pick up after Holmes and I had settled ourselves at the Green Dragon. Mid-morning found us tramping down the road leading towards Shoscombe Old Place, carrying rods and reels and all the rest of the trout fisherman's paraphernalia. Holmes also had a shaggy black spaniel in tow. Ah, splendid weather for fishing, eh, Watson? The trout should be fairly jumping at the hook. Yes, I shall have a good opportunity to try that new fly of mine. If that confounded dog doesn't scare the fish away, what in thunder made you bring that spaniel along? You mean Pip? Yes. Down, boy, down. I saw him tied up in the front hall of the inn. Mine host says that they have to keep him on a leash or he runs straight back to his old home. Easy, Pip. Don't pull so, boy. Poor dog seemed to want to go walking, so I said I'd take him. Yes, but a dog on a fishing jaunt will really, Holmes, you... Now, if we were going hunting, it'd be different, eh? Yes, but it's not the hunting season. You never know. We may get in a little hunting before we get to our fishing. Ah, that is the entrance gate to Shoscombe Old Place, I presume. And some old ironwork. And tightly locked, too. <laughs> Dear Sir Robert, is very jealous of his privacy, eh? You would be, too, if you had a horse you expected to win the derby. I understand he's very vicious with touts or any stranger he catches snooping around his property. I say, look, here comes a big yellow open barouche. Yes, Lady Beatrice returning from her morning's drive, I fancy. I thought we should have some hunting this morning. What do you mean? Pip and I are going to hide behind this hedge. When the footman gets down to unlock the gates, I want you to engage him in conversation. Yes, but I don't understand, Holmes. It... Holmes, where are you? Where did you go? Here, behind the hedge, trying to keep this confounded dog quiet. Here they come. I say the old girl must be a million years old, 
all bundled up in shawls and veils and things. That must be Carrie beside her. The one with the suspiciously blonde hair. They've stopped. The footman's getting down off the box. The gates are swinging open. After him, Watson, after him. Hello there. I, I say, my good man, can you tell me how to get to the mill stream? Now then, Pip, out you go, old boy. It's your mistress. After her, boy, after her. <coughs> there he goes. He leaps into the carriage onto his mistress's lap. By Jove, he's snarling. He's trying to bite the woman. Get that confounded dog out of here. Drive on, drive on. Come on, Pip. Did she try to kick you? Well, never mind, old boy. Well, Watson, that's done it. He expected to see his mistress and he found a stranger. Dogs don't make mistakes. But it was the voice of a man. Exactly. Our little hunting party was quite a success. We flushed our bird. Now, come along, Watson. The fish are waiting for us. Look here, Holmes. You're not going to give up this clue. Not exactly. But our hunting must be postponed until after dark. And then, I promise you, it will be for big game. Here, Holmes, that storm is going to break any minute now. Hadn't we better get back to the inn? Oh, rubbish. We can reach the chapel before we get too wet. Yes, but how do we get home again? By running, I suspect. We may get wet. I told the landlord to have some of the trout we caught this afternoon and a Stilton cheese, salad, and a hot toddy waiting for us. Oh, then let's get back now. I said we wouldn't be back before half past ten. But if we weren't back by then, to route out the local police. You, you think it's as bad as all that? I don't know. It all depends on what we find in that crypt. There, that, that must be the chapel up ahead. I saw it in the last flash of lightning. Here comes the rain. Run, Watson, run! I say, don't go so fast. Good Lord, it, it's as black as the inside of my pocket. I, uh, I've lost the chapel. No, no, there it is. Over here, Watson, over here. There's an entrance. Right. Oh, great thunder, I... I'm soaked to the skin. It's, it's coming down in torrents. Here, this must be the stairs leading down to the crypt. I say, Holmes, you, you have eyes like a cat. I can't see a blasted thing. Take my hand. Easy now, easy. Don't fall and break your neck. There. Now you can light the lantern. Yes, if I can find a match that's dry enough to light. We all feel like spaghetti. There. Phew. What a sepulchral place. Look at all those vaults. I had no idea Lady Beatrice's husband had so many ancestors. Yes, some of those graves date back before the Norman invasion. Look at the Saxon names. Adalbert, Harold. And here are the Normans. Mm. Long line of Hugos and Odos and Percys. But it's this leaden coffin we're interested in, I imagine. Notice how the dust around it's been disturbed. Yeah. Hand me that Jimmy, Watson. Look, you're not going to open it. Holmes, let's get out of here. All, all these coffins, hundreds of dead ancestors. I I feel like a ghoul myself prying into their long-forgotten secrets. Rubbish. I'll have this lid off in no time. One, two. Stand back! What the... Keep away from that coffin. Keep back, I say, or I'll blow you to bits. Well, well, if it isn't Sir Robert Norberton himself, this is a surprise. Allow me to present myself. I am... Sherlock Holmes, you don't have to tell me. I heard how you tried to frighten my sister this morning. Now, clear out. Your sister? Yes, my sister. Now, what is your motive? What are you doing here? Answer me, do you hear? I, too, have some questions to ask, Sir Robert. What have you done with your sister? My sister? My sister is home in bed, of course. If your sister's home in bed, would you mind telling me whose body is inside this coffin? Throw back the lid, Watson. There, Sir Robert. Is that the body of your sister, or isn't it? It is. But you're not the official police. What business is it of yours, anyway? My business is that of every good citizen, to uphold the law. What? You mean you'll hand me over to the police? Good Lord, this is terrible. I know appearances are against me, but I couldn't do anything else. Now, let me explain. Your explanations must be to the police, I'm afraid. But that will ruin me, don't you understand? I've always been dependent on my sister, Lady Beatrice, for everything. I'm... Deeply in debt. 
If it were known that my sister were dead, my creditors would come down on me like vultures. Everything would be seized, my stables, my horses. Shelscombe Prince would never run the derby. Oh, Mr. Holmes, my sister did die just one week ago. She died of dropsy, which had long afflicted her. That will be for the coroner to decide. I was faced with absolute ruin. If I could only keep her death hushed up until day after tomorrow when the derby is run, I'll make a fortune. If your horse wins. Oh, he will. He must. My good name depends on it. On the first night after my sister's death, Norlet, who is Carrie Evans' husband and an actor, helped to carry her body out to the old well house. We were followed, however, by her pet spaniel, who howled all night long. I finally had to get rid of him. And it was Norlet, the actor, who impersonated your sister this last week? Yes, Mr. Holmes. All oh, this last week I've lived a life of the damned. My conscience has given me no peace. Later, we buried my sister's body here, in what is still consecrated ground. One of the tombs of her husband's ancestors. After having endeavored to destroy the ancestors' bones in the furnace. What? I don't know how you know that, but it's true. And now it's for nothing. All for nothing. I'm ruined, Mr. Holmes, ruined. Not necessarily. Well, what do you mean? After all, the derby is only the day after tomorrow. Of course, we must lay the case before the local authorities, but uh, I still have a little influence here and there. Would you? Would you use it? It's not altogether impossible. And now, Dr. Watson, before you tell us Holmes' rather surprising decision in the case of Sir Robert, I'd like to make one more speech on behalf of Clippercraft. Go ahead, Mr. Stark. When you advertise anything as extensively as Clippercraft, the product's got to be good. Clippercraft clothes really have to have it, and they have. They're the most amazing clothes you've ever seen at prices so very modest. Remember, Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45, top coats and overcoats only $40, and sport jackets only $26.50. No, you won't find such smart styling and comfort, such rich, long-wearing fabrics, even at far higher prices. They're made possible by the renowned Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast, so that these great clothes are available to you at your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now, Dr. Watson, did Sherlock Holmes use his influence in Sir Robert's behalf? Yes, indeed, Mr. Stark. We went back to the inn and Holmes routed the local constable and coroner out of bed. They discussed matters over the trout and coffee and cheese. Uh, luckily, our catch had been a fairly big one. Moreover, the creditors were all Londoners and Sir Robert was a local man. <laughs> Pride of county, you know. And besides, the constable and the coroner had both placed bets on Shoscombe Prince. And they wanted to see him win. And did he? He did. And netted his owner £80,000. Sir Robert paid his debts and bought a small place in the neighborhood of Shoscombe, where he threatens to end his days in an honored old age. He and Holmes have become great friends. Holmes often visits him when he wants a bit of trout fishing. Well, all this uh, talk of trout and salad and cheese has given me the most tremendous appetite. <laughs> I had hoped it would. I have a special treat in store for you tonight. Just ring the bell, will you? I received two of the most beautiful trout from Sir Robert just this morning. I imagine my housekeeper has them in the pan by now. Frying in butter with lemon sprinkled on the top. And a fresh green salad and a Stilton cheese. But, uh, but look here. Isn't it a bit out of season for trout? <laughs> Nothing is out of season these days, Mr. Stark. Sir Robert has what is called a deep freeze, you know. <laughs> yes, I know. But what have you in mind to tell us next week, Dr. Watson? Well, next week, Mr. Stark, I think I'll tell you of the vicious robberies and bludgeonings that occurred in Boston Yard. 
The criminal, you know, was a cat named Peggy. Holmes always called it the adventure of the wooden claw. The makers of Clippercraft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Wooden Claw. Charles Starr speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations, the Mutual Broadcasting System. In just 25 seconds, you'll hear Melvin Elliott reporting the latest news. Fly Eastern Airlines' new type constellation, tried and proven with 300 million passenger miles of dependability. Fly Eastern Airlines. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new road-rated 76 gasoline and the new Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company presents... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. As the great clouds of fog roll in, the tall buildings of the San Francisco skyline gradually become giant bulwarks in the mist. Most businessmen are at dinner now in the world-famous restaurants of the city. But the light shining in a window of the Rust Building shows that private detective Michael Shane is an exception. As he struggles with the necktie he's going to wear this evening, he munches a sandwich brought to him by lovely Phyllis Knight. Hey, uh... Hey, Phil... Yes. Here, uh, help me with this tie, Angel, will you? I can't do a thing with it. Why do I have to work for a detective? If you were anybody else in San Francisco, your tie would be tied, and we'd be at dinner at Jack's or Vanessa's or Lupo's or... Oh, let me at that tie. <laughs> now, Angel, you know very well I said I'd take you to dinner, but you want to make the first stack at the Geary, and... Hey, just a minute, honey, just a minute. Make the knot a little tighter, will you, please? Glad to. This, my uncultured employer, is the fashionable way to tie a tie. It's known as the Windsor Knot. Oh, yeah? Well, make mine smaller anyhow. Hmm? Oh. I'm not a member of your office colony yet. All right, all right. How's that? Better? Oh, that's perfect, Angel. Like you. Oh. <laughs> Do you know how long it is since you said something nice like that? Hmm? Well, not to change the subject, but uh, that letter on your desk. Who's it from? Which one? Oh, the one written with the very fancy hand. Oh, oh, that. It's from some poet who wants my opinion of his work. I've never heard of him before. Oh, so you're still the uncrowned queen of the artist, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how is his poetry? Well, confidentially, it... No, oh, don't answer it, Mike, please. It might be important, Angel. Well, that's just it. We'll miss the play, Mike, and you promise I'm me. I'm sorry, oh. Angel. Hello. That's you, Mike? Oh, yeah, yeah. What's new, Inspector? Oh, no, the Inspector. What do you know about a guy named Van Allen Haven? Oh, nothing. Why? I'm out on a case. He's a murder suspect. I see. So you just naturally assumed that uh, I knew him. No, not quite. There's a note on his desk. It says Phyllis Knight, Rust Building, San Francisco. Oh? What did you say his name was? Van Allen Haven. Oh, that's quite a name. Just a minute. Say, honey... Did you ever hear of a guy called Van Allen Haven? Yes, yeah, certainly. He's the poet that wrote that letter. Oh, 
That accounts for it. <laughs> Inspector, we don't know him, but he wrote to Phil for a criticism of his poems. Say, maybe we'd better drop over. Oh, my. You're sure you don't know more than you're telling me, Mike? Well, sure, I'm sure. We never met the guy, but he wrote to Phil. You know, she's got a rep in those poetry circles. Okay. Come on over. It's that apartment house at Leavenworth and Jewel. It's on Russian Hill. I'll be right there. Well, come on, Angel. Let's go see how the other half kill. <laughs> Well, here we are, right on top of Russian Hill. Ah, the view is almost as good as from your apartment, Mike. Mm -hmm. But different, Angel. Well, come on, come on. Let's see what the fuss is all about. Uh Uh-oh. Three guesses which building it is. Yeah. Gee, looks like the whole police force is out. Mm -hmm. Hi there, Mike. Oh, hello, Sarge. Hi. Go right in. Oh, thanks, Sergeant. The inspector inside? Yes, sir. He's expecting you and Miss Knight. Hello, Sergeant. Okay, Doc, you can have the body removed any time. I'm through with it now. Oh, there you are, kids. What kept you? Well, Mike had trouble with his necktie, Inspector. You know, as far as ties are concerned, he's still living in the Middle Ages. Oh, oh, don't mind her. She's prejudiced. Well, come on, kids. We've got a lot to do. Okay, Inspector, okay. Give us a quick rundown. Look over there at the foot of the stairs. The corpse you see all huddled up is what's left of Robert Freeman. Know him? Nope. I didn't think you would. Oh. What happened to him, Inspector? Coroner says he was shot in the back while coming down these stairs. He died instantly and fell to the bottom. Hmm. Any suspects? It's an apartment house, Mike. Theoretically, everybody in the building is a suspect. We sent them all back to their own apartments, and we'll question them there. How about the gun? So far, we haven't found a thing. Well, anyone here report the incident? Yeah, yeah, one of the tenants, uh, Miss Rambo, phoned us. I got right over. Well, what's your opinion, Inspector? Well, Phil, from the angle at which the bullet entered the body, the killer must have been standing at the head of the stairs. I assume he or she then stepped back into an apartment after firing. Hmm. Probably into a front apartment. Now, look at the top of the staircase now. You see those two doors? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. The occupants of both those apartments would have had a better chance to get out of sight after the killing. I see. Who lives in them, Inspector? Well, Phil, here's the list. The one on the right is listed to the deceased and his wife. The left one, let's see. Joseph Bauer, pianist. May I see that list, Inspector? Yeah, here, Mike. Where did the gal live who uh, reported the killing, Mike? It shows Elaine Rambo on the first floor. Mm-hmm. That's right. Joan Schmidt Haven. Oh, here's Van Allen Haven. Hmm. Lives on the main floor, too. Yeah, right across from the base of the stairs where we found the body. And it was in his apartment that you found the note with my name on it. Yeah, and he's really a poet, all right. Never stops reciting his stuff. Really? Is he any good? <laughs> you can't prove it by me, Phil. Uh-huh. Well, come on, let's have a look at these apartments upstairs. And okay, them. come on, Phyllis. Let's, uh, let's try the two at the head of the stairs first. Yeah, that's what I had in mind, Mike. Not much of an apartment house, is it? No. What do you mean, Angel? Well, look at these dirty stairs. Dust, sawdust, everything. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, where's the piano music coming from? Seems to be the one on the left. Yeah, yeah, that's listed to a pianist, isn't it? Yeah, Joseph Bauer. And here it is. Pretty good, isn't it? Yes, yes, and pretty excited, too. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, Phil? Well, I'm no expert, but even I can play Rachmaninoff's Prelude in C-sharp minor without missing that G-sharp note every time, you know. You must be a callous sort of guy. Anybody who played piano right after a murder. For I guess mo- he didn't hear us, Mike. Mike, look at the crack under the door. There's no light. Well, he must have cat's eyes to play in the dark. Well, he's apparently going to ignore us. Let's try the door, Mike. Hi, it's pitch black. Can't seem to find the light switch. You won't find it over there. Who are you? Do not reach for your gun. I've taken the precaution of having my own cover the three of you. You can get away with this. I appear to be at present, do I not? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Bauer, Joseph Bauer. And you are... Inspector of Homicide. Your credentials, please. Look, you. Aren't you a little silly playing games in the dark? 
You couldn't see my badge if I showed it to you. Try it and see, Inspector. Here, here it is, Owl Eyes. Yes, I can see it plainly. Thank you. I'll turn on the lights. All right, let me have that gun. I have no gun, my friend. But I must take every precaution, especially when I hold such information as I do about the Freeman murder. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventure. The body of Robert Freeman was discovered at the foot of a staircase in his apartment house. He was shot in the back, apparently from the second floor landing. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have started interviewing the tenants on the second floor. And we find them now with an eccentric pianist called Joseph Bauer. All right. Out with it, Bauer. What information do you have about the killing? I will tell you, but you must promise to protect me from any revenge on the part of the murderer. No harm will come to you. You can trust the inspector, Mr. Bauer. You understand that a man in my position has to be careful. There are many who are envious of my great talent. Yes, yes, Bauer. The information. When I saw Robert Freeman lying dead, I knew he had been killed by Mrs. Freeman. By Mrs. Freeman? Why? The deceased and his widow had been arguing. Is that all? Is this not a revelation to you? Oh, for how do you know, Bauer? I was practicing this afternoon, and I heard them talking. You know, I sometimes practice for many hours in one day. I... You uh, were saying? Oh, yes. Well, I was playing the piano, and I heard their voices, quietly at first, and then they became louder and more violent. Could you make out what they were saying? Not at first, but as they grew louder, I heard Mrs. Freeman say, If you don't stop, I'll kill you both. Kill you both? Do you know who she meant by both? I'm sorry, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Bauer, where were you when Freeman was killed? I was a block or so away. I'd gone out to buy some cigarettes. When I entered the building, I saw everyone gathered around the body. Anyone see you come in the building? There was quite a crowd when I arrived. I don't know if I was noticed or not. All right, Bauer. I want you to remain in your apartment. We may want to question you again later. Say, Phil, what are you doing? Huh? Oh, I'm just looking at Mr. Bauer's telephone pad. What, um, what do these represent, Mr. Bauer? Nothing. I often scribble when I'm on the telephone. Mm -hmm. hmm. Looks like the initials E.R. It is nothing of the kind. I, I am what you call a, a doodler. Nothing more. Uh -huh. Okay, Inspector. You ready? Yeah, Mike. And now, if you do not object, I'll go on with my music. That's all right. Go right ahead. Oh, do not stop, my good friend. Play your music to the end. Ah, oh, Mr. Haven, I am delighted to see you. Uh, permit me to introduce one of the foremost poets in the country, Mr. Van Allen Haven, Inspector of Homicide... And I assume his assistant... Miss Knight and Mr. Shane. How do you do? Hello. Have I the honor of addressing Miss Phyllis Knight, who has assisted so many an artist in his plight? Oh, that's charming. I did receive a letter from you, Mr. Haven. What a happy happenstance meeting you this way. You read my poem? Uh, not yet, Mr. Haven, I'm sorry. Mr. Haven, you live on the first floor? Yes, right over there you will find my lair. The first apartment across the stair? Oh, quite, Inspector, quite. Where were you when the murder occurred? Composing verse in my abode. I always say, for every man some troubles lurk, unless he's busy in his work. Did you hear the shot? Ah, yes, I did. The fatal shot. You went into the hall at once? Sir, I write poetry. I do not have the heart of lions like my heroes. I but opened the door barely ajar and peeped out. When the crowd gathered, I walked boldly forward. Yes, uh, Mr. Haven, you knew the deceased? No. Some months ago, however, I permitted him to read some of my poetry. He didn't like it. <laughs> I see. I wonder if you'd let us use your apartment as a sort of headquarters while we're here. We have to conduct a little investigation, and your apartment would be handy, you see. My good inspector, say no more. My place is yours, however poor. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, here's the key. And since Mr. Bower's music brought me to this room, I think I'll stay for a while, if you will play. Certainly, Mr. Haven. Thank you, Mr. Bower. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, Inspector, what do you think of our two geniuses? <laughs> if you ask me, they're crazy as loons. That Haven character. You know, I've never heard such poetry in my life. Well, I think we'd better see Mrs. Freeman now and get her story. Say, Inspector, why don't you have this Miss Rambo here at the same time? Not while we're questioning Mrs. Freeman, Mike. Well, I have a reason. Look, Inspector, since the deceased was shot in the back as he was going downstairs, the murderer must have been standing behind him on the stairs or at the head of the staircase. Well? I see. With Mrs. Freeman at the top and Miss Rambo at the bottom... One of them must have seen the murderer. Right. Unless one of them is lying. Well, that's why I think it would be interesting to have them both here to check each other's stories. All right, Mike. We'll try it. Oh, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector. Bring down Mrs. Freeman and Miss Rambo. Right. Hey, what are you two up to over there? Say, did you see these? What are they? Well, they're... they're miniatures, Inspector. Huh? Look at them. Handmade carvings of all sorts of things. Mm, no end to Van Ellen Haven's talents, huh? Uh -uh. What do you make them out of? Well, some of it's balsa. Some is heavier. Looks like uh, teak. Yeah. Here's one of Fisherman's Wharf, complete with both sidewalk vendors and everything. And look at these tools. Everything from a brace and bit Say, to... wait a minute, Inspector. Huh? You notice anything unusual about this? No, except they're small tools, neatly arranged. Yeah, oh, but the brace and bit... That's just what I mean. Each tool is in its place in that wall bracket, except this one brace and bit. Yes, Haven is too neat and precise to leave a tool like that lying carelessly about. You know, it could fall and break the bit. Unless he'd used it and was in a rush. Oh, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Not necessarily, no, but I just... Come in. Miss Rambo and Mrs. Freeman, Inspector. All right, Sergeant. Please sit down, ladies. This is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. Mrs. Freeman, Miss Rambo. How do you do? Hi. Do you? Now, Mrs. Freeman, we'll start with you. Will you please tell us just what happened? Well, I, I'll try. It's been a terrible shock. I understand. Well, Bob came home late, as usual. I was reading in bed. He sat on the bed, and we talked for a while. Then the doorbell rang, and Bob went down to answer it. Mrs. Freeman, you mean your husband left the apartment? Yes, at this time of night, the door downstairs is locked, and you have to go right down to admit anyone. I see. And uh, then? Then I heard the shot. I ran out to the head of the stairs and saw Bob lying at the bottom. He was all in a heap. And uh, then what happened? Then the others started coming out of their apartments. Whom do you mean by the others, Mrs. Freeman? Just exactly who did you see first? What? Miss... Miss Rambo appeared at the bottom first, I believe. That's right. I saw you at the top right after the shot was fired. Then who came out? Well, I, I think Mr. Haven came out of his apartment next. How about the pianist, Mr. Bauer? Did you see him? Yes. Yes, he was there too, I believe. Did he enter the building? Well, he may have. I didn't notice. Now, look, Mrs. Freeman. This is important. You what? saw all these people on the first floor? Yes. None of them came from the second floor and passed you? No. It was several minutes later before anyone came out of their apartments upstairs. Now, Miss Rambo, I believe you were the one who called the police. Yeah, I see nobody else was going to do nothing, so I took over. I just dialed O and said, give me the cops. When did you do this? As soon as you heard the shot? No, when I heard the shot, I hopped it out of my joint as fast as I could. Then I seen Freeman lying there and Mrs. Freeman standing upstairs. Did you see anyone else? Anyone at all? No. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. Well, the next guy to show was Haven, who come running out of his, his apartment and... And then? Well, then a lot of people started showing up from all the apartments. Did you see anyone upstairs except Mrs. Freeman? No, not at first. Was there anyone else on the staircase or inside at all when you first ran out? No. Mrs. Freeman, we have testimony that you and your husband had been arguing. The fact that you threatened to kill him. Is that true? Well, I... I may have said something like that, Inspector. But I didn't mean it. I loved Bob. Then will you tell us why you were arguing? Bob had, had been staying away from home often. Uh -huh. He said he was working, but I knew it wasn't true. Do you know whom he was seeing, Mrs. Freeman? Yes. It'll be better if you tell us. No, I can't. I can't. She's um, a showgirl, Mrs. Freeman, isn't she? Well, I, I... She lives in this building. As a matter of fact, she's in this room right now. It's Elaine Rambo, isn't it? Yes, 
Well, kids, it's just too simple. What do you mean, Inspector? Well, if the bullet was fired from upstairs and all the suspects except Mrs. Freeman were downstairs, it leaves only her, doesn't it? Yeah. And her husband being in love with Elaine Rambo supplies the motive. But you don't believe she did it, Inspector, do you? No, Mike. I don't think she did. Neither do I. Oh, now, wait a minute, you two. You know, we aren't getting any place. If everybody but Mrs. Freeman is in the clear and you don't believe she did it, well, we're up against a stone wall. That's what it looks like. Oh, maybe not. Now, look. Here are two women. One at the head of the staircase and one at the bottom. Between them, a man is shot as he comes down the stairs. Now, if Mrs. Freeman had done it, Miss Rambo would have seen the gun. And Rambo couldn't have done it, or the bullet would have entered the body from the front. So? So the bullet must have been fired from some other point. Mike, you're right. Come on, kids, this calls for an examination of the staircase. <laughs> We'll rejoin we Mike and Phyllis in their adventures in a few moments. Robert Freeman has been murdered on the interior stairway of his apartment house. As we rejoin Mike, Phil, and the inspector, they're examining the staircase with Mike and Phil on one end and the inspector on the other. You uh, find anything up at your end, inspector? Not yet, Mike. You? Uh, no. You two certainly look cute, bending over and tapping those stairs. Well, you look kind of cute yourself, Angel. Come on, Phil. I'll come up here. What? What'd you find? What is it? Would you find anything? Look. Look at this step. Huh? Right there. Two holes. Both plugged up. Yeah. Here, wait a minute. I've got long fingernails. Let me try to get them out. Go ahead, fellas. Yeah. Uh-uh. uh-uh. It's, it's no use. They're in too solid. Well, here. Let me try to push them in. Here's my penknife. Use it, Mike. Okay. There. Well, I guess we know where they landed. In the closet under the staircase. Come on. Yeah. That's, uh, that's where all the sawdust you noticed came from, Phil. Yeah. Be careful. Be careful. Here. I'll open it. There are the plugs. And two shafts of light made by those two holes. Yeah. They were bored in the riser of the step. About halfway between the two floors. Yeah, but why two holes? One to see through and one to shoot through when the victim was in range. So the murderer rang Freeman's doorbell from downstairs, as Mrs. Freeman said, then waited in the closet for him to come down. When he got about halfway down the stairs, he was in range of this hole, and he got it in the back. Then the killer plugged the holes and waited for a crowd to gather. When he did, he slipped quietly out of the closet. And joined the crowd. Well, that's the way it happened, all right. Okay, Mike. Now we know how it was done, but we're not sure who did it. No. No, and our picture has changed completely, too. Before, we thought that everyone on the main floor was innocent, and, and now... Now, now they're the ones who could have done it, and Mrs. Freeman is the only one who couldn't possibly have done it. Right. All right. Now, who have we got? Joseph Bauer, Van Allen Haven, and Elaine Rambo. No, oh, no, I think we can eliminate Elaine Rambo, Inspector. If she and Freeman were seeing each other, she'd have no reason to kill him. Besides, I... I can't see any woman boring holes in the staircase to kill a man. No, but you could see a man doing it, couldn't you? Yeah, a man handy with tools. And that would account for his leaving the brace and bit around. Yes, but you'd never get a conviction on that little evidence. No, you're right, Mike. It's not enough. We're stymied. Sounds like Mr. Bauer is stymied, too. And by Mr. Rachmaninoff. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean, Angel? Well, he can't be deliberately trying to miss that G-sharp note. No, it doesn't make sense. He plays too well. Huh? Say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look, Inspector. What? Let's try this, huh? We'll switch off all the lights. Have Mrs. Freeman stand where she did at the top of the stairs. Have Elaine Rambeau stand at the bottom. Have Bauer at his piano. And have Haven bring his brace and bit. I've got a hunch we'll get ourselves a nice little confession. <laughs>
Oh, that's beautiful, Mr. Bowers. Beautiful. But uh, right now, I would like to hear you play the C-sharp minor. C? The Rachmaninoff? Mm Mm-hmm, that's right. Oh, but I... I... Play it, Mr. Bower, or Miss Knight will. Very well. often play the piano in the dark, don't you, Mr. Bauer? Like you were when we first interrupted you. I need no light to see music. That's right. But you do need light to see sawdust. Switch on the lights, Inspector. You see, Mr. Bauer? After killing Freeman and leaving the crowd that gathered around his body, you returned here and began playing in the dark. But... But you didn't notice the sawdust fall from your sleeve into the keyboard... Most of it right under this G sharp, which doesn't play, as uh, Phil pointed out. That's not true. When Phyllis found the scribbling on your phone pad, your hand had been tipped already, Mr. Bauer. This just clinches it. It's not true, I tell you. It's not true. Bauer, you're a dead duck. Would you like to go down to headquarters and have the sawdust under your fingernails analyzed? We both know they'd match the sawdust on Haven's brace and bit over there. Why don't you give up? All right. All right, I did it. I did it. Well, Inspector... I guess there won't be any problem about satisfying the D.A., will there? Michael. Hmm? You think we could still catch the last act of the Geary? Oh, could be. But it would take a couple of detectives to figure out what we've missed. What's the matter with us? (laughs) <laughs> Seriously, Mike, there are just two things I can't figure out First, mm. why didn't Bauer fix that key on the piano? Well, he didn't have time, Angel You get stardust underneath a key And you've got to practically tear the keyboard apart to get at it Well, that's right Secondly, why did Bauer kill Freeman? Well, Angel <clears throat> Bauer was in love with Elaine Rambo. He knew she was seeing Freeman, so in his uh, distorted imagination, he figured that getting rid of Freeman would give him a better chance. Oh, so when I found the initials ER on his telephone pad, you realized that they stood for Elaine Rambo. Yep. You see, darling, he just couldn't get her off his mind. Uh Uh-huh. Just like you can't get me off your mind. Huh? Yes, Angel. Just like... solid hour of exciting mystery dramas. Listen every Monday on these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by the case book of Gregory Hood. Michael Shane, private detective, stars Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis with Joe Forte as the inspector. The sergeant was played by Charlie Lund. Tonight's story was written by Robert Webster Light and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. And this is Ben Alexander saying good night for the people who make the new road-rated 76 gasoline and the new Triton Motor Oil Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.